<laughs> I worked closely with a man in his mid-50s. He was very special to me. He was diagnosed with a severe illness and underwent a liver transplant, survived the surgery, but never regained consciousness. A couple of years later, I was racing some movies to the video store, and as someone who naturally flies, I was on my way back and still in my racing mood. We lived about four miles out this long, dark, curvy at times road in Samira, Tennessee, just south of Nashville. I was in my car by myself, and as I approached the worst curve on the road, the smell filled my car. Instantly, I knew the smell, but couldn't place it. I slowed down and looked around the car as best I could. I remember looking in my rear view in the back seat a couple times, still trying to recall where I knew that smell. I looked through my rear view mirror for a split second, and I could have sworn I saw the face of a man. But before I could get a detailed look, it was gone. As for the smell, I rolled down my window to see if it was coming from the outside. It wasn't. Just past the curve, the thought hit me where I knew the smell from. My friend, Jim, my coworker or mentor who had died, had been on some very strong medicines before his death. The meds created an odor around him when you were near, and his breath had a certain smell that I'm sure was induced by the medicine. The smell that I smelt in my car was exactly this. I'd never smelt it before, nor after his death. Then the thought, clear as a bell, came to me. Jim had come to slow me down on that curve. I swear to this day, needless to say, it was scary, and I raced the rest of the way home. That night as I lay in bed, I remember looking up in the four corners of the room, saying, Jim, are you here? I didn't really think so, because that smell had dissipated just around the curve. To this day, almost 14 years later, I've never encountered it again. I know without a doubt the smell, as it was burned into my memories of Jim. After it was over, I remember thinking, Jim, come back, I would love to talk to you, but never had another experience. This is the first time this story has ever been told to anyone outside of her family, so I hope that everyone finds it as interesting and chilling as me and my family have. It all started about two years ago, when I stayed the night with my sister in her new house in northeastern Texas. I was lying on her couch, watching TV, when out of the corner of my eye, I saw someone standing behind me. They were wearing a gray sweatshirt. I just assumed it was my sister and said hi. I then turned back around, and there was no one there, so I went into my sister's room to see if she wanted anything, and she was in the shower. I freaked out, so I sat in her room until she got out of the shower. I didn't say anything to her about it, because I was afraid she would be scared since she was often home alone, as her husband is a truck driver. Two weeks after this incident, my sister and husband came to our house for a visit. As my brother-in-law was talking to my father, he mentioned that he would be lying in his bed sometimes, and out of the corner of his eye, he will see someone in a gray sweater, standing at the bar in the kitchen, and when he gets up to investigate further, he finds no one in the entire house. My father told him and my sister that I had seen the same thing, but it seemed to scare my brother-in-law more than it did my sister. On another visit, me and my niece fell asleep on the living room floor watching TV. My niece had been long asleep when I began to hear a creaking noise and due to the previous incident, I automatically decided that it was the rocking chair recliner rocking by itself. I was honestly scared to death. I'm 16 and I was afraid to turn around and look. After trying forever to wake my niece, she finally woke up. I explained to her the situation and told her to run as fast as she could to her mother's bedroom. I also followed, and as I was going out, I happened to look back, and I was right. The chair was rocking very fast, and by itself. A few weeks later, the man who owns my sister's home came by, and wanted to know if she would like to buy the entire house, instead of just renting. 
He then told her, the house has just too many bad memories for me. My sister also found out later in the same week that the owner's son had fallen off of the back of a tractor and into the tractor discs and died in her backyard. And there is still an old tractor disc and many very old children's bicycles behind her shop. There are two rooms in the house that every time me or my other sister, who lives in Arkansas, go in them. We get this strange feeling of being watched and or followed and the room always has a damp feeling to it. If anyone has any questions, they can email me. Hope you enjoyed this story. Hello, my name is John. I live in Lake Worth, Florida, half for all my life. I've had so many unexplained experiences since my youth, but first, I want you to know that I'm a Christian and will not deceive you or anyone to the facts I'm going to tell you. It's up to you, but to me it's real and has actually happened. But the one I want to tell you about happened in 1989. I'd gotten a divorce in 1988. I moved back to my mother's house. I'm 47 years old now. My bedroom was my mother's couch, which rests facing north to south. The front of the house faces east, and to the back of the house faces west. One night, as I lay sleeping, my brother's dog began to bark a lot, then stopped. Having woken up because of this, I thought maybe a person was passing by, as they sometimes do in the neighborhood. As I was about to go into sleep, I must have been in between sleep and awake. As my eyes wandered to the side door of my mother's house, which could be seen, for my pillow was in the north position, the door leads to the car part facing north, the north door. Through this door, came a spirit of a girl who came to my head position. All I saw was a glowing outline of a girl whose hair was short. I sensed that I knew her. I honestly thought that was so weird. She went back through the door in which she came in and the strangest thing happened. My brother's dog started barking and chasing the apparition as it was leaving out of the door. I heard that dogs can sense or even see things we can't, but I know that this was real. I had the feeling I knew this person at one point, and that was the strangest thing ever. I know I just mentioned that, but I can't get over that fact. In the end, I had no further contact with the spirit, but one thing is for sure, the spirit definitely knew me. Since I was a little girl, my sisters and I had frightening experiences with ghosts. When I was six, my family and I moved to a fairly new house only eight years old at the time, in West Texas. As far back as I can remember, we had strange things going on in that house. First off, at night, if you were to go through the hallway to get to my parents' room, you would always hear what sounded like a TV. You could hear voices and sometimes music. Most of the time, my parents' TV was off. If you left the room, and stood in the hallway again, the sounds would be gone. Secondly, when I would try to go to sleep at night, I would always have that classic someone's watching me feeling. I always blamed it on me, being a young child. The house was a very scary place to be at night. Wherever you went, someone was watching you. Friends who have spent the night rarely stayed twice. The areas of the house that scared everyone the worst were the hallways to my parents' room and my older sister's closet. The closet always had a feeling of hate radiating from it. I tried to spend a night in there with my scared sister and didn't last. I was sleeping on the floor with my head next to the closet and that just wasn't a good feeling. I went back to my room after she fell asleep. A couple years after we moved in, my younger sister had a frightening experience. Her and I shared a bedroom with our beds parallel to each other, with a nightstand in between us. We were about three feet apart. One night, I woke up to her screaming my name. I woke up and asked what was wrong. She told me that, for no reason at all, she woke up and looked over at my bed, laying at the foot of my bed. She saw a light blue, glowing figure of a woman. 
Her eyes were gone, and her mouth hung open. My sister described her as looking dead. My sister also added that she couldn't see me anywhere on the bed, so she started screaming my name and closed her eyes. When she opened them, I was awake, asking her what was wrong. She told me, and I looked down at the foot of my bed, and my huge stuffed animal that I had there every night was sparking like it had really bad static electricity. I took it off my bed and threw it in my bathroom sink and ran water over it. Being young, I thought it would help. Years later, my family and I moved to southern Louisiana and moved into a gated subdivision. One night my two sisters were mad at me and left the house to go on a walk. I followed them without them knowing. I followed them up to the front gate of the subdivision and talked to them for a minute. They quickly left in a huff, being that they were still angry with me. For what, I don't remember now. I stayed by the gate for a couple of minutes afterwards and then decided to run to the end of the main street and hide behind some bushes that faced the gate. I waited for my sisters to walk by and when they did, unaware of where I was hiding, they stopped remotely in front of the bushes. I heard my younger sister say, what is Jenny, me, doing, sitting on top of that stop sign? The stop sign is located next to the gate. After that, they walked on. I was a bit confused. It was about to chase after them. But then, through the leaves, I saw a shadow of someone running past the bushes I was behind. I could also hear the sound of footsteps. I stood up quickly to see who was there. No one was in sight. After this, I ran to my sisters and told them what I had seen. They then told me that they saw me, or what looked like me, sitting on top of the stop sign. They said I had a very angry, disfiguring grin. After we traded stories, we ran home quickly. Later. My younger sister told me that the ghost she saw on my bed and the ghost she saw on the stop sign both looked exactly like me. Possible doppelganger? I don't know. It all began around the 1st of June, this very year. This incident took place in my grandmother and grandfather's house. My grandfather had been diagnosed with cancer in the summer of 1998 and I didn't know that, that these last few months would be the last time I would ever see him alive. During that period of time, I would spent a whole lot of time with my grandparents and had felt like I actually gotten a little closer to them both, but especially my grandfather. At the end of the summer I left and went back home. Subsequently, about five months later, our family received a disturbing phone call. It was from my grandmother. Unfortunately, she informed us about the passing of our grandfather. He had passed away in the hospital. We went back to our grandmother's home, which was the very last place that our grandfather lived in before his passing, a month and a half after we had been staying there. I noticed that something just didn't feel right. The whole atmosphere had changed. I decided to take the guest room. For some reason, I always got the feeling that I was being watched in the guest room. Then, other little occurrences started to evolve. The very first was, I always felt like somebody was standing over my shoulder. I started to notice scars on my back after I would awake in the mornings, and I would feel light touches on my back. My mom and brother both complained about the door handles being rattled and opening and closing really fast. Cabinet doors would fly open, and the pots and pans would all fall out. My hair would get pulled in the night. Objects would fall from midair, such as paper, and I would hear voices, one of which said, wake up, very loudly in my ear. I would see mist and rays of light shoot past me extremely fast, and so fast in fact, I could feel a whoosh of air. I would notice some of my belongings missing, such as my CDs, jewelry, and money to name a few. Usually the belongings that I would use around the house a lot, I would feel my bed move, as if someone were to bump into it during the night, flickering lights, and last, but certainly not least, since animals can sometimes see things that humans cannot see, 
my cat would turn her head really fast and just stare at something, which I would not be able to see for a significant amount of time. A little while later, about a month after being there, I saw the unthinkable. After I had sound sleep for about seven hours or so, I woke up suddenly to a spirit at the foot of my bed, and it was my grandfather. I could not believe what I was seeing, but I will describe this to you in full detail. There was no doubt in my mind that this was actually a spirit. He was shadow-like, but his clothing was colored. He would always wave at me, and sure enough, he was waving my direction with a smile on his face. It was plain to see that he was trying to get my attention. He just wanted to see me. I was too afraid to move a muscle in fear that in spite of everything else, that he would approach me. I had never seen anything like this before in my entire life. I didn't want to tell this to anyone though. I thought that nobody would believe me or even listen. About a week later, I was in the kitchen with my mom and she told me that the guest room was where our grandpa had stayed before he died because he was too ill. And that explains the reason why that very room felt like the most eerie room in the house. I almost fainted whenever I discovered that, but I knew that a spirit can travel anywhere in the home, even outside or in back of the house. But it wasn't until a month later that I decided to come out with the news. I first confided in my mom and brother and my mother believed me because she said that before I brought up anything that I had said. Our grandmother had experienced the exact same thing, that he was at the foot of the bed watching over her and smiling. I had a phone conversation with her and I let her do all the talking fast and everything that she told me measured up with my experience. And it only happened to my grandmother and I, whom he was the closest with before he passed away. Everyone was wondering why I didn't scream or attempt to run out of the guest room as soon as I saw him, but I was too afraid. Whenever you're that close to something like that, it just takes your breath away completely. I was in my own little qualm. I felt very uncomfortable. It wasn't until I started sleeping in the living room sofa that I felt appeased. Albeit, this has not been my first experience. Ever since I was the age of five, my family and I started traveling around a lot, and we would move here and there. I've went to nine different schools total. I'm 17 now. In previous homes, I've experienced a whole lot. I lived in a haunted house for a total of three years. Not only by all the experiences that I've endured, I've been doing many researches involving the paranormal. I'm really good at picking up on things too, which I've found out. There was this one house that we went into that we were thinking about purchasing, but I felt like something was wrong. There were many rooms in the home that I could just not stop venturing off into. The main ones were the master bedroom and the study. After I left the house, I told my parents that someone from the house must have passed away. Someone that used to stay in the master bedroom. So, my mom went to go look up the history of the house, and sure enough, the owner and his wife on a trip to California got killed in a car wreck and they lived in the master bedroom and the owner spent most of his time in the study. After I was enlightened with that information, I was in disbelief. I still am, even to this day. My mom told me that it goes back to her being Jewish and Indian. She said that she can pick up on and see things too. She claims that it's an Indian thing. But I don't know, maybe it is. Anyways, God bless everyone and thank you for your time. Great website by the way, I'm a current visitor. Hello, I have a lot of experiences to share. I've been told that I'm more in tune with the spiritual world and that's why a lot of stuff happens to me. Anyways. I'll just share some that I can remember. One night, my friend Amanda was having a sleepover with three other girls, and someone brought along a Ouija to play. We were playing and having fun because it was spooky. After that, we went to sleep at about 12, and we slept on a trindle that came out of the couch. We were the only ones in the house because her mom was out. Anyways, 
I woke up and shook everyone awake because I had a bad feeling and I heard the closet door slamming all night. It was pitch black, so I told for my friend to turn on the light. She did, but it blew out. She tried it again, but it blew out once more. I thought bulbs can only blow out once. We were really scared, and we saw this black mass approaching us and closing in on us. We jumped up and all ran out of the house. We were really spooked and didn't go back inside for like two hours. One time, when I was about seven, I'd been staying at my grandparents' house for Easter vacation. I'd got up to sleep in this one room, but for some reason, I didn't like it. Well, one night, I woke up because I felt someone watching me. There's a door that leads to my room, and right next to it is a door that leads to the backyard. I sat up in bed, and right in front of the back door was this figure. It was about six foot and they appeared to have armor on. I was afraid because I knew it was bad, but I wasn't able to run away because the door to get out of the room was right next to where the spirit was. I just looked at it and it wouldn't let me go. Finally, after like two minutes it faded away and I ran out of the room and refused to sleep in there again. Another time, at my mom's house, I was home alone and I was watching TV in the living room. I heard the bath water running and so I ran to the bathroom to turn it off. I thought it must have been loose or something, so I tightened it. I closed the door and resumed watching TV again. It somehow turned on again, so I tightened it again. This continued on for another four times, and I still didn't know what it was. In my dad's house, an old lady supposedly died there. I never sleep with the light off, because I like to be able to see who and what is in my room. Anyways, I always get knocks on my door, even though it's open, and one night, I felt like someone was sitting on my chest while I was sleeping. My older sister seems to get bucked more. Someone tickles her feet, pokes the bottom of her mattress while she's sleeping, and breathes behind her when she's on the computer. In the same house, in my bedroom, I hung this picture about six inches across and three inches wide of this rapper Dr. Dre on my wall. The next day, there were scratches that I had torn through the picture, although it was still on the wall. This freaked me out because I was the only one visiting my dad that weekend, and he doesn't have any pets. I put tape over it just to cheaply laminate it and see if she could or would scratch it again. The morning after that, I was surprised to find it scratched again. It freaked me out. But I left the picture there. I don't think she likes rap very much. And I think she and they take and hide things. These may not sound scary, but when they happen to you, it is. I have many more, but I can't remember anyone right now. Thanks for listening, and I'm sorry it was so long. Hello. My name is Annie, and I live in Southern California, just outside of Los Angeles. I've been reading over the stories posted here, and they sound a lot like my own story. First of all, my mom, oldest brother, and myself all have some degree of ESP, which I think makes us sensitive to paranormal activity and might even attract spirits to us. I'm sure my house has been haunted ever since I was a baby, and here's what happened. In 1979, the year before I was born, my parents and two older brothers moved into a brand new house. My mom said the second day in that house, she knew weird things were going on. Footsteps, voices, odd sounds, things like that. All she knew was that our house and all the others in the streets were built on farmland. It seemed that strange things would happen in our house for a few days and then would stop but then a neighbor would complain of odd things in her house. It seemed like the ghost was going up and down the block to all the houses. I was born in 1980, and ever since I can remember, I've noticed strange things myself. I would hear heavy footsteps downstairs when everyone was asleep upstairs. Sometimes, I would hear chairs dragging across the floor, pots and pans banging, things like that. One day, when I was about five years old, I heard a woman's voice call my name from the second story window 
Although my mom was making dinner in the downstairs kitchen, my two older brothers would constantly ask my mom, who is that lady in the white nightgown that was walking in the hallway last night? Sometime later, a child spirit came to our house also. He liked to go running up the stairs in the middle of the night and generally cause mischief, like hiding things and moving objects around. His footsteps sounded like a toddler scuffing around in a sleeper jumpsuit. My mom confronted the ghost lady one time, and all the ghost said was that I love your baby. I only remember seeing the ghost only once, when I was 14, as a dark shadowy figure moving down the staircase. My best friend even witnessed the curtains in my room swinging back and forth rapidly when the window and door were shut tight, and I was awoken one night with my bed shaking pretty hard. In 1999, we moved to another house across town, and either the ghost followed us, or there's other spirits here anyways. The first night here, I watched a book move itself from the middle of a table and fall onto the floor. Every night in my new room, just after I shut off the lights to go to bed, my bedroom door would open. I'd hear some footsteps on the carpet. My guinea pigs would squeal, and then the entity would leave my room and shut the door again. My mom has seen her many times. She's an elderly lady named Helen that often goes out the large window in the den. Sometimes I felt cold spots in the house, usually in the hallway by the bedrooms. My younger brother, sister, and myself all feel like somebody is watching us if we stay up late at night. My sister says that sometimes, a light fixture on the ceiling in her room will swing back and forth by itself. Oh, and sometimes, my TV, stereo, and VCR will flip on and off when nobody is around. Here's another creepy event. I have a rabbit that lives in the den, and she begs for food whenever humans walk into the room. A few days ago, I was watching TV in the den, and the rabbit ran to the edge of the carpet, turned around, and stood on her hind legs, begging for food at thin air. She ran into the middle of the room and did the same thing again. Finally, she ran to the other side of the room and begged some more. And then she sat, looking at that part of her room for a while, with her ears turned forward in an alert manner. I've heard that dogs and cats are sensitive to spirits, and I guess my rabbit is too. Either way, I've had several dogs in my house that I've watched for neighbors and family for a few days at a time, and each one has done that, stare at the empty corner and bark thing. Since my schedule is usually different than everyone else's here, I often get home very late at night when everyone else is asleep. There is always a light on in front of the house, and when I come home, I always see a dark outline or figure of Helen standing in the window as if our friendly spirit is waiting up for me. So when I walk in the door to say, I'm home, thanks for waiting for me, I get the feeling around me that all is well. Sometimes her spirit plays pranks on us, such as hiding my makeup, and I'll find my lipstick a week later perhaps under the sink or in my mom's china hutch. A few times she comes up behind me and tugs on my ponytail, and when I turn around, nobody is there. I often feel someone touching my hair too. We also get other spirits passing through, such as the male ghost dressed like a lumberjack that my mom only saw once in the backyard, or another entity with heavy footsteps that whistles in the kitchen once in a while. Right now, I don't mind living with a friendly spirit or two. I think it's kind of nice to know that somebody is waiting for me every night. Helen has never caused us any problems, besides the occasional, uneasy being watch feeling, a few pranks, a flowery perfume scent that's in the house some days, and the usual disembodied voice calling from another room. I've never felt threatened or sensed evil, so she is welcome to stay. If anyone else has a friendly spirit around, feel free to email me. I've had a few ghostly experiences in my life so far. Most are probably my overactive imagination. The incident I experienced in Columbus, Ohio was as real as it can get. I went to college at Columbus College of Art and Design in Columbus, Ohio. There were plenty of stories going around that the freshman dorms were haunted. CCAD is known as being very fast-paced. Highly stressed school 
and that many of the ghosts are past students who kill themselves because their already sensitive dispositions couldn't handle the pressure. I never really gave any credence to these stories until I experienced something that I still can't explain today. I lived on the third floor of the dorms and shared my room with three other girls. Two girls slept on one side of the room and I shared my room with Rose on the other side. A kitchenette and dining area with the main door leading to the hall separated the two. One night, I was sleeping and my roommate Rose left to go visit her boyfriend in his room. It's co-ed dorms. I slept without incident until sometime around 9.30. I awoke to the sound of someone entering our room through the main door, coming into the bedroom and rifling through papers and things by Rose's side of the room. Thinking that Rose had come back to get something, I said, hi Rose, you forget something? But got no answer. The moving of papers continued and I called out another greeting to Rose and still got no response. Finally, I turned my head to look at her and ask her what her problem was. I thought she wasn't answering me on purpose, but no one was there. Plus, the shifting of paper stopped and everything fell off of Rose's desk and onto the floor. I got up and ran out into the commons area to ask if anyone had seen someone come in or out of the room. No one had. Then I went down to Rose's boyfriend's room and asked Rose if she had come upstairs. She swore to me that she had been in her man's room ever since she had left upstairs. I really can't remember which room it was, but if you're on the third floor facing the elevator, the room is the second room on your right hand side. Once you're in the room, it's the bedroom to your left. Another quick incident. Not long after that, I was taking a nap by myself in the room. Just as I was falling asleep, someone pushed me out of bed. Most people that I told this about just said I fell out of bed. However, I swear that I felt someone push me on my back and I hit the floor a decent distance away from the side of my bed. Since then, it's been five years since I lived in those dorms and I haven't had any paranormal instances since. Thanks. This happened while I was about 10 years old or so, but to this day, I can never forget it. It was summertime, and summers in India are so hot. My cousin had to come spend the holiday with me. I was wearing a short top with a pair of shorts, and I was still feeling incredibly warm. Since my bedroom was not big enough for all of my cousins, nine of us, we spread mattresses in the living room next to the kitchen and slept there. I was not able to sleep at all. My parents have also decided to call it a night and were in their room. There was absolute silence in the house. Suddenly, almost out of nowhere, on that hot night, an ice cold jet of air rushed past me, making me throw my blankets on, but within seconds, it was gone. I forgot about it and went back to trying to go to sleep, but I was disturbed by the sounds from the kitchen. They were the most odd sounds to hear at night. The clatter of vessels or pouring of water or juice. It sounded almost as if someone was cooking a meal right in our kitchen. It then occurred to me that if a meal was being cooked, who was cooking it? I could not understand this, and since I was afraid to go in the kitchen, I called out to my mother. I heard the sounds of vessels being dropped and the cold jet of air pass by once again. Within seconds, it was gone. I could not sleep that night for many nights afterwards even though I've never heard anything after that night. To this day, I've not told anyone about it and have never clearly explained it to myself. I've always been interested in the supernatural and am convinced that ghosts do exist. Unfortunately, I've never seen nor felt one. I am, however, overly curious and try on occasion to find one. I have a friend that often accompanies me, but sometimes she gets too afraid to press on. She can feel their presence and bows out. I think she can feel them, and if she perceives them as evil, well, she just quits. She has a gift that I can only wish I had. I, on the other hand, don't possess that gift, 
and as a result, am fearless. I suppose I ought to get on with my stories. Again, I've never seen a ghost, but listen to this. My curiosity in the supernatural goes years back. When I was younger, I attended a university in southern Illinois. I had a friend named Tanya, whose parents lived in a supposedly haunted house. They claimed that a ghost lived in the attic of their home. I don't remember the spirit's name at this time, but I do remember that they claimed that she liked to play with the hangers in the attic and that they could hear her slamming doors and climbing to the stairs to the attic at night. There were other farther fetched claims as well, but they said that whenever something strange happened, they would always have the association of the smell of Lilyx. It was apparently the popular perfume of the time when this girl passed. No explanation was given as to the events of her passing. Anyway, I was invited to sleep in the attic of their home one night. I was apprehensive at first to be able to relax enough to sleep, but in time, I started to drift away. Just as sleep began to overtake me, I heard a very loud and unsettling rustling in front of my face. I instantaneously turned on a light right next to me. Nothing was there. The memory of that sound made it very difficult for me to concentrate on sleeping again, but after what seemed to be about two hours, I started to succumb to sleep again. As I drifted again, again came that sound, louder this time. I stayed calm for a few minutes to be sure this was actually happening. I stayed still, but pulled my eyes open to see if anything was there. There was no light. My eyes were wide open, I was fully awake, and the noise persisted. Again, I turned on the light, and there was nothing there. Once the light came on, the noise ceased instantly. This time, I decided to feign asleep. I turned out the light, closed my eyes, and regulated my breathing. I did everything like sleeping, without actually sleeping. Eventually. I even got my heart to stop pounding. Hell, I was scared, but managed to seem oblivious. Once again, it started, and in an instant, I turned on the light yet again. There, in front of my eyes, was a mass, a ball of white moths, about the size of a softball. As soon as the light hit them, they flew straight into the shadows of the room. Not like moths fly, they flew straight course into the various shadows and disappeared. They disappeared into the shadows, not holes or cracks. They weren't real. No moth could do what I'm trying to describe here. Once they disappeared, my fear was gone and has been ever since. I'm no longer afraid of ghosts. I believe that if a spirit chooses to stick around, it is because it or they have something to tell you. I'm convinced that these moths were presented to me by Lily at Girl, and I believe that she showed them to me only because she wanted to be acknowledged, not feared. I think that if I were to return to this house, she'd show me the moths again. This time, I'd be much more appreciative and a lot less afraid. I'd see it as a welcome to an old friend than as a threat to a newcomer. I think she just needs someone to talk to. She must have been terribly lonely. Moth story number two. About a year after that incident, I was still in college. I was on the 16th story of my dorm, cramming for finals. I happened to look out onto the ledge, outside the window, where sat a beautiful green wood moth. I knew it meant something, but at the time, not what. My roommate walked into the study area and informed me that I had a call from my mother. I went into my room and answered the phone by saying, Is Gran dead? My mom was speechless for a time. Then she said, How did you know? I... I didn't answer. You see, my Gran was 103 when she died. For years, she didn't know my name. She always just called me. Janine's son. Well, 
on the day that her husband died at 98 years old. I took her for a long walk around her house. She hadn't been out in years. During that brief walk, I had found a feather and a greedwood moth's wing. I saved them as a token of that day. After that walk, she never called me Janine's son anymore. She called me that nice boy who took me for a walk about twice. Then, she just called me that nice boy. When I heard of her passing that day, I made arrangements to get to her funeral. I did, and upon viewing her casket, I placed the feather and the wing on her body. I feel that she's still around and still views me as the nice boy. Once again, I must reiterate that I've never seen a ghost. I promise you though, that they are real and I don't need to see to believe. Just as Grandma Chip, she's still there. Look for a moth. When you do, it'll be a Greenwood moth. This is what I like to call motion pictures on the wall. The first time it happened was when I was about six years old. I had woken up in the middle of the night and crept into bed with my parents. I still couldn't sleep and when I rolled over towards the wall, it appeared that someone was showing a movie on it. Hard to explain, but it was a dim, full color, silent motion picture like a living painting of a man dressed like Henry VIII talking to a woman being helped into a wide hoop frame that went under her dress. That was it. Then it ended. Totally harmless but still. How the heck did it get there? I told my mom about it in the morning. I had tried to wake her up and dad, but they were sound asleep. She said I was just hallucinating because I was so tired who was still amazed at my description of the hoop skirt and undergarment as I have never seen one before. Okay, fast forward three more years. My brother and I were staying with our folks at our grandparents' house. We kids begged to sleep in the dining room under the huge table so we could pretend it was a fort. Again, in the middle of the night, I awoke to find a huge silent motion picture on the wall. This time, I was able to wake my brother up and together we watched it. He stood up and looked out the window to see if someone was doing it from the outside. No, nothing, no source of light or anything. In fact, the shadow of his head didn't even show on the wall. It completely disappeared for a second. But then, I heard a noise coming from the hallway in the house, a really frightening disturbing wailing. It was the scariest sound that I have ever heard in my life, like someone being butchered to death. Then, into the dining room came a black shadow. We only saw this shadow for about 40 seconds before it ultimately dissipated. I swear to God, the shadow looked as if it was wearing a top hat, and it was running around before ultimately dissipating, like I said. I don't know how this happened, but even my friend saw this at the time, and we were in the dining room like I said, but there's nothing to explain this away. Maybe it was connected to the silent motion picture I saw on the wall. In fact, I can almost guarantee the motion picture on the wall was actually a family of ghosts. Actually, it was a family of ghosts that were shadow people. That's what I truly believe. Of course, I'm guessing that this family of shadow people must have been a part of a huge tragedy because it's apparent that something caused the scream to happen. Whatever the case it was, it didn't matter now. It turned into something harmless and then became ruthlessly scary. I hope I never find out what exactly happened in the house. I'm not willing to face it. My second daughter was born on October 28, 1986. She died of a sudden infant death syndrome six weeks later. She often lets us know she is still around 
by playing pranks and sometimes allows other family members to see her. When the movie Pocahontas came out, my oldest daughter loved it. We bought her a Pocahontas talking bank. If you haven't seen the type of bank I mean, it is one of Pocahontas and Grandmother Willow. If you drop a coin in it, Grandmother Willow starts talking. It has a button you can push for the same result. For about three months, this bank would start talking when no one was in the room with it. We kept the bank on a shelf in the bathroom above the sink. One morning, I was standing in front of the mirror shaving. The bank was two feet in front of me. But when the bank started talking, well, I don't often cut myself shaving, but this time, another time my wife had washed her favorite shirt, it was loose fitting and lightweight, perfect for working in her garden. She washed it, and I know I took it from the washer and put it in the dryer. When we took the load of clothes out of the dryer, the shirt was nowhere to be found. Three months later, we found it in a small cabinet in our bedroom. We only use the cabinet for storing small things and rarely open it. I can't remember what I was looking for, but I opened the cabinet and there was the shirt neatly folded. There was another time when my wife bought me some material to make me a couple of shirts. She brought it home and folded it and put it away in her sewing trunk to work on later. A week later she opened her sewing trunk to begin the work and the material was gone. Six months later we had forgotten about the material and my wife was going to sew another project. She opened her trunk and there was the material, replaced once again by my second daughter. My youngest daughter, now 11 years old, often sees her sister either in the house or out in the yard. She sometimes talks to her and I mean she carries on a conversation. My oldest daughter has also seen her. I've seen her once. She was standing by the living room in the entrance of the hallway. I was coming out of the kitchen and saw her in my peripheral vision. When I looked up, she vanished. I can say that those on the other side do not stay children forever. My second daughter, who we lost when she was a baby, now appears to us as a lovely 16 year old. Then again, Perhaps a spirit can appear in any form. Perhaps my daughter appears the age she would, so we can recognize her. It may seem strange to some people that we live with a spirit as normal part of the family, but that's exactly what she is, and we love her the same as our two children who are here in the flesh. Being of Cherokee and Iraqi descent, we do not fear spirits, but try to understand them. They are not here to harm only to guide. My great grandfather was a self-proclaimed ghost hunter. I've heard many stories growing up from my grandfather of his exploits in the field. Now, he wasn't the whole mystical crystals and holy water type. His theory on ghosts was once shared by many. They are here for something, either a lost item from their past or a deed left undone. The way he went about the hunt was fairly simple-minded. He would follow tales of haunted houses, graveyards, bridges, whatever, and research them as well as he could, and try to figure out what the ghost wanted, and give it to them. At the time in history when he was doing this, many people were offering rewards for someone to step in a haunted house for a night, so he would move in and spend however much time it took. Not all of the stories my grandfather told were successes, but one I remember vividly was, I will tell it to you now, and then I will relate my own experience. Back in the 1800s, my great grandfather was a ghost hunter. He mainly did it for the reward money offered to sleep in haunted houses at first, but a growing need to help soon took over. One such place was a farmhouse in the Oklahoma Prairie, where a woman in white, I know, stereotypical ghost story, would be seen walking down the staircase and out onto the front porch. It was one of those old wraparound types, 
that goes all the way around the house. Once on the front porch, she would pace the length of the front of the house a few times and then disappear. Other times a woman would be crying, but you could never pin down the sound. My great grandfather moved into this house and lived there for about two months while trying to figure out what the ghost wanted. Many times he would be sleeping in the entryway of the house at the foot of the stairs trying to catch a glimpse of the lady. After about three weeks of research, by talking to all the people that live nearby, we are talking about 1800s Oklahoma nearby, and I guess that would be within a 10 mile radius. He found an older couple who had known the original builders of the house and every family that lived there since. They began relating the story of the house to him as best they could. It seems that the first lady to live in the house had only two children a boy and a girl, and when the girl was about 16, she fell in love with one of the local farmer's sons. After a few months the marriage was arranged, and events were set into motion. They got married in the spring in the front room of the house. They built their own small house on some of the land, and lived there for a few years, until the girl's mother got ill. Then they moved in to stay, and take care of her, and the family. The brother had recently joined the army and was away. After a few months, the mother passed away and the girl and her husband also became ill. The father was left to take care of them and soon became ill as well. They all died after about a year of fighting the illness and trying to keep the house and land cared for. After that, the boy now serving in the army came back to collect any belongings and dispense with the house. He sold the house to the local bank and left to live in Texas. About a year later, a young couple moved into the house and lived quite happily for about three years until they started seeing the lady walking down the stairs and along the porch. They soon moved away and let the loan default back to the bank. A few other families had lived in the house, but all moved out soon after and the bank was stuck with his house. Finally, the owner of the bank decided to offer a ward for anyone to sleep in the house to prove it wasn't haunted. Well, empowered with this knowledge, my great-grandfather went back to the house and set watch for the ghost. After seeing her a few times, he noticed she seemed to be looking for something on the porch. So he got some digging equipment and began to dig under the porch. After about two weeks of digging, he found a small gold ring. Thinking that had to be what the ghost wanted, he placed it on the railing of the porch and waited that night to see what happened. Nothing happened for about another week. Then he was sitting on the porch, enjoying the good weather, when he caught sight of her walking down the stairs. Not daring to move, he watched as she walked the length of the porch until she came even with the ring. She turned and seemed to look at the ring for a long time, then just vanished. He spent another week in the house, and never heard so much as a creak, and never saw the woman again. The ring he put under the first step of the stairway, and as far as anyone knows, is still there. That is how my grandfather related that story to me, not in the scary ghost story boogity boo way, just a plain and simple fact, a piece of family history. Now my story. I was about 18 and living with a friend of mine and his mother. We all lived in a small house. Some would call it a shotgun shack because you could shoot a shotgun through the front door and not hit anything but the back door. It was all one room only separated by a small wall that ran about three feet from each outer wall. You could walk straight from the living room to the kitchen going through the bedroom in a straight line. One night, I was sleeping on the floor in the living room when I was awakened in the middle of the night. I don't know if it was a sound that woke me or just a bad feeling, but when I woke up, I happened to be turned so that I looked straight into the bedroom. I saw what looked like sheer curtains lit by moonlight blowing outside beside the bed that my friend's mother was sleeping in. I had an eerie feeling 
but being half asleep, didn't think anything of it, and promptly fell back asleep. When I woke up in the morning, I remember what had happened, and looked at the wall, expecting to see an open window. The problem was, there was no window on that wall, not anywhere in the house. All the windows are on the opposite wall, so it couldn't have been a curtain. Later that day, I asked my friend's mom about it, and she told me that it was her father, that he came to help her when she had a bad night. She had terrible arthritis. She said that she never saw him, but could feel his presence. I had many other strange experiences in the house. Rocking chairs that didn't need anyone sitting in them to rock, things disappearing, and reappearing in strange places when no one was home. Say the least, I was glad when I got an opportunity to move out. About two years ago, my boyfriend Luke and I were at our friend's house. He lived about a half an hour away from us in a small beachside suburb called Two Rocks. To get there from our house, we have to travel down a road called Winero Road. It's a very long winding road and has no street lights. Lining the side of the road are white gum trees. These stretch on for a few kilometers. A lot of people have crashed their cars on this road. Most end up as fatal crashes. There are quite a few crosses, especially in the white gum area. Anyway, it was about one in the morning when we decided to head back home as we were both really tired after a long day. We turned, as usual, onto a narrow road and were chatting to each other about what to do the next day when we reached a high-end death toll area. Luke always slowed down near here because there's so many windy sharp turns that you have to be careful. As we were driving, I looked out of the window and to my absolute astonishment, there was an old man walking down the road with a bag in his hand. I pointed this out to Luke, but he just thought it was some weirdo who had one too many to drink. About a minute later, Luke slammed on his brakes and we skidded around, doing a 180 degree turn. We had both just seen the same man carrying the bag run out into the road waving his arms. We sat dead silent watching where he had come from, but nothing was there, just the trees and the butte men. Not far away from where we had stopped, there was a white cross where an old man had flipped his four-wheel drive and died instantly. On another occasion near the same spot, I saw a young girl, about 17, wearing blue jeans and standing next to a white gum tree. Luke didn't see her, but I can remember that she looked sad, almost lost. There have been a lot of claims from a lot of different people about the white gums on Winero Road, mainly about figures darting out trying to make their vehicles come off the road, or of an old man walking along carrying a bag. We don't travel down that road anymore. They've built up a new road that's more convenient for us. A few other things have happened to me in the past 18 months. I just bought a new kitten not too long ago, and she is always very alert when she is in my bedroom. Usually, she will cuddle up and purr, or go to sleep, but in my bedroom, she can't settle down. A few weeks after we got her, Luke was working a night shift, and I was home alone in bed because I'm not fond of being on my own in a dark house. I decided that my kitten would stay with me in my room until Luke got home. At about 11 p.m., I just finished watching a movie on the TV and grabbed the kitten and headed to bed to read a book. I was a few pages in when Lottie, my kitten, started trying to hide underneath my arm. At first, I thought she was just getting comfortable. But that's when I noticed she was hiding. She then started to walk up onto me, looking up at the ceiling. Her pupils were huge, and her ears were back, and her tail was wagging angrily. 
I tried to settle her, but she started to follow something along the roof with her eyes. I looked up, but couldn't see anything, so went back to reading, although I was very uneasy. Lottie kept following this invisible thing for about a half an hour. Then she eventually went to sleep under my blanket. From then on, when I'm alone in my room, I always feel uneasy, like I'm being watched. Okay, this isn't the first supernatural type thing that I think I may have experienced, but it is the only one that I know for sure was real. My best friend moved here to Kentucky when I was in kindergarten from Chicago and moved next door to me when I was about 10. After that, me and her were always together and always spending the night with each other, loved her parents to death. That particular night, she had spent the night with me and it happened to be her other best friend's B-Day the next day. Well, maybe about two o'clock that day, we went over to her house to ask her dad if we could walk down there, as I was just down the road. Her mom was at work, by the way. I waited outside when the door slammed open and she was screaming, there's something wrong with my dad. I went in and he just looked like he was sleeping. He had his arms crossed and everything. I'm glad he went peacefully. He was pale, and I touched his arm to wake him up, and he was cold. At that point, I knew he was gone. We ran to my paps, and he came over and called an ambulance. The rest is all just heartache and pain, like that comes with any death. I felt like it was important to tell you all that because it really is relevant to the rest of the story, or at least, in my opinion, it has some correlation. Okay, now on to the creepiest moments. I was spending the night with that same friend, and I asked where the mouthwash was, and this was probably about three or so months later. She said her dad had some in his dresser, so I went into his room, I stood there as she looked, and suddenly, we heard this rhythmic knocking all down the side of her house. It was really fast and complicated. We freaked out and ran to her room. I think he didn't want her going through his stuff. Well, that's all that happened for a very long time. The last experience, her dog is chained up in their fenced-in yard and it was in heat, and my male dog got in her yard and no one was home, so I rushed over there. They really didn't need any more puppies, and opened her gate to get my dog that somehow got in there. And I heard his voice again, very meanly shout, hey, so I freaked out and ran again. The main thing I'm wondering about is that knocking. It's really odd. I think about it sometimes, but I mean it shouldn't bother me anymore, but it does. If you have any ideas as to what this is, please speak up. I live in a small residential neighborhood in western Kentucky. My family has resided in our home for 37 years. We're the first home to ever be built on this property as the same with several other homes in the area. Since day one upon moving into the house, we have been plagued with numerous experiences that quite frankly can't be explained. They are loud banging noises that echo from between the halls, strange odors ranging from the distinct smell of death to a light scent of lilies and roses. Strange shapes of a blackish gray smoke clinging to the baseboards. Voices that echo through the entire house, ranging from the intensity of a deafening shriek to the softest of whispers. Shadow people walk the house day and night. Strange bluish green bars of light extend from room to room. 
balls of light that chase each other around the ceiling. Full body apparitions, plain as you and I. Things disappearing, sometimes returning in different parts of the home, sometimes never reappearing. Cold breaths in your ear, an unmistakable touch that chills you to the bone. Several homes in our neighborhood have also stated similar events. Several of the people that have admitted strange occurrences in their homes have been very religious, God-fearing people, with no reason to lie about their situations. Something is happening here. Upon researching our area, it was discovered that back in the early 1700s, this area was an old Indian burial ground. In the mid-1800s, it was decided to put in a real cemetery. The old graves were destroyed, and the remains were disposed of. A new cemetery was started in its place. However, in the 1960s, it was decided to move the cemetery once again due to flooding issues, and a new subdivision was to be put in its place. Being a contractor for our city, my father was offered a reasonable deal on one of the first homes to be put on the land an offer too good to turn down. Our house was finished on June 14th, 1972. We moved in on June 21st, 1972. It wasn't until recently that my father told his children that he worked for the crew who removed the graveyard. Some of the graves are so damaged by water erosion that they could not be moved, so they were left, and the homes were built on top of them. Even as recently as 10 years ago, less than 5 miles from my home, a family was putting in a swimming pool. While excavating the backyard, several Indian bones were unearthed. The family sold a home and moved. Mysteriously, when several homeowners started asking for copies of our area's records, the records suddenly vanished without a trace. Here are two instances in which I experienced ghostly activity. They're not very long stories, but I think they're very interesting. So here goes. I really don't know if you keep up with your website, but if you do, back in 2004, a couple of buddies and I went to Thompson Creek Trail. We started down the trail. My friend and I were at the front of the group. We had flashlights and we were flashing them at all the really dark areas of the trail. We had passed an old looking house to our right at the beginning of the trail. Shortly after, there was a curve in the trail, and in the bend of the curve, there was a tree. It was really dark at the trunk of the tree, so I was kind of scared, and I shined my light on it. The image that had projected from my flashlight was of a very tall man and was standing very close to the tree and a shadow was cast onto the tree trunk. It is a fact that no one was in front of me. My friend had also seen the huge shadow of a man. I've been to a lot of places on your website and this was the only one where I'd actually seen something and it scared the living crap out of me. On to my next paranormal experience. For me, I've always believed in the paranormal, though I've never had any experiences of my own until very recently, including the one I just told you about. I met a new friend at school, and he told me his house had spirits in it. He and his family had all something happen to them, i.e. seeing figures, hearing voices, unusual odors, and poltergeists. They even hired a priest to bless the house, and also a psychic. I never thought it would have something happen to me, but me and my mates were watching a movie in his room, and suddenly out of the corner of my eye, I swore to God that I saw a shadowy figure in his mirror, and when I turned my head, it kind of stepped out of view. I thought this was weird, because usually I can tell my eyes were playing tricks on me, but this time, 
It just seemed different. Another experience I had was when I was on the computer alone and my friend was downstairs. While I was on the computer, I thought I was hearing many voices, like the background noises you hear in a restaurant. I could hear very faintly. Now because of these experiences, I don't like being alone in this house. What I want to do next is to actually try to do ghost hunting in this house. So there you have it, my two experiences. I hope you thought they were interesting because they scared and terrified me. I'd just moved back from Long Beach, California, from Vancouver, Washington. A longtime friend named Alan offered me one of his bedrooms in which I could stay until I got back on my feet. That night, I felt something sitting on my chest. I remember being too afraid to open my eyes. Whatever it was, it did not move. Then, I opened them and witnessed a flow of whitest looking vapor protruding out of my chest. It went up above the bed towards the ceiling in shape of stretched out rings. It looked similar to smoke from a cigarette. It just hovered over the bed in circles and then began to stretch and exit towards the kitchen, which was next door. I did not dare tell Alan about this experience because he is such a skeptic. I can predict his very words. Ernie, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. You must have dreamed it. He says there's no such thing as spirits or even a god. The very next morning I told Jim, one of the tenants, what I experienced. I just had to get it out of my system. Will someone please hear me out? He had told me that a man named Ron had been staying in that very room, and that when he discovered that he had some type of incurable hepatitis, he hung himself from the refrigerator door in the kitchen. That really didn't make any sense to me, but he explained that Ron had somehow did this by tying his belt around his neck and then somehow sliding on the floor. According to Jim, Ron received a letter from UCLA about a month later, stating that he was to come to UCLA immediately because they now had a treatment for his type of hepatitis. If he'd only waited one more month, Jim told me that he believed Ron had tried to inherit my body when I was sleeping, as in, tried to possess me. This incident, however, never happened again. I do recall one time waking up at 1am in that house and hearing a repetitious sound coming from the garage. I looked out the window because the garage had a window, but it was dark. The next day Al was in the garage and I asked him what he was doing in the garage at 1am. He said, I wasn't in here. Why do you ask? I told him what I had heard, a repetitious sound from the night before. Then, something made me focus on a small machine that sat on a shelf. I asked Al what it was. He told me that his previous tenant named Ron used to do laboratory work and that the machine was for polishing rocks. There was still rocks in it. It had a handle that turned. When I turned it, I heard the same sound that I had heard in the morning. I told Al, but he said he must have been mistaken. No one was in the garage last night. It was locked at night, and only I have a key. I said no more. After my brother had died in his home, my family gave it to me to live in. It was an older mobile home. One day, while on my PC, which faced the same wall that my door was on, in fact, my desk was next to the door. My desk is huge, and a bigger desktop than most kitchen tables are. So sitting at my desk, I could see part of the hallway while reading, typing, or whatever on my PC. One day, I just happened to look up at the door, and there came a figure of a man. 
I could only see his shadow on the emergency door and wall outside my bedroom. He was either bald or had some very short hair. I just sat there and stared for what seemed like several minutes, waiting for him to either come into my room or say something. It finally turned and seemed to go into the bathroom, which was on the other side of the wall, or went in the wall towards the kitchen and living room area. They are both open, with no wall dividing them. I was there alone, except for my dog Chewy, who is very large, over 160 pounds. I got up to check it out, because from what I saw as a shadow, it didn't look like anyone I knew. I walked by the bathroom peering in, and he wasn't there, so I kept going. When I got into the kitchen, I saw Chewy on the couch, looking out the window at the kids who had just gotten off of the school bus and were walking home. He would have barked, even if he had known whoever the shadow was. He never made a sound. There was no one there, not even in my son's bedroom. I checked everywhere. If he had gone outside, I would have heard the door open and close. The only time my brother ever had short hair was when he was in the Marines. The only other person who had no hair or short hair was my father before he had died. The chemo and radiation treatments for cancer had done that, and both were dead for about four years, both dying about four months apart. So far. This has been my only encounter with a shadow person or ghost. I never really knew they could or would show up like this. This past year, my daughter who works in a nursing home was telling me they have seen shadow people there too. They seem to be only showing up in this one hall section. I believe she said it was where the patients who weren't doing so well stayed. One patient even complained about being there in that hall. He said they kept bothering him and wouldn't leave him alone. When they moved him to another hall, he quit complaining. He did eventually die several months later. I did see this happen on Ghost Hunters too, where they saw a man's shadow like a figure on a locker. They've mentioned shadow people a few times on there too. Now, I suppose you're wondering if I were scared, for some odd reason. I wasn't at all. I just wish I knew who it was. I know dogs have a sixth sense too, and I still wonder why my dog didn't seem to know he was there. Chewie had never met my brother or my father. Even if he knew them, he would have barked at being excited. Someone came to visit. When I was young, my grandmother owned a very old rustic country summer home in a small village about three hours away from the large city where I grew up. There was nothing particularly threatening about the outside of the house. To a casual onlooker, it just looked like an old quaint house, much like the majority of the houses in the village. During summer break from school, my parents would send me there since my grandmother always took her vacations there, far away from the busy life in the big city where we all lived. Though I miss my parents a lot and didn't get along well with my grandmother, I still, for the most part, enjoyed the large garden with its old apple trees, a berry orchard, and a large vegetable garden. The inside of the house had a very different feel to it. First of all, it was definitely very old and somewhat musty because it went unused for a large portion of the year. In one of the bedrooms where the wallpapers was peeling, you could see several layers of different color wallpaper, which makes me think that the house was owned by many people before my grandmother, though she had for many, many years. Though I had a sink, it did not have a toilet or a shower. Instead, there was an outhouse outside and an outside shower for summer use. There was one room in the house, which was added sometime after the original house was built. It was a slightly newer, open space with many windows, 
painted in a pleasant pastel color. It was located at the very back of the house. For some reason, my grandmother insisted that this particular room is where I would stay. If you were to simply look at it, you would find absolutely nothing threatening about this room. However, for some reason, I was terrified of staying there. My parents always remarked that unlike the other children, I was scared of nothing. I always slept with the lights off, never had any incidents where I was scared to be alone, and never had any childlike fears such as a monster in the closet, etc. So, my parents found it highly unusual that being 8 or 9 years old, I was absolutely terrified of this room. I would beg my grandmother to let me sleep in the bedroom in the main part of the house, but she always told me that I was being silly and there was absolutely nothing wrong with the room. Yet at night, with the lights off, I couldn't help but hear unusual creaking sounds, knockings, and what sounded like footsteps after my grandmother had gone to bed. Having never been scared of anything, I would pull the blanket almost all the way over myself, except for my eyes, out of which I could see faint black shadows moving along the corners of the room. I tried so hard to convince myself that I was just imagining things, but the extreme uneasy feeling never let up. I felt like something in the room could physically hurt me if it chose to. I told my parents and kept asking my grandmother about the room. But my questions were sidestepped, and I was always told that I'm just imagining things. And maybe it's because the room is sort of isolated from the rest of the house, and that makes me nervous. And of course, I got the usual explanation of it's just the house settling, etc. Since the house had no hot water, they couldn't blame the water heater. Things would go on like this. Every summer I was there. On a few occasions when I was allowed to sleep in the bedroom in the main part of the house, I felt much more at ease and was able to fall asleep much easier. In the other room, the uneasy feeling would keep me awake for hours, which was highly unusual for me since I never had trouble sleeping anywhere else. Yet, though significantly weaker, the effects of that negative energy permeated the entire house. To wash up before bed, we would heat water in the kitchen and put it in a basin. On numerous occasions, when I was washing my face or giving myself a sponge bath, since the only shower was outside, I had very strong feelings of being watched to the point where I would do what I needed to do as fast as possible and would turn to look behind me expecting someone to be there. One particular occasion I remember very clearly. It was broad daylight and my grandmother went to the local market to buy food while leaving me at the house by myself. I was about to go outside to the garden when I heard a loud female voice clearly calling my name from the living room. Utterly confused since I was supposed to be the only one in the house. I went to investigate. My grandmother was still out, and I confirmed that I was alone. Then I heard the same voice again, calling out to me urgently from another room. I was really freaked out, and almost ran out of the house, but made myself go and see if anyone was there. I saw no one. When my grandmother got back from the market, I told her what happened and she told me many people imagine someone calling their name when they are home by themselves. Even then, I thought it was an odd explanation since I never had an occurrence like that before. And actually, I haven't had an occurrence like that in the nearly 20 years since then. Sadly, since I was still a child, I never found out the history of house before my grandmother finally sold it after she was too old to maintain it. I don't envy whoever owns it now though. Okay, one of my first experiences with ghosts 
was when I was about five or six years old. I was in Texas at my grandmother's house with my brother and cousin. We were sleeping in the living room, and I heard kids playing in the background. Then I heard a man call my name. I thought everyone else was up, and my grandma was waking me up. I stood up and opened my eyes, and there was no one there. It was also silent. I thought it was a dream, but then I heard kids again, and a man's voice started to call my name again. I now knew that this wasn't a dream. I ran to my grandparents' room and told them there was a man calling my name and that there were kids playing. My grandma said I was having a nightmare and to go back to sleep. I got into bed with them and went to sleep. About an hour later, my cousin came into the room saying that a man wouldn't stop calling his name. My grandma thought it was maybe a coincidence and told us to go to sleep. Nothing ever happened to my brother. A few weeks later, we got a call from them telling us that they were moving. My grandpa had gotten up about 1 a.m. to let the dog outside. And when he turned around, all of the dog's squeaky toys started squeaking. And there was a woman standing right in front of him. And it wasn't my grandma. They found a house and started moving as quickly as possible. We came down to help them. We lived in Oklahoma at the time, and my grandma told us that there was a family that lived in the house, and the dad and kids all died in the house fire. We never found out who the woman was though. Thank you for letting me submit my story to you. This is one of the scariest, but I have lots of them. For as long as I can remember, I've been able to feel and see spirits that no one else could. It took me many years to discover what this ability was, and that I wasn't alone. I don't remember my very first ghostly experience very well, but my mother does. She told me the story many times. I was three years old, and we were visiting my grandmother at her home in East Boston. I walked into the back bedroom my grandmother's room, and then back into the dining room and asked my grandmother about the man in our room. She asked me to describe him, so I did. She turned to my mother and quietly said, she has a gift. She handed me a photo of her and my deceased grandfather and asked me if that was the man. I said yes, but he was skinnier now. My grandfather died of a brain aneurysm, a complication from a bout of meningitis in 1952, 34 years before my birth year. One year later, I was four, we moved into a new home, directly behind the house was the cemetery. We lived in the house for the next 14 years. There was a very heavy, eerie feeling that surrounded the stairs. Something watched you from the base of the stairs while you were in the living room, or at the top of the stairs. Every so often, there was footsteps and the sounds of someone falling down them. When he went to investigate, nothing was there. The basement was the worst place. It felt like something like a voice grip was squeezing your chest. I could never go down there. I was apparently the only one that felt it. My sister told me after she moved into her room down there that she never quite felt alone and she get this odd headache, then smell something really awful. My dad made sure everything was perfectly safe before she moved everything down. There was no explainable reason for her experiences. I've had experiences outside the house as well, in cemeteries, in other people's homes. Recently. I began to investigate haunted places in New England with my friends. Since moving into my current residence in 2005 though, I haven't had any experiences at my home. We lived in a small farmhouse with a huge backyard, and beyond the fence, 
an even larger pasture. I was 11 years old when we lived there, and we, the kids, would always explore the backyard, especially at night, and play hide and seek all of the time. One night, in this big backyard, I was alone and looking out at the pasture, when suddenly, I felt as though I was being watched, and I turned my head to look at the house, when I saw a transparent man looking at me, and then he disappeared a few seconds later. My uncle had died when I was four, so I assumed it was him watching over me, and ventured into the house, and went to sleep. A few minutes went by with no strange happenings, when I went over to a friend's house, and spent the night with her. We had a little bit of a slumber party, and ended up sleeping in the living room. When she woke me up at about 3 a.m. in the morning, apparently scared out of her mind, and told me she had woken up to go to the bathroom that made her hair stand on end, then saw a shadowy tall figure of a man with a press suit on, no hands or feet, and some kind of burlap bag over his head with a rope tied twice around his neck. So naturally, I thought she was kidding around, trying to scare me. So I got up and ventured into the direction she was pointing. When I felt this strange sensation, and boom, like magic, he was there. I ran back and told her that I had too seen it. And she ran into her parents' room and got them out of bed. And naturally, they told us there were no such things as ghosts and told us to go back to sleep. We lay in the living room a long time, just watching this thing pace back and forth, and waiting for dawn so we could finally get some sleep. And about five in the morning, the visitor disappeared, and we soon fell asleep. Never in a million years, if someone would have told me this would be the beginning of a 19-year-old haunting, would I have believed them. But that is exactly what happened. Not just to me, but to my friend also. It seemed that this ghost visited us every night at the same time for almost two years at first, just pacing the halls, then turning things off and on, changing TV channels and radio stations, swinging things in the walls, just little annoying things that at our age would scare the crap out of you. One of the scariest nights I can remember was one night at my house, we were sitting on the bed eating ice cream, when we both got that spooky feeling and fell silent, and we smelled something burning for a second, and then we heard the most guttural scary movie growl I've ever heard in my life. We threw our bowls and ran into the living room, where I felt the need to spoil the beans to my parents. Of course, they told me we were crazy and that our imaginations were great. A few months later, I was still insisting to them that something evil was in the home, and they kept telling me the same thing and began asking me if I needed help like counseling or something, but I kept fighting with them about it. By this point, even my brothers thought I was insane. A few months later, my parents decided to move because I stuck to my story, and they were hoping that if they got me away from my friend, that my imagination wouldn't work overtime. We moved about 65 miles from that town to another farmhouse that was even older than the last one. The same thing was happening, only instead of pacing back and forth, the figure began to float to my bedside, lean its head to the side, and make noises like it wanted something from me. This was a nightly ordeal for a few months, and then it began to start touching me. I could never see its hands but I could feel the icy cold prickle sensation that came with it, working its way up my bed, to my legs, up my body, and even surrounding my head. Most nights, I was too afraid to move and afraid to cry out, so I laid in my bed, silently weeping. This went on for quite some time too, then it began to lay in the bed beside me and touch me off and on all night, as though I was testing me to see if I was scared, and trust me, I was terrified, but when 5am rolled around, 
proof he would vanish. After a few months of this, in a tunnel of sleep, I finally got the nerve up to throw a pillow at him and whisper yell at him. You know, things like what do you want from me? And he began to put his head to the side, even more, in grunt, as if he was replying what? Remember, the figure always had a pressed on pinstripe suit and some kind of burlap bag over his head, with a rope that showed to be strung around his neck at least two times. So, I never saw a face or even heard him speak anything other than the grunts it was doing that night. But shortly after my temper tantrum, it left. Finally, a few nights of peaceful sleep, until I was awakened by heavy footsteps in the foyer, going through the kitchen, which was not like him at all, and then the burnt smell again, and I was so afraid that I would hear the growl again, that I remember thinking, my parents would surely find me dead in the morning from a heart attack. To make a long story shorter, here's a list of things that happened. After that night, I never saw the burlap ghost again, but strange things and sounds and figures would keep me up all night. It was like an open portal in my bedroom. I would wake up scratched up, heavy breathing in my ears, pressure on my chest, racing black silvery balls across the ceiling, red eyes racing through my room and disappearing, laughter, waking with my arms bruised as if someone had grabbed me, something cold that I always assumed to be a hand, because I felt something like a huge ring hit the bottom of my foot, grabbed me by the ankle, and almost slung me out of bed. A Bible was slung across the room and landed on my bed as I had taken to the habit of filling my room with religious items. In one night, so much activity in my room that my younger brother was awakened and came in only to turn white and started screaming. And to this day, he will not tell me what he saw. So on to the future. I turned 18, still struggling with this haunting, or whatever you call it, and joined the military, and it still followed me. Even being stationed in Iceland, it was still up to no good, and my best friend, who was also my roommate, would say things like something is not right, and it was doing all of its little tricks again, like turning things on and off. But she seemed fascinated with it, so I told her the entire story, and she didn't seem to mind. She had just wondered what I had done to have this happen to me. Finally, a few years of peace without one thing happening. I'm now 24 and live with my boyfriend in our three bedroom, two bath house, and nothing. Another year of peace when he tells me one morning that he felt like he was being choked in the middle of the night and he has some bruises on his arm. I say nothing because I don't want him to think I am crazy, but it keeps happening and then I wake up, look at the clock and it's 3 a.m. again and something is breathing heavy in my ear. I got up and went into our guest bedroom in nothing, so I fall asleep for what seems like a few hours. But when I wake up, it is only 40 past 3, so I attempt to get up, and I can't move. Something is strangling me and hitting me all over. I struggle to get up, but I can't move. I can't even scream. This went on for about 15 to 20 minutes, and proof the struggle is over. This time, the attack is so severe that I consider calling a team of specialists out to see what it is, but I never did. Shortly after that, my boyfriend and I split up, and I moved to Oklahoma to be with my family, and nothing has happened since. Once in a while, I get a strange sensation, but I don't think about it twice and just keep doing what I'm doing, and it has now been about two years since anything out of the ordinary happened. There are many more things that happened during this trying period of my life, but for me to write it on here would take a year at least. For those of you who read this and think I'm crazy, 
I can only say that maybe someday my little brother will tell me what he saw. My fiance had just died in our townhouse. This was in 2002. He had offed himself in the head. I went back later because I couldn't go back there for a while after he had died. Anyway, I went back and I kept feeling hand brush across my forehead. One night, I was in bed and was about to fall asleep when something grabbed my foot and was pulling it downward. I freaked out. I was the only one in the house. Then, I had a friend come over because I was afraid to be alone because of these things happening. My friend was downstairs and I was upstairs coming out of the bathroom and a dark floating figure floated right by me. It almost ran into me and would have had I not stepped back. It telepathically told me it was not here for me and that I had gotten what it wanted and also will not look directly at me. I somehow felt like I was being protected by God and the thing was actually afraid of me. I didn't feel scared. Later on in the month, I took a bunch of pictures of the townhouse because I wanted to remember the good times where my fiance had lived and been very happy together at one time. I was planning on moving because the memory of his death was just too much for me and I always had this creepy feeling there since he had died. After I got the pictures developed, there were 120 photos in all of several different rolls of film of different things and then the one that I had taken pictures of the inside of the town hall. Out of all these photos, I had taken three of the exact place where he had died and only those three photos were what appeared to be flames right in the place where he had passed. It almost looked like the portal to hell. Seriously. To this day, I cannot explain those pictures. They were taken with a very expensive camera. No other photos I had developed before or after that had ever had those flames in them like that. Just the three that were the exact location of his body when he died. My name is Malin, and I've just turned 21. I live in Sweden. In my parents' house, I've experienced some strange things that I really can't explain. My sister and I have always felt that there is a presence, other than us. My parents don't believe in that kind of thing, and have always told us that it's just our imagination. One of the first things I remember is that my father had gotten this stuffed animal that looked like E.T. He got it from his students as a present. I must have been about four years old and had recently seen the movie with my sister. And for some reason, I thought that E.T. was the most scary thing I've ever seen. So I didn't like this doll at all. In our basement, there are a lot of different rooms. In one of them, we had a huge box filled with stuffed animals. Every time I went down there, I took the E.T. doll and put it in the bottom of the box under all the other stuffed animals. But the next time I went down there, the E.T. doll was lying on top of the others again. This happened repeatedly every time I went down there. It didn't matter if I waited two days or two minutes. I of course had my sister and my parents about it, but they swore that they had nothing to do with it. Of course it could be so that they lied to me every time I asked them, but I find that hard to believe. Anyway, I solved the problem a couple years later by giving the E.T. doll to one of the guys in my class. I constantly heard, and still hear, cracks and other sounds in their house, footsteps, and sometimes voices. They've always been there, and I guess I got used to it, but it took a few years before the next big thing happened. I was 15, maybe 16, and had moved down to the bedroom downstairs. I didn't like sleeping downstairs, but it was either that 
or a tiny room upstairs. One day, I was sitting in my bed, writing in my diary, when I heard a knock on my door. I was surprised because I was alone in the house and hadn't heard either the car nor the door open. I said come in, but when no one entered, I got up and opened the door, but there was no one there. I thought it was strange, but went back to my diary. I had hardly any time to pick up my pen before I heard another knock. This happened a couple times and really scared me, so I locked the door and crawled under the covers. Then I heard scratching outside and froze, just to hear meow, one of my cats. At first I thought it was my cat who had caused the knocking, but I've never met a cat that can actually knock that hard. Another time I was in the bathroom upstairs, I just finished washing my hands and was outside the bathroom when I remembered that I left my watch in the shell in front of the mirror. I turned to go get it and took a step into the room when a bottle of lotion literally flew off the windowsill and landed in front of my feet. The window was closed and there was no wind to speak of outside. If the bottle had fallen off the windowsill because it was placed unstable, it would have fallen right down in the cat's litter box, but instead it flew almost 13 feet. I calmly went out of there, closed the door, and got into my room and locked the door. I've also seen a boy in the basement, a teenager. He's not transparent at all. He looks as real as you and me. I've only gotten short glimpses of him, but I know he has brown hair in a green shirt. For some reason, I most often see him around Christmas and other holidays. I wonder why. Even though some of these things scare me, I've never felt threatened, so I guess whomever or whatever is present in my parents' house doesn't want to harm us. I'm one to be afraid of the dark, but there are feelings I get. Feelings that tell me to get out. Almost a communication with my location. The basement has been home to incidents experienced by me and my slightly older sister. My experience is weird. I went downstairs to retrieve something for my mom when just when I was near the stairs. An opaque dark shade of gray temporarily blinded me. Whilst running up the stairs and wiping my eyes, I swore I heard something. My sister heard something too. She was on the downstairs computer once. It had basic features. She swore she heard something whisper something close to her name. My sister sprinted upstairs as well. Finally, my parents' room. I come in on rare occasions like when the light and TV is on, or when my mom or dad are watching a good movie. My room is on the other end of the hall. I need to pass my parents' room. When I pass their room, I see strange things at the end of the bed. I see dark, almost impish figures. Once, I could have sworn I've seen red eyes. Now, for the sound, it is very creepy, yet inconclusive. I have no idea what the sound actually is. Once, when the family and I were in the living room, I heard a broom sweep in the back of the house. Weird part, there was no broom in the back of the house. Plus, just today, on 3-20-2008, I heard something in my room exhale. I know it wasn't me. That had freaked me out. The feeling. I think I may actually have been touched too. Once, when I was eight or nine, I was watching a show on Urban Legends. I felt something run something gently down my back. It was around 10 or 11, but I got up anyway, and I went to the living room where I found my mom. I told her what happened, but she just said it was just a curtain.
I lived in a home in North Salt Lake City that my children and myself had many experiences over the years that we never could explain other than the supernatural. My husband, myself and two children lived in this house for over 12 years. There is a family that now lives in the house and I do not want them to cause any problems by giving them out the address of the house. I will say that the house is located on 5th North. My children attended Jackson Elementary School when they were young and graduated from West High School. My daughter was sleeping and thought she heard her name being called and when she opened her eyes there was a man with a beard sitting in a rocking chair holding a hat in his lap. My daughter's bed was hung from the ceiling with chains and her bed was four feet from the floor. My daughter said the man turned his head towards her and grinned at her. She also said that her rocking chair was even with her bed and was four feet off the floor. She told me she pulled the covers over her head and when she peeked out over the covers, he was gone. My son told me of a man with a beard and a top hat sat on the end of the bed. My son heard his name called and when he even looked in the direction of the speaker, the man sitting on his bed, the man grinned at him. My son pulled the covers over his head and when he looked out, the man was gone. I was alone in the house for a few days and on two different nights, I was awoken to the sound of music, violin and tinky sounding piano. The lights were on in the kitchen in the front room. As I entered the kitchen from my bedroom, the music stopped and the lights dimmed and as I entered the front room, the lights dimmed and I found myself standing in the middle of the front room in the dark. I heard footsteps in the stairwell and when I got to the bottom of the stairs, the lights were on upstairs. I started walking up the stairs and with each step, the light got dimmer and about at the fifth step, it was now dark upstairs. I could write about many other things that happened at this house. We never felt anything evil with our experiences and it was always our own fear that scared us. I believe the house I grew up in was haunted. My family all makes jokes about how it was just all my imagination. There were several different occurrences throughout my childhood. Nothing on a regular basis, but frequent enough for me to believe that something paranormal was going on there. I lived in this house from birth until 18 years old. I am now much older and I still believe what I saw and felt was real and inexplainable. As a child, I always woke up in the night to get a drink of water or a snack even sometimes. I wasn't overweight, but it was a running joke in my house that I always had to get up to get something to eat at night. On several of these occasions, I would walk out of my bedroom down the short hall and into the living room where we had one of those old TVs that when you turned them off, the colors would dance for a short while and then go out. My parents were early to bed, early to rise, so I know the TV couldn't just shut off, but I would go out and there would be a human face made from those colors that actually would just swim around when it was shut off. I watched the TV during the day and it shut off and always watched to see what the colors did, but they never made the face during the day, only at night after the TV had been off for hours. The second occurrence that freaked me out completely was on one night. I was standing at the refrigerator, which was on the same wall as the doorway that led down to a small landing, which is where the back door was, and the stairs to the basement were. I always felt watched downstairs and couldn't stand going down there at night, even with all the lights on. I could do it fine during the day, but at night, it freaked me out. Anyway, the night I'm speaking of, I turned my head to the doorway. 
The only illumination was the light from the refrigerator. And there was a fully formed person peering around the corner from the side that would have been coming up the stairs. The horrible thing about it was that at first I thought it was my stepdad, but then I got to look at his face a little closer and it was his face, but almost evil looking. I swear it had red eyes, but that could have been a misinterpretation of what I saw. I ran back down to see where all the bedrooms were and I peeked in my parents' room and he was still in bed. I've never found an explanation of why it could have been his likeness, but I know it was definitely scary. I think my house is haunted. I was really terrified at one point, but after a year, I got so used to it. But for example, me and my boyfriend have heard footsteps up and down the hall outside our bedroom. Sometimes it sounds like someone is checking the doors and windows, and one night, me and my boyfriend had a fight and I went to go stay at a friend's house. When my boyfriend came home, he sat on the sofa and started dozing off. When all of a sudden, there was a series of loud banging up and down the hall like someone was angry. He jumped up and came out the door and came to my boyfriend's to ask me to come home. Another strange time, my boyfriend came home for a few hours to take a nap. He called me at work. I was about 45 minutes away. We talked for a few minutes. After we hung up, he went into the bedroom to lay down when all of a sudden, again, it sounded like someone was putting dishes away and moving around. So my boyfriend says he thought to himself, oh, Ivy's home. After about a minute, he realized that it could have not been me because he just got off the phone with me and I was 45 minutes away. A lot of unexplained things have happened. Sometimes, when we've been in the house alone and sworn that we're not alone, even when we are alone, it feels like someone is watching us. We've been together in the house and feel like we are being watched. I don't feel afraid anymore, but now we are moving out of this apartment and it may sound even stranger. But you can almost feel a sad feeling, like whatever it is with us knows we are going and is sad. But I find myself feeling sad too. I don't think I need any help now, but I sure wish the help would have been there in 1974. We didn't know where to turn at the time. I thought you might be interested in what happened to us. The couple rented the apartment to my daughter were 80 years old plus. We told them about the lights going out at different times, and they couldn't figure it out, so we never told them anything else. One time, my two daughters and my two-year-old grandson were sitting on the floor, and way back in the kitchen, they suddenly started to hear a strange sound, and my grandson said, Tiger, Mommy, Tiger. It was a growling sound. My grandson was scared and jumped up and made a beeline for the stairs. Then my daughters also jumped up and they left the house for the night. Every other day or so, they would hear pots and pans filling out the cupboards, but when they would go look, nothing was out of order. It was a very nice apartment, very clean and pleasant looking. It was getting close to Christmas and she decided to move. She couldn't take it anymore. It was just too scary. So I would go over in the daytime and thinking nothing scary would happen in daylight, I went over to pack some things up while she was at class. I started to grab some things off the shelf, but I had a funny feeling that I didn't want to reach in the closet. All of a sudden, it sounded like a hundred footsteps in there walking, so I ran out of there in a quick second as I could and refused to go back there by myself. From then on, we could go over at least two of us at a time. Then one of the last times I went over, I was standing waiting for my grandson to finish in the bathroom and as I was afraid to stand with my back to the hall for some reason, I kept thinking someone was going to touch me. Sure enough, I turned to ask my grandson if he had finished yet and it felt like someone's hand had touched me on my left arm. I grabbed my grandson and ran to the front room with my family and told them what happened. So after that, we pretty much stayed together and worked together to move out of there. A friend of my daughter's knew the couple who had lived in that apartment before her, and they got in touch with the woman and told her what happened there. She wanted to meet with my daughter because she had some scary things happen to her. Her husband had drowned in the Maumee River in Toledo, Ohio, 
Under suspicious circumstances, the police were never able to prove it, but he thought he might have been murdered. So his wife had a seance in the apartment where they lived, and she said she brought him there, and he told her he was murdered. She had a big insurance on him that he had taken out on himself, and when she went home from work at night, her house would be all messed up with things tossed all around. She had to move away, but couldn't take it. Over these past 24 years, we've had some strange things happen, spiritual things and such. Seems to have settled down now, but I thought you would be interested to hear our story, and all that I've told you is true. There are no lies here. Let me know what you think. It's comforting to have someone tell this stuff to. A lot of people think you're nuts when you mention these things, so we pretty much keep it to ourselves. I'm interested to hear what you have to say about these things. Hi, I would like to tell you of some strange things that have happened to me. It started with a dream that would not leave me alone. It was about a house that was important to me for some reason. I dreamt of it over and over, seeing all of its different owners as they moved in and changed the house's layout, parties they had every day, things that were done there, etc. One early owner was an older female that did not like being there. I wondered about this house for years until I moved to my recent address and ran across the house on a drive. I was angry because they had moved my garden and replaced it with a pool. I was surprised by this feeling. Why did I feel angry about that? I decided to talk with the recent owners and tell them of the remodeling I'd seen and about the baby that was lost in the home early on. The owner was astonished that everything I said was true and explained to me the house was haunted. I was surprised at this and wondered who was haunting this place. Could it have been me? Was I haunting them while I was dreaming? Can this even happen? Why was I drawn to this house? I assure you, I never visited this house in real time and am in awe as to what this secret house holds for me. Could I be the woman who died in childbirth in this house over a hundred years ago? Also, the woman who I spoke of earlier who did not want me in the house she turned out to be the original owner's second wife. The first died in childbirth. Please write back with any insight you may have on this subject. I've not dreamt of the house since finding it. Thank you. I've experienced hauntings in almost every place I've ever lived in. That's probably because my mother never sees ghosts, but loves old-fashioned houses. The first house I grew up in, was a single level two bedroom with a basement. When you passed inside the front door, you came upon a hallway with four doors. First my parents' bedroom door, then the bathroom door, then the basement door, then the door to the bedroom that I shared with my brother. When I was little, I was always the first one awake. I would walk into the hallway to go to the bathroom. Once, I saw a carved wooden chair with big wheels, one on each side, sitting right outside my parents' bedroom. Normally, I would have lost no time in climbing all over this new piece of furniture, but this one, for no apparent reason, made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. I ran back into my room and slammed the door. Later that day, I asked my father to please get rid of the big wooden chair in the hallway. Thinking I was playing a game, he said there weren't any chairs in the hallway, but if he ever saw one, he'd be sure to move it. I didn't see the chair again for almost six years. When I saw it the next time, I was sitting in the exact same place as before. I was older now, but wasn't quite so afraid, so I came closer. The chair was battered and scarred this time. Part of the back corner had been broken off, and the seat was yellowed. It smelled like very old, musty leather. I still couldn't bring myself to actually touch the chair, but I managed to go to the bathroom anyway. While I was brushing my teeth, I heard a metallic crush in the basement. I figured my dad was downstairs trying to fix the furnace again. It was October after all, but that was odd, since I hadn't heard him go down there, but maybe he was up there before me. When I came back out, the chair was gone. I went to the fridge and poured myself some juice. My mother came into the kitchen in her night robe, and I asked her if dad had gotten the furnace fixed yet. She said no, but he'd probably try once again he got out of bed. I said he's already up. 
I heard him in the basement. She told me, you mean that loud noise? I heard it too. It woke me up. Your dad's still in bed. Go downstairs. Maybe a stray got into the basement last night. And so, I went. The basement was very cold. Colder than usual, even for an October morning. I searched the entire area. Not too difficult since it was just a big, concrete floor. Not much on it except for shelves of canned goods. But I didn't find any signs of an animal being there. No droppings, claw marks, paw prints, or jars of food broken. There was no animal smell either. I thought for a moment. The crash I heard was too loud to be just any animal, unless something had been knocked over and everything appeared to be in its usual place. That wasn't the first time we had heard strange noises coming from the basement either. They normally happened around winter or late fall, and the noises always sound like metal clanking, like someone banging a shovel against a wall. The sounds would come at night or early morning, and one week, they got so bad that we had to move into the living room just to get some sleep. I didn't put two and two together until many years later, when I was a teenager. Mother finally told me a story of how they bought the house. It had been cheap to buy because a man had fallen to his death down the basement stairs a few years prior to dad buying the place. The man was fairly wealthy and had the house built, one story high, to accommodate his special needs because he was in a wheelchair. I told my mother about the chair I had seen in the hallway twice before, chair with wheels. I was too little to have seen a wheelchair and she told me what our next door neighbor had told her. That when the man had died, he was sitting in the hallway while the nurse ran a bathroom and the basement door opened or had been left opened. Who knows? The man was a miser, according to neighbors, and probably didn't want a draft coming into the house, so he wheeled himself over to shut the door. One of the wheels accidentally went over the edge, somehow, and the poor guy fell down the stairs and split his head open. There were still bloodstains at the bottom of the stairway. My brother and I always just assumed it was just red old paint. The nurse called out for him to come and take his bath and heard him flailing around downstairs trying to get back into his chair. Mom and dad never told me or my brother. I guess they didn't want us to grow up nervous or jittery. The ghost, if that's what it was, was never really me. I guess he just wanted his wheelchair back. I live in Spartansburg, South Carolina. I live fairly close to the Cowpens Battlefield area. I'm going to tell you about one of the times I went there. A couple of weeks ago, I visited the battlefield for a picnic. It was weird from the start because, I swear, I could no longer find the visitor center. The asphalt's roads had been replaced with dirt roads. In the clearing, where concerts are held, was all covered with trees and bushes. When I finally found my way to the area where the big cavalry battle was fought, I began to feel an eerie presence like I was being watched. I turned around to find a bush shaking furiously. From the bush, a big flash quickly followed by the sound of a loud bang erupted. I quickly turned to see who or what was shooting at. In the clearing, a good 50 yards away, a blue cavalry rider, surely American, stood with a traditional 17th century revolutionary uniform on, and before my eyes, he vanished into thin air. I've not been back since. The story I'm about to relay was told to me by a very reliable friend during my years in college. I had no reason to question the authenticity of his story, since I knew him to be a very level-headed man and was not given to ghost and goblin stories. It appears that his grandfather lived in an old home out in the lonely countryside of North Carolina during the 30s and 40s. He was a farmer by trade and a very religious man. He lived there some years alone, his wife having died of an unusual sickness. I had occasion to visit the area myself, and if you go to this area of North Carolina today, you will still find many cousins and aunts and uncles living very near one another. It was the same way during his grandfather's time where he lived there very near to his son, my friend's father. In fact, the homes were only two miles apart and connected via a dark path that wound through a gloomy forest through which the relative often traveled on visits back and forth. It was always the goal to leave well before sunset, 
Lamp oil was a precious commodity before and during the war years, and one could not waste it on long trips in the dark. On this particular occasion, my friend's grandfather went to visit the relatives on the other side of the forest. It was Thanksgiving time, and the trees had shed most of their leaves going into winter, and there was a cold chill in the air. The family had a joyous time together feasting on turkey and all the trimmings. Grandfather was deeply engrossed in all the family time, and no one noticed the sun starting to dip low in the horizon. In fact, too low for the safe journey back through the forest. Even though the members of the family pleaded with him to stay the night, Grandfather shrugged them off. I have to start out early tomorrow morning for town. My house is closer. I'll be alright. He departed just as the sun disappeared behind the horizon, and everything was bathed in the misty light of twilight. As I said before, Grandfather was a very religious man and wasn't in the least bit intimidated by ghosts and ghouls, so the trek back through the forest, although very dark without a lamp, didn't even cross his mind as being risky. It was a waning moon that evening and cloudy, so there was very little light, and under the eaves of the forest it was even darker. He told his grandson later that even though he knew the trail well, he found himself thrashing around in the underbrush on several occasions. He even miscalculated the stream that crossed the path around halfway through the forest and got his feet soaking wet. It had rained through the night before, so the trail itself was muddy and his feet started getting heavy from the mud. It was at about this point in the trail that he felt something, as if something were following him. Never having been on the trail after dark, he explained it away as his imagination. Perhaps another 50 yards down the dark trail, as he recalled, he heard something behind him splash through the creek he had just crossed only moments before. I didn't know what to think of that, maybe a deer or something that was just spooked down the trail by his passing, he later told his grandson. It sounded like he was in a big hurry whatever it was. Perhaps it was the uncertainty derived from the extreme darkness, maybe it was his imagination. But when he heard a twig snap no more than 20 yards behind him only seconds later, he knew it was time to make tracks. His grandfather was in his early 40s at the time and was in excellent physical condition, like many farmers from the years of working with their hands. From his estimation, he was only a half mile from home when he started running, more of a jog than anything, as he recalled. The mud made it tricky work, and his feet were pretty heavy with the thickness of mud clinging to them. But when he broke from the trees and saw the shadow of the house around a hundred yards away, he heard whatever it was behind him give out a guttural growl, as if it were exerting itself by pouring on the stream for the final stretch. That was his cue to let loose with full out run for his life, mud or no mud. He didn't look back, but he heard the beastly thing behind him chugging for air and crashing through the underbush as it too broke into the open. He then thought it might be a cougar or panther because of the snarl. He didn't turn around to find out. He made for the back door that was unlocked and at full speed dove through the door. The door crashed open at the force of his huge frame. He probably slammed it shut with his foot and quickly locked it. No sooner he had gotten to his feet and backed away from the door, perhaps three second time lapse, when something hit the door, the force of which shook the house. The center of the door bowed in and he heard the hinges creak under the stress, but thankfully, as he was their call later, it held solid. He quickly reached for his gun and like many hardy folk of his era, leapt at the window just next to the door and aimed his shotgun out at nothing. There was nothing there. Immediately, he went around the house to make sure all the doors and windows were locked. Of course, they were all wide open, but nothing got in that he could find. It didn't rain that night, so the next morning, before he went to town, he went to check out the tracks of the great beast that chased him. To his surprise and dismay, he found none, nothing to verify his story that he didn't imagine it, only his word, which was significant since he grew up in an era where a man's word was totally his bond. He rarely told the story because he just figured it was a panther or maybe a bear. He did find it strange that between the time it took him to grab the shotgun and get to the window was less than a second and there was nothing there. He couldn't see anything racing off towards the forest in the decreasing light. What about footprints? Certainly, something that knocks down trees and crashes into doors with such force should leave tracks. To this day, 
It remains unexplained. From the time I was four until I was about 16, my grandparents lived in a house in Cloverdale Road that had a poltergeist in it. I lived with them for the first four years, then moved out with my mother, but even after we moved, I would spend weekends or holidays at my grandparents' house. The happenings were noticed by everyone in the family. My grandfather was the only one who never said anything was out of the ordinary. He's a staunch man of God and kept pictures of Jesus around, and he prayed daily to bless our house and everyone in it. The house had a sunroom that was added on the second floor. Over the front porch, this became my room. This wall between my bedroom and the master bedroom, where my mother's sleep was brick, and had two small windows on either side of the door. I had to walk through a room to get to the upstairs hall, where there was a door leading to the middle room. Always dark, because the only window was two feet from the house next door, and the back of the upstairs had a small kitchen over the top of the one on the first floor, and a bathroom at the very back over the top of my grandparents' room on the first floor. The downstairs had a living and dining room combination that was curtained off. The front room was a bedroom, the middle of the dining room, and the stairs to the basement went down at the doorway to the kitchen. Beyond was my grandparents' room, as I mentioned. My grandparents, my mother, my aunts, and myself all lived there all at once. My aunts were teenagers, and experimenting with the occult and spirit invocations, I really think this had to do a lot with everything. At their age, they could have understood the consequences of what they were asking. You could clearly hear the footsteps in the middle room, even during the day, and then find out later that my aunt wasn't home. So many things got moved around in Susan's middle room that she put a lock on her door, but it wasn't any of us. We heard walking, someone laying down heavily on the bed, drawers opening and closing, the closet opening and closing, not loud or frightening, just the normal noises Susan would make if she was there. Many times, when I was very young, I'd scamper up the stairs, convinced she was there, and wanting to play with her. When I got there, the door would be locked, and no one would answer me when I knocked. Once I even saw the light was on in her room, it was shining around the door. I called to her and tried to open it, but it went out and the noises stopped. My scalp would tingle with fear and I'd run crying to my grandmother and tell what happened. Once, when I was about five or six, I got up to the bathroom in the middle of the night. My room was awash with streetlight lamp, but my mother's, with no other windows, was very dark. I had to go slowly, even though I was dying to go into the bathroom, because I didn't want to crash into something and wake her up. When I got there, I was just flushing and was suddenly possessed, no pun intended, with the most abject horror for no apparent reason. I screamed and screamed and screamed. I ran all the way to the bathroom past my mother who was struggling to get up into my room and under my blankets. I was trembling and pale and shaking. It woke up the whole house and it took me hours to calm down and sleep with the light on. I never knew what had set me off, just blind panic. Our pots and pans could be heard falling out of the cupboards and when you go check, everything would be in place except maybe one thing and that would turn up days or weeks later. My mother saw a black shadow about two to three feet high at the foot of her bed when she'd wake up in the middle of the night. One day, it waited until she was awake, then slowly, deliberately came around the side of the bed and advanced towards her head. She prayed fervently while it just stayed there, then mysteriously, it faded away. But it will always come back another night. She was the only one who saw anything. The rest of us just heard disturbances. I was playing with my toys one sunny day, in my room. I was about seven at the time. I picked up a bunting bag, sort of like a baby sleeper, but like a gown sewed closed at the bottom instead of two legs, and also the ends of the sleeves are sewn closed, and it had a hood. It was made of flannel, and had flowers on it. I loved putting my baby dolls in it. It fit like the ones that were about 12 inches high. I had a doll prepared to put in it and reached for the flannel bag on the floor next to me. Then I shrieked and jumped up, flinging it away from me. I could feel like there was something, felt like a gardener snake or two, writhing inside of it and making a buzzing noise like the world's biggest house fire bee. I stared at it in horror as it laid on the floor and the writhing could be seen. Then the noise died down and as it did so, 
The shapes quit swirling and went flat. I was screaming for help. My mother and aunt came upstairs and I told them what happened. I was sobbing so hard they could barely understand me. They picked it up even though I screamed and begged them not to and looked inside. There was nothing. The only way out if something was in there was through the neck hole and it was lying face up a couple of feet from me and I had not taken my eyes off it for anything. They searched the room and found nothing. They said I imagined it and took me downstairs to have juice to drink. I swear I never played with it ever again. I put that thing in the bottom of a box and left a pile of heavy toys on top of it. The house still stands and when we all left, none of those things ever followed us. I wonder what else happened there over the last 20 years. My father died in Las Vegas in 1993, the youngest of his five children. I was the first one to make it out to Vegas for his funeral. He was cremated. I got there on a Wednesday, Thursday morning. One of my mother's friends came over to our house with some soda and other things for us. I ran out of the house to help her unload her car. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw my father standing beside the house. He had his right hand on his hip and held his left hand in mid-air as if he were going to take a pull off a cigarette. Ironic because he died of lung cancer or as if he wanted to wave at or beckon to me. It was only a few seconds but a whole jumble of thoughts ran through my mind. He's going to say something to me. I don't want to hear it. So I looked away and when I looked back, he was gone. I regret not stopping to hear what he wanted to say to me. My brother said he chose to say goodbye to me. This was the first time I've ever seen a ghost. I'm waiting to see my mother, who died in May 1998. A footnote, when I saw him, I noticed that my father was wearing his favorite khaki pants and golden white striped shirt. That afternoon, I went to my father's office to work on the program for the memorial service. His boss gave me a picture of my father. In it. He was wearing that gold and white striped shirt. When I was growing up, I've had several experiences which led me to believe the house was haunted. The first, I was about six years old. I was laying in bed, just about to fall asleep, when I heard what I thought was laughing. I turned over to tell my sister to be quiet when I saw a black form floating beside my bed. My sister was sound asleep. This form had no legs that I could see. It did have a smile on what I call its face. The next encounter did not happen until I was 16. I was coming home late one night and came face to face with this thing. It was the same thing I saw when I was 6, only this time there was no smile. After an indiscernible amount of time, I ran to my room. I've had several encounters with this thing throughout my teen years and began calling it Paul. Don't ask me why, because I don't know myself. My sisters and brothers claim they have never saw it, but one brother says he has had haunting experiences such as floating in his room. My mother says she knows the house was haunted, but she refused to give any examples. I know this thing was not harmful because nothing ever harmful ever happened. I also came to feel that this thing was protective of us because I never felt alone or afraid in the house when I was alone. Whenever something was going to happen, we were given warning signs such as popping noises on the stove that we found out had a gas leak and uneasy feelings using the garbage disposal that checked out to have a barbed wire that an electrician said could have caused a fire. This is my story. Hope it wasn't too long. I know it sounds incredibly terrifying just by the details I've given, but that black face was just so mysterious, but I didn't know what to think because I believe that he was actually trying to help me and protect us from anything possible. I guess at this point, it really doesn't matter what it looked like, as long as it was trying to help us, right? Thanks again for reading. I really appreciate you listening to this story, and I hope you have a good day. I used to bicycle the four miles to and from work, along the main roads connecting to two towns in a part of southern Japan. Along the way, there were rice fields on both sides of the roads, shops of many kinds, a school or two, and quite a number of houses set back only about 10 or 15 feet from the sidewalk. One evening in winter, around 7.30, I was bicycling towards home and passed by several homes in a row along the left side of the road. 
One of them was a one-story wooden farmhouse that had a lawn, low facade, with several square beam columns holding up the roof over the entranceway. As I neared this house, I noticed that there was a boy of perhaps 10 years old standing behind one of the columns, partially obscured by it. He was clearly wearing shorts. It is not unusual for boys to wear shorts all year long in relatively warm southern Japan, and a long sleeve t-shirt, and most notably, a red baseball cap. As I got nearer and passed in front of where the boy was standing, I spotted him again, this time just a few feet away from me, and I noticed that where his face should have been. There was just a blur, a somewhat dark flesh tone blur, but no visible features. This quite naturally shocked me, and just after I passed on my bicycle, I looked back over my shoulder at the place where he had been standing. He was no longer there, though there clearly was not enough time for him to have moved so quickly that I would have seen him. I had chills during the rest of my way back home. The next day, I told the people in my office what I had seen the night before, and one of the older, upper 50s women told me that a stretch of the road was notorious for fatal car accidents, most involving children who dart into the street after a ball or some other toy. I suppose that to most readers this sounds like a fairly typical ghost sighting story, but it is the only one I have personally seen, what I can only conclude was a ghost, so I had quite a deep impact on me. Though I worked at that same job for more than a year after the sighting, and bicycled to and from work along the same road almost every day during that time, I never again saw the boy in the red cap. Victorville, California George Air Force Base is deactivated now, but back when I was assigned there in the 70s, I lived next door to a haunted house and base housing. My wife and I lived in what were known as worry housing units. These were small concrete blocks duplexes that were two bedrooms that had swamp coolers for cooling in summer and natural gas wall heaters for the winter. We moved into our unit and found it agreeable for just the two of us. While talking to the neighbors, we found out that our unit and the next three units had to have the heaters replaced. The unit next to ours had malfunctioned and the woman living there was asphyxiated. The next family to move in had a small boy and he would wake up screaming every night. His mother asked him what was wrong and he finally told her that the white lady kept coming into his room and saying, I'm going to take you home with me. My wife had told her that I had experiences with that kind of thing and volunteered me to go have a look. Naturally, I waited until it was full noon before I went in to check out the house. Now at this time, we had a stupid cat. What other kind is there that will follow me around? So, in we go. Kitchen, okay. Dining room, okay. Living room, okay. Master bedroom, okay. Bathroom, okay. Kids room. Uh-oh. No feeling cold or anything, but my eyes are drawn to the far corner of the room. I can't see anything there, but I know something is there. I glance down at the cat and it's looking in the same spot. Glance up. It has moved closer to me. Glance down. Cat is fluffing up and backing down the hallway. I figure the cat has the right idea. Now, here's where I made a stupid mistake. I got in front of the cat. I hear the cat make a loud hiss, and the next thing that happens is the cat went up my back and off the top of my head running. I don't stop to look behind me, remember what Satchel Paige said about that, and take off running. My wife said she heard the cat make a noise, and then me saying, oh crap, then a herd of elephants running out the door. Needless to say, I recommended our neighbor have the chaplain come out. A second episode after that really had the hair stand up, and still does to this day. I was coming home around 2am, and noticed the master bedroom window was open and the light was on. I glanced over, and there was the gal next door, brushing her blonde hair, and not wearing a stitch. Well, good neighbor that I am, I call out to her to close the blind at least. First word out of my mouth, lights off, blind closed, window shut. I don't to this day know how I got through the front patio gate or the front door. I woke up my wife and told her what I had seen. She said one, our neighbor's hair is brown, two, they were in San Francisco, and three, the woman who died in that house was a blonde.
I went to Blackburn College in Carlinville, Illinois, before I moved into my dorm room. People asked which dorm I was assigned. When I told them Stoddard, everyone told me to watch out for the ghost and I believe it was room 305. Blackburn is a very old school and Stoddard was one of the oldest dorms dating back to the 1800s. The supposed haunted room was the only single room. The rest were doubles. It was on the third floor as the third floor was all guys and the first two all girls. The story goes, a freshman hung himself in that room years ago. Or another one was that a boyfriend killed his girlfriend and then himself there. Anyways, you were supposed to be able to hear them walking around at night and see them in windows and such. My room was diagonal from this room. My only encounters there were sometimes in the middle of the night. If I walked down the hall to the bathroom, I could swear someone was outside the stall walking around, but there would be nothing there. Also, I would leave stuff in my room, and when I came back, it would be gone and then later return to the same spot. I transferred schools the next semester for personal reasons, but the weird thing is, the guy who lived next door to me there always said how he could see the ghost, and then I got word that he tried hanging himself last semester. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. In 1992, I was a full-time student at Columbus State Community College, earning an associate's degree in law enforcement. I had to earn a full-time salary as well, so I took a job as a security officer during third shift at an American Electric Power Lab in Groveport. It was a facility set out in a rural area, and with the understanding that I would be the only one in the building during the graveyard shift, figured it would give me time to study. I will try to make this as short as possible. My first few weeks there were rather strange, as I kept seeing the presence of a shadowy figure of a man walking very fast out of the corner of my eye. I really did not consider it a haunting or ghost, because I never saw the apparition head on, so I just went on about my business and really did not give it much thought. However, I became very uneasy and spooked during the midnight and early morning hours. One morning, at about 6 a.m., I happened to be looking in the direction of the same window blinds while I was sitting in the lobby area. The window separated the lobby and the work area. Just then, I saw the definite figure of a man walk by the blinds. I got up and, thinking it was an employee who had gotten in early, went to investigate the area. There was no one there at all. The cleaning crew then related the story in which they were seeing a ghost in the building. They described the same type of apparition as me. I never told them about my experience. While training new officers, I had some who would stop in their tracks while I was showing them the building. I would ask them what was wrong, and they would be looking towards a room and hallway and tell me something like, I thought I saw someone walk by. This happened more than once. I spoke with the guy who used to manage the security division, and he told me he had an officer leave in the middle of the night because he saw the shadowy figure of a man walking very quickly around the perimeter of the security fence. I told an employee at the building, whom I had gotten to know over the time I'd worked there, about the sightings. Almost immediately he said, oh, that must be Roger. He was very serious. He said that Roger died about eight years prior, but that he loved his job, and that was probably him. Indeed, there was a former employee named Roger that died eight years ago. Without going on and on, I will just say that many other security officers had reported the same types of activity. I quit the job back in June of 1993. I worked there almost two years. I would like to contact some officers working there now and see if the haunting is still going on. It was a cold winter's day. The year was 1991, and I thought it was a very typical day. Matthew. The little boy that I care for was taking an afternoon nap, as usual. I was cleaning up the kitchen, then gathered up all Matt's dirty clothes and put up a wash. It was around 3.30 in the afternoon when I heard Matt screaming. I could hear his voice very clearly from the baby monitor that was on the kitchen counter. I called to him so that he wouldn't get scared as I walked upstairs to his bedroom. That's when it hit me first. On the way up to the staircase, I was chilled. I ran back down, got my sweater, then ran back upstairs to Matt's room. Well, that's where the coldness came from. Sure enough, as I opened the door, 
That's where all the cold air was coming from. It was freezing in the baby's room. I walked over to his bed, pulled the railing down, and held him in my arms. His hands were ice cold, and he was shaking and crying. In an effort to calm him down, I held him in my arms, and I tried rocking him back and forth. He finally had quieted down, so I began to change his clothes, and that's when I noticed my tape recorder on his dresser. I'd forgotten all about that. You see, Matt's family was relocating to another state soon, and I knew that I wanted something of Matt's to remember him by. So, that morning I brought my tape recorder with me to have a tape recording of him. Little did I know, that's not that was all on the tape. When I got home, I never did listen to the tape. It was Friday, so I thought to myself that I had the whole weekend to listen to it. On Sunday, I had some free time, so I started to listen to the tape. In the beginning, I thought, well, I did it. I finally have Matthew's voice on tape and was so happy to know that I have something to remember him by. As I began to listen, I heard our voices, Matt's, mine, and something that I couldn't make out. I kept backing up the tape because I heard something so strange that I couldn't even make out what I was hearing, but it sounded so eerie that it gave me the chills. What could this be? Did I have a faulty tape here or what? As I kept rewinding and listening, the more clearer it became. It was definitely a voice saying pull the gate up, but what kind of voice was it? It sounded ghostly, but how can this be? I heard nothing that particular day, only Matt and myself. There was no one else there, just the two of us. As I kept listening, I became more frightened. I heard the same voice saying I wish you were dead. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I never heard of anything like this before. I thought to myself, you're just imagining all of this. You're going crazy. But it was true. The tape doesn't lie. It had to be a ghost or something else. I had no other explanation. It just had to be. After a few hours, I decided to let my daughter listen to the tape. Now, my daughter is a very religious person. She has many religious friends and even knows a couple of Catholic priests personally. After she heard the tape, she told me that she would contact a priest right away. The next day, we called a Catholic priest that we both knew very well and made an appointment with him for the next night. Since the priest knew about the tape already, when we arrived there, we went right into his office. The three of us sat down and he listened to the tape right away. Well, it only took him one time to listen to it. He already knew what happened. He looked at me and he asked me if the family was Catholic and I answered yes. Then he asked if there was anything religious in the home. I said no and then asked him why. Then he began to explain that the family had no protection in the home. It was at this time that I understood what he was talking about. He was very concerned for the baby's welfare. He said that what he heard on the tape was evil voices and other things that I didn't even hear. Certain sounds of doors slamming and some creaking floors. He told me to tape Matt's room again and if it happened again that I should tell the parents. But what should I have told them? That Matt's room was haunted or the whole house was haunted? I didn't know what to do. If I told the parents the whole story, would they think I was nuts? So, I decided to take this to a doctor friend of mine. He happens to be a psychiatrist and also dabbles a little into strange and unexplainable things. When I went to see the doctor, I told him the whole story thus far. Then he listened to the tape. His exact words were, the voice is not from this world. It's from another dimension that is not a human voice. Well, from then on until this day, from a priest to a doctor, this tape has been a mystery to me. So, I've decided to take my tape and my story to any parapsychologist or website that has to do with the paranormal and let the experts decide for themselves. What in the world happened to Matthew's room that cold winter day in 1991? I'm finally ready to hear what they have to say, aren't you? I lived in what I believed to be a haunted apartment for about a year. I cannot disclose the exact location due to the fact that the apartment is still rented to tenants. When I first moved in, everything seemed normal until I began doing some small renovations. My husband Eric began to pull up the carpet and we noticed odd gouges in the floorboard that would be our bedroom. At the time, we thought that maybe some previous tenants had damaged the floor while moving their furniture, so we proceeded to paint the floor and lay down the rug. After two months or so, 
My husband walked into the bedroom after taking a shower. I was on the bed reading when suddenly Eric slipped on the area rug that covered the gouges. After assuring that he was okay and passing it off as having wet feet, we turned in for the night. The next morning we noticed what appeared to be stains seeping through the area rug. They appeared to be the same pattern as the gouges. I picked up the carpet and noticed a slick substance sticking to the back of the carpet. After much arguing as to what exactly the substance was, we decided to just throw it away. We never gave it a second thought. About three or four days later, I was in the kitchen having a cup of coffee with my friend Alec when suddenly the room temperature dropped considerably. I asked him to make sure all the windows were shut. As he walked into the living room, he glanced into my bedroom on the right and noticed the curtains were blowing. He went in to make sure the window was closed, which it was. About five minutes later, we both heard a loud bang coming from the bathroom, which was on the other side of the living room. It took Alec and I a good 15 minutes to get the courage up to check the bathroom. The first thing you see when entering the bathroom is the tub. I opened the curtain and noticed four tiles on the back wall that appeared to be pushed out. You have to understand the layout of my apartment to fully understand our fright. The apartment was a third floor attic in an old Victorian style house that was renovated into a small loft type apartment. When entering the apartment, you go up three flight of stairs, into the doorway, and up another two set of stairs into the living room. To the right is the bathroom, and little beyond that is a crawl space in the wall that runs under the eaves of the house and behind the bathroom and bathtub. Alec and I bickered about who was going to go into the crawl space. Needless to say, we waited until Eric came home about two hours later. We told him what had happened and insisted that he go into the crawl space to investigate. When he got to the space behind the bathtub, he discovered a lot of debris, which included dark old stained ropes and large J hooks. I insisted that he just leave them alone and figure where the house was so old, they must have been left behind during renovation or construction. We had our landlord fix the tiles and continue with our daily lives, even though I was permanently left with a feeling of unease. For about six or seven months, nothing happened. On Christmas Eve of 1975, we had a tray set up in front of the crawl space door, which was approximately two inches wide by three and a half high. The door fell open, knocking over the tree and smashing all of my Christmas ornaments. Eric jumped out of bed and stopped suddenly. We both heard a strange sound coming from the living room. It seemed to be coming from the crawl space. At the same time, I saw a strange mist or fog hovering close to the ceiling in the living room. It was a very faint, almost like thin smoke. I pointed it out to Eric, but it vanished before he could see it. I still can't believe how calm I stayed throughout this whole episode. When Alec and his new wife Vanessa came by on Christmas morning, we told him the whole story. Vanessa was a very spiritual person became instantly spooked before we even told her the story. Alec commented on how strange she was acting before she entered the apartment. She lost all the color in her face and seemed aloof. She mentioned that something didn't feel right about my apartment. I really started to feel like it was time to start looking for a new place to live. Eric had to leave the following week for a business trip to California. He would be gone for almost three months. I asked my girlfriend Samantha to stay with me for a while. I did not want to be alone. Samantha knew what had been happening and agreed reluctantly to stay on the sofa in the living room. The first month and a half was pretty much uneventful, so Sam and I began to look at new apartments. I started feeling confident and then nothing was going to happen. I was wrong. Samantha had to go back home for a few days so I was alone. I had gone out with Alec and Vanessa on a Saturday night and came home at about 1am. I climbed into bed with a book. I must have fallen asleep while reading. Do you ever get that feeling that someone is near you? I woke up on my stomach and I could sense somebody walking around my bed. I laid still and waited for it to pass. I heard the floorboards creaking and I felt a cool breeze pass over me. I finally turned over and looked into the living room and saw the mist moving towards the crawl space floor. The absolute fear that I felt paralyzed me. I could do nothing but stare and hope that nothing would happen. The strange noises started again. I can only describe the noise as a clang or knives being sharpened. I lost all of my composure. I ran out of my apartment wearing only my nightshirt and grabbed my car keys on the way out of the door. I drove to Alex and spent the night. I called Eric in LA and explained what happened 
and that I would not go back until he came home. I paid the rent. There was no way I was going to stay there alone. Eric came home on April 7th. I told him Alec and I would pick him up from the airport and then we would go to the apartment and get our belongings. I will never forget what we saw when we went back. It made me a true believer in the paranormal. I still don't know to this day what was haunting that apartment, but I truly believe it was evil. We walked into the apartment to discover the rug torn up, almost gouged up in the living room. All the tiles in the bathroom enclosure were punched out into the tub. The bedroom truly horrified the three of us. It appeared that something mauled the bed linens. The mirror that we had was smashed as well as my lamps. We grabbed what we could salvage and started to leave when we noticed the rope and J-hook through the kitchen table. I don't know if a person came in and did all the damage, but nothing explains the J-hook and the rope. My landlord insisted that no one had access to the apartment since we had moved in. We left that day and never looked back. I did some research on the house but found nothing significant that would explain any of the occurrences while we lived there. Eric and I now live in Vermont with our three kids. The house was renovated and turned into a retail store. We have not told them the story, and I don't think we ever will. I've been tempted to write what happened to my family many times, but it seems far too unreal. We were not allowed to talk about this out of the house when I was a child, and my mother only told our house guests about our visitors when they experienced something in our house. Our childhood home was built in 1898. My parents bought the house in 1974 when I was only six months old. The house was very large and had been converted into a double. My grandmother moved into the upper level. Strange things began to happen shortly after my family moved in. My mother had her first experience one night after she sent my older sisters to bed. From her bedroom door, she could look out and see into the kitchen's hallway and into the bathroom. My family had only lived in the house less than a month when my mom saw a little blonde haired girl walk into the bathroom. All of my sisters have very dark brown hair and this was clearly a blonde haired child. My mother panicked and yelled to the little girl but the door shut. My mom jumped out of bed. In her mind, she was thinking that this little girl was a neighbor's child that my sisters must have snuck in the house. When she opened the door, there was nobody inside the room. My mother nicknamed the little girl Jessie and I have no idea why. My mother had many experiences in the house and with the younger children, myself, my younger sister, and younger brother. When we were very small, it was as if we were playing with someone else. I don't remember this particular incident, but my mom did. But I do remember that in my oldest sister's bedroom in her closet, there was a paneled off section that led under her hallway steps to the second floor. I remember talking to someone that we called the lady under the stairs. I always thought that it was my mom or grandmother, but I later learned that that was not the case. When we told my mom about this, she would not let us play this game anymore. I do not remember being scared at all though. My younger sister and I would always go into our hallway and play with the lady on the stairs. I have very little recollection of this and at the time, I would have been about 4 years old and my sister would have been about 3. When we described the woman to my mother, she forbade us from being in the hallway alone. I never took the ghost stories to heart and was very carefree as a child. I always felt safe. However, I did finally have a bizarre experience that I could not explain or rationalize away. My grandmother had a stroke when I was 15 and my mother gave my older sister's bedroom to my grandmother since it was on the first level and safer for her. She had no control over what she was saying and was rapidly deteriorating. My parents did not lay any ground rules for us kids that summer as things were in havoc and my brother and I had stayed up all night watching Nick at night in the living room. I could see into my grandmother's room and we also kept an eye out for her should she use the bathroom or want something to drink. I was just starting to doze off when I thought I saw someone in my grandmother's room. It was a blonde haired girl who might have been 10 to 12. I have no idea the age. I thought I was just seeing things or that I was really wiped out and my mom's stories were starting to get to me. I walked out into our kitchen and my oldest sister was eating a sandwich and I told her what I saw. She laughed at me and told me I must have been dreaming. I thought maybe she was right because I just never believed what my mom had been saying about the girl she had claimed seeing on several occasions. 
Now here's where I realized that was not a complete nutcase. I said before that the house was very big. Well, my grandmother started screaming and my sister and I ran into the room. My grandmother was up and headed for the front door. She was screaming about fire and the little girl. We could barely make out what she was talking about. But she kept repeating the little girl said I was going to hurt the baby and I have to go before it caused a fire. That was the most intelligible sentence that my grandma had said in over a month. My sister kept saying what little girl? And my grandmother said clear as day, the little blonde haired girl. My grandmother was 72 years old and short of hearing. She was also three rooms away when I literally whispered this to my sister. We woke up my mom because we did not know what to do. My grandmother ran out of the house and refused to come back in. She stood on her porch. My parents took her to the hospital and she was placed in the nursing home because even the mention of our house sent her into hysterics. The baby she was talking about is my younger brother who is the baby in the family. My mom decided to turn the house into a one family home again and had us kids, there were six of us, do the work. We did not mind as we wanted to help and it was a good way for us not to think about my grandmother all the time. My younger sister and I would be the only two sharing a room, but that was fine with me as we were very close and we were excited. Again I was up and could not sleep, so I went up to the room that would be ours. It had been my grandmother's and I was scraping wallpaper off the walls with a putty knife. We had started this project the night before and I was bored so I went up to get some work done. I was scraping the walls and had been doing so for about a half an hour when I heard a funny noise sounding like the scraping noise I was making with the knife, but different. It's hard to explain. I thought someone was playing a trick on me, so I began to scrape the wall and very quickly I stopped. However, the sound that I heard continued and it was the sound of scraping, but it was coming from across the room. I don't know if whatever was in the room was mocking me or playing a game, but the scraping kept going on. Whoever or whatever did not care that I heard them. I screamed. I thought it was one of my older sisters. I ran down the front stairs and opened the door and the house was completely quiet. Everyone was sound asleep, snoring. I woke up everyone in the house. I was terrified and I never slept in that room. I would hear things in the house until I was 18 and moved out. As for our house restorations, my mother began working on the kitchen and back hallway that led to our attic. While doing so, she found where the house had burn marks and was scorched. My mother mentioned this to one of our neighbors, a woman who had lived on our street from the day she was born. In the early 1920s, our house had burnt very badly and had been rebuilt. At that time, it had been converted into a double. A little girl and her parents lost their lives in the fire. My other sisters had things happen to them too. One of my older sisters was looking out of the living room windows. Something grabbed her shoulder and called her name. One more thing. Please don't think I am nuts, but I have not had this happen to any house or apartment I have lived in since. And one thing I did notice was that whatever was in the house was not frightening to me in my youth, but only became frightening when each of us hit a certain age. Why? I have no idea. This was also something I thought that was weird. This little girl was never visible upstairs and the woman only was spotted downstairs once. The neighbor who was alive when the house caught on fire remembered that the little girl's name was Jessica. My mom had been calling her that for years and had never known what the little girl's real name was but had just called her that because it seemed right. I've been reading the stories on your site for a while now and decide to share experience of my own. I'm afraid it's not particularly exciting or dramatic, but I feel it's a good example of the attitude you need to take when dealing with spirits. I've been told on more than one occasion by people who claim psychic abilities that there are spirits present in my house. This really comes as no huge shock as the core of the house is a farmhouse that is over 120 years old. Although I've never seen a ghost myself, I am familiar with the sort of chilled feeling that people describe when they are in the presence of spirits. It is not truly the same feeling as normal reaction to temperature, but something that seems more internal and comes and goes independently of environmental changes. I have very commonly experienced this sensation, usually beginning before someone else remarks about their perception of something otherworldly. Several years ago, 
One summer morning, I'd come home in the early morning from working the night shift. I was getting undressed for bed and placed my bedroom door in a three-quarter closed position that I usually keep in to provide some cross ventilation. Let me explain that my bedroom is a rectangular room, approximately 10 foot wide by 16 feet long. There's a set of double windows in the far end of the room. My bed is crossways in front of the windows with the head on the longer wall. The door was on the other end of the room, and due to irregularities from different additions to the house, there was an approximate 4 inch step down when entering the room from the hallway. At the time of this incident, there was no central air in the house, so the only cooling method was to open windows. As I was getting ready for bed, I saw the door swing shut rather firmly from the three quarter position. At first, I dismissed this as just being the breeze as I was feeling a slightly chilled feeling on what was a rather warm morning. Even though I didn't really notice much in the way of the air current, I was very tired and somewhat groggy and only wished to get to bed as soon as possible. I put my door back into the position I had it in and went back to getting ready for bed. Almost immediately, the door swung shut again very firmly. Even though I really did not notice the breeze, the door swung quite freely on its hinges and I did not think much of the fact that it kept shutting. I then took one of my work boots the common style most everyone is familiar with that laces up about 9 inches above the ankle and placed it with the toe section underneath the door and the heel towards the doorway and repositioned the door to the 3 quarter position I wanted it to be in. Moments later, the door drug the boot across the carpeted floor and closed as far as it could with the boot in the way. Now at that point, I realized that there was certainly no breeze present that could exert that amount of force and the chill. I was experiencing was not the normal environmental kind, nor was it in any way cold enough that morning for me to be experiencing a normal chill. Now, I'm not a person who likes to have a sleep interfered with, nor do I particularly like to have my plants of any kind thwarted. Besides, all of my reading and conversations regarding the supernatural and hauntings have always indicated that you have to assert your rights to control your domain when challenged by spirits. With this in mind, I grabbed up a heavy, approximately 12 pound Thor hammer I had cast from aluminum years before in shop class and placed the head of it underneath the door, with the handle sticking up between the door and the doorway. Stepping back, I then witnessed the door drag this heavy hammer, approximately 12 pounds, across the floor the same way it had my boot, until again the door was as far shut as it could be without actually removing the hammer from underneath it. At that point, Becoming somewhat angry, I took the hammer out from underneath the door, placed the door into a two-thirds closed position, slightly more open than I really wanted, and waited. Within seconds, the door started to shut again. At this point, I pointed at the door and said loudly and firmly, no. The door stopped moving and stayed perfectly still. I stood there for a few moments longer watching the door and it did not move again. I then said thank you and went on to bed. I think it's important for people to understand that in most cases of encountering a spirit in your home, you simply have to assert your right to be the master of your home. I can't promise that it will always be the complete answer in all cases, but I believe it to be the best way to begin with dealing with a disagreement with a spirit in your home. Many years ago, my family and I lived in a lovely Queen Anne style home. We lived in it for 13 years, 11 of which we experienced paranormal phenomena. Two years after we moved in, we had our first of many odd occurrences. My daughter was in the kitchen and I was upstairs when I heard her call out that the upstairs toilet must have overflowed because water was running down the outside of the staircase. I ran to the top of the stairs in bare feet, only to feel water on the surface of the carpeting. I looked over the top of the railing to assure that the toilet hadn't overflowed and that was when I felt the wetness on my feet, but there were no water pipes in that part of the house. When I got down the stairs, I found water running in rivulets down the wooden molding. My daughter reached up to turn on the light under the stairway alcove and as soon as she did, the water stopped. We had to wipe the trom down and we never found any reason for that activity. Months later, while preparing for bed one night, I heard footsteps running down the attic stairs. The door crashed against the opposite wall, and then nothing. 
I was terrified thinking that someone was there. They would have to pass my room to get downstairs, but nothing happened. When we finally went to look, the door was against the wall. We even thought that maybe a ball had bounced down the stairs, sounding like footsteps, but there was nothing. Strangely, when we started to think our house had unseen guests, we were no longer frightened. As time passed, we had many more experiences. I heard a woman crying softly but pitifully. Two of my daughters saw images of old-fashioned children dressed in long white nightgowns and mob caps. A visitor to my house saw the same thing and asked me who the little girl was. On another occasion, my nephew was spending the night and thought he saw me standing at the top of the stairs in a long white old-fashioned nightgown and then supposedly, I went down the stairs and didn't come back. My nephew was 16 at the time and we hadn't told him about the house. My husband thought we were all crazy because he didn't believe in this sort of thing. My daughter came home late one night and was just lying in bed, going over her evening, and looked up to see a male figure suspended over the bed, and as she watched the image dissolve from the bottom up, as if it were sand falling. There were other things that happened there, although nothing dangerous, and finally, we sold the house and moved on. It was several years after we moved from the house that we met a family that had lived there years before we did and had very similar things happen to them, but they said their experiences were very frightening and mean-spirited. I sometimes think our guests moved in with us because from time to time, we still get very strange sensations in our present Victorian home. This is my own personal ghost story. This happened when I was about 12 years old, so keep in mind that 12 years have passed but as long as I live, I will never forget the details. Here goes. I was spending the night with a good friend of mine in a house that was extremely haunted. Stephanie lived in one of those houses that just seemed to be the epicenter of paranormal activity. Her aunt walked the basement steps, an unknown spirit lived in the attic, and there was a tree out back that just looking at it scared me to death. I'm really not entirely sure why the tree scared me so much, but it rocked me to the bone. It was large and had an ominous presence. Stephanie called it the witch tree, but really had no actual reason for doing so. But nevertheless, the tree is not my focus in the story. It just gives a little background information. We went to sleep that night, and about 2 a.m., I woke up with a start. I thought it was just because Steph and I had talked about ghost stories until we fell asleep, but then I had the feeling that I was being watched. I looked up and saw this large pair of blue eyes hovering over me. I know this sounds silly, but I'm dead serious. They just kept watching me. Maybe watching me is not the right word. They kept glaring at me, and all I could sense was evil. I felt so cold, and I couldn't wake Stephanie up. I thought I might have been dreaming, so I closed my eyes and laid there. But I looked up every few minutes and the eyes were still there. I had no clue what to do to make them go away. So I just started praying to God, something I saw in a movie, and never opened my eyes that night again. I woke up in the morning and told Stephanie about them. She had never seen them before, but didn't doubt me. She of all people knew the history of her house. I went on with life as normal, forgetting about the eyes until about two months later. Stephanie came to me and said she talked with her little brother Aaron, who was eight. She said she didn't even mention the eyes to him, but one night, they were talking about the house and he asked her if he had ever seen a large pair of blue eyes. She stopped dead in her tracks. Aaron said that to him the eyes were friendly and never glared at him. We just figured out that they saw me as a stranger and focused evil on me. I will never know for certain. All I know is that I never stayed in that house again. In addition to that story, my sister and I were out driving about 9 months ago. It was about 11 p.m. and we passed by Stephanie's old house. She no longer lived there, but I'm pretty sure that her father still did. I turned to Lauren, my sister, and said, Look, La, there's that creepy house. Now, this next part will sound so bizarre, but I swear it is true. All of a sudden, a light shot up from the house, which was completely dark, and two other lights shot up from the other side of the road. We thought they might just be electrical charges. That was, of course, until they started chasing the car. We had to get the mail down the road until they disappeared.
Do you have any idea what those lights might have been? Thank you for listening to my stories. Back in 1996, my Uncle Wayne passed away in a tragic auto accident on the interstate near Nina, Wisconsin, between Appleton and Oshkosh. He had been pulling a load of sod with a small pickup truck that he borrowed from a coworker. The truck must have been too small to carry the load because the truck flip killed my uncle instantly. Needless to say, my father flew out to Wisconsin from our home in Pensacola, Florida to attend the funeral of my youngest brother. My father is the oldest of seven children. The story I'm about to tell comes from the mouth of my father. The afternoon before the day of the funeral, my father took his mother and father to the funeral parlor to finalize their arrangements. On the way back to my grandparents' home, my grandmother noticed that her family ring was missing a stone. The stone that was missing was my uncle Wayne's birthstone. They looked everywhere for the stone and could not find it. Everyone kept saying it was Wayne's way of saying a final goodbye to his mother. The next day, the day of the funeral, everyone left my grandparents' house to go to the funeral except my uncle Stan. Stan stayed behind to wait for that cousin that was running late. A few minutes later, Stan heard a car pull into the driveway. At the bottom of the driveway was a car that looked exactly like Wayne's, a green Spitfire. My uncle Stan thought how strange it was that their cousin had a car exactly like Wayne's. His car was still parked outside his old apartment at the time. He looked out the window again and saw a man sitting in the driver's seat with a beard. My uncle Wayne had a beard when he died. My uncle Stan opened the door to walk outside, thinking it was their cousin who also has a beard. When he opened the door, the car reversed out of the driveway and quickly drove away. A few minutes later, their cousins pulled up in a totally different car. My Uncle Stan was so shocked that he told everyone at the funeral about what happened. Since this time, no one else had been visited by my Uncle Wayne. A year ago, we bought an old Victorian house. The family matriarch had refused to let it be sold, although it was in a dismal condition. When she passed away, the family decided to sell, although it had been with them for 80 years. We began the serious process of renovation, but I was disturbed by the obvious presence of an old woman, dressed in pink, always in the same place, in the same room. I naturally assumed it was the family matriarch, Sophia. She was so unhappy and seemed displeased at the disturbance we were causing, so I called in a psychic friend of mine to help her move along. The psychic rang bells, chanted, burned, and we put lit candles in all the doorways and windows. The very next day, it appeared that Sophia had gracefully moved on. A year passed. We finished the renovation and were preparing to throw an open house party. The day before the party, a woman came into the house and announced that she had grown up there. She said she had been coming by to check on her progress, but had always been shy to come in. Something had drawn her courage up to come in on that day. We were very pleased and immediately invited her and her family to come to the open house the very next day. They all came. At one point, I couldn't resist and I asked this woman if there had ever been ghosts in the house. Oh yes, she replied. My great grandmother was so persistent, we had to call in a priest to exercise her. Feeling confident, I then told her about Sophia. The woman began to tremble and cry. She said that her mother, Sophia, had always worn pink, and the room and place I described would have been between the beds and the children's room. Rest in peace, Sophia. Years ago, before I was born, my father was sleeping at the head of the bed, I believe, and my mother was at the foot by the window as there was no air conditioning, and the light was out, room dark. Well, my mother said all of a sudden, she heard what she believed to be a woman at the head of the bed, jabbering away, could not understand her at all. My mother got terrified and pulled the cover up over her head, and when she did, this thing came right by her ear and just talked. She was unable to make out what the thing was saying. She jumped up and yelled and slept for a week with the ceiling light on. She asked, and someone told her that they believed the house we used to live in had been moved from another location. Another true story. 
My mom used to walk me to grade school, about six blocks from the house, and she lost her house keys one day. Well, she traced her steps, even looked by the mailbox at the corner of her house, thinking that she laid them there. No keys. We lived upstairs, 16 feet up, and my dad was in front of the bedroom, and my mom was in my room, laying next to me, and the strangest thing happened. All of a sudden, I had the most peaceful feeling. This is a feeling that's kind of hard to explain, but I'll do my best. So, someone I don't know, it could have been an angel or a dead relative, who knows, but it was right next to the bed on my side and said my name. I was not scared at all, but my mom heard it too and jumped up. I had so many questions such as who are you, what are you doing, and how do you know me? But at the moment, the phone rang. And Sandy, who lived around the corner, was walking home from church on a Sunday and said, I found your keys. They were by the mailbox. I know this writing is all over the place, and I'm so sorry if this was hard to understand, but I think you guys got the gist of it. These things I can't explain are occurrences of the afterlife, in my opinion. My life has very been much like a horror film or a creepy horror novel, and recently, I began contemplating on a strange and creepy story I grew up with, one that really isn't talked about in my family anymore, and when we do speak about it, usually we joke around about it as an attempt to lighten the mood, when in reality, it is nothing to joke about. My sister is about five years older than me, and on a side note, I hope she doesn't get mad at me for telling this story, and for a time before I was born. She and my mother and father experienced strange occurrences in our former apartment complex. My sister saw the film E.T. and it didn't affect her in a negative way. She wasn't afraid of E.T. She enjoyed the movie and it didn't really impact her in any way other than the fact that she found it to be a good movie. Now, I'm not sure at what point my sister saw the movie, but I think it was at least a few years before the strange events began to occur. Sometime later, my sister began to act strangely. She would do very violent things for a child her age, throwing objects at people's heads and just all around really strange and violent stuff. Most of it is personal and I'm not going to get into it here. So at some point in time, my sister begins to talk about the being in her closet. She said the being talked to her and told her its name was E.T., that it was the same E.T. from the movie. This E.T. was the one who was telling my sister to do all those strange and violent things. My sister was bewildered. She was unsure what to think. At first, like most parents, she thought it was all in my sister's imagination. But then she began wondering about my sister's strange behavior over the past few months. One night, my mom decided to sleep with my sister in her bed. E.T. didn't come out and talk to everyone. But he did begin to shake my sister's bed while my mother was on it. It started slowly then violently. My mom always told me it was like something straight out of the exorcist. It really shook like one of those old hotel room beds. You know the ones? My mom jumped out of the bed, took my sister with her, and went to my dad's bedroom. Frightened, she explained the situation to my half-asleep father. Up to this point, my dad was very stern in his opinion on the matter. It was all part of my sister's childhood. She was just a kid, and this was all a part of her overactive imagination. But this time, my mom told my dad that if he didn't believe them, that he should sleep in that room by himself while my mother and sister slept in my dad and mom's bed. My dad accepted it, as she just wanted to get some sleep. Sure enough, the bed shook on him too, and needless to say, my father slept on the living room couch that night. A few weeks later, everything returned to normal, and my sister was once again sleeping in her bedroom by herself. So this part of the story I've decided to remove. Basically, sometime after things seemed to return to normal, my mom experienced something truly horrifying in my sister's room, and at some point, my parents complained about the apartment to their landlord, and the landlord allowed them to move into the vacant complex directly above and across from the current one. After that, the events ended. My sister apparently still acted out from time to time, 
but it was really just normal kid stuff. Nothing as violent as those times in the old apartment. The old apartment sat vacant for a while. Eventually, a small family moved in, and to my mother's horror, they had two young sons. My mom waited a few weeks for them to settle in. Then one day, while at the washing machines downstairs, I think that's where it was, my mom asked the new woman who had moved in how she was liking the apartment. She had no complaints, but she found it strange that her younger son suddenly had an imaginary friend, and he claimed that this friend's name was E.T. And the funny thing about this was that the boy had never seen the film and had no idea E.T. the extraterrestrial even existed. This part of the story is where it gets fuzzy. As I said earlier, it's been a long time since my family and I have spoken of this story. Eventually, the boy stopped talking to E.T., but I'm not sure how long it was before he did. The family moved out of that apartment, but I don't recall how long it was. It may have been a few years. I think the family may have had a priest bless the place, but I'm not 100% certain. And eventually, my sister got a new bed, and that was when my parents found out where the bed had really come from. They had known that the bed came from my dad's parents' attic, but what they didn't know was that someone that my dad's parents had known had passed away on it. The person had died of old age, aka natural causes, but still one can't help but wonder if it had anything to do with the events. Maybe the bed was some sort of catalyst for what took place. The apartments we lived in weren't exactly old, and my family wasn't into the occult or anything like that. One theory my mom has is that maybe whomever lived in that apartment before us was into the occult and had invited some entity into the location. My sister was but a child, and we all know the theories around children and the paranormal, not to mention the bed someone died on, whether related or coincidence. Another theory is that something from my grandparents on my mom's side home had attached to her, but that's another story for another time. Thank you for reading. I have had one experience where a type of demonic entity descended on a lady battling alcoholism. This lady told me point blank that this demonic came up out of her deceased uncle at the funeral she was attending. The uncle was also an alcoholic and had battled the disease most of his life. Her family backed her story, relating that the uncle had often spoke of this demonic being. The lady was terrorized for nearly two years and eventually gave up the addiction. The family gave a long list of family members who had battled this creature and the disease. The belief was that when one family member died, it simply found another victim to adhere to. It took the form of a bat-like creature with an old man's very small head and face. I spent a great deal of time with this lady and did believe what she told me. This woman was as about as tough as they come, but she would break down and cry every time she related the story. Right, let's start this off with the traditional I'm not crazy bit. On the 7th of April 2014, I decided to take my routine shower of the day. However, while I was in the shower, I kept feeling like I was being watched. We have three mirrors in the bathroom, and I swear I saw a dark figure. No facial features or any clothing, just a solid human-like figure passed through each mirror. It was not tall or anything, and it looked about average height. And I kept telling myself, you are not here for me. You are not here for me. And the figure just vanished. Since the 7th, I have not seen it again. On the 9th of April 2014, my wife's father, who seemed in very good health, had a massive heart attack and suddenly passed away. His passing was so shocking that no one believed that he passed away. I personally feel that that figure was somehow involved. Fast forward to today, the 21st of April, 2014. I was sitting in the lounge, and a picture we framed of my wife's father suddenly fell over. The reason why I am so freaked out about the picture falling over is due to the fact that we positioned it in such a way that it would not even move if the wind picked up. To add to the freakiness of the picture falling over, this evening, my wife asked me to make her and my daughter a cup of tea. 
I already had the kettle boiling and the tea bags in the cup. However, I reached for the sugar and placed it on my right hand side. I then opened the cupboard to grab an extra cup for myself and the lid on the sugar suddenly popped off the container and landed next to the kettle, which is also impossible as they are generally slipped on lids. My wife said it could have just been compressed air, but it gets open and closed multiple times throughout the day. If there is anyone that knows what the hell is happening, some insight would be amazing. I'm not a nut job or anything. I'm just very freaked out. I told my wife about this and she said that I may be open to things like this. In the past, I used to have really bad nightmares, but they stopped once we placed a bit of holy water in the room. I've not had any nightmares in around five years. However, over the past few months, they have started again. Anyway, I will end things off here. Any help would be much appreciated. Thanks for reading. When I was 16 or 17, I woke up to a symbol written on my mirror. I'm 37 years old now, but the question of what it was or where it came from still haunts me. The memory pops into my mind occasionally from time to time. Today, I thought of it for the first time in several years. And for the first time, it occurred to me that I might be able to find answers on the internet that weren't available when it happened. The symbol wasn't something that the steam in the shower made visible. I woke up one morning after thoroughly cleaning my room the day before. Both parents are ex-military. When I say thorough, what I mean is completely spotless and looked up from my pillow to see it. Strangely, my eyes went right to it. It was like my subconscious knew it was there, but consciously, I had no idea how it got there. I was not scared. I was at a point in my life where I had felt most secure in my own spirituality. To explain, I identified with Native American spirituality because it was the closest thing to natural to me, but I hate labels. At the time, and even now, I felt an odd familiarity with rocks, trees, and the wind. Not animals so much, but I do like birds, rocks especially. I know this sounds freaking insane, hence why I never bothered to explain it to people. It's just how I polarized. I wasn't scared, but I wasn't sure what it was. I told my sister about it. She saw it, but I smudged it away. I assumed there would be no defining it, and I tried to rationalize it by telling myself I probably put it up in my sleep, but it looked like it was drawn with clear wax or chapstick, and there wasn't any in my room. But has anyone ever seen anything like this before? I would love to hear them if so. I've been dealing with addiction, and it seems to directly correlate with the strange phenomenon I've experienced over and over. Every time I engaged in this particular addiction, I would begin to experience strange, scary, and even threatening phenomenon. I could go on forever about all the experiences I've had if someone were interested, but I'm fairly certain that I would be deemed insane. For now, let's just say that I hear voices that sometimes give me information that I have never heard of, but I Google it and there it is. I began to use a recorder. Will an iPad app to record some of this? I have heard whistling so clear and realistic that I have searched my house inside and out, as well as set up cameras. To my surprise, I captured the whistling on my recorder. My wife heard it, but just denies anything out of the ordinary due to the fear of actually conceiving the possibilities. Also, I have two small dogs. On occasions, I could strongly feel a presence. My dogs jumped up from their beds and start sniffing and acting anxious. Once I sat down and used an app that measured EMF and it suddenly showed giant calculations and my dogs actually got up and run in front of me wagging their tails and sniffing the floor like I had thrown treats out to them. There is plenty more information that has no explanation but is backed up by actual findings. If anyone wants to hear more, let me know. Meanwhile. I have made it clear that I stand my ground and I am no longer afraid, but I do have a real situation on my hands. This event happened when I was maybe three years old. 
My mom was cleaning around the house when I came out of my room and asked her to come to the bathroom with me because I had the potty and there's a man in there. So she went with me and she couldn't see anyone, but she asked me to describe the man. I told her the man was a policeman. She asked me what color his uniform was because she knew the colors worn by the different law enforcement agencies. There's sheriff department, local police, and highway patrol, of course. Before I was born, I should note that my mother had been a dispatcher and deputy for the sheriff's department where we lived in Northern California. I said the man's uniform was tan, which meant highway patrol. As we left the bathroom, I pointed into my bedroom and said, there's another one in there. I described how the men had been shooted with a shoot gun, one in the elbow and stomach, one in the knee, as well as other places. I don't remember exactly where, unfortunately. From the fact that two murdered CHP officers appeared to be hanging around in her house, my mom knew who they had to have been. After all, she didn't know very many people who had been murdered. I'm not writing their names because I don't know if there could be an illegal fallout from doing so. I can't think why there would be, but just to be on the safe side. Some time passed and my mom told the story to a friend of hers who still worked for the sheriff's department. The fact that one officer had been shot in the elbow was one of the details that was withheld from the public as the cops investigated the crime. Even my mother hadn't known about that. But because of that, she was able to confirm her guess about the identities of the dead officers. On December 22nd, 1978, the two officers, one of them, a friend of my mother's, had made a vehicle stop on a stolen car. The driver somehow managed to get control of their weapons, shot one in the knee and one in the elbow, disabling them, and killed both of them with their own service revolvers. The officers were not expecting a fight and were caught off guard, and theirs was the only CHP car in the county that night, due to state-mandated cutbacks and nightmare patrols. At the time I saw the ghosts, the case would have been just going to trial. The Murdered Family I lived in an old two-story house. I did not like it there. I just felt like there was a presence watching me in my bathroom and room. By the way, the house is made of wood. I see just for a second a shadow running across the room and, the, and into the bathroom. All my stuff is misplaced all the time. It's frightening. So I did some research and found out a horrible murder took place here. A family of three was murdered here in the room and bathroom. It seems that the father of a poor family made an enemy of a mean neighbor. One day, the father humiliated the neighbor in front of a town not far from the house. The neighbor was, of course, very mad. At night, the neighbor snuck into her house. He grabbed a knife and slit the father's throat in the same bed I sleep in. His son came in there wondering what the noise was all about. When he saw his father dead, he screamed. The scream woke the mother. The neighbor cut the boy in the chest and killed him. The mother fled to the bathroom and locked the door. When the killer got in, he stabbed the mother repeatedly. There was blood all over the place. The neighbor was scared, so he committed suicide. When I told my parents, they were shocked. So one week later, we moved to Texas. I'm glad I am out of that house. But it was pretty interesting. I was 15 then, and now I'm 31. Murdered Friend is still about. I find it strange that I'm sharing a story that is so personal to me, but I would just like to get some understanding from it. I come from Manhattan, and I'm still currently living there. It starts from 2002 when my father, brought up in the Bronx, but moved to the Upper East Side, decided to give back to his community, since it has, he says, made him who he is today. He set up a graffiti club, as I should put it, where kids in rougher neighborhoods could come off and get off the streets and express their emotions through their art. It was pretty successful, 
some trouble here and there, but overall it went pretty great. I decided to go of course, and I befriended some people who, if it wasn't for the club, I would never have thought they'd be friends with me. Cut the long story short, I really got on with Jay. Jay, not his real name, but for privacy's sake, with whom I could have so many laughs with. Tragically, in early 2003, he was shot down in Harlem, where he came from. It was a tragic blow to the club and me personally. It affected me more than I could ever explain. It hurts and still does now just to think about him. I visited the spot a few weeks later. I bent down and cried with my head in my hands. As I did, I felt a hand on my shoulder, and I heard a laugh, then a mumble I will never even make out myself. But I think it sounded like, don't cry about me or something. I thought I was a respectful person, yet seconds later when I stood and turned, nobody was there. I wasn't frightened, I just assumed it was someone who walked off fast. Driving back home, still crying, I stopped at a light. I wiped my eyes and looked out the driver's window at some girls playing double dutch. On the steps of the building beside them, I could have sworn I saw Jay. I was so convinced that I shouted his name. The kids were bewildered at who I was shouting at, and the man I saw didn't even look towards me. His eyes just stayed fixated somewhere over the top of the car. I drove off fast, sure that I was going crazy. It wasn't until the club stopped in 2005 that strange things happened once again. As I prepared food in the kitchen, my music player blasted a Tupac song. I think it's called Hold Your Head. It was an album from the Don Kilimnati, the Seven Day Theory, which Jay persuaded me to buy, but I'd never listened to it since the day I'd buy it. This overwhelming feeling of happiness came over me, even though I knew I should be scared as for how a CD had got out of my bedroom closet into the stereo in my living room and then played by itself. I walked into the living room, smiling and silently laughing, and then I heard a laugh, very loud, coming from by the hallway. I then became scared, even though I was so familiar with that laugh. I just stood there burst into tears, and that feeling, that gutted feeling I felt all those years ago. That night, as I got into my bed, my bedroom door opened. Thinking it was my cat, I got up and closed it, of course. Now this is the part that I find so unbelievable and disturbing to think about. Halfway down the hallway, a figure stood, just dark, with no features at all. It stood directly in front of a picture Jay and another kid had created. For about a minute I stood there bewildered, too scared to move staring at the figure that barely moved. Then I just slammed my door, ran to my bed like a child. Since then I've never seen anything like that, but sometimes I don't feel alone in my home and channels on TV have the tendency to switch to certain music channels. I've never told anybody except my best friend and my father. On here, I'm hoping people are more open-minded and help me understand what happened. Even though I never believed in the paranormal, I really do think Jay is around me at times, which makes me feel so happy to know. It really does scare me the idea of a ghost, but if it is of Jay, I know he's only there to joke around and just see if I'm okay. But I can't help thinking that people become ghosts on Earth because they are stopped from going into the afterlife. Because they have some unfinished business to attend to? Thank you for allowing me to share the story, which has been bothering me for so long. The Ghost Girl in the Mirror This is a true story that happened when I was around 11 years old. It is so far the only ghost experience I have ever had, but it is one of the scariest moments ever. I was in middle school and this whole experience occurred. We have two bathrooms for girls and boys, the downstairs bathrooms and the upstairs ones. Everyone knows about the upstairs girls bathroom. The reason is whenever you go in there, you always feel really weird, feels cold, and basically just gives you a feeling of distortion. 
because I was with the older students. All our classes were upstairs. So if we needed the toilet, we had to use the upstairs ones. Anyway, one lesson, I needed to go really bad. I had no choice but to use the bathroom upstairs. I walk into the girls' bathroom and immediately get that familiar sense of disorientation. I rush into the cubicle, all the while feeling this freezing cold energy, despite it being a lovely warm day. My heart was pounding. The feeling of panic was rising. I just wanted to get out of there quickly. I opened the cubicle door and headed for the sinks. Even though I was terrified, I was still a freak about germs. I quickly washed my hands and glanced at the mirror in front of me. My heart literally stopped. My eyes went wide. In the mirror's reflection, I kid you not, was a young girl right beside me. She was turned to the left, making a clapping gesture with her hands and eyes closed. I only saw her for about two seconds before I shot out of there, screaming. I assure you, I was the only one in there the entire time. The bathroom door is a very large one. You can certainly hear it if someone comes in or leaves. When I first entered, the room was empty and all the cubicle doors were swinged open. So I am positive nobody was in there but me. Besides, when I left the cubicle, it was still empty. I only saw this girl in the reflection. I never went to that bathroom again and now I moved up to high school. My friend has a familiar experience in the same bathroom, but that's for another day. In January 2000, we lost my dad because of a doctor's error during surgery. As we were all very close to him, this all hit us particularly hard. I decided to move back with my mom. I was 24 at the time, and I took care of her. I've been with her ever since. It has now been nearly seven years since his death. Before my dad died, I didn't believe in anything paranormal. I believed in what I learned at church, but I did not believe in ghosts or hauntings, even though I had experienced a few unexplicable things myself. I brushed them all off as weird phenomena, but nothing to concern myself with, and certainly nothing to change my views about, until spring 2005. When my dad passed away, we began having trouble with people messing around the house. There were a few things stolen from my dad's work building, and there were three batteries stolen right from the vehicles while mom and I watched out a window after placing a frantic phone call to the police. The police didn't show up until some time later, and by then, the burglars were gone. Occurrences of this nature would happen time and time again. Spring 2005, I was up late one night, 1 a.m. or later studying for finals in my bedroom. Everything was quiet and dark. The only light on in my house was in my bedroom. We lived in a very rural area, so when it gets dark and quiet, it really gets dark and quiet. I was engrossed in my studying when my dogs began barking. I sighed, realizing that someone was probably out there, but there was really nothing I could actually do about it since we lived so far away from a police station. They had already stolen most of everything of any value, and they never had tried to get in the house before, so I went back to studying. I'd become engrossed in my studying to the point that I didn't even really notice the dogs barking anymore, when suddenly, my bedroom filled with the overwhelming scent of my dad's cologne. But it wasn't just the smell of the cologne. You know how different perfumes and clothes smell different on different people because of differentiating body chemistries? Well, this was my dad wearing the cologne. I looked up, fully expecting to see him, but nothing was there. The scent was getting stronger and stronger. It was then that I noticed the urgent pitch of the dogs barking and growling and the rustling coming from outside underneath my bedroom window. There was someone out there. Suddenly. Daddy sent centered at the window beside the bed where I was working and seemed to become malevolent. Don't ask me how I know this, I just do. It's like the air seemed to crackle. It was then that I heard someone running away breakneck from the house without even bothering to try to be quiet. The atmosphere in the room suddenly went from malevolent to peaceful and Daddy sent lingered for a moment and then was gone. I'm not sure how I feel about it, 
but I can't deny it. I would like to think that he's still here, watching over those he loves. It made me feel very safe and taken care of. Not once did I feel one bit of fear over the scent in my room. Thanks for reading. I have yet another story to tell. I guess I am susceptible to spirits and apparitions, as I've had other encounters with loved ones who have passed. This one was my very first encounter. I was going through a very bitter divorce. Being only 28 and afraid to be alone with two very little boys, I didn't know which end was up, so to speak. It was in the summer. I had my two babies bathed and in bed. I decided to lay on the sofa and watch some television. I fell asleep. A pretty deep sleep at that. I was awoken by the static of the television. The station had gone off the air for the night. My baby of 10 months old had the bedroom right off of the living room. The sofa was facing his room, and he was sleeping soundly. I had a habit of keeping all of the bedroom doors open at night so that if one of my sons cried, I would hear them. All of a sudden, the living room got so cold, like a very damp chill. A glowing light appeared at the doorway of my baby's room. Then a figure appeared, a woman, in a long white dress, in dark hair. Her hair was up in an upsweep, but I couldn't make out her face. Her face was blurry, and I just couldn't see it at all. I was shocked, couldn't move, mind racing and heart pounding like crazy. I sat up on the sofa and just stared at this figure in the doorway of my baby's room. Then she spoke, only a few words, but she spoke. She said it will be alright. Then she vanished into thin air. That damp chill vanished along with the apparition. I was so shaken by this not knowing who it was or what it was about. I eventually calmed down and put it out of my mind. A few days later, my mom and dad came up for a visit. They loved their grandbaby so much, they came to visit several times a week. We were sitting at the table in the kitchen, just chatting about anything and everything. That's when I thought of the strange happening I experienced a few nights before. I told my folks about what had happened and described the figure that I saw that night to my parents. I mentioned too how cold and damp it got in that room that night and how the chill went away when the figure went away. My dad sat there, looking at me with the eyes of dinner plates and had a stunned look on his face. I asked him if he was okay. He said that he was, but he knew who that figure was. I asked him who that could have been, and he said it was his mother. He was only 7 when his mother died. She was only 34 years old. She died a week after her ninth child was born. She had all of her children in the farmhouse where her and my grandfather lived. Dad used to sit at his desk in a one-room schoolhouse and look out at her grave. The cemetery was right next door to the schoolhouse. I asked him how he knew it was his mother. He said the way I described her, wearing a long white dress and the color and style of her hair. Her hair was dark and always in an upsweep, but this part is what really convinced me that he was right. He told me that she would always use that expression, it will be alright to him and his brothers and sisters when things didn't go quite right. He said he just knew it was her. He said she was comforting me and telling me that everything would get better. I was quite amazed, not only by the fact that I never saw my grandmother, but how she came to visit me in my times of need. I never had any other encounters with her after that visit, though I felt a calmness inside of me and felt somehow closer to her after that hot summer night. Thank you for reading my story. I hope you enjoyed reading it. I had visited my mother on Monday afternoon, after she and I had a disagreement on the Saturday before. She had called me on the Saturday afternoon and told me she needed to come to her house. I lived in the country at the time, and she lived about 10 miles from me. I had just been in town with my youngest two sons for baseball practice. I also had just taken my only transportation to the shop to have new tires put on, so I had no vehicle to take me anywhere for the day. Our conversation escalated into an argument quickly, and I ended up hanging up the phone after she had not stopped her insistence that I come to her house immediately. 
She was never this insistent over me coming to pick up some fresh veggies she had gotten from her early garden. On Sunday, I was stubborn, and though I could have gone in to visit all day, I stayed at home. On Monday, I'd taken off work a little early to go to school to watch my sons in a spring sports day. I had about 45 minutes after the sports events before they would be out of school and I went to see my mother. We talked and our argument from Saturday was completely forgotten. She and I talked about all three of my sons. My oldest is 8 years older than my younger and 10 years older than my youngest, so he was in college and doing well. She told me that she had some problems with asthma lately, but she wasn't going to let it get the best of her. I told her she should really go to the doctor because asthma might not be something to ignore. She said she would be fine. On Tuesday morning, around 2 o'clock, I got a phone call that they were on their way to the hospital with her. I got up, dressed quickly, and drove into the hospital. About 20 blocks from the hospital, I was at a spotlight and thinking that I could run the light because I was the only car around. When I had a warm and comforting feeling fill me, Something told me to take it easy. She was okay and in heaven. Really, it was such a grateful feeling of peace. I got to the hospital, and I knew for sure the way the receptionist at the ER desk met me, that she was gone. In the next week after the adjustments, I'd driven my sons to school and was on my way to work. There are some industrial sites at a cross street right before a spotlight, and it can get busy and bottled up. Also, there's a hill going down in the direction of where I was headed. I again felt a warm presence and felt her hand on my arm. Her voice said, Vicky, look up. Far enough ahead of me was a tractor trailer truck crossing over my lane into the side street. I had been in deep thought about so much, but had plenty of time to slow down very preventively, not to have any problems with the truck. She has been with me many times since then, and it is always such a warm, loving feeling. In her life, she dismissed ghosts and paranormal things as if she didn't think it was real. I have no idea if she has ever been with any of my four sisters or my brother, but she has definitely been with me. Thanks for reading. When I was about four years old, I answered the front door. We had one of those bells that was a knob you would turn on the outside. There, in bright daylight, stood a woman dressed in all pale yellow, in a long dress and matching, colored big brimmed hat. This occurred in the 1950s, around 1959. I let her in. She asked for my mother. I told her I didn't know where she was. She was illuminated. I thought by the sunlight coming through the glass of the front windows and doorway, I was only about four years old. Not frightened by her, but... Rather, I was fascinated and mesmerized. I followed her into our living room. She proceeded to sit on the antique empire couch and kept asking where my mother was, and she seemed very concerned that I was left all by myself at a very young age. After what may have been an hour or so, she got up from the couch and said to me, Tell your mother that Ada said it was very beautiful and don't be afraid. She then got up, walked to the front door with me following her, and left. When my mother came home, I told her about the lady in yellow named Ada and related her message. My mom almost fainted and fell down on the same spot where Ada sat. She asked me in a very unnerving voice, are you sure she said she was Ada? To which I said yes. Then she said, my cousin Ada just died a few days ago. At my age then, thankfully, I feared nothing. Ghosts were not in my brain tank, so to speak, until about seven years later. I was up in our attic. It was a very old house, looking for stuff to wear for Halloween, and came across the same dress Ada had worn when she showed up as a ghost many years before. It was a dress that had actually belonged to her from when she was young in the early 1900s. Also had a run-in when I was 19 years old. Old same house, with a sea captain. I was lying in my bed daylight and I was not asleep, just relaxing. Suddenly, I felt someone was there, next to me, and no one but me and my mom were home. My mom was downstairs watching TV. So, very reluctantly, I slowly looked to my left, and there, standing, 
was a tall man dressed in a blue uniform with brass buttons with anchors on them. He had no face, just like TV static for a face, but the rest of him was visible. He reached out a huge hand to me and said, don't be afraid, I only want to touch your blonde hair. It took me a while to not have a heart attack until I found my voice. I screamed to my mom. She came running upstairs. I told her what happened and she said, you just had a bad dream. I explained to her I wasn't asleep. I knew what I saw and I was very frightened. She then told me that my most male ancestors on her side of the family were sea captains and some were lost at sea. She assured me that he didn't want to hurt me, but he almost killed me from fright. I've also had animal ghost visits, and those were of course sad, but that's a whole nother story. Didn't want to bore you. You may now go to sleep. Thanks for reading. I've decided after about a month or two of wandering around your site that I'll add my own story. I noticed your last update was in 2003 or so, therefore I'm not expecting immediate posting of my tale. Keep in mind, this is the first time I've ever written the story out, so excuse me if I digress or repeat myself. In other stories that I've read, I've noticed people apologizing for extensive background information, so here's my apology slash disclaimer. There's a serious pity me I've had a hard life story involved that needs to be told before the actual ghost story can be understood. Feel free to skip over it, but don't expect to get the whole situation if you do. Oh, and may I add that I'm not completely looking for sympathy or anything. So that being said, here goes. When I was 14, I was living in a predominantly African American suburb in Illinois. My best friend and I seemed to be the only white teenagers around. Something started one night when someone called my friends, let's call her Jen's cell phone. The number showed up on Jen's caller ID as private number, and Jan answered, thinking it might be her parents calling from the restaurant they had gone to, but the other person on the other end started ranting about how Jen was a slutty person and a nasty whore. The caller proceeded to tell Jen that she should just kill herself and get it over with adding that if Jen didn't commit suicide, the call on her friends would hunt her down and slaughter her. Jen told the girl to grow up and hung up the phone. She was obviously and understandably shaken up, but she had the sense to star 69 to call. She wrote down the number and informed her parents of the incident when they returned. The next day, Jen's father, being the military man he is, called the number. No one picked up, so he and Jen headed to the police station. The police force in that town was also predominantly black, and when Jen stated that she thought the caller was black because of the way she spoke, the officer behind the desk gave her a dirty look and said he'd look into it and call her in the morning. She never heard from him. Then again, she never got another threatening phone call either. About a month later, Jen and I were walking back to her place from a convenience store about 9 o'clock at night when we heard something walking behind us. We turned around and there was this black girl following us. We didn't recognize her from anywhere and yet she started screaming the most obscene things I've ever heard directed at Jen. To this day, and I'm 20 now, I've never heard such awful things come out of a human being's mouth before. This girl, who looked to be about our age, told Jen, I told you to just kill yourself. I warned you that I'd get you if you didn't. She then stabbed my best friend in the stomach and chest. I was frozen with fear and shock, but I finally jumped on the girl and started punching her with such fury and animal rage that she backed off and ran, but in the scuffle, she slit my arm pretty badly and took off. I started to chase her, intending to tackle her to the ground, not knowing if I wanted to hold her down until someone came to help or if I wanted to just kill her for hurting my best friend. But I quickly decided that Jen needed me. So I went to Jen, ripped my t-shirt off, wrapped it tightly over her wounds, and told her to hang on. I ran back to the store we had just left, in my bra, which made the most horrifying moment of my life also the most embarrassing, and begged to use the phone. I called the police and explained what had happened and where we were. Then I darted back to Jen, ignoring the blood dripping onto my jeans and the pain in my forearm. 
I sat there with Jen's head in my lap, pressing the shirt against her injuries, telling her I loved her and everything would be okay and that the police said they'd be there with the ambulance as soon as possible. It wasn't soon enough. Jen died in the ambulance. The stab wound to her chest punctured her left lung. She suffocated before even reaching the hospital. I didn't find out until the next morning. It was two summers later that I saw her. My family moved to New Jersey soon after the incident, thinking a change of scenery would help me forget. Wrong. Our new home was down the street from a conservation area, where I liked to go and relax on nice days. There was one specific spot that I liked. There was a neat little clearing where just enough sunlight came through the thick trees and there was a fallen tree that I'd sit on to read or write or whatever. On the other side of the clearing though, there was a spot I wasn't too fond of. There were six saplings, taller than I, forming a triangle. I never had a positive vibe from that area. It just felt wrong, not like the rest of the clearing, where I felt peaceful and relaxed. If I walked through those trees, I'd have this overwhelming urge to burst out in tears and hurt something. I never knew why until one day, I was sitting on my tree, smoking a cigarette and reading Shakespeare when that angry, depressing feeling came over me. The feeling I only got from that triangle of young trees. I ignored it and kept reading, but it grew and grew until I felt like I'd choke on it. So I looked up at the triangle and waited. For what? I had no idea. There was a little smoke coming up from the leaves on the ground, but I wrote that off as lit cigarettes someone had thrown. Then again, since I'd been there for quite a while and hadn't seen anyone around, how could someone have thrown a cigarette in there? So I shrugged it off and kept reading. Then I heard leaves rustling and the feeling of deep depression intensified. There was no wind. The trees were not swaying. My hair wasn't blowing, but leaves were moving. I raised my head and saw only leaves being pressed into the ground, as if an invisible person were walking across them, and they were coming towards me. Needless to say, I booked it out of there and sprinted home. That night, I woke up unable to breathe, with a searing pain in my stomach. I turned the light on, and just as I did, I caught a glimpse of those familiar blue icy eyes I knew and loved. My best friend. After a few minutes, the stomach pain went away, and I caught my breath and turned the light only to see those eyes again and feel presence on my bed like someone sitting down. I felt like she was sitting there watching me. The corners turned up a little, and something cold touched my cheek. I realized then that the angry slash depressed feeling I often got was flashing back to the emotions I had the night she was killed. Angry at the killer and myself, and so very depressed that the best friend I'd ever had was taken away from me. And the pains I had moments before were the same feeling she had when she was taking her last gasp of air. I suddenly felt overpoweringly tranquil. She was here, and she was not angry with me. I miss you, I said, and went back to sleep. Nothing has happened since, and it's been three years. I think she's watching over me every day now, except I know it's her, not by a feeling of extreme sadness, but by the overwhelming urge to smile and make the most of my day. Thank you for reading. I know this was heavy-hearted, but I appreciate you sticking through to the end. Thank you so much. It happened when I was a kid, maybe seven or eight years old, but I remember what I saw vividly. My little sister and I were ready to go to bed. At that time period, we always slept on the couch together in the living room. Living in an old farmhouse that was heated by a wood stove, the upstairs got a bit cold to sleep in, and we didn't have the luxury of electric blankets back then, so therefore we slept downstairs in the living room. I remember my dad saying goodnight and turning off the light, and I closed my eyes. I opened them again a few seconds later because I hadn't heard my dad leave to go to bed yet. I was wondering why. I assumed that he would still be standing there, but when I opened my eyes, he wasn't there, and neither was my sister who previously was awake. She was sound asleep. Maybe I had somehow fallen asleep without noticing, but I don't think so. 
In our living room, there was a door with glass that led to the closed-in porch, and the door was what I could see if I looked up while I was lying on the couch. That night, I looked up and saw a glowing form of a man sitting at the table on the porch. You couldn't really see anything other than his outline, and he didn't glow brightly, just sort of dimly, as if he was made out of shapeless glowing fog. As I saw him, he turned and looked straight at me. He had no face, just the same glowing fog. I was terrified and hid my face under the blankets. I kicked my sister awake. She wasn't very happy with me. Still not looking back up, I asked her if she saw it. She said she didn't and that I should go back to sleep. I convinced her to get up and investigate, and she got up, looked around, and found nothing. Years later, I told the story to my sister, asking if she remembered it. She said yes, and then asked me if she had ever told me about the time when she had seen a ghost. I hadn't. She then told me that one night she woke up in the middle of the night and heard the TV flashing on and off. Thinking her parents were still awake, she walked into the living room. What she saw was the TV turning on and off by itself. There was no one in the room. She looked over to the couch to find the remote, to turn it off, and that's when she saw it. A ghost sitting and floating over the couch. She said it felt like she had spent hours looking at it. As soon as it turned and looked at her, she felt panicked and quickly ran and went back to bed. When she looked at the time, a minute had not yet passed since she had got out of bed. She didn't tell anyone about what had happened until years later. When she told me this, I asked her what her ghost had looked like. She then described the exact same glowing ghost that I had seen. The creepy thing is that I had never told her what the ghost I had seen looked like, just that I had seen one. Our continued conversation revealed that many details of our stories matched up. Another Glowing Encounter I haven't been around for a while. I've been so busy it's hard to get free time. But finally, I can share another experience that I had just a few nights ago. It's winter here and it's really getting cold out, especially at night. So I bundle up and sit in my car to stay warm whenever I go out for a smoke. This night was odd. I was the only one outside that I could see. It was late and dark out and nothing but the street lights to illuminate the parking lot. Everything was fine during my smoke. I finished it, turned off my car, and started walking back towards the dorm. I take a glance up at the smoke pit, up the small hill, and see no one out there. So I look back ahead for only a second. But in that second, I suddenly felt a presence. And I immediately looked up back at the smoke pit. And I see this hazy figure on top of one of the tables. It looked like someone wearing a hoodie and sitting cross-legged on the table. But he was completely see-through. I could see the road behind him and the grassy hills that led to the base housing area. And the lights from the streets were glowing right through him. Yet they seemed dim in the haze of this figure. What freaked me out the most was that his eyes were very distinct. And they were glowing a very bright white. The figure just stared at me. And I stopped dead in my tracks staring at him. I don't know why, but I could not move at all. Finally, after what felt like hours, but it was only a few minutes, the figure began to slowly fade away until it was completely gone. I felt like I was released from some invisible chain, and I could move again, and I ran back to my dorm room and made sure everything was locked. I've been seeing strange things all my life, and I understand that this weird ability can cause spirits to be attached to me. Most of the time, I just ignore it, but sometimes there are those moments that I am petrified and I can't even explain why. I will say this though, 
This is the first time I have ever seen a figure with glowing white eyes. I've seen red, blue, and a strange haze of purple, but never bright white. Has anyone else seen something like this before? Thank you for reading. Creepy story number three. When I was seven years old, my mother, my brother, and I lived in a small three-bedroom house in a nondescript little town in West Central Illinois. I'd been aware of the paranormal for quite some time, as we live in a house that in the 1800s has been something like an abortion center. A summer after my birthday, my grandmother bought me and my younger half-sister a glow-in-the-dark Muppet shirt that were too big for us, so instead we used them as nightshirts. I loved this shirt and wore it all the time. That fall though, after the leaves had fallen off the trees, I remember because I looked out the window. I became scared from that shirt for life. I had fallen asleep lying in my usual spot. I had a small bedroom with a bunk bed and I slept on the bottom bunk, my head in line with the window, but on the far side of the bed, a twin size mattress that is. I remember waking up mentally, realizing that Bluey, my stuffed rabbit, had fallen off the bed. I had an attachment issue to him, so it was really a big deal. Still, I didn't open my eyes because I felt as though somebody was watching me. I remember through my eyelids, a bright green light and the same color as my shirt. I figured it was just my shirt, but I still wanted to make sure, of course. I pulled the covers over my head and opened my eyes. I hadn't looked at my shirt yet, but I remember the light was definitely coming from the other side of my blankets. I looked down and was shocked, only to realize my shirt was plain white. No Muppets, no glow in the dark, just a plain white t-shirt. Without removing the covers, I took the shirt off and checked all sides of it. There was still nothing there. I pulled the shirt back on, sat up, and yanked the covers down over my head so I could see. There, sitting at the end of my bed, was a young boy, maybe seven or eight years old. He had pale hair and dark eyes and honestly looked a lot like myself. We stared at each other for a few minutes. There was a smug look about him as he stared at me in a rather cool way. And I looked at him with what I'm sure horror mixed with curiosity. Horror because I knew he wasn't human. And curiosity because on his impish little body was my Muppet's shirt pattern. My Muppets were glowing at me from his spectral body and they seemed scary at that point. I tried screaming for my mom, but my throat was tight, almost like I was paralyzed or mute. I can only describe it by saying it was like I was going to cry, but never did. After what seemed like an eternity, the spirit boy crawled over to me, his hands making little indentations on the bed as his weight shifted forward and he sat on his knees in front of me between me and the window. He sat there for a minute, our noses maybe three inches apart, and then he smiled or bared his teeth. His teeth, I remember, were normal, except that where he should have had canines, he had fangs, fangs as in the kind big dogs have pointy, sharp, kind of curved, but not so much. I was still registering what his teeth were when he disappeared, just vanished. No faded away, no transition at all. One moment he was there, the next he was gone. I felt like screaming, but still couldn't speak. About five minutes after he left, the Muppets materialized. Yes, just slowly appeared, were they belonged on my shirt, on my body. I was too afraid to move, too afraid of what else might be in my room and under my bed. 
to go to my mom and even grab Bluey. A few weeks later, my great-grandfather, Alan, died. I've seen him four times since then, each time preceding a major life-altering loss. I'd also like to point out that I've moved multiple times since then. I feel him a lot, but still haven't seen him, which I'm glad for, honestly. He never grew up, at least in appearance. The time he appeared to me before my boyfriend's car accident, though, he looked sad. I saw him in the mirror in my bedroom for a few seconds, looking as though he wanted to say something. But he disappeared before either of us could. Has anybody else ever experienced anything like this little boy? I don't think he's evil or good, but just there. I don't know. Had to share this though. First and foremost, let me say that I have never been a believer in the supernatural. It's not that I don't think that there's more to life than what we can physically see. It's just that I've never really had a ghostly encounter, and I'm just like most ordinary people, going about my business, paying bills, trying to make ends meet, and so forth. That was until Hurricane Katrina. I'm a military policeman in the Air Force Reserves in Texas. We were activated in August of 2005 at the behest of our governor to help the battered state of Louisiana. Part of our job was to patrol the streets in New Orleans with food, water, and what little medication we had left to offer the citizens in New Orleans. We were also there to offer transportation to those who wished to leave, but were stuck without a means to travel. Contrary to what the then Mayor Nagin stated on TV and radio, we were not there to harass black people. We were volunteers who were trying to help fellow Americans. That being said, I remember one evening we were patrolling near the Ninth Ward. Not a very nice place, even before the hurricane hit. My squad and I were walking in the middle of the street, yelling out that we were military police. We had food, water, and a way out if anyone needed assistance. I could see every house had been boarded up to keep the looters out, and many people spray painted slogans on front and sides of their homes. You loot, I shoot, and you loot, you die were the ones that stuck out the most in my mind. Slowly, some people did emerge from their homes and ask for water, food, and medicine. We gave them whatever we had and asked them if they needed to be evacuated. Many refused to leave their homes for fear of losing what little they had left. Anyway, I noticed that all the houses on this particular block had been boarded up. It was a typical southern plantation style home which looked like it had been built around the time of the Civil War. A small figure of a little girl caught my eye as I looked up at the second floor. I smiled and waved at her, mainly to let her know that I was there to help and that she had nothing to fear. She seemed to smile and wave back from what I could tell. I called out to her to get her mommy or daddy, but she just stood there staring at me. It was then that a kind of cold shiver ran up my spine. I really couldn't understand why. It was my cop sense kicking in. Two tours in Iraq and over 20 years as a sheriff deputy had developed this. So when it went off, I paid attention. Just then, an elderly man on a bike rode up on us asking if we could help evacuate his family of seven out of New Orleans. I told him we'd be happy to help him out and asked him if he knew anything about the little girl and her family living in the old plantation home. He looked at me kind of puzzled and asked, what girl? I turned around and pointed to the second floor window, but she was gone. I told him that I had just seen a little girl at the window and she waved to me. His eyes widened a little and he just smiled and said, so you've seen her too? He put his hand on my shoulder and said, son, there ain't nobody living in the house for over a hundred years. I started the protest, but he just shook his head, laughed and walked away. As he was leaving, I could have sworn I heard him say, 
some things about New Orleans are better left unsaid. I spent the first 18 years of my life living in a small Kansas town. Although there was little reason to stay, it was a great place to grow up, and I have many fond memories of exploring the nearby woods and rivers. A lot of strange things happened in and around that town, but I will only tell of one for now. This short story is about the Burns Ranch. The Burns Ranch was located about five miles west of town, situated at the base of a gently sloping hill, literally out in the middle of nowhere. A curving gravel road was the only way to get there, and beyond the house, this same road soon petered out into dirty ruts that faded into miles and miles of unused pasture land. The house itself was a two-story Victorian that had to have been built in the early 1900s. It was old, but wonderfully remodeled and a beauty to behold. A smaller, more modern guest house stood behind it, and an ancient barn nearby completed things. All of this had been in the Burns family for generations, handed down from one son to the other until finally Richard Burns inherited it. At the time of this story, Mr. and Mrs. Burns had a newborn baby girl and a son who was about four years younger than me. I was a family friend, and while in my high school years, would house it while they were all away on business trips or vacations. This was a great gig for any teenager, and I always jumped at the chance to get away from it all and spend some time alone out there. One summer, they asked me to stay at their place for a few weeks. The first week, I was to be alone as usual, but the second week, their son Robert was going to be there. Although not much younger than me, they for some reason wanted me to keep an eye on him. We got along well enough, so this was all fine with me. I left for the ranch one late afternoon, just as the shadows of the day were starting to bend longer towards the east. Weaving through the curves of the road and over old, low, water bridges, I finally crested it a hill, made my way down to the last of the bridges, passed through a small forest, and then came out into the wide, open spaces of prairie land. About a hundred yards further down the road was the house. No matter how many times I went out to the ranch, I could never fully get over the creepy feeling that would wash over me the minute the house came into view. It always seemed foreboding and spooky. The place looked haunted. One corner of the house formed a rotunda in which Robert's room was located on the second floor. As I neared the house, I could see someone standing in the shadows of his room, holding the curtain back and watching me arrive. Pulling into the driveway, I saw the curtain fall back into place, swinging slightly. It seemed that someone was home, and I wouldn't be alone that first week after all. The driveway led around the house to the back door, which everyone used when entering or exiting the house. The only time I ever saw the front door used was after dinner, when we would go out to sit on the porch and watch the sunset. I locked up the car, went through the gate of the fenced-in yard, and knocked on the door, waiting for whoever was inside to answer. When no one did, I went across the yard, past the three-foot statue of the Virgin Mary, and toward what amounted to a cement room that had been built into the side of the hill. It was some sort of storm shelter, and near the door, I found the keys to the house, which were always hidden there behind an old painting. As I let myself into the foyer and sat my bags on a bench, I kept calling out to let my presence be known. Dead silence was my only welcome. On the right side of the entrance way were the stairs that led up to the bedrooms. Under the stairs and next to the bench upon which my bag sat was the door that led to the basement. Beyond the door and in front of me was the dining room, the kitchen being to its left. To the right of the dining room were the rest of the downstairs, a few sitting rooms, the library, and an entertainment room. Sure, I saw someone at the window. I began a search of the house, starting with the first floor before working my way upstairs. The stairs ascended to an L-shaped hall. Just to the left were the master bedroom and bath. To the right and down the hall, past another bathroom, 
were the baby room and a spiral staircase that led to one of the sitting rooms below. The guest room I used as well as Robert's bedroom was around the corner at the end of the L. I searched these rooms, then went down to the basement, which had been renovated into a modern living room with a complete bar. I found nothing. Perplexed, but kind of used to how weird the house could be, I went back upstairs to unpack and start to enjoy my stay. I set up my guitar and amp in the entertainment room, where I planned on creating rock songs I was sure millions would jam to in years to come. The fridge was stacked, so that was no problem, and I had brought along a ton of movies to watch on the VCR in the basement. It seemed the only thing I had to worry about was the occasional phone call and feeding the dog, which was in a pen out near the old cement shelter. No problem as far as I was concerned. I had been house sitting here many times before, so knew how eerie things would feel when evening came. Like I said, it just had that look of a haunted house. Not much happened that first night, and the next day I got up, fed and watered the dog, then watched a few movies before taking a short walk around the property. That evening the phone rang, and it was Mr. Burns. He wanted to know how much it rained the night before. I knew he was out of state, so told him it didn't rain at all, but he insisted I check his rain counter, a measuring device that he had attached to a post near his mailbox. I went out and sure enough, although it had been completely dry the last few days, there was about one fourth inches of water at the bottom of the thing. I went back to the phone, where he was waiting on the other line, and told him. He didn't seem surprised and said it would probably rain that night. He told me to take care, make sure to keep the doors locked, and to not let anyone in when evening came. I liked Mr. Burns, and he was a decent guy, but sometimes he talked like that, making little sense at all. So I agreed to do as he said and hung up the phone. About three hours later, evening crept up on the ranch, and with it came the first storm of the summer. This wasn't just a small shower. This was a torrent. It came down heavy for about 30 minutes, then calmed to a steady downpour. Suddenly, the phone started ringing. I would answer, but no one would be on the other end of the line. It rang like that all night, about three times an hour, and each time I picked up the receiver, I would be greeted with silence. No voice, no signals, nothing. Just silence. As the rain came down, I looked out the window, down toward the road that led back to town. I saw a flicker of light through the nearby forest and went to stand on the front porch to get a better look. Sure enough, there was someone down there. It seemed a vehicle had just stopped inside the forest at the low water bridge. Whoever it was had most likely been coming out to the ranch, so to make sure there was no trouble. I reluctantly slid on my bad weather clothes, went out to the shelter where I hung up the key, then made my way through the rain and mud down the road toward the light. The wind was howling and the rain pouring down in sheets, but I could still see the light shining whenever I raised my head to see where I was going. I finally got to the curve that led into the woods and towards the low water bridge, but when I made the turn, there was nothing there. By now, I was really freaked out. The bridge was flooded over, and there were no tire marks on either side of it. I could clearly see the other side of the bridge, and no one had been down it since well before the rain started. Probably not since I came down the day before. I checked around a few more minutes just to make sure no one happened to be there needing help, and then made my way back to the ranch. The phone was ringing again as I entered, but I didn't bother picking it up this time. Let it ring. I had wet clothes to get out of and weird lights to think about. I was warming up in the kitchen a few hours later when I heard a car horn go off. A steady drizzle was coming down now and looking out the window again, I noticed the lights near the bridge were back this time dancing around through the trees before turning up the road and coming toward the house. It was a car, and every few seconds the driver would toot the horn a few times. I got on my clothes, wrapped a still damp coat around me, 
and went out the back door, this time armed with a rifle. I could see nothing past the light of the porch, so went out into the storm, carrying the rifle and a small flashlight. I went towards the barn and down the soggy driveway. The horn was still honking, but I could no longer see the road due to tall brush in the fields, so the car was invisible to me, but getting louder and louder by the moment. Everything suddenly seemed to build up. The car horn got louder. I could now see the glare of the lights growing through the brush. I found myself getting tense, pointing the now cocked rifle in the general direction of whoever was coming down that road. The horn rang out one more time. The light shined just a little brighter. I finally got to the end of the drive and went out onto the road. There was nothing there to greet me, just a dark, wet, stormy night and a muddy road that led to a very flooded bridge. Even the rain seemed to have eased up a bit. After a few minutes of trying to figure this all out, I gave up, covering the rifle so as to keep the water off of it. I trudged back toward the house for the last time that night, deciding it was safer inside than out there in the open. Nothing much happened for the rest of the evening until about 4 a.m. when I was awakened by someone pounding on the front door. This was odd. Everyone always used the back door. Nonetheless, I got out of bed, put my clothes on, and went downstairs to find out what was going on. My body ached from being out in the storm the night before. I tried to hurry down the stairs and through the house as fast as possible listening as the banging became more and more persistent. I had no idea that no one was going to be waiting for me on the porch when I opened the door and I was right. Unable to sleep, I looked around a bit, then brewed a large, strong pot of coffee and sat reading until the sun poked over the horizon. The day was bright, hot, and humid, and after a short nap, I decided to take a walk around the property. I hung the keys back inside the shelter so as not to lose them and as I did, I got a strong urge to go into the little room and explore a bit. I have no idea why I would suddenly want to do this since there was really nothing in there and to be honest, it was not a place I wished to be in. Still. It took a little more effort to walk away from the shelter. Something told me not to enter all the way, so I just stuck my hand in, quickly placed the keys beside the painting, and then I shut the heavy door. I took a long walk. Before going back to the low water bridge, I shut the barn door, which had come open during the previous evening storm, then made my way to the top of the hill behind the house. From here, I got a great view of everything for miles and miles. I sat up there for some time, then went to the river. The bridge was still flooded out, but not as bad as before. There were no tire marks and no evidence whatsoever of anyone being there before except for what tracks I made. I still had no idea as to what had happened the night before. I would have thought it was all a prank, but the storm was a bad one and beside, the bridge had been out. I went back to the ranch and the first thing I noticed was that the barn door was open again, already on edge. I peered inside then closed the door, placed a large rock in front of it. Later that afternoon, while working out a few songs on my guitar, I kept getting a very strong feeling of someone standing right behind me. No matter where I would sit, the feeling was always there. Growing tired of it, I stopped what I was doing and said out loud, STOP IT! I'M TRYING TO DO SOMETHING HERE! No sooner had I said this than the feeling stopped. It came back whenever I would start to practice my music, but went away when I told it to. The next day, I was upstairs going through some things when I heard, very loudly, someone downstairs yell out, HEY! It startled me at first, but then I thought it might be the family coming home early, so I put up what I was doing and went down to find an empty house. The rest of my time there alone was uneventful, with the exception of a lot of weird feelings. 
The library for some reason spooked me, as did the shelter, and I refused to use the spiral staircase located next to the baby room. I was somewhat nervous the whole time and took many long walks. Once while sitting at the top of the hill, I saw a car coming towards the ranch. It passed through the forest and made it over the bridge. I was actually a little relieved. Robert had finally showed up. Robert's grandmother had brought him back from a summer camp he had attended, and after we finally said our goodbyes, I sat on the porch with him listening to the various stories he had to tell and looking through the photos he'd brought back. I was reluctant to mention my own tales, but it didn't matter. Robert had grown up in that house. He knew something weird had happened to me while I was home alone there. We spent the next few days enjoying the good weather. We hiked, explored the valleys and forests along the road, and went on drives that took us to places we'd never been to before. One night, just as the sun was setting, Robert finally asked me how my stay had been. I didn't hesitate in telling him some of the odd things that had happened, and he reaffirmed some of them with his own stories. It seems he too was drawn toward the cement shelter where the keys were hidden. The only difference was that he had gone inside, the heavy door slamming shut, locking him in. It was some time before he was able to push the thing open and get out. He said that the Virgin Mary statue had been removed, so it was facing the doorway, as if watching his struggle. He was as confused as I concerning the lights at the bridge and the mystery car, but he did mention seeing a lady come down the spiral staircase I was so afraid of. She came down, glared at him for a moment, and then walked back up. Robert never found out who she was, but felt she was not nice. He also told me of dreams he had about the library. They were vivid and scary and involved a closet. He had just recently discovered that a relative had been born in that room years ago and had died there as well. Above each bedroom door was a small window and Robert said one early morning he woke up seeing the shadow of someone come down the hall and stand in front of his slightly open door. The person stood there for some time before Robert called out, thinking it was his father. When he got no reply, Robert screamed for his parents, and as they turned the corner in the hall, the shadow disappeared. That explained why I always felt watched whenever I tried to sleep in the guest room across the hall. As for Robert's room, I only went in there to get a CD now and then. I never felt comfortable in there ever since I saw someone looking out the window at me as I came up to the house that first day. Towards the end of my stay, Robert and I settled down one evening in the basement. We had movies to watch and were set for the night. There was a small bathroom between the foyer and the kitchen, and in it was an old-fashioned toilet that had a string you pulled when you wanted to flush it. The thing was loud, and as we sat downstairs watching our second movie, we could hear it flushing. We inspected it before finally turning off the water and returning to our movies. Around 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning, we were in that zombie state just before our sleep actually comes. Suddenly, we heard the back door slam shut. Wide awake now, we grabbed a few rifles that we had brought down to the basement with us and listened. From right above us, we heard the unmistakable sound of boots shuffling across the foyer floor. They slowly came towards the basement door and stopped. Then we heard the door creak open. I admit, I finally came to understand the term shaking like a leaf, but Robert wasn't much braver. We were too scared to even try and pretend to be cool. For a moment there was nothing, and then whoever was above us came walking down the stairs. We could hear someone brush against the coats that hung on pegs along the wall. We could hear the firm, deliberate sound of boots making contact with the warp boards that were the steps. The stairway going down into the basement was hidden behind a wall so that anyone who came down could not be seen until they reached the bottom. The third stair from the bottom always made a horrible squeaking noise, and when we heard that, we raised our rifles and waited and waited. Finally, when no one came into view, 
I told whoever was there we were armed and to leave. There was no sound at all. Eventually we gained a little courage and slowly peeked around the wall and up the stairway. No one was there. The door was shut. I was beyond scared at this point and after going throughout the house and checking the doors and windows, we spent the rest of the night in the dining room talking about what had just happened. To this day, I am unsure what to think. We heard, without a doubt, the back door open and slam shut, but when we checked it, the key was still in the lock and the door was still bolted from the inside. Robert left the next day to go spend a few days at a friend's home. He wasn't surprised when I told him I was asking another friend of mine to come out and stay with me on my final night there. That night was quiet except for the usual strange feelings. Even my friend mentioned it and left early the next morning. Rather than spend another day there alone waiting for Mr. and Mrs. Burns to return, I wrote a note telling them I had to leave early to run a few errands, placing it on the kitchen table. I packed up all my things, made sure the house was cleaned up, and then locked the door. A sudden sense of urgency overcame me as I walked to the shelter to put up the extra key. I came close to just tossing it into the room in my struggle to hurry, but managed somehow to put it back in its proper place on the hook. As I walked to the car, I noticed the barn door was open again, and although I tried to ignore it, I ended up going over and shutting it. The big rock I had put in front of it earlier was gone. No one ever said anything about me leaving earlier or asked how my stay was. Miss Burns would often laugh at the idea that her house could ever be haunted, but sometimes I think that laughter was a little forced. As for Mr. Burns, when I asked him how he knew it would rain in the evening, I checked the level of water in his gauge. He looked at me puzzled and swore he never even called me during that trip. I still don't know what to make of that place. Like I said, lots of strange things happened in and around the small town I grew up in, and that was just one of them. My name is Dino. I'm 32 years old, married, and work as a scaffolder for a small company in Kearns for North Queensland, Australia. I moved here from a small country town at the top of Victoria called Melindra roughly eight years ago with then my girlfriend of three years. I have always been very skeptical about ghosts and thought it was just a market to make money until that day. It was the middle of summer, very hot and humid. Me and Angela, my girlfriend, jumped into my work vehicle and was going to get home and get some lunch and she wanted to go to Job Hi-Fi to grab some CDs. With me driving and her in the front passenger seat, we were driving down the main road. It is called Captain Cook Highway. When to the left of us, on the side of the road, was a woman with dark hair and a beautiful white wedding dress. She had a very scared and troubled look on her face, and she was lifting up the bottom of her dress so it would not touch the dirty road. It looked like she had no shoes on, and it looked also as if she had her feet burnt to a crisp. Once I had driven past her, my girlfriend said, did you even see the woman in the wedding dress? I replied, yes, let's go back and see if she is okay, as she looked really upset. So I turned around and headed back. It must have been no more than 40 seconds before. We were back to where we spotted her, and she was completely gone. Now this is a highway, and there were no houses or people around, and there was only horse paddocks and a slight steep cliff, so there is nowhere to go or even hide. Me and my girlfriend were in complete shock, and could not believe what we just saw. I had never told anybody this until recently, when my mate Ryan came over. We were watching Netflix, some paranormal show was on, and I felt comfortable enough to tell him. I told him, hey, I think me and my ex-girlfriend may have seen a ghost. He said, oh yeah? Where about? And I explained that between the Carnivica roundabout and the Yorkies roundabout on the Captain Cook Highway, he looked straight at me and said it wasn't a woman in a wedding dress, was it? My skin started crawling. I stammered yes. 
He said he saw the same thing near Lake Placid that is roughly a couple of kilometers from where I saw her. He said he was getting dropped home late one night from a party, and he saw her walking on the side of the road. Thank you for reading my story. Back in the early 1980s, my now ex-husband, we'll call him Ed, my then three-year-old son, and I moved into our first house. Ed started out as one-room schoolhouse. I discovered proof with the removal of layers of wallpaper, revealed old state chalkboards, and had grown into a monstrously large farmhouse-type structure due to folks adding on over the years. The place had a lot of quirks. For instance, the main floor had two full bathrooms, a very large country-type kitchen, and a smaller galley-type kitchen in what one time served as a mother-in-law apartment. This is also where the second bathroom was. Inside that apartment was also a Murphy ironing board that folded up into the wall. What I found very odd was at some point, someone had removed the interior doors that would have shut the two units off from each other. As a result, you could literally do laps around the ground floor. The front door led into a nice sized living room. From there, you could see the staircase that led up to the two bedrooms upstairs. Another quirk, the upstairs rooms were not separated by a hallway of any sort. The top stair split into two triangle stairs, one on the left, one on the right, and these faced the bedroom doors. I won't make you suffer through a lengthy description of the place. However, I thought these were points of interest that may aid with understanding the events that would take place here. Our first night in the place, I distinctly heard someone rummaging through the moving boxes downstairs. I sat up in bed and listened, deciphering normal house sounds from those that seemed like someone was moving around. I looked over at my sleeping husband and slid out from under the covers and cautiously crossed over into my son's room. I lifted his sleeping form and returned with him to my room, depositing him on my bed. Someone downstairs coughed. I shook at awake. Someone's downstairs, I hissed. Go check it out. After a few groggy swears, he informed me that I could check it out for myself. Something downstairs toppled over. I about wet myself. If we had an upstairs phone, we would in later years, and this was pre-cell phone days. I would have stayed put and called the cops. As it was, I gripped my ball bat and made my way down the stairs, flipping on the lights as I went. I didn't want to surprise whomever had broken in, and I really hoped they'd just run away. I could see into the living room. Boxes were strewn about, giving voice that someone had been going through them. I made my way through the entire lower floor, leaving lights burning in my wake as I checked every nook and cranny while straining my ears. While I didn't wish to confront whomever it was, I didn't want them surprising me either. On my way, I double-checked the doors and windows to be sure they were shut and locked tight. Finally, there was only one room left, the bathroom in the apartment. I pushed the door open hard, and in the dimness, saw someone staring back at me. As I reached for the light switch, I saw them move towards me. I bellowed loudly, swinging the bat with all my might. There was a tremendous crash of breaking glass as shards went flying in all directions. I fumbled for the switch again, and as it came on, realized that I had slain a mirror that Ed had perched on the toilet tank. I wish he had told me. I fetched the broom and dustpan, feeling very foolish, and had just swept the bulk into a pile when there was a very loud banging at the front door. Neighbors hearing my scream had called the cops. Just try explaining that your own reflection had scared you that badly. At least they didn't laugh in front of me, but they grew very somber learning that Ed, at 6'4", had stayed upstairs during the entire time and had only come down when their knock summoned us. I still recall them looking down at me, over at him and back again with something that seemed to be a mixture of disbelief and disgust. So you, one pointed at me, came down to investigate, and you, he looked at Ed, stayed upstairs? Then things got weird. Cop A decided to see where this mirror was and check out the house to be sure it was secure, taking me in tow. Cop B stayed with Ed. 
I learned later that they had their own little chat, which left Ed feeling somewhat badly. As we approached the bathroom, I said, be careful, that glass went everywhere. But there was no glass to be seen, not a shard. The mirror sat on the toilet tank, seeing it. In the light, I realized I had never seen this mirror before, but I knew I had broken it. I had heard the glass smash. The broom and dustpan still sat in the door where I had left them. Weird. Very, very weird. After the cops left, I asked Ed where the mirror had come from. He said he'd found it in the basement. He went back to bed, and I went back to check the mirror out better. It was a rectangular in shape, the glass itself a bit wavy looking, with a few light spots and tiny clear areas. Its framing was very ornate, tiny, interwoven vines interspersed with leaves and flowers. It was obviously an antique, exactly how old, I wasn't sure, but guessed early to mid 1800s. I wanted to examine it, look for a manufacturer's mark, or possibly a date, but something about it made me feel strange. I reasoned that given the whole weirdness that had happened, the hour, and the move, perhaps it would have been wiser to wait for the light of day. I closed the door and went back up to bed, but not before saying a prayer of protection and adding that anything unkind was not welcomed in my home. The next day was very anticlimactic, at least in the weird department. Ed's family had swooped in on us to help. If you ask me, it was more of a way for his mother to dictate the way she thought we should decorate, complete with paint chips she thought would be just the colors we should use, and wouldn't that chair look better over there, I advise. She expressed an interest in the mirror when she saw it. The woman absolutely gushed over it, and before I could say one word more, Ed gifted it to her. I never saw it again, and oddly, whenever I'd bring it up, the subject would be changed. This morning, I woke up at about 3 a.m. I couldn't sleep for whatever reason. I turned and tossed until it started to look like it was starting to get daylight outside. Still dark, but not black outside. I was just laying in bed with my eyes closed, but I was awake. I opened my eyes to see my boyfriend sitting on the floor next to our bed, or so I thought. It didn't scare me at first because I thought it was actually him. I looked at him very inquisitively, but couldn't speak. He looked at me back like a confused dog or something with his head all sideways. For some reason, the way he moved frightened me. I found myself leaping backwards to the other side of my bed, where I felt my boyfriend lay asleep. I thought to myself, is this real? I covered my eyes with my blanket because I was so scared. I thought it was because my eyes were adjusting. When I pulled the blanket back down and looked again, he hadn't moved, only reached towards me. I just lay there stiff as a board. I was too afraid to move or even speak. He sat there in the same position for what seemed like a very long time to me. The only thing that wasn't his were his eyes. They were black and white. He then laid down on the floor and was gone. When I felt like it wasn't coming back, I reached over to the light by our bed and flipped it on and just sat at the edge of our bed and wondered what just had happened to me. I'm afraid that it will keep happening. This has never happened to me before until last night. Someone please help me understand. What could this have been? What did it want? Someone was telling me that it was a bad thing, that other spirits like demonic things can form to look like loved ones. Is this true? I want to post something that happened to my mother, Marie, my uncle, her brother David, and my aunt, her sister Gail. A little background first, please. Marie was living in Arkansas, David was living in Florida, and Gail was living in South Carolina. Many miles apart, these three siblings shared the same dream on the same night and called their mother within 24 hours of the dream to tell her of it. This dream occurred in 1989. The dream starts with the three siblings visiting an old farmhouse they lived in as children 30 years ago with their other siblings and parents. The house was empty. Marie, David, and Gail all got out of the car 
and walked completely around the house, recalling climbing an old oak tree that held a tire swing, recalling the farm area and what used to stand there, etc. When the three returned to the front of the house, there on their steps sat their dear old dad. They had passed away in April of 1974. Shocked to see their father on the steps, they called out to him. Dad stood and stood at the three with a malevolent grin. He motioned for his kids to follow him into the house. They followed through the living room, past the kitchen, down the hall, until they reached their parents' old room. He turned and looked each one in the eye and put his fingers to his lips as if to say shh. He then motioned with his hands for them to follow. He opened the bedroom door and they followed him inside. He walked to the closet and walked through the closet door. Now in each person's dream, they were the ones about to open the door. As each reached for the doorknob and slowly started turning the knob, their mother appeared from nowhere screaming at them to not open that door. They instantly woke up from the dream. I was a teenager at the time this occurred, and I did not see the big deal about following their dad into the closet until we visited my grandmother. My grandmother was telling my mother of how David and Gail both called her after Marie did, saying they had the same exact dream as she had. My mother looked scared, and my grandmother told her they all needed to get into church because Satan himself was using their father's image to lure them into something evil. I asked dear old granny how she got that from a dream and grandpa going into a closet. She told me because her husband, their father, my granddad, was scared of closets. I thought she meant he was claustrophobic. She assured me he was terrified of closets. The whole time they were man and wife, she would have to get his clothing out of the closets and lay them out for him. She would have to put things into closets. She refused to open them or go into them. My grandmother believes that Satan used granddad's image to lure the three siblings down a path of evil. I know this isn't much, but I love to hear the story. Within my years, I've had many, many ghostly experiences, but the most recent experience seemed to scare me the most. Almost every night sitting in the downstairs of my home, I feel a strong presence each time at a different location within the dining room and the living room. First, you may want to know how my dining room and living room are set in my house. When you first walk into my home, you enter a little narrow hallway where you then have to go through another door to get into my living room. Then, to get to my dining room, we have a huge opening and there's my dining room and my steps to go to the second story in my home. The other night, I was sitting on my couch closest to the two living room windows, but something just kept telling me to look over at the window in the dining room. Sure enough, I saw black mist that looked as if a face was watching me, but then it disappeared. I passed it off if it were nothing, and that I was seeing things, because it was around 11.30pm, and I was quite tired. For some odd reason, my shades were semi-open for five blades, and then the rest were closed so no one could see. I then moved my brother to the other couch, and we sat together and I just could not keep my eyes off the window in the hallway entrance. Within an hour, I was getting finally comfortable. My brother was sleeping. My mother and stepfather were sleeping, and my older brother was home upstairs, with his car parked outside. I gazed at the window, and the black mist was back, but this time, it was more clear and bigger. It seemed more like a body and a face, but turned to gaze out of my window. Then it sounded like someone was trying to open my front door. It's a big steel door, 
and when it's locked and somebody tries to open it, it sounds as if someone is pushing against it. It happened at least six times before it stopped. I held my little brother close to me. Within the next 15 minutes, it sounded like someone was walking in the hallway and jiggling keys. Well, that was enough for me. I woke my brother up and sent him into my room because I had my air conditioner on in my room. But the jingling sound seemed to follow us to right outside my bedroom door, then stop for the night. My mother recently saw the mist and told it to go back to wherever it came from. It then seemed to glide to my basement door and disappear. My home is about 150 years old, and back then, people couldn't afford to have a proper funeral. So they buried people in the walls in the basement or in the floor. We recently had a dirt basement floor and a cobblestone wall, but we had the floor cemented over. My grandfather, whom I can safely say is a ghost expert, senses something in the walls in my basement. Around my house, but mainly in my room, I know for a fact there is a ghost in my room, but she's a sweet woman and she just seems to watch me until I fall asleep. There are several ghosts in my home, but recently, I feel as if more are residing here. Just the other night I was drifting to sleep in my room, and I heard the sound as if someone was breathing. I held my breath, and the sound was still there, so I turned the TV on. It seemed to just go away. I was scared, and looked towards the mirror, and saw a flash and then nothing happened, but I saw the woman and felt comfort. I feel as if she scared the other spirit away. In my grandmother's house, there is an attic, but it's hidden in the ceiling, and you have to pull the straps down. During the war at her home, soldiers were hidden in the attic, and rumor has it, one night, the other people found them and killed everyone in the room. But the one young nurse was beaten and then murdered. I had a dream once about a place where there's a dangling light, and you have to walk on beams and then open a door, and there's a little room with blood stains. I told my grandmother, and she said I described her attic exactly, even though I'd never been in the attic. The woman who was murdered was a beautiful woman, and she is often spotted around my grandmother's house, scrubbing floors and walking. My grandmother's house was remodeled after the war, and the woman comes down the steps and walks, straight turns, and goes out a door, which is now a window. But before there was a wall separating the rooms and a separate door. Recently, my grandma has seen a little boy petting her dogs, saying, come on doggy, come with me. She thought it was my little brother because he had spent the night but he was downstairs sleeping and no one else in the house was awake. She knows he's a ghost and she is comfortable with him. Although I am severely frightened of her basement, which in 1947, a man was found hanging with a grin on his face and a woman shot in the head underneath him. There were people found suffocated in their beds, random strangers. My grandma says the boy was one of the children found and the man is evil. She feels that he may harm me. She doesn't like anyone except for her in her basement. I have many more stories to tell you, but I'm sorry, I'm out of time. I'll contact you later with many more stories. Thank you. Feel free to email me, or if you just want to exchange experiences, thank you. I live in a two-story town. It was the middle of July and it was very hot in Kansas City. I was sleeping on the couch downstairs as the upstairs is hot in the summer months. I was sleeping and I remember a low heavy dark voice saying I must help Laura, my cousin understand. I woke up startled by the deepness of the voice. You could even say a little bit scared. My dog, which hardly ever barks, was looking into the kitchen and growling, and then slowly he started to bark. 
he was watching something, and when I looked in the direction he was looking, of course I couldn't see anything. The light from the outside street lamp was beaming through the window, so it was somewhat light. He started to back away and followed the presence into the den and then to the wall that was straight across from me. He was watching something, but of course, I still couldn't see anything, but from the way I woke up, in a startled state, I was somewhat scared to move. Like an idiot, I just stayed still and watched my dog follow this presence that only he could sense. He then started to go to the door, located on the wall across from me, and which opens to my garage, growling at the door. He would back up and then move closer, and then he started to smell under the door. Still, I was too afraid to move. I just stayed there and watched. Within five to ten minutes of this, the presence seemed to have left. My dog stopped growling and was going from the kitchen to the wall, into the door again. And again, as if to look for something, finally he gave up and just curled up at my feet, which have not moved an inch this whole time, and fell asleep. Feeling now that the presence had left the room, I went to the door, which led to my garage, and pushed on it to make sure the door was closed. Once again stating what an idiot I am, I did not dare to open the door. However, I didn't really have a choice because that was when the door cracked open just enough that I could see the face and a body of a bloodied lady in a black robe. It appeared for 40 seconds and I saw her long enough to make out that she had to be a nun. I just remember her face looking so badly bruised and beaten as if she was hit with a bat or something damaging enough to give her a black eye. I turned away in fright, then opened the door completely to see that nobody was there anymore. It was like it appeared in a flash of lightning, then was gone. Just to give you some background on my house, the door that goes to my garage does not have a lock in it. Yes, this is dangerous, for if my garage door is open, Anybody could just walk in, right into my house. Maybe this nun I saw was really a homeless person. Maybe it was someone who was trying to rob the house. But since they saw me, they fled. Nothing was stolen. Everything was in one piece. Feeling somewhat safe that the presence had left, I joined my dog and soon fell asleep. In the morning, I awoke went upstairs to take a shower and dress for work. When I came downstairs, I gathered up all my things and opened the door which leads to my garage and stood there in total amazement. My garage door was wide open. I left the door open all night and morning. I truly feel my spirit guy was trying to warn me and I was too stupid and too afraid to listen to him. As I drove to work, I thanked him for trying to warn me and I promised to try and listen more carefully next time. The reality sank in that I could have been robbed or beaten. Yes, today I'm buying a chain lock for that door and installing it right away. In hindsight, I wish I would have been more accepting of the events that were happening in me. If this has taught me anything, it's to stop, slow down and listen to the ones who are trying to help me. As a youngster, I was playing with my toys in the lounge, and suddenly, I had this great feeling of feeling fright around me. So I went running into my mother, who was washing the dishes. She told me not to be frightened, as there was nothing to be frightened of. So she assured me, and took me back into the lounge to carry on playing. But as she walked back to carry on washing, she saw a figure standing still in the hallway. 
It looked as though it appeared to be a monk in a brown habit, with his face covered by his hood. All you could see was his feet, which had sandals on. My mother walked towards it, and it disappeared into my mother's bedroom. But my mother always said how I must have sensed the presence of this ghost. Another time in the same house, it was nighttime, and I couldn't sleep. So I was just looking into space when three squares appeared on the wall. I thought that it must have been some kind of light shining in from the window, knowing full well that no light normally shines through as we had blinds and curtains up at the window. I kept on staring at the squares on the wall. They didn't move or anything, but I felt really frightened like in the other story. I must have fell asleep thinking about the lights on the wall. In the morning, when I awoke, the first thing I did was get out of my bed and go straight to the wall, hoping in the back of my mind that there wouldn't be any kind of marks on the wall where the square was. But I was wrong. Where the squares were, there were deep-lined marks, like holes that were pressed into the wall around where the shapes were. They looked almost like claw marks and definitely weren't there before. There is no logical explanation for this story, not that I can explain anyway. It was not possible for any light to come through the curtains, and there were no other kind of lights or anything on in the room or in the house. I've tried to come up with some sort of explanation, and I don't have one, and that happened about 23 years ago. I've had some strange and incredible experiences over the years, just posted one in the last batch. Some of them, I haven't sorted out how to share yet, but the following experiences are pretty strange. My roommate and I were living in a Seattle neighborhood called Capitol Hill. Our apartment building, the Ben Lamont, was built in 1910 and my apartment overlooked a little park area with a long retaining wall in the back. One night, I must have fallen into a deep sleep as soon as I went to bed. When I woke up the next day, I immediately told my roommate about a disturbing dream that a menacing, sinister black figure had climbed out of a hole in the ground right against the retaining wall. He seemed full of rage and anger and it was coming closer and closer to our window and meant real harm. It was a very real, fearful thing. After hearing my dream, my roommate said she tried to wake me up soon after I went to sleep, but I was out cold. She said she heard something like a gunshot outside in the park and walked through a darkened apartment to the living room's bay window to see if she could see anything. She said she saw a man who was built like a tank, but fitting the physical description of the man in my room to a T. He appeared to be staring up at her. For whatever reason, I don't understand why she did this, considering she thought she heard a gunshot, but she shined a flashlight on him. When she did, she could no longer see him. Although she saw everything else, the trees, the ground, bushes. Everything where she was standing was illuminated, but he had vanished. When she covered the light, there he was again. I guess she did this a few times until he really vanished. Very, very strange. Another time I was staying in an artist's loft in San Francisco that was in a really creepy area on Market Street and 6th. I was in bed just starting to get the semi-lucid feeling when I woke with a frightened gasp. The only way to describe it is a flash vision. I thought for sure my throat had been slashed with a deep long knife from left to right, and all this blood was pouring. I remember sitting up gasping, knowing it was fatal. Then on the news the next day, chills went up my spine, 
when the anchor person said that someone's throat had been slashed at a hotel on 6th Street, right around the corner from where I was staying. Somehow, I must have picked up on the victim's fear, anxiety, and shock. Not really a ghost story, but still weird. Another time, a friend and I had an interconnecting dream. I dreamt one part, and she dreamt the other. They match perfectly, and since we both dreamt this right before we were waking up, we assumed we had these dreams at the same time. I think I was about seven when I first started seeing things in my house and around my neighborhood. The first time I saw something was when my sister and I were sharing a room. I knew that I always felt something in the room, but I never saw anything, so I really paid no mind. Then one day, while I was sitting in my room, I looked up and saw an image by my door. I don't know exactly what it was, but I know that I was scared. Over the next couple of days, I would hear things in my room, like people walking, the doorknob would jiggle, and things would just tip over. When I talked to my mom about these things, she told me not to be scared of them, just tell them to go away. The next night, I was sitting on my bed, and I heard somebody walking around. I did what my mom told me, and told it to go away. It didn't work. The sound became closer, and an image began to appear. At first I was kind of scared, but when I saw what the image was, I wasn't so scared anymore. It was a little girl, about five years old, who was lost. She was just staring at me for a while, and then she just sat down on the bed next to me. She was sitting next to me for about two minutes, and then she was just gone. For a few years, I wouldn't see anything, just hear things. When my older sister moved out, my sister and I finally had our own rooms. I stayed in our original room, and my sister moved to my other sister's old room. For a couple of months, things were cool, and then my sister woke up in the middle of the night and asked if she could sleep with me. The next morning, when I asked her why she slept with me, she told me it was because she was hearing people talking from the closet. Me and her had to switch rooms because she wouldn't sleep in her room. The first night, nothing happened, but the second night was completely different. I was hearing whispering and footsteps. At first, I thought I was scaring myself, but when I heard someone ask why my sister and I switched rooms, I knew I wasn't imagining it. At first, everyone thought I was making it up, but when I told my grandma about it, she looked at me as if she were surprised. She told me that I wasn't the only one in the family to be able to hear and see things. It was something that actually ran in my family. After that, things started happening more. People would talk to me. I would feel them touch my arm, face, or even feet when I was sleeping. And sometimes, I could feel someone sitting at the end of my bed. I think when I really got scared, was when I decided to sleep with my light on so nothing would bother me. But when someone said turn the light off, that was it. I ran to my mom's room and fell asleep on the edge of her bed. That was the last time anything happened to me for about a year. I thought it was just something I went through, but when I turned 14, it got bad. Not only was I seeing things at home, but I was seeing them outside occasionally. I learned not to say anything, because when I would, people would just laugh at me. My family and I became aware of a particular area of a supposed haunting in the Jamestown, North Carolina area. We were intrigued by the article and wanted to investigate, even though we are people of faith. The article, which made us aware of the haunting, was in a local magazine and caught my two sons' attention 
after my wife read the article in a restaurant. The article described the following. In the 1920s, there was an accident in Jamestown near a certain bridge underpass involving two high school students returning from the local prom. From time to time, locals have reported driving by the area where the accident occurred and spotting a young woman dressed nicely standing by the roadside, needing a lift. The stories tell of a young woman named Linda entering the car and describing where she needed to be dropped. Upon nearing the destination, she vanishes. Of course, my wife and I are skeptical, to say the least. So, unaware of any pure, or should I say for a lack of knowledge or fear, we thought we would investigate with our two young sons of five and eight years. We arrived at the location, which is off the main road into the woods, about a hundred yards. There is an old stone blocked railroad underpass located next to the now regularly used underpass. Both of the underpasses have been covered with graffiti in tribute to the stories of Lydia. The old underpass, however, has been overgrown with ivy and weeds and is relatively secluded to say the least. Nevertheless, we were determined to investigate despite the spooky nature of the claims. As we entered the underpass, the air became distinctly colder, which we all noticed. We all felt frightened and left after only a few moments. We got in our car and drove home. We thought nothing of the event until that evening. Strange things began to occur at about 2 a.m. Of all things, an old woody doll with a pull string began to speak in a toy box and would not stop. The electric van door opened and closed several times without any provocation. My boys thought someone was in their room. We thought we were frightened from our prior experiences and let our logical minds control. The house still seemed strange to me and I had difficulty sleeping, even though my male ego would not let me admit my fear. Time went by, and although the supposed haunting events were less traumatic, they nevertheless continued for about a month. It came time for the van to have a regular tune-up, and we took it to the dealership. When my wife returned with the van, the trouble ceased. I don't know what we experienced exactly over that period in 2001, but it seemed real. My wife and I still question the validity of her haunting, but our youngest son still maintains that Megan, as he refers to her, often talked to him and was very nice. Anyway, it's a nice little story we often tell family members who don't think we're lost on cozy evenings. Hope you will enjoy. I used to work at this daycare center that only stayed in business for two years. The building that we worked in had many owners and many businesses, but never stayed in business for longer than two years. Usually, bankruptcy would follow. Anyway, I had worked there for about a year and had always been scared of the back of the building. There was a long dark corridor that always gave me the chills and I always felt like I was being watched. I had the early morning shift, so I had to be there at 6.30 and get ready for the kids to arrive. One morning, I had an infant who was only four months old and was asleep at the time of the incident. We were in our room and I was write out papers for the rest of the day when I saw a toy out of the corner of my eye being thrown across the room. I didn't think anything of it and played it off as my imagination until a week later when another coworker told me what happened to her. She was in the sleep room changing a child's diaper when she looked right and saw a little girl standing there staring at her. She looked back at the child she was changing and back and the little girl had vanished. There were no children besides the one she was changing in the room with her. It freaked her out, 
And when she told me, freaked me out. Because then I realized that the toy that I saw thrown across the room wasn't my imagination. Neither one of us had another experience, but those two were enough for us. Our house was just down from what we call Dead Man's Curve. There are a lot of accidents there, usually in the spring and winter. In the spring of 1963, about 3.30 a.m., we're all awakened by a woman screaming, help me, help me. My mother, grandparents, and myself all met in the living room. The woman's voice was very loud. We all assumed there had been another car accident up on the curve. It was extremely foggy that night, so much so that you could not see more than four to five feet in front of you. My grandfather grabbed a flashlight and headed towards the woods across the road to search for the woman in distress. In the meantime, she is still screaming, help me. My mother called my uncle who lived just down the road. He too joined in the search and heard the woman's screams. After a good 15 minutes, my grandfather came back to call the county sheriff department to send a car out. One car came, then two, then three. They combed the woods in search of the woman's voice that slowly became weaker and weaker. Finally, as the sun came up, her voice had completely faded. They never found her, a car, or any evidence of any kind. I remember standing in our driveway, hearing the police officers telling my grandfather that this was best kept quiet, not to tell anyone, because no one would believe this. They decided they were not going to file a report, even though they too had heard the screams. My grandfather searched that woods every day for weeks to see if he could find any signs of any kind, but nothing was ever found. We moved out of the area in 1976 after my grandfather had died, and I often wonder if the people that lived in the old brick house ever heard the screams of an unknown woman on foggy spring nights. It was late October 1970. Halloween was only a few days away. I'd woke up feeling a bit odd. I couldn't put my finger on what was bothering me, but as the day went on, I became more worried and anxious. My mother was in the kitchen doing dishes, and I went out to talk with her about how strange I was feeling, and she told me it was nothing more than me being pregnant and that sometimes pregnant women just get those weird feelings from all the hormonal changes going on. I insisted this was not the problem. I told her I was afraid, but I didn't know what I was afraid of. I just felt something bad was going to happen. She laughed and told me nothing bad was going to happen. As the day went on, the fear grew. I became a real mess and begged my mother not to go to work that night. Once again, she told me I was being silly and to knock it off. She said she was not going to take off work. I was close to tears when it was time for her to leave at 11.30 p.m. that night. I didn't know what I was afraid of, but it was a feeling of dread and fear I'd never experienced before. I walked my mother out to the car through the breezeway to the attached garage as she pulled out of the garage. I pulled the garage door down and locked it. I then went through the house, locked all the doors, pulled down all the windows and locked them. I put the chain on the lock on the basement door, checked on my grandmother who was sleeping in her room with our dog Happy laying at the foot of our bed. My daughter was sleeping in my bed and I decided to call one of my girlfriends since I was too afraid to go to sleep. While I was on the phone, I noticed the wind had picked up and started to rain. I could hear the autumn leaves rustling about and the branches of shrubs rubbing against my bedroom window. I continued talking with my friend and asked her if she could come out, but her husband was not home from work yet, so she didn't have a way to get there. At that moment, 
I saw the shadow of a person's head go past the window. I told my friend. She said it was probably nothing more than shadows from the branches blowing in the wind. I said, yeah, you're right. I'm just letting my imagination run wild here. But I did tell her if I scream. She was either to call my uncle who lived down the road or call the sheriff's department. She laughed and said okay and asked for my uncle's phone number. Right after I gave her the phone number, I heard someone walking into the bathroom which was right next to my bedroom. It spooked me a bit, but figured it was my grandmother. I decided to check to make sure. As soon as I opened my door, I could see my grandmother and Happy were still laying in the exact same spot when I first went to my room. I walked into the bathroom. Nothing was there. I looked out the window and saw it was still raining. Everything seemed fine. I went back to my room, picked up the phone, told my friend that was weird. Grandma and Happy are still lying in the same exact positions. Neither one has moved. Right after I told her that, I heard the footsteps in the bathroom again. About that time, my 12 month year old daughter woke up. I told my friend to hang on. I was going back to the bathroom. I took my daughter by the hand, and as we walked into the bathroom, I noticed the shadow curtain was moving, and the bathroom window was wide open. Even the storm window had been locked. I wanted to scream, but I knew I had to stay calm not to scare my little girl. So I said, okay honey, there's nothing in here, let's go back to bed. We walked out, and as soon as I got around the corner and into the room, I slammed the bedroom door closed and screamed someone's in the house call the police. Naturally, that scared my baby girl. She crawled up on the bed, scurried to the corner up against the headboard. She was sitting there crying. About that time the doorknob started turning. I threw myself against the door trying to keep the intruder out and was screaming he's trying to get in here. I was terrified for my baby and myself, an unborn child. I thought I had a pretty good chance of holding him off since the glass doorknob had fell off some time ago and it was quite tricky to get the door open from the outside. Well, I was wrong. The door was opening. I was using all my strength to push the door closed, but I couldn't hold. The door was open about six to eight inches and then this great force pushed so hard I slid seven feet across the hardwood floor. I ran to the window, flipped the lock, opened the window, screaming bloody murder. When I was hit in the face with the bright light that blinded me, I was hysterical now. I then heard my uncle's voice. I screamed, he's in here. My uncle crawled through the bedroom window and didn't see anyone in the room. He said he had been trying to get into the house, but everything was locked up. I kept saying he's in here. My uncle and I searched the whole house, closets, under beds, in every corner, basement. Nothing was there. We walked back towards the hall and bedrooms, and there was my grandma and dog laying in the exact same place still sleeping. They never moved. We went back towards my room, and there in the doorway was a 12 to 8 inch high perfect cone shaped pile of dirt. It definitely felt like no dirt I've ever felt before though. I asked my uncle how did that get there and what is it? He said it looked like dirt and was quite puzzled how it got there. He then said if I was you, I would sweep it up and throw it in the trash. I asked him to spend the night, but he refused and said everything was fine and I didn't need to be worried. Yeah, right. When you feel like there's an intruder that was trying to get into your house, why would you think otherwise? As he was getting ready to leave, my girlfriend and her husband pulled into the driveway. I was so glad they came out and stayed until my mother got home from work. The strange thing is, it had been raining all night and there were no traces of mud anywhere in the house. The bathroom window that had been opened was closed and locked when my uncle checked the bathroom. 
could only be locked from the inside. My grandmother and dog never once woke up during any of this. Happy was a collie shepherd to mix. It was a protective watchdog. My girlfriend did call my uncle and came out as soon as her husband got home from work. She heard my screams. They both saw the cone-shaped dirt in my doorway. Was this an unseen force? Where did that strange silky dirt come from? When I was holding the door shut and it was starting to open, why didn't I see anyone's hands? How was I pushed seven feet across the floor with such great force? This has always been a mystery to me. Many strange things happened in the house here in Granger before and after that, but this one has always bugged me the most. A while ago, when I was about 15 years old, I dozed off on the very comfortable couch on our sun porch while watching TV. I woke up after about an hour and looked out the door to the backyard and saw a dark shadowy figure standing, looking into the window on the door. It was one of those doors where half his window. I didn't see a face, let alone eyes just a black mass that looked like the shape of a big man. I was experiencing sleep paralysis at the time, so I was unable to get up, even make a noise, not that it would matter. I was home alone. I looked at the other end of the couch and saw a bright light. It didn't exactly make me calm, although I got the feeling it was there to protect me. Neither the shadow or the light moved, they just stood there motionless. I felt the only way to escape this was to ignore it and fall back asleep, so I did. When I woke up 20 minutes later, there was nothing in the window or at the other end of the couch. I realized I needed to let our dog out since it had been a while, so I called her to the front door and let her do what she needed to do. I looked across the street and saw the shadow again. I know it wasn't a person, because people walk up and down our street all the time, and this just wasn't the same. I blinked my eyes, and then it was gone. I hadn't experienced this again until very recently. My sister asked me to dog sit for a couple of weeks while she was away for job training. The dogs had a very strict schedule. They had to eat breakfast at about 8 a.m., and go for a two mile walk by 9 a.m. I'm the type to sleep till about 10, so during the time I found myself taking lots of naps. One day I woke from my nap and it was 11 a.m., again, experiencing sleep paralysis. She has glass sliding doors that lead out to a dock and then to the backyard. I was facing the glass doors when I woke and saw the same dark figure that I saw 10 years earlier at my mother's house. This time, there was no bright light. It was a rainy day, and I thought it couldn't be the same experience again. I must be dreaming. The dogs didn't seem fazed by the dark man standing at the door. Maybe it's the neighbor. Maybe it's the handyman. But it wasn't. The figure just faded away. I didn't remember anything after that. I must have drifted off to sleep. When I woke... It was time for the dogs to go outside, so I reluctantly went to the sliding doors to let the dogs out, and neither of them would go. They seemed to be afraid of something. From then on, when the dogs followed me to the bathroom, the shower was in the bathroom of my sister's room, they always seemed to be agitated by something. Still not sure what though, and my sister hasn't noticed anything strange. Could someone? Or something be following me. First time I can recall anything happening was when I was four or so years old. We used to live in Omamo, which is a small town of about 12,000 people, about an hour and a half north of Dundon. Our house was up on the top of a hill and fairly rural. The back of our property backed onto what I can only assume was a paddock of gores, or at least a huge area of it. 
As far as I'm aware, there were no neighbors living up that way. We also lived next to a sheep paddock that had gaps into the gores as well. Our back door had a ramp that led very close to the gate that led to the backyard, though there was very little separating the backyard from the empty gores paddock. When I was little, I'd always get this feeling of utter dread about going anywhere near that back section as soon as it even started getting dark, to the point where, if we were getting home late from anywhere, I would always just climb up the middle of the ramp instead of going anywhere near the back section. I never knew why it terrified me so much, but it's left me with a lasting fear of what I can't see. When I was five or so, I suddenly developed a fear of my closet. It would never close properly and would just swing open on its own. It wasn't very big, but seemed to connect up to the attic by a manhole, and I never felt comfortable going near it. Didn't ever see anything there though, not at that house. We moved down to Dundon when I was eight, and for the first couple of years, everything was okay. But when I was ten, I started getting spooked going through the hallway and living room to get through to the bathroom at night. I would always sprint through to the bathroom and then back to my room and wouldn't be able to relax for a good half an hour afterwards. I just felt like I was being watched and followed. The feeling was that if I slowed down at all, I would be attacked by something. I could not sleep in my bedroom at the time unless I was completely covered by my blankets. It was always colder than the rest of the house, and I never felt comfortable in there without a light on or someone else in the room. When I was about 13, I started suffering from depression and still slept in that room. One night, I recall waking up because my leg was freezing. I uncovered myself to discover that I had been pulled out between the slats of the bed. Very awkward to get my foot out of there on its own. It involves a lot of twisting and squeezing. By what looked like a hulking six foot shadow of something with horns that was sitting on the end of my bed. I covered myself up, pulled my leg back up as fast as I could, and began screaming. My room and my mother's was only separated by about a half an inch of MDF, and yet, she didn't wake up at all from me screaming for an hour solid. I eventually fell asleep. In the morning, I had a hand-shaped bruise on my leg where the creature had pulled me out by. I was never comfortable in that room to begin with, and after that point, I had to sleep with the main lights on, not just a bedside light which had been turned off on that night by something. Closet didn't shut properly in that room either, and I felt like I was being watched from the gap. It had two sliding doors that the natural woods pattern had made to look like it was covered in faces of people screaming, and even an evil monk, i.e. the ropes, and a malicious looking face. After that, the room was colder, and my bed would shake randomly. Even now, it's still the coldest room in my mother's house, despite getting most of the afternoon sun. While my mother and her husband were renovating the house, they found a hearth, part of a thigh bone, in the top of a porcelain gollywog doll, under the lounge floor. The house was built sometime between 1900 and 1908. At the time, we had to run around the outside of the house to get to the bathroom, and so on time. After coming back to the bedroom, my stepsister and I were just entering back into our front door, when out of nowhere, a man appeared on the street just outside the gate. It scared us enough that we didn't make that trip again. At the start of the year, I moved into a flat with my fiance, and a few weird things have happened since. Mostly, it's going through the kitchen which has one entire wall covered in floor to ceiling windows that opens up into the backyard, which is accessible from a street above ours, and the street we're on. I can't walk through there at night. I have to run, and always feel like I'm being watched. Unfortunately, the bathroom is through there, and I'm pregnant, so needing to do it is rather often. Coming back though, I've noticed a shadow figure that would bolt through into the hallway, and occasionally little blue balls of light. 
It makes the hackles in my neck rise, and I don't feel comfortable till I'm back in the bedroom I share with my fiance. Lately, I've been hearing strange noises. It's not unheard of in this house, because we have a possum in our ceiling space. However, the noises I hear have been coming from my room upstairs, which is being used as storage. I keep hearing sounds like being knocked over, or rustling. Originally, I just thought my flatmate's kitten had gotten in, and was causing a ruckus. But every time I go up to check, there's nothing in there, and nothing has been disturbed. It's happened several times, and my fiancé has heard it too. We're not sure what's going on, but he's definitely got a few stories of his own to do with the supernatural. I read the existing story of Area 51 on this site, a creepy haunted place located in Salt Lake City, and would like to clarify a couple of things and add to it. This isn't the Area 51 that's often discussed in Nevada, obviously. Anyway, I was an employee at Area 51 and would clean the entire building on Saturdays. This building is very old. It was first a mink farm. It was also the first building in the state to ever show porn films. It has been various strip and nightclubs until it became Area 51. And the other story, they stated that there was a girl who had died to clear up the girl's death. It was by an aneurysm, but for some reason, the story keeps told as being cocaine or drug overdose. There was also another death of a male patron on the first main floor by overdose. I've had two paranormal experiences while working there. They both happened upstairs. Once, I was cleaning the woman's bathroom where the girl died. The way it is constructed is that there is no entrance door. You get an echo of any movement or people that can travel into the bathroom. While cleaning in there, I heard a bar stool being shuffled and moved around on the wood floor outside the bathroom entrance. I thought it was the maintenance man. I went out there a minute later, and nobody was around. I looked out the windows to see who was parked outside, since there's usually one or two others in the building as I clean. Nobody was parked out there. I was not aware I'd been alone until that time. Sometimes they'd leave to get supplies. Another time. I was upstairs cleaning the juice bar area, and I heard my name being called by a man's voice. I looked around, and nobody was there. Also to note, these older buildings around downtown, Salt Lake, are all connected by underground tunnels that are boarded up or barred. Area 51 has access points in the basement. There have been reports of noises, creepy feelings, and of being pushed when someone is in the basement. It's not a pleasant place. A bartender has reported to a local publication that he was stocking shelves alone at night and was standing on a ladder. He looked down to see the apparition of a pair of bare feet walking towards him. I work at Universal Studios currently, and I was sent to your site by my boyfriend. I went through the haunted locations you have for California, and I read the Universal Studios hauntings. I just wanted to add to the Back to the Future, which is now the ride for the Simpsons. I work over at Shrek 4D, which replaced the Rugrats and Nicktoons game show a few years back. The little girl that died at the Back to the Future Simpsons building doesn't just reside there. She takes trips over to Shrek 4D as well. I'm not sure if you know, but Shrek 4D is an emotional simulator, but it looks just like a movie theater. We play a 15 minute film between the first and second Shrek in 3D. I've had a personal experience where I was sitting in the theater as one of our shows were going on, and I noticed a shadow of a person moving along the aisle, closest to our first set of automatic doors. It looked like they were walking up the aisle to sit in one of our stationary seats in the back of the theater, so I got enough for my position to check on them, but they disappeared. I thought they probably found another seat just farther back, 
but when I looked farther ahead at the back aisle, I saw the figure walking across it. I was confused, because I would have seen them round the corner and past the stationary seats. The shadow continued to walk to my aisle, closest to the main exit, and it stopped at the top of my aisle. It was blocking out one of the lights we have for our guests to see when they exit the theater, and it looked at me, and when I stared at it, it looked just like a little girl in a white dress, or a long shirt and pants. I was scared and curious at the same time, and then she just disappeared. I didn't know of any spirits or hauntings or accidents at the theme park before that incident. When I told my other coworkers, they told me of the little girl that died at Back to the Future from an asthma attack. That was the only experience I had with the little girl. Other coworkers, though, have told me what they experienced. They've seen the little hanging around in the theater like walking across the rows, running up and down the aisles. A recent experience was from my friend, that as he was running the show during the same part I had seen her, she was sitting in the front row, watching the movie without the glasses, and she was by herself. He was sitting on the chair nearby, and he smiled at her, wondering where her family was, and she smiled back, and when he looked at the movie and turned back to her, she was gone. He described her the same way, with the long shirt and pants. He was never so scared in his life at Shrek. Others had the same experience I did. They had also told me that she plays behind the curtains of the screen in her backstage area. Lights wouldn't turn on sometimes back there for no reason. Footsteps are heard in the corridor when no one was around while the park was closed and no music was going on. It would also be heard in the torture chamber in our pre-show room. My other worker had also told me of seeing a male worker that passed away a couple years back, walking across the projector on the aisle in front of it. Other than that, the typical calling of everyone's name inside the auditorium and pre-show room, the footsteps, the feeling of someone following behind you, and the shadows, and full apparition of the little girl. Those are the experiences as far as I'm aware of it. I personally will not go behind the stage by myself because of the weird feeling I got. When I was younger, I lived in this house that my family and I rented. I experienced all kinds of paranormal activity. It only happened to my little sisters and I. My parents never experienced anything. My sisters and I would lay in our room at night and talk, and we would see a dark figure walk through her bedroom and just disappear into the closet door. When we would get up and open the door, there would be nothing in sight. We would be home alone and hear talking. I had an attic door in my ceiling above my bed, and I would lay there at night and listen to whispering, although I couldn't make out what was being said. I could hear voices. My things would get moved. Stuff would fall off my dresser for no reason. Some of my belongings would slide across my dresser. One night, I was lying on my side in my bed, watching a movie, and something came up behind me and tapped my shoulder. I ignored it the first time, so it happened again. I thought it was my sister, so I rolled over to see what she wanted, but to my surprise, I found nobody, so I rolled back over and it happened again, so I got up and walked around my house to find everyone sound asleep. I got very freaked out and told myself it was just my nerves. Then a movie fell off my dresser, so I just went to sleep. Doors would always shut and open for no reason. Well, this is my story. It may not be the longest, but it certainly is most terrifying. So this is my friend Sarah's story. In the summer of 2003, she was about 12 years old, living in Modesto, California. 
She and three other friends decided to play with a Ouija board in her back room. One of her friends did a ritual of protection, which her friend thought it was a good idea. After contacting a younger male spirit for a short period of time, and they were able to get his age of about 24 to 26 and had a traumatic death in his previous life. They failed to close the portal on the board and basically walked away from the board and left the way open. Over the next four years, she would hear knocking from inside the walls adjacent to the room the Ouija board was messed with previously. Around the hours of 12 a.m. to 4 a.m., the power in her room would flick on and off. The stereo would turn on, as well as turn off on its own. One night, a friend of hers woke up out of a deep sleep to point out a darkness where the corner of the back room had enveloped the whole ceiling covering the ceiling fan. They both could not see through the blackness. In 2008, she moved to a different house within two weeks of moving in, and she started hearing knocking in her room, TV turning on and off, Lights going on and off. Her boyfriend would work the night shift, and she would be home alone and go in the kitchen. Anything left on the counter such as plates, silverware, spice racks, etc. would shift four to five inches in random directions. In 2009, she moved back home where it first began. On the first night of moving back in, while standing in the living room facing the hallway, she saw a dark shadow figure of a younger male at the beginning of the L-shaped hallway. After taking a second glance, it was gone. As she went to walk down the hallway to go to her room, the end of the hallway accesses the back room. There is a floor-to-ceiling mirror. The door was shut as she was walking. Instead of seeing herself in the mirror as she should have, she saw the same shadow figure three feet off the ground. It was as if his knees down were missing. It stayed in that fixed position until she ran in her room and shut the door. Within the next year, knocking continued and actively followed her as she moved three times in that year alone. On August 7, 2010, she drove from Modesto, California to Las Vegas, Nevada while taking the I-15 to cross state line. She glanced in her mirror and saw a shadow figure in her back seat. I've been friends with her since April of 2010, and in the process of her moving back with her dad and stepmom, I hung out with her on a daily basis till class started on August 30th, 2010. We have both witnessed drawers open in our absence in our bedroom and bathroom, doors creaking open when no one is home, the sound of glass breaking when nothing has moved or shifted. She's seen a face in her back window one late night, and we were driving on an empty back street one day, and even seeing the shadow figure sitting in her back seat in broad daylight with me, next to her in the car. Her fish tank being moved while she was out for the night or even in the day. Items being moved in a way some intelligence would be necessary, such as her fishnet being moved from the top of her dresser to under her belt and her TV cord. From August 24th to now, it has a presence of attachment with her whenever she goes from the moment wakes to the moment she tries to sleep, and at times, if she's alone, it will keep awake and feels like a heavy pressure lays upon in times when drifting to sleep to her awake. The night of September 4th, 2010, she left to go get changed and get ready around 10.30 at night while I played laser tag with friends. She was home alone. As she got ready, while showering, she felt the presence in the bathroom with, and in the process of getting dressed and putting on her makeup, she saw a figure walk in her room, thinking it was her dad. She entered after it, to find her closet door open, her phone flung across the room, the charger unconnected, all her drawers open, approximately six drawers. Her fish tank yet again moved, the TV turned on, and the computer turned off, and the bed was unmade. She rearranged everything, closed the drawers, and continued to get ready as she re-entered her room. Again, 
Her phone and her charger were off the connection and tossed about 12 feet across the room and her closet door closed. She then forgot her charger in her room. She went back upstairs in which she felt the presence follow her all the way to her car and sit in it with her. She has been with her since it's now 4.28 p.m. on September 10th, 2010. It has been six days since that night and has progressively seemed to get worse and where she won't or chooses not to speak about it, even to me. When I was young, my grandmother owned a very old rustic country summer home in a small village about three hours away from the large city where I grew up. There was nothing particularly threatening about the outside of the house. To a casual onlooker, it just looked like an old quaint house, much like the majority of the houses in the village. During summer break from school, my parents would send me there since my grandmother always took her vacations there, far away from the busy life in the big city where we all lived. Though I miss my parents a lot and didn't get along well with my grandmother, I still, for the most part, enjoyed the large garden with its old apple trees, a berry orchard, and a large vegetable garden. The inside of the house had a very different feel to it. First of all, it was definitely very old and somewhat musty because it went unused for a large portion of the year. In one of the bedrooms where the wallpapers was peeling, you could see several layers of different color wallpaper, which makes me think that the house was owned by many people before my grandmother, though she had for many, many years. Though I had a sink, it did not have a toilet or a shower. Instead, there was an outhouse outside and an outside shower for summer use. There was one room in the house, which was added sometime after the original house was built. It was a slightly newer, open space with many windows, painted in a pleasant pastel color. It was located at the very back of the house. For some reason, my grandmother insisted that this particular room is where I would stay. If you were to simply look at it, you would find absolutely nothing threatening about this room. However, for some reason, I was terrified of staying there. My parents always remarked that unlike the other children, I was scared of nothing. I always slept with the lights off, never had any incidents where I was scared to be alone and never had any childlike fears such as a monster in the closet, etc. So, my parents found it highly unusual that being 8 or 9 years old, I was absolutely terrified of this room. I would beg my grandmother to let me sleep in the bedroom in the main part of the house, but she always told me that I was being silly and there was absolutely nothing wrong with the room. Yet at night, with the lights off, I couldn't help but hear unusual creaking sounds, knockings, and what sounded like footsteps after my grandmother had gone to bed. Having never been scared of anything, I would pull the blanket almost all the way over myself, except for my eyes, out of which I could see faint black shadows moving along the corners of the room. I tried so hard to convince myself that I was just imagining things. The extreme uneasy feeling never let up. I felt like something in the room could physically hurt me if it chose to. I told my parents and kept asking my grandmother about the room, but my questions were sidestepped and I was always told that I'm just imagining things. And maybe it's because the room is sort of isolated from the rest of the house and that makes me nervous. And of course, I got the usual explanation of, it's just the house settling, etc. Since the house had no hot water, they couldn't blame the water heater. Things would go on like this every summer I was there. On a few occasions when I was allowed to sleep in the bedroom in the main part of the house, I felt much more at ease and was able to fall asleep much easier. In the other room, the uneasy feeling would keep me awake for hours, which was highly unusual for me 
since I never had trouble sleeping anywhere else. Yet, though significantly weaker, the effects of that negative energy permeated the entire house. To wash up before bed, we would heat water in the kitchen and put it in a basin. On numerous occasions, when I was washing my face or giving myself a sponge bath, since the only shower was outside, I had very strong feelings of being watched to the point where I would do what I needed to do as fast as possible and would turn to look behind me, expecting someone to be there. One particular occasion I remember very clearly. It was broad daylight and my grandmother went to the local market to buy food while leaving me at the house by myself. I was about to go outside to the garden when I heard a loud female voice clearly calling my name from the living room. Utterly confused since I was supposed to be the only one in the house, I went to investigate. My grandmother was still out and I confirmed that I was alone. Then I heard the same voice again calling out to me urgently from another room. I was really freaked out and almost ran out of the house, but made myself go and see if anyone was there. I saw no one. When my grandmother got back from the market, I told her what happened, and she told me many people imagine someone calling their name when they are home by themselves. Even then, I thought it was an odd explanation since I never had an occurrence like that before, and actually, I haven't had an occurrence like that in the nearly 20 years since then. Sadly, since I was still a child, I never found out the history of the house before my grandmother finally sold it after she was too old to maintain it. I don't envy whoever owns it now though. Okay. One of my first experiences with ghosts was when I was about 5 or 6 years old. I was in Texas at my grandmother's house with my brother and cousin. We were sleeping in the living room and I heard kids playing in the background. Then I heard a man call my name. I thought everyone else was up and my grandma was waking me up. I stood up and opened my eyes and there was no one there. It was also silent. I thought it was a dream, but then I heard kids again, and a man's voice started to call my name again. I now knew that this wasn't a dream. I ran to my grandparents' room and told them there was a man calling my name and that there were kids playing. My grandma said I was having a nightmare and to go back to sleep. I got into bed with them and went to sleep. About an hour later, my cousin came into the room, saying that a man wouldn't stop calling his name. My grandma thought it was maybe a coincidence and told us to go to sleep. Nothing ever happened to my brother. A few weeks later, we got a call from them, telling us that they were moving. My grandpa had gotten up about 1 a.m. to let the dog outside. And when he turned around, all of the dog's squeaky toys started squeaking, and there was a woman standing right in front of him, and it wasn't my grandma. They found a house and started moving as quickly as possible. We came down to help them. We lived in Oklahoma at the time, and my grandma told us that there was a family that lived in the house, and the dad and kids all died in the house fire. We never found out who the woman was though. Thank you for letting me submit my story to you. This is one of the scariest, but I have lots of them. For as long as I can remember, I've been able to feel and see spirits that no one else could. It took me many years to discover what this ability was and that I wasn't alone. I don't remember my very first ghostly experience very well, but my mother does. She told me the story many times. I was three years old, and we were visiting my grandmother at her home in East Boston. 
I walked into the back bedroom, my grandmother's room, and then back into the dining room and asked my grandmother about the man in our room. She asked me to describe him, so I did. She turned to my mother and quietly said, she has a gift. She handed me a photo of her and my deceased grandfather and asked me if that was the man. I said yes, but he was skinnier now. My grandfather died of a brain aneurysm, a complication from a bout of meningitis in 1952, 34 years before my birth year. One year later, I was four, we moved into a new home, directly behind the house was the cemetery. We lived in the house for the next 14 years. There was a very heavy, eerie feeling that surrounded the stairs. Something watched you from the base of the stairs while you were in the living room, or at the top of the stairs. Every so often, there was footsteps and the sounds of someone falling down them. When he went to investigate, nothing was there. The basement was the worst place. It felt like something like a voice grip was squeezing your chest. I could never go down there. I was apparently the only one that felt it. My sister told me after she moved into her room down there that she never quite felt alone and she get this odd headache, then smell something really awful. My dad made sure everything was perfectly safe before she moved everything down. There was no explainable reason for her experiences. I've had experiences outside the house as well, in cemeteries, in other people's homes. Recently, I began to investigate haunted places in New England with my friends. Since moving into my current residence in 2005 though, I haven't had any experiences at my home. We lived in a small farmhouse with a huge backyard, and beyond the fence, an even larger pasture. I was 11 years old when we lived there, and we, the kids, would always explore the backyard, especially at night, and play hide and seek all of the time. One night, in this big backyard, I was alone and looking out at the pasture, when suddenly, I felt as though I was being watched and I turned my head to look at the house when I saw a transparent man looking at me and then he disappeared a few seconds later. My uncle had died when I was four, so I assumed it was him watching over me and ventured into the house and went to sleep. A few minutes went by with no strange happenings when I went over to a friend's house and spent the night with her. We had a little bit of a slumber party and ended up sleeping in the living room when she woke me up at about 3 a.m. in the morning, apparently scared out of her mind, and told me she had woken up to go to the bathroom that made her hair stand on end, then saw a shadowy tall figure of a man with a press suit on, no hands or feet, and some kind of burlap bag over his head with a rope tied twice around his neck. So naturally, I thought she was kidding around, trying to scare me, so I got up and ventured into the direction she was pointing, when I felt this strange sensation, and boom, like magic, he was there. I ran back and told her that I had too seen it, and she ran into her parents' room and got them out of bed, and naturally, they told us there were no such things as ghosts, and told us to go back to sleep. We lay in the living room a long time, just watching this thing pace back and forth and waiting for dawn so we could finally get some sleep. And about five in the morning, the visitor disappeared and we soon fell asleep. Never in a million years, if someone would have told me this would be the beginning of a 19 year old haunting would I have believed them. But that is exactly what happened, not just to me, but to my friend also. It seemed that this ghost visited us every night at the same time for almost two years at first, just pacing the halls, then turning things off and on, changing TV channels and radio stations. 
swinging things in the walls, just little annoying things that at our age would scare the crap out of you. One of the scariest nights I can remember was one night at my house. We were sitting on the bed eating ice cream when we both got that spooky feeling and fell silent and we smelled something burning for a second and then we heard the most guttural scary movie crowl I've ever heard in my life. We threw our bowls and ran into the living room where I felt the need to spoil the beans to my parents. Of course, they told me we were crazy and that our imaginations were great. A few months later, I was still insisting to them that something evil was in the home and they kept telling me the same thing and began asking me if I needed help like counseling or something, but I kept fighting with them about it. By this point, even my brothers thought I was insane. A few months later, my parents decided to move because I stuck to my story, and they were hoping that if they got me away from my friend, that my imagination wouldn't work overtime. We moved about 65 miles from that town to another farmhouse that was even older than the last one. The same thing was happening, only instead of pacing back and forth, the figure began to float to my bedside, lean its head to the side, and make noises like it wanted something from me. This was a nightly ordeal for a few months, and then it began to start touching me. I could never see its hands, but I could feel the icy cold prickle sensation that came with it, working its way up my bed to my legs, on my body, and even surrounding my head. Most nights, I was too afraid to move and afraid to cry out, so I laid in my bed, silently weeping. This went on for quite some time too, then it began to lay in the bed beside me and touch me off and on all night, as though it was testing me to see if I was scared and trust me. I was terrified, but when 5 a.m. rolled around, proof he would vanish. After a few months of this, in a tunnel of sleep, I finally got the nerve up to throw a pillow at him and whisper yell at him, you know, things like what do you want from me, and he began to put his head to the side, even more, in grunt, as if he was replying what? Remember. The figure always had a pressed on pinstripe suit and some kind of burlap bag over his head with a rope that showed to be strung around his neck at least two times. So I never saw a face or even heard him speak anything other than the grunts it was doing that night. But shortly after my temper tantrum, it left. Finally, a few nights of peaceful sleep until I was awakened by heavy footsteps in the foyer, going through the kitchen, which was not like him at all, and then the burnt smell again, and I was so afraid that I would hear the growl again, that I remember thinking, my parents would surely find me dead in the morning from a heart attack. To make a long story shorter, here's a list of things that happened. After that night, I never saw the burlap ghost again, but strange things and sounds and figures would keep me up all night. It was like an open portal in my bedroom. I would wake up scratched up, heavy breathing in my ears, pressure on my chest, racing black silvery balls across the ceiling, red eyes racing through my room and disappearing, laughter, waking with my arms bruised as if someone had grabbed me, something cold that I always assumed to be a hand because I felt something like a huge ring hit the bottom of my foot, grabbed me by the ankle, and almost slung me out of bed. A Bible was slung across the room and landed on my bed as I had taken to the habit of filling my room with religious items. In one night, so much activity in my room that my younger brother was awakened and came in only to turn white and started screaming into this day he will not tell me what he saw. So on to the future. I turned 18, still struggling with this haunting, or whatever you call it, and joined the military, and it still followed me. Even being stationed in Iceland, 
he was still up to no good, and my best friend, who was also my roommate, would say things like something is not right, and I was doing all of its little tricks again, like turning things on and off. But she seemed fascinated with it, so I told her the entire story, and she didn't seem to mind. She had just wondered what I had done to have this happen to me. Finally, a few years of peace without one thing happening. I am now 24 and live with my boyfriend in our three bedroom, two bath house, and nothing. Another year of peace when he tells me one morning that he felt like he was being choked in the middle of the night and he has some bruises on his arm. I say nothing because I don't want him to think I am crazy, but it keeps happening, and then I wake up, look at the clock, and it's 3am again, and something is breathing heavy in my ear. I got up, and went into our guest bedroom, and nothing, so I fall asleep for what seems like a few hours, but when I wake up, it is only 40 past 3, so I attempt to get up, and I can't move. Something is strangling me and hitting me all over. I struggle to get up, but I can't move. I can't even scream. This went on for about 15 to 20 minutes and proof the struggle is over. This time, the attack is so severe that I consider calling a team of specialists out to see what it is, but I never did. Shortly after that, my boyfriend and I split up and I moved to Oklahoma to be with my family, and nothing has happened since. Once in a while, I get a strange sensation, but I don't think about it twice, and just keep doing what I'm doing, and it has now been about two years since anything out of the ordinary happened. There are many more things that have happened during this trying period of my life, but for me to write it on here would take a year at least. For those of you who read this and think I'm crazy, I can only say that maybe someday my little brother will tell me what he saw. My fiance had just died in our townhouse. This was in 2002. He had offed himself in the head. I went back later because I couldn't go back there for a while after he had died. Anyway. I went back, and I kept feeling hand brush across my forehead. One night, I was in bed and was about to fall asleep when something grabbed my foot and was pulling it downward. I freaked out. I was the only one in the house. Then I had a friend come over because I was afraid to be alone because of these things happening. My friend was downstairs, and I was upstairs coming out of the bathroom, and a dark floating figure floated right by me. It almost ran into me, and would have, had I not stepped back. It telepathically told me it was not here for me, and that it had gotten what it wanted, and also would not look directly at me. I somehow felt like I was being protected by God, and the thing was actually afraid of me. I didn't feel scared. Later on in the month, I took a bunch of pictures of the townhouse because I wanted to remember the good times where my fiance had lived and been very happy together at one time. I was planning on moving because the memory of his death was just too much for me and I always had this creepy feeling there since he had died. After I got the pictures developed, there were 120 photos in all of several different rolls of film of different things and then the one that I had taken pictures of, the inside of the town hall. Out of all these photos, I had taken three of the exact place where he had died and only those three photos were what appeared to be flames right in the place where he had passed. It almost looked like the portal to hell, seriously, to this day. I cannot explain those pictures. They were taken with a very expensive camera. No other photos I had developed before or after that had ever had those flames in them like that. Just the three that were the exact location of his body when he died. 
My name is Malin, and I've just turned 21. I live in Sweden. In my parents' house, I've experienced some strange things that I really can't explain. My sister and I have always felt that there is a presence other than us. My parents don't believe in that kind of thing and have always told us that it's just our imagination. One of the first things I remember is that my father had gotten this stuffed animal that looked like E.T. He got it from his students as a present. I must have been about four years old and had recently seen the movie with my sister. And for some reason, I thought that E.T. was the most scary thing I've ever seen. So I didn't like this doll at all. In our basement, there are a lot of different rooms. In one of them, we had a huge box filled with stuffed animals. Every time I went down there, I took the E.T. doll and put it in the bottom of the box under all the other stuffed animals. But the next time I went down there, the E.T. doll was lying on top of the others again. This happened repeatedly every time I went down there. It didn't matter if I waited two days or two minutes. I of course asked my sister and my parents about it, but they swore that they had nothing to do with it. Of course it could be so that they lied to me every time I asked them, but I find that hard to believe. Anyway, I solved the problem a couple years later by giving the E.T. doll to one of the guys in my class. I constantly heard, and still hear, cracks and other sounds in their house, footsteps, and sometimes voices. They've always been there, and I guess I got used to it, but it took a few years before the next big thing happened. I was 15, maybe 16, and had moved down to the bedroom downstairs. I didn't like sleeping downstairs, but it was either that or a tiny room upstairs. One day, I was sitting on my bed, writing in my diary, when I heard a knock on my door. I was surprised because I was alone in the house and hadn't heard either the car nor the door open. I said come in, but when no one entered, I got up and opened the door, but there was no one there. I thought it was strange, but went back to my diary. I had hardly any time to pick up my pen before I heard another knock. This happened a couple of times and really scared me, so I locked the door and crawled under the covers. Then I heard scratching outside and froze, just to hear meow, one of my cats. At first I thought it was my cat who had caused the knocking, but I've never met a cat that can actually knock that hard. Another time I was in the bathroom upstairs, I just finished washing my hands and was outside the bathroom when I remembered that I left my watch in the shell in front of the mirror. I turned to go get it and took a step into the room when a bottle of lotion literally flew off the windowsill and landed in front of my feet. The window was closed and there was no wind to speak of outside. If the bottle had fallen off the windowsill because it was placed unstable, it would have fallen right down in the cat's litter box, but instead it flew almost 13 feet. I calmly went out of there, closed the door, and got into my room and locked the door. I've also seen a boy in the basement, a teenager. He's not transparent at all. He looks as real as you and me. I've only gotten short glimpses of him, but I know he has brown hair and a green shirt. For some reason, I most often see him around Christmas and other holidays. I wonder why. Even though some of these things scare me, I've never felt threatened, so I guess whomever or whatever is present in my parents' house doesn't want to harm us. I'm one to be afraid of the dark, but there are feelings I get. Feelings that tell me to get out, almost a communication with my location. The basement has been home to incidents experienced by me 
and my slightly older sister. My experience is weird. I went downstairs to retrieve something for my mom. When just when, I was near the stairs. An opaque dark shade of gray temporarily blinded me. Whilst running up the stairs and wiping my eyes, I swore I heard something. My sister heard something too. She was on the downstairs computer once. It had basic features. She swore she heard something whisper something close to her name. My sister sprinted upstairs as well. Finally, my parents' room. I come in on rare occasions, like when the light and TV is on, or when my mom or dad are watching a good movie. My room is on the other end of the hall. I need to pass my parents' room. When I pass their room, I see strange things at the end of the bed. I see dark, almost impish figures. Once, I could have sworn I've seen red eyes. Now, for the sound, it is very creepy, yet inconclusive. I have no idea what the sound actually is. Once, when the family and I were in the living room, I heard a broom sweep in the back of the house. Weird part, there was no broom in the back of the house. Plus, just today, on 3-20-2008, I heard something in my room exhale. I know it wasn't me. That had freaked me out. The feeling. I think I may actually have been touched too. Once, when I was eight or nine, I was watching a show on Urban Legends. I felt something run something gently down my back. It was around 10 or 11, but I got up anyway, and I went to the living room where I found my mom. I told her what happened. But she just said it was just a curtain. I lived in a home in North Salt Lake City that my children and myself had many experiences over the years that we never could explain other than the supernatural. My husband, myself and two children lived in this house for over 12 years. There's a family that now lives in the house and I do not want them to cause any problems by giving them out the address of the house. I will say that the house is located on 5th North. My children attended Jackson Elementary School when they were young and graduated from West High School. My daughter was sleeping and thought she heard her name being called and when she opened her eyes, there was a man with a beard sitting in a rocking chair holding a hat in his lap. My daughter's bed was hung from the ceiling with chains, and her bed was four feet from the floor. My daughter said the man turned his head towards her and grinned at her. She also said that her rocking chair was even with her bed and was four feet off the floor. She told me she pulled the covers over her head, and when she peeked out over the covers, he was gone. My son told me of a man with a beard and a top hat, sat on the end of the bed. My son heard his name called, and when he even looked in the direction of the speaker, the man sitting on his bed, the man grinned at him. My son pulled the covers over his head, and when he looked out, the man was gone. I was alone in the house for a few days, and on two different nights, I was awoken to the sound of music, violin, and tinky sounding piano. The lights were on in the kitchen in the front room. As I entered the kitchen from my bedroom, the music stopped and the lights dimmed. And as I entered the front room, the lights dimmed. And I found myself standing in the middle of the front room in the dark. I heard footsteps in the stairwell. And when I got to the bottom of the stairs, the lights were on upstairs. I started walking up the stairs, and with each step, the light got dimmer, and about at the fifth step, it was now dark upstairs. I could write about many other things that happened at this house. We never felt anything evil with our experiences, and it was always our own fear that scared us.
I believe the house I grew up in was haunted. My family all makes jokes about how it was just all my imagination. There were several different occurrences throughout my childhood. Nothing on a regular basis, but frequent enough for me to believe that something paranormal was going on there. I lived in this house from birth until 18 years old. I am now much older, and I still believe what I saw and felt was real and inexplainable. As a child, I always woke up in the night to get a drink of water or a snack even sometimes. I wasn't overweight, but it was a running joke in my house that I always had to get up to get something to eat at night. On several of these occasions, I would walk out of my bedroom down the short hall and into the living room where we had one of those old TVs that when you turned them off, the colors would dance for a short while and then go out. My parents were early to bed, early to rise, so I know the TV couldn't just shut off, but I would go out and there would be a human face made from those colors that actually would just swim around when it was shut off. I watched the TV during the day and it shut off and always watched to see what the colors did, but they never made the face during the day, only at night after the TV had been off for hours. The second occurrence that freaked me out completely was on one night. I was standing at the refrigerator, which was on the same wall as the doorway that led down to a small landing which is where the back door was, and the stairs to the basement were. I always felt watched downstairs, and couldn't stand going down there at night, even with all the lights on. I could do it fine during the day, but at night, it freaked me out. Anyway, the night I'm speaking of, I turned my head to the doorway. The only illumination was the light from the refrigerator, and there was a fully formed person peering around the corner from the side that would have been coming up the stairs. The horrible thing about it was that at first I thought it was my stepdad, but then I got a look at his face a little closer and it was his face, but almost evil looking. I swear it had red eyes, but that could have been a misinterpretation of what I saw. I ran back down to see where all the bedrooms were and I peeked in my parents' room, and he was still in bed. I've never found an explanation of why it could have been his likeness, but I know it was definitely scary. The first time I had a supernatural experience, I was asleep in my room at my parents' house. Now, I knew this house was haunted because in the middle of the night, I would hear something banging on my walls or my doors, and our dog, who slept inside, would bark on and off during one night, and the next night be completely quiet. But on this particular night, I saw an angel. I later found out that there is an old refrigerator under our house. Ask me why, and I couldn't tell you. Anyway, about a month after we moved in, we bought a six-year-old Shih Tzu puppy. About two days after we bought her, my fiance and I were sleeping when he woke me up and told me the dog was on the bed. This of course was impossible since she was only six weeks old, had short legs, and her bed was tall with nothing around it for her to jump on. He told me that he felt something tugging at the covers around his neck and growling, and when he rolled over it, ran and jumped off the bed. I just passed it off as him dreaming. But about a week later, while he was at work, he works night shift. I was asleep and I woke up because it felt like something was running from one end of the bed to the other and back and forth. When I rolled over, it stopped. That kind of freaked me out. Then about three months later, I woke up and saw a hand coming out of our closet door with what seemed to be a letter or a piece of paper in its fingers. The hand was small and white. When I gasped, it disappeared. Then, 
about a week after that. The bed would periodically shake while I was asleep. I later asked my fiance if he ever felt the bed shake, and he told me he did. And when he described how it felt, I knew we were both feeling the same thing. It's a subtle shaking as if we're an earthquake, except we live in Virginia, where we don't have earthquakes, at least not the kind you can feel. It was almost as if there was a big dog on the bed, scratching furiously at a flea, and he also described it the way I would have, which is when you wake up, your first thought is, man, my heart beating that hard? And then you realize that it isn't your heart at all. In just last week, I saw a young woman with brown curly hair and brown eyes peering at me from a crack in the closet door. And last night, the downstairs bathroom door slammed by itself, and the bed shook with both of us on it. Usually, it only shakes with one of us on it. Anywho, that's my story. If you have any insight, please give it to me, and you can put the stories on your site. I've had the special gift of seeing those who passed on to the afterlife, often seeing those who have long departed Earth. It happens periodically, but when it happens, I have some pretty vivid and memorable experiences. This has been happening since I was 8 years old. One of the scariest ghost encounters I had was when I was 23. I was a teacher at that time. And when I first started teaching, it had gotten very late, and I was in school grading papers. I remember it started to violently storm for a few minutes, before it stopped, after some time. At this point, it was so quiet. I was the only one in the school at the time. I had left the classroom door open, when I heard a loud banging on the school lockers, right outside the door. It startled me so much, I flinched so hard. I wanted to make sure it wasn't a break-in, so I went outside in the hall to investigate. That's when I was floored. Standing all the way down the hall near the lockers was a man in blue overalls with a long beard. He was holding an umbrella in his hands and looked so deranged. He honestly looked like a homeless squatter to me. I told him not to move at all, and that I'd be calling the cops, that I was armed with weapons, so if he tried anything, I'd attack, which wasn't true at all. I was bluffing, but I needed to scare him anyway. The next thing I know, the man starts charging at me full speed. I run back into the classroom I was just in, slam the door, and hide under the desk. I remember hearing the most intense scream for a second coming from the hallway. The lights go out, and it's pitch black for a moment's time. I started to hear a couple footsteps, then silence. It wasn't until about two minutes later the lights went back on. I screamed out loud, I'm armed, you need to leave, you are trespassing, you don't belong here, etc. I waited a minute or so under the desk, and eventually got out. Still quiet, quiet enough to hear mice, I opened the door and head out into the hallway. There was no sign of life, nobody was there, no deranged, homeless man, just nothing. The school is pretty small, it's one floor and about ten classrooms. There are, of course two entryways to get into the school, the front and back. I went to check the doors, and to my utter surprise, they had been both locked the entire time. I thought to myself, how could anyone break in? The doors are locked, no windows are open, and all of them are locked as well. Was I hallucinating? No, not at all because the man looked as real as any person I could see. So, I made sure to check all the classrooms, 
even opened the lockers to make sure this man wasn't hiding in there. But there was no sight of this guy. I did end up calling the police. They checked out the school as well and saw absolutely nothing. By morning, everyone was aware of what happened. I think they actually canceled school for the kids that day because they were worried that a maniac was on the loose. I think they made the right decision. To this day, I have no idea what it was exactly. Of course, since I'm gifted, I lean towards the idea that this was a ghost. If it wasn't, then I'm really lucky I was unharmed. It could have been a lot worse, and I'm honestly thankful that it was just me that evening. I should mention that the school does have a history of oddities and ghostly phenomena. Supposedly there was a rumor that years ago, in the indoor pool at the school, a teacher went mad and drowned a student right in front of everybody. Legend has it that you could hear the moans and cries of a young person in the pool from time to time. One of the school janitors once swore that they saw a blue figure hovering right above the pool. Unfortunately, nobody took him seriously. He actually lost his job and was put into a mental asylum because he had a mental breakdown after seeing that. Anywho, that's my story and the surrounding rumors of this haunted school. I hope this was thoroughly entertaining. I don't work there anymore. I moved to a different state and work as a teacher currently. After what happened to me, I honestly couldn't stay. Thanks for reading. I'm from Dublin, Ireland, and when I was a boy, I forget how old I was, maybe about 14 or 15. I was staying with my parents with my old aunt and my family's ancestral home. There's a very old church just up the road from the house. It's so close that you can take a shortcut across just one field and you're there. It used to be part of an old Francescan monastery. Anyway, I was in that church on my own one summer's afternoon. It was a hot day, and though the church was naturally cooler, it was only a degree or so cooler. I remember feeling a little uneasy. All of a sudden, the hackles on my neck rose. I thought my little sister had followed me in. But then the temperature literally nosedived from somewhere in the high 90s to the mid 40s in a matter of seconds. I sensed that someone or something was watching me from the choir balcony above and behind me. Something told me that as sure as hell was not human. I don't know how, but I knew. I slowly turned and looked up. Three seconds later, I was tearing down the road as fast as my legs could carry me. What I saw was the semi-transparent, cowled figure of a Franciscan monk regarding me from the balcony. He was barely there, yet details, the folds of his robe, the heavy cross about his neck, and the shaded outline of a face was visible, yet weirdly see-through. I'm now 20 and still refuse to enter that church alone. I've since asked the parish priest about it. He explained that he had seen an apparition a couple of times when he was alone in the church, but refused to comment or speculate further. I still feel funny talking about this because the only people that seem to believe me are the children around here. You described some of the things that have happened in your number two list of types of ghosts, so maybe I'm not crazy. We moved to this 120 year old farmhouse about four years ago. When we first moved here, my youngest son was three. He would ride his tricycle back and forth from the living room to the kitchen, which at the end was the basement door. He would ride his tricycle back and forth from the living room to the kitchen which at the end was the basement door. I was doing the dishes when he turned to me and asked me to stop laughing at him. I told him I didn't see anything, so he proceeded to go to the living room and back again. When he reached the basement door, 
He turned to me and said, Can you hear them, Mommy? They're laughing at me. I left it alone, but I never forgot it. As time went on, little things would happen that really got my attention, like the smell of perspiration when nobody was around. It would only last a minute or two, and it would only be in one spot of the room. I would go to other parts of the room, but could smell nothing until I went back to the original spot, and it would still be there. I would also smell it as if it were just passing by, in front of me, and then be gone. This continued for the next year, and then one day, I laid down with my son for a nap. It was about one in the afternoon. I would wait until he fell asleep, and then I would get up. But before I could move, our bed started shaking for no reason. It only lasted a couple minutes. After that, things happened a lot. My eight-year-old started to get smacked in the leg when he was asleep. He would always come downstairs afraid after it would happen. I started getting nudged on my leg at night, like someone was trying to wake me up. I am a very light sleeper, so I'd wake up immediately and look all around my bed in my room, but nobody was there. One night, when I was sleeping, I felt something lay across my legs. I tried to move, but it was so heavy, so I started to kick real hard and crazy, and it went away. Again, nothing was there. My son was five when he asked me if I could see the man's work boots standing in my dining room. He would see black things floating by and asked if I saw them. He would describe them like shadows. But the clincher was, when we were all sleeping at four in the morning and my dresser started shaking so hard, I thought it was going to fall over. I spoke to my pastor's wife about it and she said they say a prayer every night that asks the Lord to protect them from any harm or evil. My children and I started including that in our prayers, but we added spirits also. We have never had another problem since, except I do still smell them from time to time. I do still hear footsteps across the ceiling when nobody is upstairs, but that's no problem I don't mind. My mother, brother, sister, and I moved into an old house in Cambridge, New York in 1995. They had the intentions of refinishing parts of the house to make it more modern. To give you an idea of the house, it was built in 1884, had four floors, which consisted of a basement, first floor, second floor, and a full attic. Above the attic, there was a window's peak. And access was through the attic by a flight of stairs. Strange things started happening that everyone just brushed off the first week. Every night at 7 p.m. on the dot, the house would fill with the smell of cigar smoke. Nobody in the house smoked cigars. We could hear voices of adults upstairs and people running around. When we went up, no one was there. We heard knocking on the walls all hours of the day. People were heard whispering. It would get so intensely cold in the kitchen, and appliances would randomly turn on and off. My sister was coming down the stairs when she looked to be pushed from behind, and luckily my mother was at the bottom and saw the whole thing. My mother was never bothered at all. It seemed to target only the children, which were my sister, 11, my brother, 13, and me who was 15. She did hear things, and she also felt things, but never scared out of her mind. One day, my mother came to me and said she had to show me something. She took me to the basement door and said, watch. She opened the door and turned the light switch off. Then she shut the door, waited for a few seconds, then opened the door, and the light was back on, and the switch was up. We then proceeded to do this over and over again, and the same thing occurred, so we duct taped the switch off. We left that night to visit family friends, and when we returned, 
Every light in the house was on, even the basement, where it looked like someone tore the duct tape from the wall. We left the light on. From then on, everyone in the house had seen shadows and felt presences, but my brother was the one who saw and felt the most. One day, he was home alone and said he saw three men in the backyard digging by the garden. He watched him for a few moments when one of them looked up at him and all three of them disappeared. He said the men looked as real as he did. He woke up one morning with three scratch marks down the front of his chest and he said he didn't feel it, nor did he wake up during the night. My closet doors in my bedroom one night rattled uncontrollably while I was trying to sleep. This creeped me out so bad I refused to sleep or even go into the room. The room became a used office and me and my sisters opted to share a room. My sister said she felt something watch her whenever she was in the bathroom, and on one occasion, she said the shower curtain whipped open. I do believe her, because she ran out of the shower screaming and straight onto the front porch. We found out that the house was part of the Underground Railroad. When research was done on the house, it was found that it was also an underground bar during Prohibition. Many. Many people lived in that house and also passed away in the house. A woman by the name of Ann Douglas hung herself in what was my bedroom. And we also know that there was also a shooting outside of the house, around where my brother saw the three men. There were so many incidences, but too long to tell all of them. We lived in the house for five months before selling it and moving out. We have heard that people have lived there or stayed a short time before moving out. The house is currently vacant. I wonder why. I had many paranormal experiences when I was young. As I grew older, I dismissed them as fantasy of the young mind. As I grew older, they became less, but two, as an adult, stand out in my mind. One happened when I was in Germany, and the other didn't happen to me. The first time was when I was in Mittenfing, Germany. I was about 23 years old. I was new to the country, military, and looking for a place to rent. We, my ex, an atheist and I, found one. Our apartment was on the second floor. The landlord lived on the first, and there was an attic. The first night we stayed there, I had a dream about a person named Kayla. I could not see his face. All I could see was a shadow behind curtains. He was asking my ex to come with him, and I kept saying no. I had the dream several nights, but I never told my ex my dream. About one month after we moved in, I started experiencing phenomena. We had a bathroom with a skylight. I had this unnerving feeling that someone was looking at me while I bathed. Keep in mind that this was an old German house and showers are hard to come by. I also had the feeling of being watched when I went into the kitchen. Several months passed by and winter came. We had a lot of snow, and it was piling up. One day, I was in the living room when I heard this sound in the attic, like someone was dragging something across the attic. I dismissed it as snow piling up on the roof and falling. The only problem was, the snow really was falling north to south, roof pitch, and the sound I was hearing was from east to west. I ignored it for about two weeks, and the sound got so loud that I had to leave. My ex found me sitting on the landing one day and asked me what the problem was. I told him what I was hearing, and he laughed and told me it was the snow falling off the roof. I told myself, giggling, you're losing it. Several days went by, and I kept hearing the sound. I did ignore it. One day, 
I tried to lay down the couch when I heard this sign next to me. I left the apartment again. But one night, we had a party and my ex told people that I was hearing things. They laughed and I was embarrassed, but I told them open the attic door, which was between the bathroom and kitchen, and see what was up there. They did, and everyone stopped laughing. I didn't really want to see what was up there, but then again, I did. My ex told me there was nothing up there but old rags. He tried to persuade me from looking, but I wanted to see for myself, so I climbed up the stairs and looked in the attic. What I saw took my breath away. There was an old black German baby buggy sitting up there. It was full of cobwebs, and someone pushed it, and I knew what that dragging sound was. It made a distinct sound that could be heard by everyone. I actually felt sick to my stomach. We stayed there for about another month, and nothing happened. Then one night, we laid down to go to sleep when I heard this knocking on the wall above us, Three knocks. I asked my ex if we had heard that, and this is what he said. I'm going to tell you I didn't, but I did. Well, it was about two weeks after that when my ex told me we were moving. I didn't know it, but he was looking for another place. No explanations. We were just moving. As we were moving, I asked him why, and all he said was, Let's leave this place. I asked him why, and he got really mad and told me we were just moving. Well, we moved, and about six months later I asked him why we moved, and he told me that he looked up to the kitchen window, and there was a man looking down at us. I know there was nobody left in there, because I was the last person to leave. He also told me he was experiencing the same things I was, but wouldn't tell me because he was afraid to scare me. Keep in mind, my ex was an atheist. I felt chills go down my body. The next one didn't happen to me. It happened to my husband. Keep in mind that he is a Gulf War vet with over 20 years active duty military, Brook Army Medical Hospital in San Antonio, Texas. Where it stands now is not where it used to be. You actually have to go on post to see the real hospital. It was abandoned many years ago. It is barricaded off, but I would like to hear more about this building. My husband went for training last year. He's a reservist now. He stayed in a hotel across from the abandoned building. After a few days he was there, he called me and told me he couldn't sleep in this haunted hotel. He stated he woke up several times to find his stuff from his closet strewn across the floor. He also said his closet was extremely cold. He also told me that there were roaches as big as tanks. I laughed most of it off until I went there. He told me that several soldiers complained about things happening to them, but no one believes them. Well, I didn't believe him until he drove me by the old hospital and it looked like an abandoned building, barbed wire and chains with locks. After a few passes by the hospital, he told me I needed to see the hotel. He got me into the hotel pretending I was a soldier. I felt more like a prostitute the way the CQ looked at me. I will tell you, this place looks as if you stepped into the 30s. I swear they haven't changed the wallpaper since then. He kept telling me that when he looked out his window, the hospital would have lights on and the windows would be open. Keep in mind, this is an abandoned building. He took me to the room he stayed in, and yes, the whole room was cold. I could see the hospital from the window and no lights. When we left, I looked up at the hospital and I saw a room with lights on and a window open. I got the creeps. As we were leaving, he drove closer to it and there was no way anyone could have gotten in there. 
Firstly, I guess I'm what you call a sensitive. I regularly see things, hear things, and feel things that others don't. I'm usually the first one to point out when something doesn't feel right, and I've been like this all my life. During my first year at university, I stayed at Hillhead Halls, and I had the strangest experiences. For about the first month of being there, it was fine. One day, I was walking about the kitchen, and I felt a huge blast of cold and loud whispering, which really frightened me. Seeing strange things doesn't usually bother me because it happens quite regularly, but this really bothered me because it felt so, so bad. I asked my flatmate if she had heard anything, but she said that she hadn't. Just after the Christmas holiday, I came back to the worst time of my life. Firstly, there was a man walking around my flat. He was very tall wearing all black, including a black hat or hood, and you could not see his face. I saw him outdoors and inside the flat. He frequently had a black dog with him, which often walked by my bedroom door. My flatmate got really scared of being alone in her room, as she felt there was someone watching her from her door. It was about a week after seeing this man, that electrical appliances in my room started to go wrong. My electrical alarm clock, for example, would just start to beep much louder than anything had ever done before. It did not stop when I pulled the plug out. It has no battery backup. My printer would just print out random rubbish, even if it was not switched on, and light bulbs would blow if you looked at them for a long time. The electrical stuff would only happen in my room. Objects would disappear from my room, reappearing elsewhere in the flat. An example of this is that we lost a bread knife out in the kitchen, bearing in mind that I don't eat bread much, especially not in my bedroom. We found it on top of my wardrobe at the back, about three or four months after it got lost. At night was the worst. Me and my flatmate would drag our mattress through to my room and sleep there because we're too frightened to sleep in separate rooms. I would have the most horrendous nightmares, which I never got before and have never got since. At night, there would be constant bangings, tappings, and scrapings, which sounded like they were coming from the space between the walls. I think about the worst thing that I experienced while living there was getting up one morning and walking to the window at the end of the landing and looking out at the trees that are above the river dawn. On the larger branches, there were hanged people, as in dead, with a rope around their neck, swinging in the wind. They weren't dressed in modern clothing. I wanted to run away and stop seeing it, but maybe I was too frightened because my feet wouldn't move and I found it really difficult to breathe. After this, my flatmate found staying in our room, which overlooked the river dock, unbearable, and moved into the room next to mine. As soon as that room was locked, everything was fine, until it came to the end of the year, and she moved out. She moved out about a fortnight earlier than me, but I was spending most of my time in the flat above mine. After her moving out, I came downstairs from upstairs to find her door open, and light shining through onto the landing carpet. Very bravely, I went to shut the door and switch the lights off. But just as I got there, the door slammed in my face and locked, and I heard the light switch off. I phoned my flatmate to make sure she was home, which she was. I then phoned the people from upstairs and asked them to come down, and when they got to my flat, the room was unlocked again, but was totally empty and freezing cold. It was the summer, but you could see her breath was white. The next day when I got out of the shower, I found that the bathroom door was wide open, despite the fact that I'd locked the door and there was no way that the lock could open itself. Also, the bathroom door was very creaky and I hadn't heard a creak. I went to my room and got dressed as quickly as possible but I couldn't find the key to my room so I could lock up and leave. 
I had left the key in the lock on the outside of the door, but it was gone. I found it in the bathroom sink. Finally, one night, I gave my key to one of the people living upstairs to go and get me a sweater for my flat, as I was too frightened to go down. This person, who was a complete skeptic, came back upstairs completely pale, sweating cold sweats, shaking, and totally out of breath. I don't know what happened, because this person won't talk about it, and has made us all promise never to bring it up in conversation. These all sound like really weird events, but I don't smoke, drink, or do any kind of drugs, and I didn't then, but I swear they are all true. I don't want to experience anything like that again as long as I live. Thanks for letting me share this with you. My friend and I went to Alabama during our senior year in high school to visit my grandparents. Now. My grandparents lived in the middle of nowhere. Little town. You blink. You miss it. Anyway, there wasn't much to do, so one day we went exploring. Down about a half mile from my grandparents' house, at the end of the road, was a huge pasture. It hadn't been inhabited or cared for for years. There was a large gate with a no trespassing sign. This made us curious to see what was hiding back there in the middle of nowhere. We crawled under the gate and started walking. There was a gravel path and nothing else but trees, grass, and insects. We kept going for about a mile until we were in a fully wooded area. This is where the strangeness happened. First off, we stumbled across an old graveyard with only about three graves in it. it looked like a family. The tombstones were dated back to the early 1800s. I took photos that I can send at a later date if you'd like. Across from the graves was a waterfall. We decided to sit and take in the sight. While sitting there, we heard horse hooves galloping closely. We turned and saw nothing. A little while later, we heard what sounded like something being swung through the air near our heads. Nothing visible, though. It spooked us, and we decided then that we should probably head back to the house. On the way back, we heard the horse hooves again, and this time we ran. We got back to my grandparents' house and replayed our story to my grandfather. This is where it gets spooky. He said that a while back, he stumbled across the waterfall, too, and decided to sit and fish at the bank. He heard the horse too, and heard the swinging, which he described as a hatchet or something similar. Only he said that he turned and he saw a man on a white horse, carrying a machete, and appeared to be clearing the fields. But it wasn't really there, like he and the horse were transparent. He said that's when he took off running too. The only thing I can think of is that at one time, someone lived on that land which is why they were buried there. I can tell you one thing, it spooked me then, but now I just realize that people just stayed there where their home was. I haven't had any opportunities to get back to that area, but if I do, I may go visit them. I moved to Indiana in 1986. I befriended a woman who sold real estate and said she knew of this huge house that was for rent in a small town called Lamb, Indiana. It sits directly across the river from Carrollton, Kentucky, and is halfway between Vevey and Madison, Indiana. The house was absolutely fabulous, made of stone, and built circa 1800. It is told that the Native Americans taught a white man how to build the house. It became part of the Underground Railroad, during the Civil War. There was a tunnel built from the Ohio River up to the basement wall where they had knocked a hole in the wall for slaves to enter. My story starts in the fall of 1987 when my mother, my dog, and I were on the first floor in the living room watching television. My little dog ran upstairs and was running around in circles. I could hear little toenails on the wooden planks. 
I felt a cold chill, like a burst of cold air, and became puzzled by it. There were no doors or windows open in the house. It was cold out, and we had built a fire in the wood stove. I went up to check on my little dog to see what she was doing, and there it was. My room had a door that led out to nothing. I assumed there was a balcony at one time, but at this time, there was no evidence of one, so the door stayed shut and locked. When I had gone upstairs, I noticed the air was more frigid, and it seemed windy. I went to my room and the door was standing open, and it looked as though a small child had breathed on the window of the door and wrote Amy's room on the window. I think the most interesting experience in this house also happened to be the most terrifying. One night, I had been sleeping in bed with the door open when I was awakened by what I thought was my dad. I remember the door squeaked open slowly, and I heard a whisper. I couldn't hear it too clearly. All I knew was that it was some sort of talking. That's when I started to open my eyes slowly, and saw what appeared to be a nun with an axe on her head, kneeling down and praying in front of my bed. I screamed. My parents rushed into the room, and I told them I saw something. My dad did his best to reassure me that everything was okay, and after I explained what had happened to me, I feel like he was just as creeped out as I was, even though he tried not to show it. Well, that even frightened my dad, to the point at which he told me he couldn't sleep the rest of the night. I ended up falling asleep, and my dad stayed up. He told me he went to the bathroom and turned on the light, when all of a sudden, it went out. Needing to use the bathroom, he grabbed one of the flashlights we had. When he shined the flashlights towards the mirror to wash his hands, he looked at the mirror for a second, only to notice an old man's face right behind him. He only saw this for a few seconds, but he couldn't forget the man's face. He had three large gashes on the side of his face, like he had been mauled by a tiger. Claw marks. He was a balding man, with gray hair only on the side of his face, and he looked about 70s. Of course, when the bathroom light came on, there was nothing there anymore. The basement had some creepy occurrences as well. You would hear a very young voice, often singing softly, not super loud. In fact, very faint, but a voice was there. When he'd get downstairs and into the basement, you wouldn't hear it anymore, but it was always something you heard whenever you were in other parts of the house. About a year or so later, we had some family staying with us for the weekend, and my cousin set up a large tape recorder in the basement to see if there were any noises. My little nieces and three friends bedded down in the living room by the wood stove to stay warm, and we all went to bed. The next morning, one of the little girls thanked my dad for stalking the fire that night because it was getting kind of chilly. My dad hadn't been downstairs all night. My cousin went down to the basement to get the tape recorder, real to real by the way, brought it back upstairs and played it back to us. You could vividly hear a little girl say mommy. My family lived in that house for almost 15 years. This is a wonderfully chilling and rather classic, if that can be said, Scottish Tale ghost experience. My mother, who was attending university in St. Andrews, Scotland, was walking home from a party. It was about 11 o'clock on a chilly November night. It should be noted beforehand that St. Andrews was, centuries ago, the religious capital of Scotland and the ruins of the great cathedral still stand in the middle of the town. Anyhow, she decided to take a shortcut to the dorms. Instead of taking the road, she began to make her way through the soccer pitches. These were surrounded by spinnies of trees. As she crossed the fields, she noticed what appeared to be three policemen at the road at the end of the pitch, 
where she was heading. Though not that close, she could see that they wore heavy cloaks, like the Scottish policeman's coats traditionally worn in the winter. She didn't want to be found by them at that late hour, and went to the nearby trees to hide. To her chagrin, they began to move towards the center of the field, though not directly at her. She stayed put. As they came closer, she realized that they were walking on the air, about three feet above the ground. Furthermore, they were not policemen, but monks in clerical robes. Two of them were supporting a third in the middle, who seemed to be wounded. They passed only a few yards away from her, so that she saw them very clearly. Oddly, their feet moved very slowly, but they were moving through the air very quickly. When they came about parallel to her, my mother, mad with fear, ran as fast as she could back to the dorms, clearing a fence that was as high as her, with one leap on the way. A violent wind kicked up against her as she ran, as if trying to blow her back. The next day, she went back to where it happened. At the very spot where the three monks had passed near to her, she found three black cats eating the carcass of a rabbit that they had just killed. In another note, the mystery as to why the apparitions were floating is easily solved. The ground was leveled in order to make a proper playing field. The monks were simply walking on their own terrain, as it would have been in medieval times, three feet higher than the leveled field. My family has had many paranormal experiences. When my mother was a child, they purchased a house near Martins Ferry, Ohio, that had some strange occurrences there. My uncle was in his room asleep, and woke up in the middle of the night to find an old woman in a rocking chair sitting in the corner of his room. He said she told him to get out of her house. My uncle was so frightened, he literally dragged his mattress into my mother's room and refused to ever sleep in his room again. My mother and all also saw the woman and can vouch that she was real. My great-grandmother would also see a small black devil-like creature with glowing red eyes outside her window at night. None of my family's pets lived very long in that house either. Their fish were found dead in their tank one morning. All of them. Here's the thing though. The water was somehow boiling hot. My mother's hamster was found dead in its cage too, and I've been told it looked like something had maybe scared it to death from the expression on its face. Also, every night, my grandmother would dream that the house was on fire, and they couldn't get out. After living in the house for six months, they moved out. The day after they had moved out, the house caught fire and was almost burned to the ground. To this day, my aunt still has ghost experiences. At one of their old houses, they would turn out all the lights, lock the doors, and would come home to find that every light in the house was on. I never felt comfortable being alone in the house upstairs. I would feel like someone was watching me when there was no one else upstairs. And in the house they live in now, they were in bed one night when they heard a blood-curdling scream coming from their living room. They ran into the living room to find nobody there, and all the doors in the house were unlocked when they knew that they had been locked before they went to bed. Also, my aunt was in bed, and someone told her that her baby's daughter's face was covered by her blanket, but no one else was home. I swear this is absolutely the truth. I wanted to share my family's stories with other people, so they can know that maybe they are not alone out there. Hello, my name is Naomi, and I've had several paranormal stories to share. Ever since I was young, I've always been terrified of the paranormal, and I have had terrifying, vivid dreams. As a child, I would frequently awake to see a dark, shadowy figure standing by the doorframe of my bedroom. 
I would feel a presence behind me when I would walk upstairs at night. At a slightly older age, I dismissed the possibility of ghosts because I figured it was impossible, but later I had a change of heart when I went to this haunted yard. I'd heard many stories about a small yard where strange things had occurred. One night, I thought it might be interesting to go take a look at it and see what all the fuss was about. The yard is almost impossible to find, totally surrounded by trees. If you are able to find it, go there in winter. The snow is always perfect, not a single flaw. If it's a windy night, there will be no wind within the yard. The freaky part about it is, is that there is an old building which used to be an insane asylum, now abandoned. It's boarded up, but one night we opened it up and we heard a faint barking of dogs from within, but there were no dogs anywhere nearby. Next to it, there is a small trailer. No one lives in the trailer, but light and the TV are always on. There is an old swing on the yard. If you watch it for long enough, it will begin to swing slightly. The strangest part is that there are two old Native American tombstones. Every time you go back, they have been re and moved to another location on the yard. I'm not sure if any of this is ghost related, but it certainly is freaky. An incident happened to me this evening as well. I was walking with some of my friends along the railroad tracks in my town. On the street next to the tracks, a hundred years ago, there was a man who went insane, killed his family, and was hanged in the courtyard. Anyway, tonight, as we were walking, we all of a sudden simultaneously stopped and looked at each other terrified. We all felt a strange presence brushing against our backs. Later, we were sharing stories about screams people frequently hear coming back from the park. We decided to sit out on the deck of my friend's house, who lives right by the park. We were just sitting around, talking, when we hear the scream of a little girl, as if she was being murdered, coming from across the park. We randomly ran inside. Once inside, we began to share ghost stories. One of my friends believes his house is haunted. He always feels things in his room when he is sleeping. With one particular experience, back in winter, he would wake up in the morning with claw marks in his shirts and slight scratches on his back. This happened about six times. Another time, he woke up and all of his blankets were totally flipped upside down, but looked as though they had been untouched. He talked to his grandmother about it because she is able to communicate with the dead, and she visited their house and told the spirits to leave. Since then, there have been no strange occurrences. I work in a nursing home and didn't believe in ghosts till I was offered a night shift position. One of the girls said that the home was pretty bad with spirits, but I thought because of my age, 19, she was just trying to scare me. I was walking alone after answering a buzzer past the dining room when someone touched my shoulder. I turned around and no one was there. I was convinced it was the other two girls, but they were in the lounge and couldn't have got there without me seeing them. Later, we were sitting talking when the door, which is a fire door and doesn't move, was slamming and opening for about a minute and abruptly stopped. We all got out of our seats, don't know why, and then a black figure appeared at the door and just stared at us for about a minute and walked off. The eldest girl went after it, so we followed and no one was there. We sat down to calm ourselves because we were pretty freaked out by that. When the emergency buzzer started going off simultaneously, from one room to 30, but there are patients who can't reach them and others on medication, so we went and turned them off and checked our residence. We went to one lady who was dying of cancer and I turned off the buzzer 
when my coworker said she was gone. We can only think this was her having a laugh, because she was a great lady, or she was trying to let us know she was gone. That also wasn't the first time someone passed away before we were aware of it. I had a coworker once who could have sworn she was talking to an old woman at the clinic that had been at the nursing home for nearly a decade. This coworker had gone on vacation, and this was her first day back. There was a figure laying in bed, in her room alone. She was facing away from my coworker, and she had the door cracked over for a second to see if the woman wanted anything to eat. There was no response, so she figured the lady was just cranky and didn't want to be bothered. A few hours later, she went back to the room, and nobody was there. My coworker asked another why the patient was missing. The other coworker looked puzzled. Did nobody tell you that Miss Noble passed away in her sleep while you were on vacation? My other coworker said, Well, then why was there somebody in the room a few hours ago? She found out that nobody moved into the new room since Miss Noble passed away. They tried moving a patient in there for a couple of days. But we would hear him scream bloody murder for no explicable reason. But again, they took him out right away, and way before my coworker returned to work. My coworker insisted that she saw a figure in that room, and that she wasn't tired or feeling unwell. This might end up kind of being long since I'm going to try to cover a lot of what I experienced in my life. I will start with the first thing that I remember. I was about four or five years old. I was sitting in my bedroom getting some coloring books. It was summer and the window was open. I heard this noise and at first I couldn't tell where it was coming from. I looked towards the window and the sound faded. It sounded sort of like a lawnmower. Well, I went back to what I was doing, and the noise just got louder. I realized the noise wasn't coming from my window, but from the other side of my room, where the closet was. I looked over, and saw this black orb hovering over the molding of the closet. It was moving in the swaying motion, and the noise I was hearing came from the black orb. I screamed and curled up into a ball. I continued to scream until my mom reached my bedroom. She looked terrified and kept asking me what was wrong. Well, my little brain could only assume it was a black bee, which she didn't find amusing. She said she thought someone was trying to kill me because of how I was screaming. From that point on, I read everything I could get my hands on about ghosts. Nothing happened for many years after the first incident. My father was in the military, and we moved from Atlanta to Minot, North Dakota, my sophomore year of high school. I'm not going to get into everything that happened down there, since it was a daily occurrence down there, no matter where in town I was. In brief, let's just say the blacker than black negative things. Everywhere. Luckily, the people that I normally hang out with saw them too. So I didn't feel like I was going crazy. They ranged in height from being one foot to over seven feet. There was one we nicknamed Split Toes. Keep in mind, there were more than one of them. I lived in Mano for just under one year, and I'll never step foot there again. On top of the shadows, there were many other things that happened ranging from smells to noises the absolute feel of being chased, the fear. My sister even saw them. Though it traumatized her so badly, she shut down and now says she didn't. Now I know this sounds crazy, but I know there are other people out there that have experienced these things. I know that what happened down there was not an overactive imagination. We all from time to time will wake up with cuts we couldn't explain, 
or have them appear out of nowhere, sometimes singular, sometimes looking like a tiny clawed hand had hit us, and rarely, bite marks. We were told by a friend's mother to wear sage and little leather bags for protection. I still wear one, even though I'm back in Alaska. After Mano, things slowed down a lot. I had a few more experiences with the shadows. After a while, I had enough, though. I yelled at them and told them if they agreed to leave me alone, I would pretend they didn't exist, and it has been pretty much quiet ever since. The last time I had an experience like that was out in Cooper Landing, Alaska, just a few years ago. I left Mano almost eight years ago. My friend invited me and a few other people to her parents' cabin for the night. We drove out there from Anchorage at around 8 p.m. in the winter. I don't know if you're familiar with Alaska seasons and such, but in the winter, it's hardly ever light out. Maybe a couple hours a day during the time period we went out there. So anyways, we drive out to Cooper Landing in the dark on really icy roads. We finally get out there. And at first sight, this place made me nervous. I was determined to have a good time, so I forgot my initial feeling on the cabin. The night went well. The cabin was set up in a very open layout. There was a wall that went halfway across in the middle of the cabin, with the living room on one side and three sets of bunk beds on the other. Come to find out, it used to be her grandmother's cabin before she died. Well, we all decided to go to sleep. My friend and her boyfriend pulled out the futon in the living room and went to sleep. Me and my boyfriend were lying on the bunk bed where we could look into the side of the cabin where the living room was. We were just talking and then all of a sudden, we started to hear this noise. It started by the living room, but outside and worked its way around the cabin. But the noise would continue to come from everywhere it had already been. It was sort of like wailing. It reminded me of what a banshee might sound like. I was really freaking out and asking my boyfriend what the hell that was. He said it was a ghost crying. I looked out to where the living room was and this thing started to appear, starting at the top and kind of whirlwinding down. My boyfriend saw it and leapt to the bunk bed directly across and was freaking out. I started demanding he go and turn the light on. It wouldn't stop until he did. Finally he did and the thing disappeared. My friend woke up and told us things like that always happen out there and we just needed to get used to it. I was really upset she didn't tell me. Neither me or my boyfriend could sleep till it got light outside. Nothing else happened that night, but I have no desire to try my luck again. Since then, I haven't had any encounters with anything that appeared as a shadow. I've seen ghosts that appear like people look, in color, and they don't scare me at all. I'm not sure what the black things are, and I'm not sure I want to know. I do know that as long as I don't think about them, I don't have any problems with them. Oh, I almost forgot. Aklunta is a really creepy place up there. Not the cemetery, but the village, or what's left of it. I only got to spend about 15 minutes out there, but that was more than enough to feel it out. Very bad vibes out there. And as we were leaving, I saw something back in the trees. As soon as I looked at it, it darted behind a tree. It was dark out, so I didn't know what it was, but it didn't look like a person. And when we were driving back to Anchorage, on the outbound side of the highway there was an accident, and this huge bull moose was on the side of the road dead, but none of the vehicles looked like they had hit it. A moose hitting your car would crumple it like a soda can. Well, that's all I have for this morning. Maybe sometime I'll go more in depth about my experience in Mano, but not yet. I don't like talking about it when it's dark outside.
It all started when I was about five. There was a thunderstorm, and I hate storms, so I went to my parents' room across the hall. After the storm was over, I decided to go back to my room. When I got to the doorway, I saw two figures sitting in two of my chairs. I had a little table and tea set in the middle of my room, and they were just sitting there. One of them was facing me, and it looked like a pitch black shadow. The other had its back to me. I wasn't sure if it was real, so I blinked my eyes very tight multiple times. The one whose back was facing me slowly turned around to look at me. It was white, kind of fuzzy looking, like the way your TV looks when it gets all snowy in the TV set, and had two black holes where the eye should be, and an outline of the nose and mouth. I think the best way to call it is a static man. I got scared and ran and told my father what I saw. He told me that her grandfather tends to watch over us. He passed away years ago. He even said he saw this dark shadow hovering over his bed one night, although it was pretty dark, so he could barely make out anything. I later found out that an old couple originally lived in the house before my parents bought it in the 70s. The original house is small, two bedrooms, and a kitchen a small living room. It was only one story, and when my parents moved in, they said the old man died. They heard voices a few times, but didn't think anything of it. Then, when me and my brothers were born, they built a basement in second story, where the bedrooms are. My bedroom and my parents' bedroom are right above the original part of the house. My room used to be the attic, until we built the upstairs. I think the ghost from my grandfather and the old man, but I keep seeing the same ghost when I go places. I'm never scared though. Also, we've had things fly across the room, things shatter out of nowhere, hear noises, and I've had experiences where I felt a presence in the room, and then I saw a crease in the couch right next to where I was sitting. I'm not scared though because I just have a feeling they don't intend on hurting me. It actually makes me feel safer at times. Hi, I've enjoyed your website and wish to share one of my experiences. This is all true, and if you have any comments about ghosts or questions, please feel free to email me, as I'd like to know what it might have been. When I was 12 or so, I had a strange experience. I was playing with my friend in the woods near the Quib and Abduct. This is in Wayland, Massachusetts. We had to take our neighbor's police dog on our adventure, looking for the Indian artifacts. On a hill that was gravely, I found what I believed to be an arrowhead. After showing it to my friend, I stuffed it into my pants pocket and moved to a new spot with the dog. He began to whine towards some bushes about 20 feet away. I looked in the direction the dog was looking and saw nothing. Figuring it was a rabbit or squirrel, I let the dog off his leash. He began barking and ran into the bushes. My friend joined me and we called the dog back. He came right away, being well trained. He sat looking from us to the woods and panting. We put his leash back on, and both my friend and I had the feeling of being watched. I reached into my pants to see the arrowhead, but it was gone. I checked the other pockets. Nothing. Then we decided to go home. Both of us creeped out. On our way back, the dog stopped at the tree and looked up. And at least 30 feet up, we saw a piece of bloody fur stuck to the tree. We ran back to the neighbors and returned the dog, not wanting to get laughed at. We didn't tell him about the fur. My friend got her bike and went halfway to me to my house. When I got in the door, the phone rang. It was my friend. 
She asked if I was okay. I was fine. I told her. Then she'd explain she'd seen someone lurking in the bushes of the only empty house in my neighborhood, and they seemed to be following me. I dismissed it and ate dinner. That night, a storm came. The thunder and lightning woke me up. During a flash of light, I saw a tall, thin figure at the foot of my bed. I think it was a man. He wore all black, a long, odd jacket, and had very long arms. They reached his knees. On his head was a stovepipe hat that was too high and had a wide brim, so his face was shadowed. As I looked at him too terrified to scream, he raised his arms and pointed at me with the long finger. Another flash of light, and he was gone. In the morning at school before homeroom, I asked my friend to describe the person she had seen the day before in the bushes. She said he was thin and had a weird hat like Lincoln wore. Of course, I was freaked out. I don't know how much later, maybe a month or more, I was doing homework on my bed and heard scuffling in my closet, thinking it was the cat. I opened the door to scoot him out. The cat was not there, but the clothes were swaying side by side. I closed the door and left my room. The next and last time I saw the ghost was at summer camp. I had been put into a room alone, having had a panic attack over an incident in which I had a dream come true. I dreamt a kid got run over by a van, and a storm came in a cabin was hit by lightning, and kids burnt up. That day, we were teamed up and competing for ribbons. One event was a van pull. A team of kids were pulling a van. A kid fell under, and the van went over him. He was unhurt, but the license plate made a dirty mark on his back. I got scared and then it began raining very hard. Everyone headed to their cabins. It began to lightning, and I lost my mind. I'd confided my dream to my friend that morning, and as she tried to tell the counselor, I was crying and trying to warn the people about the fire I believed to be about to happen. The counselor locked me in her room, alone. A blast of thunder and lightning hit and blew the outside door open. Rain poured in, and in the storm stood my ghost looking in at me. I screamed and slammed the door shut. Luckily, fire never happened. I never saw the ghost again. I often wonder about it, and as scary as it was, it never hurt me. Please note, I know the story sounds far-fetched, but it isn't. This really happened. Hi, Sam here. I've apparently spoke to a ghost when I was two years old. To cut a long story short, I moved to Invicta Road in Charnas, Kent when I was two years old, with my dad. A year or so before we moved in, a lonely pregnant woman lived there and offed herself by hanging. Because of the pregnancy in the back room, no one lived there until my dad and I. I slept in the back bedroom. My dad told me that he would often hear me talking to someone at nights in my room. My dad asked me who I was talking to. I said it was the gray lady who sits at the end of my bed. My dad then met my stepmom and she moved in with us at nights. Sometimes my stepmom and I would sit alone and she'd hear walking around upstairs and things being moved about. It was so bad one night that she went over to her parents house to get them they brought their dog over the dog started growling and barking for no reason my dad moved me out of the back bedroom to another bedroom when i started to get upset and not sleepiness dreams and anxiety are my main feelings i get i can't walk through a graveyard without getting anxiety and i also smell a really musty smell that no one else seems to notice. It's so intoxicating that it makes me feel like I'm suffocating 
and it makes me feel sick. Sometimes it makes me wonder whether I still have this woman following me. I was recently staying at a youth hostel in Cornwall, England. The manager warned me jovially when I arrived that there were three ghosts in the hostel, all linked to different areas in the building. He added with a mischievous grin that one of them had a particular dislike for the new computer that had been installed and seemed to keep switching it off. He chose to tell me this because the reason I was there was to do some work with that very computer. After an evening of unproductive work on the computer that obviously wasn't working properly, I retired to the small private room I had been given. I dropped off to sleep fairly quickly, but woke up after about an hour feeling cold, the reason for which became clear very quickly. The duvet for my bed was lying in a heap on the floor around my feet. I picked it up and covered myself but then had trouble getting back to sleep as the couple in the next room were being very noisy. Eventually, they quieted down and I started to relax, but before I managed to fall asleep again, the duvet began to slowly slide down the bed as if pulled from the bottom. I let it move about six inches to see what was happening, then got hold and pulled back. Whatever was pulling, gave up with relative ease and I was soon covered again. At this stage, I can remember that rather than being frightened, I felt as if some silly game was going on and I was almost giggling about the fact that some impish ghost had chosen me for an adversary in its little game. As a result, after a half hour or so, I had no trouble getting back to sleep. It seemed, however, that I hadn't taken things seriously enough and had managed to cause offense. The next time I woke up, it was with a startle, as the duvet began to quickly slide off the bed, again in the same direction towards my feet. This time, I decided that enough was enough and started to feel very afraid. You know what it's like in the dark at night. A simple duvet can seem to offer so much protection and security, and the potential lack of it made me feel very vulnerable. I think I managed to move about an inch before I found myself suddenly unable to move anymore. I couldn't actually feel any force or weight holding me or pressing down on me, but I was totally unable to move my arms or any part of my upper body except for my head. In fact, it felt like it was suddenly made from lead. I was then greeted by an old man's laugh. I had literally heard a very slow guttural sounding laugh, and it sounded far from pleasant. I fought and fought and eventually managed to get my fingers to move slightly. As soon as I achieved this one small movement, everything was fine. The inability to move evaporated quickly and I was left back in full control of my body. I stood right side up, surveying the entire room, and what I saw next terrified me. There were a pair of red eyes looking at me by the door for about 30 seconds before fading away. Just then, the door opened, and there was a light mist that moved through the door and then evaporated. I screamed, I'm not afraid of you, and that tonight's rest will be a peaceful night's rest. I pulled the duvet back over myself and surprisingly only felt any kind of fear for a few minutes and was soon relaxing again. Whatever the game was about, it seems that I had won and that my adversary had admitted defeat fairly gracefully. I slept peacefully well for the remaining few hours of the night and woke up perfectly refreshed in the morning. Since I was a little girl, my sisters and I have had frightening experiences with spirits. When I was six, my family and I moved to a fairly new house, only eight years old at the time, in West Texas. 
as far back as I can remember. We had strange things going on in that house. First off at night, if you were to go through the hallway to get to my parents' room, you would always hear what sounded like a TV. You could hear voices and sometimes music. Most of the time, my parents' TV was off. If you left the room and stood in the hallway again, the sounds would be gone. Secondly, when I would try to go to sleep at night, I would always have that classic someone's watching me feeling. I always blamed it on me being a young child. The house was a very scary place to be at night. Wherever you went, someone was watching you. Friends who have spent the night rarely stayed twice. The areas of the house that scared everyone the worst were the hallway to my parents' room and my older sister's closet. The closet always had a feeling of hate radiating from it. I tried to spend a night in there with my scared sister, and it didn't last. I was sleeping on the floor with my head next to the closet, and that just wasn't a good feeling. I went back to my room after she fell asleep. A couple years after we moved in, my younger sister had a frightening experience. Her and I shared a bedroom with our beds parallel to each other, with a nightstand in between us. We were about three feet apart. One night, I woke up to her screaming my name. I woke up and asked what was wrong. She told me that, for no reason at all, she woke up and looked over at my bed. Laying at the foot of my bed was a light blue glowing figure of a woman. Her eyes were gone, and her mouth hung open. My sister described her as looking dead. My sister also added that she couldn't see me anywhere on the bed. So she started screaming my name and closed her eyes when she opened them. I was awake, asking her what was wrong. She told me, and I looked down at the foot of my bed, and my huge stuffed animal that I had there every night was sparking like it had really bad static electricity. I took it off my bed and threw it in my bathroom sink and ran water over it. Being young, I thought it would help. Years later, my family and I moved to southern Louisiana and moved into a gated subdivision. One night, my two sisters were mad at me and left the house to go on a walk. I followed them without them knowing. I followed them up to the front gate of the subdivision and talked to them for a minute. They quickly left in a huff, being that they were still angry with me. For what, I don't remember now. I stayed by the gate for a couple of minutes afterwards and then decided to run to the end of the main street and hide behind some bushes that faced the gate. I waited for my sisters to walk by, and when they did, unaware where I was hiding, stopped remotely in front of the bushes. I heard a younger sister say, What is Jenny, me, doing, sitting on top of that stop sign? The stop sign is located next to the gate. After that, they walked on. I was a bit confused and was about to chase after them, but then... Through the leaves, I saw a shadow of someone running past the bushes I was behind. I could also hear the sound of footsteps. I stood up quickly to see who was there. No one was in sight. After this, I ran to my sisters and told them what I had seen. They then told me that they saw me, or what looked like me, sitting on top of the stop sign. They said I had a very angry, disfiguring grin. After we traded stories, we ran home quickly. Later, my younger sister told me that the ghost she saw in my bed and the ghost she saw in the sign both looked exactly like me. It all began around the 1st of June this very year. The incident took place in my grandmother and grandfather's home. My grandfather had been diagnosed with cancer. In the summer of 1998, I didn't know that, that those last few months would be the last time I would ever see him alive. During that period of time, 
I had spent a whole lot of time with my grandparents, and it felt like I had actually gotten a little closer to them both, but particularly my grandfather. At the end of the summer, I left and went back home. Subsequently, about five months later, our family received a disturbing phone call. It was from my grandmother, informing us about the passing of our grandfather. He had passed away in the hospital, which was the very last place that our grandfather lived in before his passing. A month and a half after we had been staying there, I noticed that something just didn't feel right. The whole atmosphere had changed. I decided to take the guest room. For some reason, I always got the feeling that I was being watched in the guest room. Then, other little occurrences started to evolve. The very first was, I always felt like somebody was standing over my shoulder. I started to notice scars on my back after I would awake in the mornings. I would feel like touches on my back. My mom and brother both complained about the door handles being rattling and opening and closing really fast. Cabinet doors would fly open and the pots and pans would all fall out. My hair would get pulled in the night. Diminutive objects would fall from midair, such as paper, hair clips, and coins, and I would hear voices, one of which said wake up very loudly in my ear. I would see mists and rays of light shoot past me extremely fast. So fast, in fact I would hear a whoosh of air. I would notice some of my belongings missing, such as my CDs, jewelry, money to name a few, usually belongings that I would use around the house. I would feel my bed move, as if someone were to bump into it during the night, flickering lights, and last, but certainly not least, since animals can sometimes see things humans cannot see, my cat would turn her head really fast and just stare at something, which I would not be able to see for a significant amount of time. A little while later, about a month after being there, I saw the unthinkable. After I'd been sound asleep for about seven hours or so, I woke up suddenly to a spirit at the foot of my bed and it was my grandfather. I could not believe what I was seeing, but I will describe this to you in full detail. There was no doubt in my mind that this was actually a spirit. He was shadowy like, but his clothing was colored. He would always wave at me, and sure enough, he was waving my direction with a smile on his face. It was plain to see that he was trying to get my attention. He just wanted to see me. I was too afraid to move a muscle, in fear that in spite of everything else that he would approach me. I'd never seen anything like this before in my entire life. I didn't want to tell this to anyone though. I thought that maybe nobody would believe me or listen. About a week later I was in the kitchen with my mom, and she told me that the guest room was where our grandpa had stayed in before he died, because he was too ill. That explains the reason why that very room felt like the most eerie room in the house. I almost fainted when I discovered that, but I knew that a spirit can travel anywhere in the home, even outside or in back of the house. But it wasn't until a month later that I decided to come out with the news. I first confided in my mom and my brother, and my mother believed me, because she said that before I brought up anything that I had said. Our grandmother had experienced the exact same thing, that he was at the foot of the bed watching over her and smiling. I had a phone conversation with her and I let her do all the talking first and everything that she told me measured up with my experience and it only happened to my grandmother and I, whom he was the closest with before he passed away. Everyone was wondering why I didn't scream or attempt to run out of the guest room as soon as I saw him, but I was too afraid. Whenever you're that close to something like that, it just takes your breath away completely. I was in my own little calm. It felt very uncomfortable. It wasn't until I started sleeping on the living room sofa that I felt appeased, albeit this has not been my first experience. Ever since the age of five, 
My family and I started traveling around a lot, and we would move here and there. I've went to nine different schools total. I'm 17 now. In previous homes, I've experienced a whole lot. I lived in a haunted house for a total of three years. Not only by all of the experiences that I've endured, I've been doing many researches involving the paranormal. I'm really good at picking up on things too, which I've found out. There was this one house that we went into that we were thinking about purchasing, but I felt like something was wrong. There were several rooms in the home that I could just not stop venturing off into. The main ones were the master bedroom and the study. After I left the house, I told my parents that someone from the house must have passed away. So my mom went to go look up the history of the house. And sure enough, the owner and his wife on a trip to California got killed in a car wreck. And they lived in the master bedroom. And the owner spent most of his time in the study. After I was enlightened with that information, I was in disbelief. I still am to this day too. My mom told me that it goes back to her being Jewish and Indian. She said that she can pick up on and see things too. She claims that it's an Indian thing, but I don't know. Maybe it is. Anyways, God bless everyone and thank you for your time. Great website, by the way. I'm a current visitor. When I was in high school, my family lived in a rented farmhouse in the country. I was 17 and dating a very nice gentleman who had come to visit me for the evening. My mother worked nights and usually got home around 11 p.m. or so. My boyfriend and I were sitting on the floor in the living room, leaned up against the couch watching TV, when the kitchen door opened and the light came on. We both heard a thump like my mother had put her purse on the table, and then the bathroom door opened and closed. We both thought that was odd, because usually my mother would not have turned on the light, because my dad is a light sleeper, and the light would have woke him up, and my mother would have at least said hi to us anyway. My boyfriend noticed that it was getting late, and he needed to get home. We had expected snow and he didn't want to be caught in a storm. I got his coat, and we walked to the door together and stood on the back porch watching the snowfall. As my mother pulled in, my boyfriend made us both wait on the porch as he searched the house from one end to the other. No one was in there other than my sister, upstairs asleep, and my dad, who was sound asleep in the back bedroom. Many other things happened there. One night, me and my boyfriend decided to play the Ouija board to summon the spirit that was residing in the house. I remember it was a blizzard that day, and my entire family except for me were in another state visiting my extended family. We were asking questions about the spirit. At first we asked its name. Nothing happened. Then we asked if we were bothering it. Still nothing. After nearly 20 minutes of continuously trying to get in touch with someone, my boyfriend angrily grabbed the planchet to Ouija board and threw it out of the window. He said he had enough of this make-believe and that he was really starting to get tested. I told him he shouldn't have done that, that he could really upset whatever was living in the house. My boyfriend mockingly says, Sure. Why doesn't this stupid spirit just possess me if it even exists? Make some real noise. My boyfriend gets frustrated and ends up sleeping on the couch because he was tired of playing games. Later that night, around 3 a.m., I was awakened in the middle of the night to hear my telephone landline ringing. The only problem was there was no landline telephone here. We all had our cell phones, and they were on silent. Seconds later, I hear loud pounding on the door to my bedroom, and it slightly opened. I yell out to my boyfriend, but there was no answer. I hear the phone ringing again, but I couldn't locate the sound. Then, 
everything fell silent. Not a second later, I hear a gargling noise coming from the living room, mixed with prayer. It was coming from my boyfriend's mouth. He was violently whispering in his sleep. What really got me though, as I went to see my boyfriend on the couch, there was this very dark cloud floating above him for a few seconds. It disappeared, and then I heard my boyfriend choking, so I ran towards him. He was literally pale in the face, almost as if he stopped breathing. That's when I realized he did seem to stop breathing. I frantically shaked him, yelling at him to wake up. I started getting scared, and I cried. This time, my phone went off, and someone was on the other line. All I heard was what sounded like a low voice saying call, and the phone call disconnected. This was on my cell phone. I then called the paramedics. They arrived. Paramedics were in my house, checking my boyfriend's pulse. That's when he wakes up, delirious, but confused. He asked me what's going on. After talking with the paramedics and my boyfriend, they were convinced that he had a panic attack in his sleep, and they ended up leaving. But he told me something very scary. He said that while he was asleep, he had this odd dream that someone was trying to get him to go to the afterlife with them. There was this hooded figure who said nothing to him. He was just motioning towards the sky. And then all of a sudden, he was in a cemetery and saw himself in a coffin dead. I told him, this all makes sense because you threaten the spirits. This is 100% true and all I have is my word. But believe me, these events happened. I can't explain the mysterious phone call. I'm sure that my boyfriend challenged the spirits to make some noise because it certainly made some noise. My girlfriend Liz and I haven't been together for very long, but we share a passion for ghosts and hauntings. On our second date, we went to a couple sites in our county that are supposed to be haunted. The scariest one has to be the Jericho Covered Bridge, located in either Falston or Jarrettsville, depending on who you ask. As Liz and I drove up to the bridge, a heavy fog rolled in, almost like the ones you see in the old movies, set in places like London. This was weird, because Liz and I have been driving around the county for the last two hours, and we had only encountered fog in this one place. Maryland was a neutral state during the Civil War, but racism ran deep here. The Jericho Covered Bridge is a grim reminder of that. It is a well-known local legend that runaway slaves were hung from the rafters of the bridge and sometimes left there for days. As we drove over the bridge, we both felt a chill and a sense of terror in the air. Like the bridge had been in fact the scene of unspeakable horror, neither one of us really wanted to leave the safety of the vehicle to take the pictures we were so willing to take just a few minutes prior. Eventually though, we did take the pictures, and when we got them developed, we found only two pictures had turned out. In the first one, you can see some kind of disturbance in the air towards the rafters, and in the second one, we can definitely see an orb in the area where just a minute before, the unidentified disturbance had manifested itself. A couple of months ago, I was living in a house with similar history as the Hanging Bridge. It was a super old Victorian style home, very big, wide and spacious, multiple rooms. A few things happened that I thought was very spooky. The first incident happened when I was sleeping with my girlfriend in bed. In one of the rooms upstairs, we had an old music box that was in the dining room. It came with the house. I was awoken by the sounds of the music box playing by itself and could see that the door was slightly opened. Needing answers, I hopped out of bed to investigate, not understanding how the music box could play by itself. 
Needless to say, I made a gigantic mistake. As I opened the door and faced the stairs, I saw a dark shadow move directly up the stairs and then disappear. I froze for a second, almost chickened out, but decided to go downstairs anyway. To my surprise, there was nothing there and all was silent. The music box had stopped playing. Another time, I was standing in the kitchen with one of my friends and we were the only two people in the house at this time. We decided to use a spirit box and play with the Ouija board to conduct a session. I was fairly convinced that there was a spirit that needed guidance and was lost. We asked the spirit box multiple questions, but at first, no response was given to us. After nearly an hour, being frustrated, we nearly gave up. That was until we asked the spirit to give us a sign that they were still there. My back started to hurt, like some kind of pressure was being applied to it. I said to the ghost, is that you on my back? Now get this, the spirit box sounded like it said death on the bridge. This immediately startled us, knowing that down the road was the hanging bridge. We tried asking it follow up questions after that, but the spirit didn't say anything. And just like that, the pressure on my back disappeared. I was starting to think that the ghost was trying to tell us that they were one of the ghosts that tragically passed on the bridge. The last incident happened in the kitchen. The kitchen door was slightly opened, and all of a sudden, I heard what sounded like a girl's whisper in my ear. As I looked towards the door, I saw a lady, I think, who walked past the door. At first I thought it was my friend Laura, who always used to wear jeans. So, I popped my head around the corner to try and scare her, but there was no one there. I wasn't scared, because it was in the middle of the day. I actually found the experience quite exciting, but also unexplainable. To this day, I've always thought these incidents were all related to the hanging bridge. The Job Corps in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I was a student there in 1973. Since then, there has been a lot of renovation on the buildings, but when I was attending the Job Corps, it was pretty much the same as it was when it was an orphanage. One night actually at 2 a.m. in the morning, when I came back to the dorms after babysitting, I had to walk across the campus to get to my room at the far end of the campus. While walking down to my room, all was very quiet in the dorms. Out of nowhere, I hear what sounded like children laughter in the distance. It was very faint, but I could definitely hear something. Yet, through the faintness of the sound, you could still hear shouts of glee and anger as little children would do on a playground, if that makes sense. This happened behind the little chapel that was there, but the sounds came right there from behind the old chapel. And while I looked and squinted, I didn't see anybody there. I thought to myself at the time, why would parents allow their children to play so late outside? It was cold and it was dark. Meanwhile, my hair was standing on end and I tested the wind to see if the noise was carried from another place. Noises can carry long distances. There was no wind at all. At the time, I didn't know that the job corps used to be an orphanage until the next morning when I was talking to my friend about hearing those children. This service worker told me that she used to work there as a service worker for the orphanage. She told me the voices I heard were probably the little children that died of broken hearts while she had worked there. Her face went pale as she told me that the children she thought were treated cruelly.
there are two versions of this legend that I know. It's called the Devil's Footprint. The first is about a construction worker that was aggravated with a boulder that would not budge. The man stepped on the boulder and said, I will give my soul to the devil, this boulder will move. By the next day, the boulder had moved and there was an imprint of a human foot and a hoof print of the devil. The man was never seen again. The other version is about a farmer that was having a terrible harvest. He then said, I will give my soul to the devil if I had a bountiful harvest. Indeed, the farmer's harvest was bountiful, and he made plenty of money. The farmer was quite pleased with himself until the day the devil came to collect. The farmer refused to give the devil what he wanted, and a chase ensued. They ran all around the farmer's land, and the chase ended when they reached a cliff. I believe the footprints happened when they had their final fight at that cliff edge. I've heard many stories about the devil's footprint being haunted. My fiancé told me about occurrence that happened when he was there with his brothers when he was about 13. He said that his brother was contacted by a ghost, according to him, and his brother swears this very day. He was standing in front of the church doors, and being a rebellious young man that he was, he attempted to kick the doors open. At the moment his foot hit the door, it swung open and knocked him off the steps. Now, you may be thinking, that there was probably someone on the other side of the door playing a prank. But keep this in mind, the doors open inward, not outward. I also know someone that was there very late at night, and she swears that she saw hooded men walking in the edge of the woods. I myself had an experience of sorts. One night, a friend and I decided to go find the place. We drove and drove, and we couldn't find it. When my friend was so sure she had driven too far, she turned back. We figured we'd better wait until daylight to look for it, so we turned on the road that we thought would take us home. And what did we see? The old cemetery, and that unmistakable white church. Of course, we freaked out. My friend swerved and barely escaped going off the road. By this time, we were both feeling a little unsettling feeling in our chests. Now whether this was due to some unwelcome presence or fear, I'm not certain. I'm assuming the latter. However, needless to say, we didn't stop there that night. My name is Bobby, and I was checking out your website and I decided I should send in my own story. We live in Gross Point Shores, Michigan. This event happened on Monday, August 15th, 2005. One day, my brother named Vince was on the computer at about four o'clock when he heard a scream. He ran upstairs to find me and my older brother named Sam. Vince asked what was wrong and we asked him what he was talking about, and he said he heard a woman scream, and we said nobody screamed. We were also the only ones in the house. We got scared, but eventually thought that Vince was probably hearing things and forgot about it. But a week later, me and Sam saw this website and said the check of something was haunting our house. We checked everywhere, but found nothing. But just as we were about to give up, Sam said to me that we never checked the attic. This was the first time that anyone was up there in the attic in a very long time. We got to the attic door and opened up the hatch, and a ladder came unfolded from the top of the door. We started climbing up the ladder and got to the attic, and it was all dark. I felt the wall right behind me and found a light switch. I flipped the switch, and a dim light turned on. 
there was this old rocking chair rocking back and forth. The one that my grandmother used to have before she died. We totally forgot that we had gotten it and threw it up in the attic. Either way, we were freaked out. After about two seconds, we heard a scream so loud that it knocked me backward against Sam. We climbed as fast as we could down the ladder and shut the attic door. We were so scared that we didn't tell anyone except Vince about what happened. We checked the time and it was exactly 4.06. We now know that Vince heard the scream from the attic a week earlier. All we know about the people that lived here before us is that they were the Andersons and that they were an old couple that lived here and raised their kids here. I don't think it was my grandma's spirit because she was always a gentle soul and wouldn't scare us like that. Anyway, after all the kids moved out and Miss Anderson died, a short while after that, he sold his house to us about four years ago. I believe Miss Anderson was the one who screamed. I guess she was mad that we stole her house from her. When I was a freshman in high school, my parents moved us from the city in central New York to a big, empty house in the country. Little did we know that the house is haunted. So many things happened there that even my skeptical dad began to believe that we were sharing the house with someone or something else. My best ghost encounter occurred in the middle of the day. I walked into the bathroom and saw from the corner of my eye someone that I thought was my youngest sister. I said hey Lori, but she didn't answer me. Annoyed, I turned to find out what her problem was, only to realize that it wasn't her at the sink. An old woman with gray hair up in a bun, a pink flower dress, and a white apron was drying her hands. She turned to look at me, and then she disappeared. We weren't often frightened of the ghosts and missed them when things seemed to be quiet for too long. We would lament that they didn't like us anymore. One day, I was in the house, and I went into the shower. All of a sudden, there was a huge noise. I thought a plane hit the house, or at least there was a terrible car accident outside. I jumped out, grabbed my rope, and went to investigate. I found nothing out of order at all, so I got back into the shower. Not two minutes later, I heard that huge noise again. I jumped out, shaking this time, and checked everywhere, but again, there was nothing to find. I decided to skip my shower. I had a ghostly nightmare about this house before even moving in. My family moved into the house, and from day one, things were creepy. People before had moved out in a hurry, and their family broke apart almost instantly in four months. They all spread to four different places. When we moved in, we all got terribly sick within the first month. My mom had a life-threatening experience. My sister ran away. All the pets in the house died mysteriously, with no known cause of death. My parents divorced. All of this happened in only four months. I walked into the house after school one day, and I heard my name being called. I knew no one was home, because none of the cars were in the driveway. The voice calling my name sounded exactly like my mother, and I looked all around for her, even though I knew that she was presently in the hospital. Within the next few days, and a few more creepy paranormal events, all four of us left in just as much of a hurry as the one before us, leaving most of our personal belongings. We all split, each of us in a different car, to different places away from each other and away from the house. I will never go back to see it. 
nor would I wish the haunting of the house on anyone else. Hello. I lived at this house from 97 to 99. It was in Atlanta. My family and many of my friends were witnesses to the occurrences. Voices, electronics malfunctioning, dark figures. It happened day and night, but mostly at night. It is an older white home near the river, and for a while, we had a rat problem. The plumbers had left a hole under the bathroom sink. The rats, who were fond of shiny objects, left two human molars, complete with silver fillings, on the bathroom floor on two separate occasions. The back of the home had a foul odor off and on, and the crawl space had been cemented over. I'm an investigator for the state, not a hysteric. But the place made a believer out of me, my family, and half a dozen friends. My then four-year-old son complained of the man in the mirror with a string around his neck. Voices were male and female, also a small child. I have often felt the crawl space needed to be examined, just never could figure out a way to ask the officials to do such. I truly think that there is a body her bodies under that house. Myself and a girlfriend watched as a man-shaped shadow moved across the dining room wall into the kitchen where the light turned on while we're checking out if you can get the new owner's permission. So when I was about 17, my family had just moved back to Canada from living in the USA. It was a bit sudden, and being a family of six, it was a little bit of a scramble to find a place to house all of us before the snow hit. So, my mom and dad decided to live in an old house that my grandpa had on his property, just for the duration of the approaching winter ahead. The house was my great uncle's, and my grandpa skidded from my brother's property to his place. Now my grandpa has two quarter sections, and this house is tucked way back away from the main house, so the powers ran from the main house, and with it being so far away, there is no running water. This house is old, so to add to the running water, there also is in heat, only a wood stove, just to give you an idea of where we were living in. Me, being a 17 year old. I often stayed in town and didn't stay there very often. I specifically remember the first time it happened. I was in my bed. I was the only one who would stay downstairs. With the wood stove, everyone wanted to sleep upstairs since it was warmer. So I was just starting to fall asleep and I started to feel the room get really heavy. I remember the feeling of not being alone. The doorway didn't have a door on it. It only had a beaded curtain, and I could feel it standing there. I then remember having the feeling of total fear rush over me and frozen to my core with it. Then, it moved closer, and I felt the bed move and someone crawl right beside me, not in a way that was super noticeable, but in a sneaky, slow, sloth moving type of way. I specifically remember wanting to vomit with fear. Then I felt it, the feeling of an unshaven face rub against mine. I scrambled out of bed, holding my blanket, and ran up the stairs to my parents' room. I was so out of my mind with fear that I couldn't even scream. I slept on the floor with my dad's side of the bed. The next morning, mom was wondering why her 17-year-old daughter was curled up at the foot of her bed, and I told her what happened. Later that morning, we walked over to my grandpa's house to have breakfast and go chat. My mom brought up my wild story. My grandpa and grandma silently listened as my mom was laughing at the last bit of the story. 
my grandparents got really serious and turned to each other. Apparently, this has been an issue in the old house and they didn't want to tell us, hoping we didn't acknowledge it, and then it wouldn't bother us. I can honestly say it didn't feel angry or upset. It just wanted to cuddle. I didn't stay there much after that. I moved in with a cousin in town. While serving at RAF, Middle and Hall, with USAF, 1993, 1994, I lived with a roommate from Santa Rosa named Greg. Santa Rosa is located in New Mexico. We both originally lived in the dorms on base, but got special permission from our first sergeants to move off base together. This was due to the fact that we did not drink alcohol, and drunken parties were a constant among our roommates, and in the dorms, in general, 24 hours daily as airmen worked three shifts. We were both practical-minded Air Force aircraft mechanics with serious responsibilities, and not given the flights of fancy, and had no previous interest or experience in the paranormal or occult. I simultaneously dated an English man I would later marry named Bill. The cottage only had a coal fireplace for heating. Greg did all he could to keep the coal stoked, but the house never warmed, and coal always died out quickly, despite large piles of coal Greg stoked well often. The phone rang at various hours day and night, with a loud, hissing static. There was a faint, but unmistakable sound of someone whispering loudly through the static, but the words were always unintelligible. Calls to the operator to discover where the calls came from were answered that we had not received any phone calls at all during these events as far as the phone company was concerned. The call simply came from nowhere. Reg worked a night shift. I worked days. Every night, I heard heavy footsteps come up the stairs to the bedroom landing, four square feet, and back downstairs after varying lengths of pause. When I was home at night, these heavy footsteps occasionally went into Greg's room. When he was at home, he heard the steps enter my room a few times. 500-year-old stairs creaked very loudly beneath thin carpet when no known humans were using them. The human footsteps could be heard anywhere in the cottage. These phantom footsteps were much, much louder and projected a foreboding emotion to the roommate at home when they occurred. The rocking chair in the living room near the fireplace rocked off of its own accord on a regular basis. Once, Greg and I were simultaneously TDY or assigned temporary duty to separate bases for a few months. We locked the cottage down tight as a drum. A friend agreed to check the place from time to time, but as all doors and windows remained locked, he never went inside. I returned before Craig did. Every object in the kitchen that could be moved, such as culturey, dishes, pots and pans, bread bins, knickknacks, whatever, were taken by someone and all dumped in the middle of the living room floor. Nothing was missing. It was simply transported to the middle of the living room and unceremoniously dumped there. At other times I was TDY and Greg experienced occurrences more often and more intensely for him when I was gone. However, his worst experience happened unbeknownst to me while I was deep inside the cottage. One night, as Greg went out to his car to go on duty, he saw what are sometimes called a shadow figure, but in much more detail. Greg was not bothered by the unmistakable occurrences in the cottage until he met this thing. It was blacker than black, the outline of a large adult male, about six and a half feet tall, be his estimation. No facial or other features, except glowing eyes that looked at Greg in such an evil way. Greg said he was scared to death. He 
complained without hearing a sound that this thing was unmistakably evil and had ill intentions, to say the least. Greg got in his car, a true British yellow mini, and sped away as soon as he could. There is a broken down shed directly behind the house in the backyard. Both Craig and I looked into it from time to time, but refused to enter until one day we agreed to go in together. We both experienced an unexplainable strong sense of being watched from up close, though no one else was on the property. The sensation we both agreed at the time was an evil one. We both thought we heard heavy breathing, but neither one of us wanted to jump to the conclusion and appeared to the other one to be easily duped by what we couldn't explain. There's a storage area on the side of the house that cannot be accessed from inside the house. Only by the door outside the storage area, attached to the side of the cottage. Craig and I both hardly dared to look inside after our first time inspecting the property. There were no electrical lights in the room. There was junk and building materials scattered around, as if someone dumped everything from the ceiling and materials changed positions from time to time. Occasionally, the taps, faucets in the bathrooms upstairs, turned on and off on its own accord, yet both hot and cold tap levers were always in the off position. Every unexplained occurrence was of an extremely strongly sensed nature. It always got our attention, except for the static phone calls and the chair rocking itself. Most activity took place when there was only one roommate in the cottage. Neither Greg nor I had ever experienced anything paranormal before. At least, he had not anything to this degree. Of the photos taken inside and outside the cottage, there is nothing remarkable. No orbs, light streaks, vortices, apparitions, etc. The Englishman I was dating and later married was a complete skeptic, but strongly disliked being in this cottage. He would only state, something is wrong with this house, something is strange about it. For his degree of skepticism, that was quite a statement in itself. When a man with a young teenage girl moved into the other side of this duplex cottage, Greg and I decided to warn her without giving anything specific away about the occurrences, so we weren't planting suggestions in our mind, knowing teenagers are very impressionable. We simply welcomed her, made chit chat, then told her when she was alone if she was ever uncomfortable or frightened, telling us she was in her bedroom alone when she audibly heard a voice call out for her. She had no history of hallucinations, swore she did not mistake it for a conversation she heard through the walls, which would not have occurred for that night Greg was on duty at the base, and that the voice was male, not matching Greg or myself. Shortly after this, I moved in with my fiancé in a nearby town, largely to get away from the occurrences, and soon lost touch with Greg entirely. The paranormal occurrences in the cottage were constant, in one form or another, and experienced intensely. It carried a heavy pull of fear or, at times, dread or terror everywhere in that cottage that never ever left. Never anything that could be called benign or benevolent. In the summer of 1996, I bought a large home in a nice, older neighborhood. My fiancé lived with her parents at the time she was still in college, and I was living with my parents since I'd just gotten out of the army. We were really looking forward to getting married and having our own private place. The first night in the house felt very strange to me, but I chalked it up to being a newlywed in a new home. As time went by, the strange feelings did not abate as they thought it would. I felt more and more apprehensive 
especially when I was in the house alone. The house made very strange noises when I was there by myself that it didn't make while Sandy was home with me. Also, I asked Sandy if she heard any strange noises when she was there alone, and she said she didn't. I tried to ignore the noises in apprehension, but it was getting harder and harder from the upstairs. There were just the two of us in the house, and the bedrooms upstairs were only used for storage. The footsteps seemed to pace back and forth in the upstairs hallway. Sandy claimed she never heard any of the sounds and was calling me paranoid and crazy. At first, the footsteps were confined to the upstairs, but eventually they came downstairs and into our bedroom. Whatever was making the footstep noise would come up to my side of our bed and stand there for several minutes before walking straight out of her room. I heard other strange noises in the house, like the sound of an animal growling and scratching noises in the walls. Someone or something knocked on our front door one morning at 3 a.m. so loud that I thought the door was going to come off the hinges. Of course, Sandy never heard anything and accused me of trying to scare her. I began to see small, black humanoid figures darting in and out of the corner of my vision. They would shoot behind furniture or duck into some rooms when I tried to lay my eyes directly on them. I saw them during the night and day and began to see them more often and often. I would often get this odd feeling that someone was behind me and if I quickly turned around, I could see one or more of those things run away. One day, when I turned around to try and see the little black things, I saw a large black thing at the other end of the hallway. It was about six feet tall, and though I could not make out any features, I could tell that it was a human shape under a cloak, and it did not run away. It just stood there for several seconds to let me get a good look at it, and then it slowly disappeared. I saw that apparition several more times over the next few months, always standing some distance away and just looking at me. I was really getting scared, and it came to the point that I did not want to go home at night. The experiences were taking a huge toll on our marriage. Sandy would blame me for scaring her with reports of things that were not happening in her mind just to cause trouble in our marriage. She would not begin to convince that I was truly scared and that something was really happening, even if she did not experience it. We stayed married for a total of 30 months before she moved out of the house and filed for a divorce. But here's where the story gets even stranger. The day she moved out of the house, the frequency and intensity of the experiences began to diminish. That night, the footsteps did not come downstairs like they always had in the past. I saw the large black apparition only one time after she moved out, and that time it was translucent, as opposed to being completely opaque as it had been before. It also did not stick around as before. Once I saw it, it vanished. Four months after she was gone, all the activity ceased. The house was quiet and still, and I no longer felt that apprehension I wrote about earlier. I've since remarried, and we live in the same house with our children. I thought that the experiences might return once I brought my new wife into the home, but they didn't. If they had, I would have sold the place. It had to be something associated with Sandy. Maybe she was into the occult or something. I spent plenty of nights with her in her parents' home when they were away, before we were married, and never experienced anything like what happened in the house. Perhaps it was the combination of her and the house that was the problem, but I hope not. If it were, then that means the same thing could happen again, and I don't want my family subjected to that.
I'm writing to tell you my story. I was reading Dave's story, and it's so close to the experience that I had that it actually gave me chills. My first paranormal experience happened to me when I was four years old. All the experts say the things that happened to someone before the age of five is very hard to remember. The funny thing is, is that I can remember my experience like it was yesterday. My mother, sister, who's three years younger than me, and myself. I remember being asleep in my bed and waking up very suddenly. I looked at the doorway and I saw this full-bodied figure. The only thing is that it was completely white. I'm not talking like white, like a white wall. I'm talking white like energy. This figure to me was a child. The reason I believe this is actually because of its height. I mean, it did not have a face or anything like that. It walked towards me and got on my bed. I remember pulling the blanket up over my head because I was so scared, but I actually felt it on the bed. At that point, I ran screaming and crying into my mom's room. Her boyfriend got up and walked me back to bed to show me there was nothing to be scared of. When we got there, it was gone. Now let's fast forward to the age of 17. By this time in my life, my mom had gotten married, not the same guy from when I was four, and they had bought a house. It was a tri-level with a full finished basement and a sub-basement. From day one, something felt very odd in the house, almost like a very heavy, unwelcome feeling. The sub-basement was probably the strangest. When you would walk in there, you could see spray paint all over the walls. I know that's not strange, but when you stood in the center of the room, you could see that the spray paint was actually covering up what looked like writing on the walls, and it was also on the floor, so that was kind of creepy. We had two dogs, that both refused to go into my room and constantly would either stare at the wall and bark or would stand at the stairs and bark up to the second floor or down the stairs to the basement. The longer I lived in the house, the more I began to feel almost alone. It was like I was becoming isolated mentally from everything. In my room, it would constantly feel as though I was being watched I would hear loud bangs and things sounding like they were hitting the floor, but nothing would be around. All the motion sensor lights from the outside of the house would turn on all at once for no reason. I mean, I actually began to think I was going crazy. Finally, I broke down and told my stepdad everything that had been going on. He looked at me very seriously. I remember thinking, oh crap, he thinks I'm nuts. He began to tell me about how one night, after I'd gotten home from work, he worked second shift and didn't get home till around 1 a.m. We were sitting on the computer playing a game. At the time, our computer was in the front room and you could see right up to the stairs and onto the landing where the bedrooms were. He said he saw a man walk out of my room. The man he saw was a taller man in a pair of jeans and a flannel shirt. At first, he thought it was me because he only saw the man out of the corner of his eye. But then he asked how I was doing and looked up and realized the man wasn't me. The man turned and walked back into my room. My stepdad ran up the stairs and opened my door and I was the only one in there and I was asleep in a pair of boxers. After my stepdad told me this, I was convinced something was going on. One weekend, while my parents were out of town, I invited two of my friends over so we could try to catch stuff on film. Of course, we got absolutely nothing, that is, until we tried to go to sleep. We had all decided to sleep in the basement because there was more room there. 
we turned off the lights and started to go to sleep. My one friend, Chris, was already asleep and myself and Dave were talking. All of a sudden, the light to the sub-basement turned on and we could see what looked like a shadow under the door. You could actually hear what sounded like the work boots walking up the wooden stairs. We woke up Chris and we all stood at the door. We really thought someone had broken into the house. We opened up the door, prepared to beat the crap out of someone, and there was no one there. We walked downstairs and looked around. We checked the windows and everything. The windows were shut and looked like no one was there. There are a lot of things that happened, but it would be like writing a novel to tell them all. I just thought it was kind of creepy how similar my story is to Dave's. I've been looking at your website for the last couple of weeks and have read some of the experiences people had with the supernatural. I've had several experiences in my life. The first one that I can really remember is when my grandmother died. I was 16 years old and lived most of my life with my grandma. The night she passed away from cancer, I was devastated since I never got to say goodbye to her. But the night she passed, she came back to say goodbye to me. I remember being in that state between wake and asleep. I remember her coming to my bed, sitting beside me, and telling me she was perfectly fine and so happy to be with my grandpa. I told her I loved her, and she left. The second thing that happened was about two months after I had my third child. We moved into a beautiful home in Northwest Ohio. It had been totally remodeled, except for one room upstairs, in which we made into a toy room for the kids. My daughter, who was two at the time, was in that room playing when she started screaming for me. I ran up the stairs to see what was wrong with her, and she was in a corner with her hands protecting her head and screaming for the bad man to go away. I did not see a man. I picked her up and headed back downstairs, and when I was on the third or fourth step down, I felt as if someone was behind me and very angry with me. Needless to say, I ran the rest of the way down. Also in that home, I was in the kitchen washing my son's bottles, and directly behind the sink was our stove. I'd placed my son in the carrier by the stove. My daughters had brought in their stuffed animals that my mother had gotten them for Easter, and laid them down beside the stove. Now, these stuffed animals were the kind that make noise, as in the duck quacked, the pig oinked, and the cow mooed. I know my son was just a little bit too young to be able to reach over his carrier and play with the toys, let alone make them talk. While I was washing his bottles, the duck started in. I thought nothing of it. I thought maybe it was just malfunctioning. But then the cow started in, and a few seconds after that, the pig. I turned around and my son was just all smiles. Needless to say, I hightailed it out of the home. I always hated to go into the basement of that house. It just felt wrong for me to be down there. But one afternoon, I had no choice but to go down. I had to take a bag of old clothing down to be stored. I thought I would just leave them on the floor, right at the bottom of the steps. So I leaned down to retie the bag, and as soon as I look up, I saw two little girls standing right in front of me. They were not my little girls. They looked about seven and five years old, and let me tell you, I didn't waste any time getting up these stairs. They did not make me feel very safe. I did some research on the home, and found that the house was built in the mid-1800s. A man and his family lived in the home, and he had two daughters. 
the man owed some money to a loan shark, and when he couldn't repay his debt, the loan shark killed the two daughters and buried them in the basement. My family and I didn't stay long in that house. The longer we stayed, the more evil it seemed to be. The most recent experience has been for the last two and a half years. My father passed away. And I've had a very hard time dealing with his passing. I was made to make all of his decisions when it came to taking him off of life support. I felt and still feel guilty for letting him go. I know that my dad comes to visit me and I hope he never stops visiting. I don't let anyone smoke in my home and my dad hated it. He hated to go outside in the garage. He was always on my case about it. Well, now that Dad has passed away, there are many nights and even days that you can smell cigarette smoke so plainly, like it's right next to you. I know it's my dad, and I tell him to take it to the garage, and he does. I know that he's looking out for me and my family. I just wish he would show himself to me just one more time. Thank you so much for your website. It's a comfort knowing that I'm not alone, and definitely not crazy. This story involves my aunt and uncle, and took place in the late 70s and early 80s. My aunt and uncle, and then baby cousin lived in a nice modest house in Upland, California. A very nice little city near Panola in Ontario. The niceness of the house didn't last long, and almost immediately, my family began experiencing weird things. Every night on the way to bed, my uncle would latch close the door to the spare bedroom across the hall from he and my aunt's master bedroom. Every morning, as he passed the same door, it would discreetly unlatch and push itself open on its own. This same room once locked in my uncle's sister, with her and my uncle both frantically turning and pushing and pulling on the door as things flew out of the closet at her. All at once everything stopped, and they both jumped back to have the door unlatch and push itself open as it always did. Needless to say, my uncle's sister didn't stay much longer in the bedroom, let alone the home. When my aunt would leave the home to run errands in the daytime, she would return to find all the pictures from the wall on the ground, not knocked over, but propped against the wall, directly under the nail it was once hanging on. This would happen nearly every time the house was left empty, no matter how many times they would put the items back on the wall. Another nightly struggle was the pounding up and down the walls, like someone banging their fist across the center of the wall, back and forth, back and forth. My own grandma, as well as my mom and dad, witnessed this and hightailed it out of there ASAP. One day in the summer, my cousin, who was about two or three, was sitting in a high chair next to a long hallway. My aunt was just outside the back door. My cousin asked, Mommy, who's that man in the hallway? My aunt, not quite listening, aspects somewhat distracted. What man? My cousin proceeded to explain that the man looked like her uncle Mike, who lived out of state. When my family had finally decided that enough was enough, they decided to sell the home and move to Calamasa, just outside of Yucapica, California. On one of their last nights in the home, it seemed as if everything was going crazy. The pounding was out of control. There were loud bangs and unusual noises everywhere. And their dog was at the front door, its hair on end, and growling out the front porch. My aunt and uncle looked outside to the wraparound driveway and saw their van rocking back and forth as if people were inside jumping around. Within seconds, everything had stopped. Once my family had moved out, 
they eventually learn that their house was built over an old Indian burial ground. I've tried to ask my aunt more about this story, but she'll rarely talk about it, and I think is subconsciously trying to block it out. My aunt and uncle are very straight-laced, and don't make up these sort of things, and I think that if my other family members had not been there to witness a lot of them, I would not even know about these occurrences in Upland. I've had to rely on my mom retelling me what she remembers, my aunt telling her, as it was happening. There are probably many more things that went on that I would love to find out. I still don't even know the address of this old home, to see if the place still exists. As for the significance of Uncle Mike, my cousin's Uncle Mike had long, black flowing hair with darkly tanned skin and often wore a leather band across his forehead. Think 70s rocker fashion, looking somewhat like an Indian perhaps. This happened quite recently, well a few weeks ago actually. Apart from what I think are a few cases of what I think are more likely sleep paralysis, with resulting hallucinations. This is the only experience I felt that was truly, well, weird. A bit of background first. I live alone and rent an apartment in a newly built block, one of three, of low-rise units. These were built on the grounds of an old public primary school, which is over a hundred plus years old. The far end of the strip of where the school used to be is preserved and still has the school hall, a beautiful sandstone building, and is used for public functions. My particular block is built where the playgrounds etc used to be. I know this as I grew up in the area, and remember the school when I was a teenager, though I did not go there, and remember what it used to look like beforehand. I'm personally unaware of any hauntings in the area, nor am I unaware of the history of the site, so I've not researched it. There is a fairly modern funeral base directly across the road containing offices, a small chapel, and a large garage with several hearses. Whilst I assume bodies prepared there, etc. there, there are no burials. The story. I had a very hard day at work. I have been under a lot of stress. It was a Friday night, fairly late and I eventually decided to go to bed. I had a lot of trouble sleeping, as my mind was working 100 miles per hour. You know the feeling. I simply couldn't turn it off. After staring at the ceiling for an hour, I became frustrated, and finally, I thought I'd open my mind and try to meditate. It was an effort, but after almost half an hour of this, I drifted off. Shortly after, I had an odd feeling, and I woke up and opened my eyes. I immediately noticed a web of white mist floating above me. This network of yellow-white colored mist was basically sort of like a spider web about a meter above my bed, and almost stretching across the entire room. Actually, the whole room was a bit foggy in general. I blinked, and then did a I don't think so, double take and rub my eyes. No sleep paralysis this time. It was still there. I tried to focus my eyes on it, and it was not easy. But what I saw was what I thought were transparent faces outlined in the mist. The effect was very like the outline of an invisible person in smoke. One moved through on my right side and looked directly at me. The fear started to hit me now. But I tried to calm myself down and think rationally. Just hold on here. I might be seeing things just because I am so tired and stressed, and I've just woken up too. I forced myself to be distracted and take my attention away. I shifted position in bed, closed my eyes, rubbed them, blinked them several times, and looked over at my clock radio. It was about 1.10 I think then looked back up, and it was still there. I then started to feel a slight vibration in my bed, 
not a strong one, just like you'd feel the ground at a station as the train went past. I remember thinking what the, and thought at first it was just my body shivering because I was cold or I had a muscle twitch. My attention on this now I flexed my muscles a few times and then tried to hold still and feel it was still there. The bed was definitely vibrating, even a bit more pronounced now. I was getting quite frightened and not knowing what else to do, short of running out of the bedroom. I began to recite a prayer softly and also verbalize what I wanted any spirits to leave the place, basically anything that came to mind, just in case I wasn't imagining things. After about a minute of this, it faded. After a while, I wanted to go back to sleep as I was super tired, but every minute or so, I was worried it was still there, so I snapped my eyes open to check. It had gone. A few minutes after that, I fell asleep again with no more events that night. Now after the events when I think about it, I wonder if it was just my imagination or something else. What surprised and concerned me is that I felt very lucid. I felt quite clear headed. The only other event which is vaguely similar, which I dismissed at the time, was about a year ago when I woke up in the early hours of the morning to see a similar face above and to the left of my bed, no mist, looking at me. I rather sheepishly recall the shock yelling and then punching it. Honestly, who punches a ghost? Seemed to work though. The action either jolted me out of my sleep hallucination or made whatever it was go away. I'm not sure what to make of the above event to be honest. As a general comment in my apartment itself, I don't typically feel anything strange or a presence and other than this, there have been no odd things going on. Plenty of unusual sounds mind you, but I'm fairly sure these come mostly from the neighbors, etc. Usually from what I read about hauntings, they tend to be more or less repetitive and don't just hit you like that and go away. So I'm still not 100% convinced it wasn't a half dream. But still, what a freak out. I now believe that I officially have a poltergeist in my home. At first, my living boyfriend thought I was nuts. Now, he believes it too. The first day I moved in, I was doing laundry in the basement. My cats both began acting strangely and circled me whenever I was in the basement. I thought they were just hungry and trying to get my attention. But when I waited out to go upstairs, I had this terrible feeling that someone was standing behind me, staring right through me. The 12 year old inside me told me to run up the stairs like I did when I was a kid. And I did. Then, one day, I was looking for my favorite tank top. I couldn't find it anywhere and could swear that I brought it to this new house. I dismissed it as having it left somewhere. The third day we lived in this house, I broke my ankle playing softball. I ended up having to sleep on the couch in the living room. Throughout my two months stay on the sofa, I could swear I heard someone going up and down the basement steps, cold breezes, etc. I just thought that the pain medication was kicking in and that my mind was playing tricks on me. After I could walk again and venture into the basement to do the laundry, I still had the same feeling that someone was standing behind me and staring at me. One night, I was getting ready to fall asleep in the bedroom when my boyfriend was out of town fishing. I had both dogs in the room, one on the bed, and the cats too, and the dog on the floor next to the bed. Out of nowhere, I heard a loud thump, like a book had just fallen off a bookshelf and onto the hardwood floor. Well, I don't have any bookshelves in the bedroom, nor was anything on the floor except for clothes 
when I turned the light on. Just this last week, I came home to discover the bed neatly made, pillows stacked just so, and the blankets pulled up neatly and turned down. When I thanked my boyfriend for making the bed, he just stared at me. He said, what are you talking about? And I said that I didn't know what got into him to make the bed so nice, but it was a nice thing to do. He said though that I came home on my lunch hour and made the bed. He had been gone all day, and didn't come home until I was already home. The basement lights continually go on and off, the light switches don't work, and the light bulbs are new. The circuits have been checked and everything is fine, I never know when they will work. The other night, the toilet handle in the bathroom jiggled for 10 minutes straight at 3am, and we both heard it. The night before last, my boyfriend witnessed the light come on in the hallway outside our bedroom and had heard the light switch flip. The light faded and later when he got up to go to the bathroom, the kitchen light was on, which had been off when we went to bed. Last night, I saw a light come into our bedroom from the hallway and then fade. I also heard a very loud thump at the foot of my bed. When I got up, only my tennis shoes were in the floor, hardwood floor, and nothing else had fallen off or was out of place. It was so loud, I physically jumped when I heard it. My boyfriend was sound asleep. I am convinced that someone or something is totally screwing with me. I've been reading all these great ghost stories. And now I feel it's safe to share mine. Being a paramedic literally saved my life. Before becoming one at age 34, I was always a troublemaker, getting into physical fights as a kid and early adult, rebelling against parents, doing lots of hard drugs, and ultimately doing a stint as a drug dealer. I was a real pain in the rear. I'm 44 now and have completely turned my life around. Eventually, I got arrested for possession and spent six years in prison at the age of 24. Prison life was a lot worse than I could have ever imagined. It's not like they say it is in the movies. Ironically enough though, I had a prison mate who ended up becoming one of my best friends, Sam. Sam was about eight years older than me and did time for attempted murder. He once walked in on his sister getting abused by her boyfriend, grabbed a bat, and beat the man in the face until he became severely deformed. He ended up surviving of permanent injuries sustained. Sam was a good guy, but he had a bit of a temper issue, and it only really came out when he felt like he or his loved ones were in true danger. So, Sam was always a bit of a protector, even to a fault. Sam and I would always have these profound conversations as my cell was next to his. The last conversation we ever had, he told me that the stuff that I was doing was too petty and he didn't want to see me throw my life away. I remember him distinctly asking me who I wanted to be, and I always just said I don't know. He suggested a paramedic because he saw me as a healer, figuratively and literally. He made me promise him that when I got out, I would straighten my life out. When I asked him what he was going to do when he got out, he just laughed at me and said, Kid, it's my time to go. At first, I didn't really think much about his statement. I thought he meant he was getting out of prison soon, but he got 10 years and was serving his five. That's when I realized what he really meant. He was going to permanently exit this world. So I go to bed that night, and before I end up drifting off, I say to Sam, good night. The next thing he said, is something I'll never forget for as long as I live. Sam said to me 
See you later. The next morning, I called for Sam, but he wasn't responding. A present guard came by and noticed that he wasn't breathing. Before I knew it, my best friend, Sam, was gone. Little did I know, though, that Sam would reappear in my dreams and as an apparition in jail. Yes, my jail cell. So, in my dream, I'm a free man. I'm in this empty, narrow white hallway. Sort of hard to describe. But, the entire hallway looked like it had clouds surrounding it. At the end of the hallway, I see Sam. He looks in great shape, about 10 years younger, and is wearing a white suit to match the hallway. He's just smiling. As I continue to walk down the long hallway, I approach Sam though, and that's when he slowly starts to disappear. I suddenly fall down to my knees and yell, Why did you do this, Sam? Why? Your sister needs you. Suddenly, I wake up, and I'm in my jail cell. This is late at night. Felt like it was half past midnight. That was when I saw a black shadow. As I was adjusting my eyes. At first, I couldn't believe it. But it was the shadow and silhouette of a man. Somehow, I instantly knew that this man was Sam. I then watched as the shadow slowly moved away and disappeared down the hallway of the jail. Nobody was around at the time, and it definitely wasn't a prison guard, for the obvious reason being. Prison guards don't look like dark shadows and silhouettes. So, fast forward a few years later, and unfortunately, I relapsed into a bad drug habit after getting out of prison, getting addicted to the powder. This was the last and final straw that led me to focus on my life and pursue my paramedic career. I end up taking a hit and almost dying entirely. I remember taking one last hit of the powder, passing out and not waking up for hours. At this time, I was rushed to the hospital because I was on the verge of losing my life. Apparently, I flatlined and became medically dead at the same time, but I came back to life. In that moment, it seemed as if it was an out-of-body experience. I could see myself in the hospital bed, and suddenly, I was in this light room, just like the dream I had in prison. There was Sam again. Sam looked at me, grinned, but didn't say a word to me. My old dog Spot was right next to him who had previously died when I was a kid. My favorite dog in the world, Spot was a black lab. There was an overwhelming peace that came over me, and everything felt so good in the moment. It was a feeling that I didn't want to escape. Suddenly, I regain consciousness, and I'm back in the hospital bed, in tremendous pain. That's when the doctor told me I had basically died, and I was shocked. So, fast forward a couple more years, I finally became a paramedic. I turned my life completely around, and I truly believe that Sam was responsible. I believe that I did see Sam in the afterlife through spirit communication in my dreams, and also the black outline I saw in the prison. I remember what he said about trying to be a medic, and it just sort of resonated with me. I did want to help people in the end, and it was the best decision I ever made. These days I wonder how Sam would have been if he was still with us, but I'm sure he would have been proud of me now. When I almost died, it was the ultimate wake up call. In some deranged way, I think Sam was responsible for it. Thanks for reading my story. I know it's a bit unbelievable, but I promise you, this all happened. I know I don't need to prove to anyone that this really happened to me, but I truly believe that Sam is my guardian angel watching over me. 
I believe that he gave me a second chance at life. Maybe because he believed in my potential. Thank you, Sam. I'll never forget you. I have one last story for now to tell you. I was born in 1955, so I went to high school starting in 1970. Needless to say, the fashion and hairstyles I liked were very different from those which my mother was used to. We frequently had clashes over these things. Also, from the get-go of my life, I'd always been interested in things like camping, fishing, hiking, and nature in general. My mother, to say the least, was disappointed. She had always envisioned having a daughter who was interested in clothes, makeup, and flirting with boys. I just wasn't the daughter she had envisioned. I ended up working in forensics for years, and I do believe she was proud of me during the last 20 years of her life. The year and a half after my father had intentionally left this earth, and she died, were filled with sadness for us both. Looking back, if I had known then what I know now, I would have done things differently. But that is Monday morning quarterbacking. I did the best I could to take care of us both during that time, but I feel like I could have done better, and I regretted it after she had passed on. First, I distinctly remember seeing my dad's ghost sitting in his favorite chair of the old house that we lived in, and the one that I own today. One day, I was in the kitchen and looked over to the chair. That was when I saw a great cloud literally sitting in the chair for a few seconds, then slowly disappear. I tried to blink my eyes to see if I was just imagining things, but then something crazy happened right after. The picture of my dad that I had hanging on the wall somehow fell to the ground without explanation. I was shocked, and that's when I instantly put two and two together. I took it as a comforting sign that my dad was making sure I was okay. Even if at the time, it still terrified me. Things weren't always so pleasant with the hauntings, though. I would constantly hear the sounds of boots thumping upstairs in the middle of the night, always at the same time, for weeks on and off. I wanted to believe it was my dad then, too. But he never wore boots, and I don't think he would intentionally scare me off if he knew I was frightened. I remember hearing whispering in my dad's former room, and it sounded demonic, low, like multiple people talking to each other. I was always alone and by myself when these things would happen, so I know it wasn't just me hearing things. In that very same room, in the middle of my sleep, I once heard heavy breathing coming from the closet. I jumped out of my bed opened the closet door to make sure nothing was there. I was right. Nothing at all. When I had my son at age 25, years after my dad died, he was four years old at the time, said he made friends with the old man in a fedora hat. This really shocked me, because my dad loved fedoras. He would wear them constantly during life, and even collected them as a hobby. My dad also smoked cigars a lot, and sometimes, a fog, a light fog, would mysteriously appear in his room, without the windows open. At times I would get paranoid and think that the house was smoking. Honestly though, I'm not sure if this was paranormal fog, but everything else was 100% paranormal to me. Now on to my mother. Unfortunately. I never had any obvious hauntings from my mother that were as obvious as my dad's. Sometimes I could swear I saw her face looking into the window of the front door, but because it wasn't clear, I wasn't sure if that was just my mind. One night, not too many months after she had died, I dreamt of her. Framing this photo in my dream were right in red lacy strands as in a Valentine's Day card.
as I viewed this picture in my dream, I heard her tell me I love you. Her voice radiated nothing but 100% love. It was as if she was saying to me, I know we had our differences when I was with you, but I can see things so much more clearly from where I am now, and so I want to tell you now I love you. This was a very intense dream, and I do believe it was a message from my mother. The memory of this dream has been a great comfort to me. I've been a fan of this site for years, so here's one of my stories. When I was young, my dad's mother and her second husband, not my grandmother, lived in a 1920s vintage flat top Suko house in West Orlando. My brother and I both spent nights over there. The room in which we would sleep had a bed that was, from a four-year-old's perspective, about a mid-chest high. I remember when I was about four years old walking into that room one day and seeing this white-haired lady in the bed. I remember she had dark eyes and a prominent curved nose with large nostrils. I remember that she and I looked at one another. She seemed to want something from me, but I didn't know what that could be. She was not either malevolent nor cuddly like my grandmother. She seemed to be a business-like person who didn't hesitate to ask the nearest person around to help. In other words, a matter-of-fact person. I believe at that point, I turned and left the room. To the best of my knowledge, my grandmother never had anyone like this stay in her home. As I got older, I remember my mother talking about my step-grandmother's mother who had lived with them for some time. During one of these conversations, I said that I remembered her, thinking of the older lady that I'd seen in that bed. My mother said there was no way I could remember her since she died before I was born. I never brought this up with mother again, and since then, my mother has passed. I still can't help but wonder who that lady was. I've been to Church Road with a group of my friends. It's located at Church Street in Burt Road in Michigan. It is haunted. Where the house used to be has been torn down. The temperature will change about 10 to 20 degrees. We tried to test the ghost, so we put my friend's Jeep in neutral and was pushed uphill by something. The red eyes are true. If you walk outside your car, he will follow behind you. We also had handprints down the side of our vehicle. We went out there every night for a week and experienced something every night. I have lived in Hillsdale County all my life, and my friend lives right down the road from the cemetery on Burt Road. The truth, it's haunted. I've never seen the sign change, but I will agree that the people who are buried there are not at rest. There are a lot of people who died there of murder, offing themselves, and accidents. I've seen people walk through there at night, and you just get an angry, uneasy feeling about the whole place. You also have to remember that right behind the cemetery is a gravel pit where a woman drowned while swimming out there with her friends. I love the ghost hunt, and I've seen spirits since I was little. I also know that the one on Church Road is not a nice man. I've watched him make one of the people that were in my car very sick, and she didn't get better until we got off the road. The legend is that you have to enter from Holcomb Road, and you have to exit from Holcomb Road. If you don't, he'll follow you home. We tried that one night, and he didn't follow us home, but something did because we woke up to a little girl singing one day, like legit singing, and then we went back. I can't make this stuff up, and I promise you, this is 100% factual. There is a ghostly presence that many have reported as a man 
who just lingers in that area. I haven't been out there in years, but I'm planning to go back there in a few weeks to see if things have changed since they started building a home on the old foundation where the house used to be. I grew up in a city in southern Ontario, and I've had several encounters with paranormal activity. When I was eight years old, my mother and my brother had moved into a single family home that was attached in the front to a store for clothing alterations and such. The home was built in the 1930s, and I was unaware as what the history of the home was. However, there was always the strong feeling on the back of my neck that I was being watched in a way that made me feel horrid and vulnerable. There were certain parts of the home that had felt more evil than the whole house felt. The first part was the stairs going to the basement and the upstairs bathroom made my stomach turn. I always felt eyes of anger on my neck. My little brother who was six years old at the time and I were rollerblading in the basement that was not developed enough to be a problem with the rollerblades. There was a separate room in the corner that had a glass pane door and we had never gone into that room as it was just really creepy. We both very suddenly stopped blading and both looked to the glass paned window and we both had seen a clear apparition of an older man who had the evil look in his eyes, just like we always felt, looking at the back of our necks. We ran upstairs with the blades on to tell our mom. She refused to go look, as she then admitted to having the same fear in the home. We did move out within six months, as it seemed to be getting worse with things going missing, and my Barbie dolls going missing for weeks and then re-showing itself mutilated. It just felt horrid to be there for all of us. As an adult, I'd share that story with a woman that I had met, and she knew exactly which house I'd spoken of. I showed her the exact home, and she said that the home had been a funeral parlor. The home was evil, and I could never go into it again. Here's my first quite shocking meeting with a ghost. I was seven years old then. I was in my grandparents' house with my mother. The house is about 80 years old. I was relaxing downstairs when the phone suddenly rang from upstairs. My mother proceeded to go upstairs to answer the phone, and I followed her. After climbing about halfway up the old staircase, I felt that somebody or something was behind me. I quickly turned my head, and that's when I saw a middle-aged lady climbing the stairs, holding out her hands as if to grab me. She was wearing a bathrobe, and her hair looked mangled. I freaked out and ran upstairs as quickly as I was able to. She surely was a ghost because she wasn't a family member or a friend. I had never seen her before, and my mother didn't even notice her. She disappeared as fast as I had seen her. Unfortunately, that wasn't the only ghost experience I had in that house. I was about 10 years old when the second meeting happened. It happened in the same old staircase in my grandparents' house. It was late night and I was going upstairs to get some sleep. That's when I quickly discovered that my route was blocked. At the end of the corridor where you turn right to get to the staircase was a man, a very unusual man standing there. He was wearing a gas mask, so I wasn't able to see his face. He didn't speak, nor did he move at all. He just stood still, and I was too afraid to go past him. So I then got my grandmother and went back to the corridor with her. The gas man was nowhere to be found. Understandably, I was too afraid to sleep, 
so my grandmother stayed the night with me. I'm pretty sure that my grandparents' house is haunted, and my friend has witnessed that too, as the next experience tells. I was 11 years old, and my friend was 12 when this happened. We were playing in the basement of my grandparents' house. It's no surprise that the basement is also quite unsettling, just as much as the rest of the house is. We were in the big room just under the staircase that leads to the middle floor. We were having fun, until both of us felt a strange feeling that made it obvious that we were not alone in the basement. We felt that there were other beings present, entities that couldn't be seen with the naked eye. We were also sure it wasn't our grandparents, because both of my grandparents were upstairs. That feeling also told us to leave the basement. It felt like we were surrounded by invisible people and that we really needed to leave the basement immediately. After a few minutes, in a panic, we fled back up fast. Even at this stage of my life, it is still frightening for me to walk that staircase or be in the basement. I often feel the same feeling in these places that I felt 10 years ago. My friend also feels the same energy as well. Luckily, I haven't seen any ghosts since then. Regardless, one thing is certain. There's a lot of paranormal activity going on in that house, and I'm the person the spirits need to target, for whatever reason or another. My story starts back in 1991, when I first hooked up with my then boyfriend, now husband. My boyfriend lived on the bottom floor of a house that his aunt owned. His aunt and her family lived on the second floor. His cousin was my best friend, and so I was always at the house. We had a small close-knit group of friends, and were over a house one time playing truth or dare. I remember it as being late at night, and we were sitting on Holly's bed playing this game. When one of the girls asked her if the house was haunted, Holly said that it was, and that it was her maternal grandmother. She then went on to tell us certain things that would happen, and most situations would take place right next to the father's recliner chair. About 15 minutes after we finished playing the game, I had to use her bathroom. Though I was so totally afraid to go alone, I didn't want to seem chicken, so I went on my own to the bathroom. Just as I was passing by the recliner, I noticed I suddenly got cold. It was a warm summer night when this happened. Okay, I chalked it up to being my imagination, seeing as we had just been talking about it. Then, years later, I had this woman I was working for we got along really well. So, one day she had invited me to her house. Well, as we were at her house, we were talking about ghost stories and the like. She excitedly pulled out her digital camera and led me upstairs to their master bedroom. We stood just outside the bedroom doorway, and she told me to take the camera and just scan around the room, starting in one corner and going to the next. Just see if you see anything, she said. I took the camera, still not knowing if I was truly a believer, and scanned the room. Suddenly, I moved back to the corner I just scanned over. She said, you see something, don't you? I did. I saw a greenish male figure standing in the corner, looking out the window. I was scared to death. But even when I scanned the corner again, the figure was there. We returned to the first floor of the house when she started to tell me all about it. They had bought the house just about a year prior. The first week they lived in the house, their children, very young children, would awake in the middle of the night, screaming and crying. Finally, one night, my boss's husband got so furious, he 
he yelled. I don't care that you're here. I don't care if you just stay. Just leave my children alone. The children never woke up crying again. Then about a week later was when my boss had noticed the image through her camera. She had been going through various parts of the home, taking photos to send to relatives that lived out of state. When she was scanning the master bedroom, looking for a good view of the room, and found the exact image I found. She yelled for her husband who saw the same thing, but it could only be seen through the screen on her digital camera. After I saw it, I was a believer. There was no way I would have seen it if it weren't there. A couple of days after she saw the first image herself, she was cleaning in the basement when she found a hidden room. She went into the hidden room and found a box of papers. They started investigating the roots of the home. She found out that the old police chief of Renister, the town she had lived in, had built the house a very long time ago. The only thing she could figure is that the greenish male figure is the police chief looking out the window and watching over his town. They still live in that same home and they still live with their chief, all of them living peacefully together. Since I was little, I've been sensitive to ghosts. Sometimes I had dreams that would later turn out to be true. Also could tell which song was on next on the radio, knew who the phone call was next, etc. My experiences tend to happen at times when I'm either feeling low or just open towards the other side. My stories. As a little girl, I didn't like being in my room after it got dark or darker when it was summertime. I remember feeling watched and something wasn't right. A lot of times, I was so afraid of the door leading to the back of our house and the stables. I felt like something was looking at me and wanted to hurt me. This went on from when I was around 8 and stopped when I was 12. At times, they would show up only once. Once I was in bed and was close to falling asleep, suddenly I heard a voice calling my name. I woke up completely and looked into the corner of my room and there was an old woman there. I couldn't see her clearly. She was kind of blurry, but she had a friendly feeling about her. She then disappeared, and I never saw her again. When I was 17, my dog died, and I was devastated. A few weeks later, I heard him coming up to my room from the kitchen and saw him enter my room. He then jumped up on my bed, walked around three times before sighing, and got down. I could feel him on my bed and against my leg. When I tried to touch him, he disappeared. My parents' farm, where most of the events happened, is old. It burnt down once there, and there seems to be quite a lot of ghostly activity. In the barn, my parents got their car. Since I was little, I was afraid being alone there. I felt something was wrong and that something was hanging in the dark. I always felt uneasy there until a few years ago, when my mom told me that someone had off themselves there. My worst experience I've had was when I was around 15 to 17 years old. My room was connected to the kitchen by a little hallway. From the kitchen, you can go directly to the two living rooms. The last one I've never felt easy in was always feeling unnaturally cold and just weird. One night, I woke up and my room was ice cold. I heard someone open the door from the hall to the kitchen. It was a man and he was going directly to the last of the living room. Somehow I was there when he went there. I saw him take his rifle and then off himself. It was feelings more than actually seeing him do it. I then was back in my body, but heard him fall down to the floor, moved a bit, 
and moaned before he died. The second that happened, the coldness disappeared and I could breathe again. I told my friend at the time about it, but I was too afraid to ask my parents. One day, I sort of jokingly asked if anyone had offed themselves in that room. My dad turned around and looked at me with a strange look. Yes, your godmother's father offed himself there. They hadn't told me because my godmother didn't like me to know. I found his grave and it happened the exact day he had offed himself. I've had nice experiences though. A friend of my parents and their friend had offed herself. My friend was really devastated about it and couldn't get over it. One day we were in the kitchen when I saw a sort of fog that turned into a ghostly hand. It may have looked ridiculous, but I'm telling you, I know with my own eyes what I saw. It was right on my friend's shoulder, almost as if to soothe her. After it disappeared, I immediately alerted my friend and she said that her shoulder felt really cold. My friend then told me that she felt a lot of peace. To the both of us, it really meant a lot. The latest year, the happenings happened without any real pattern. Last year, when I was at my parents and sleeping in my old rooms, I didn't get any sleep for the last four days I was there. There was a presence in the room and it was not a pleasant one. It just radiated hatred and it was pointed at me for some reason. The next time I got home, it wasn't in there, but then I had to sleep in my mom's bedroom. I was woken up by someone slamming their hands into the bed very hard. I looked at the end of the bed, and I saw a shadow standing there, and then disappeared. Since then, I haven't felt it. For some reason, I knew it was male, but I didn't know why he felt so badly about me. When I'm home at my parents now, there's a young girl there, something I can't feel what it is, and a man. None of these are evil, but just looking out for me. I've seen the girl from the corner of my eyes, and seen her reflected in the mirror. I think they are protecting me, and just looking out for me. At times I can enter a house and know that there's more than just what the eyes see. I felt the presence of family or just passerbyers. I do believe that at my parents' house, there's some kind of field of energy where these spirits can enter. Some stay, but others don't. I got one in my room where I live now. Just a little prankster really, turns on my computer or opens all the cupboards. I did have an old man though, who loved to watch me shower. I told him that it was rude and I didn't like it. Since then, he hadn't been there. At the same time, there's a girl running every night on the upper floor. My brother is sensitive too, but apparently never experienced the same as I have at my parents' house. Seems I'm the only one they get attracted to also felt being pushed, but that happened at my parents' house as well. I don't mind having this ability, but I know I have to learn to control it. It can get to be too much at times. I've been doing some research about black spirits and ghosts. I had an experience in January 2000 when I lived in an old house in Portland, Maine. It was late in the evening, about 10 p.m. or so, when I felt something peering at me from a closet in my basement apartment. I thought nothing of it, but when I looked again, a materialistic, three-dimensional human-shaped figure with no facial features darted from the closet and stood behind me. It was suspended above the floor, about a foot or so. Before I knew it, two more had come out of nowhere. It happened so fast, and they moved so quickly, that I didn't even know what to make of this incident. I was a skeptic at the time, and had been all my life on ghosts, supernatural, etc. I was 36 years old at the time. 
There were multiple instances where I seriously felt like the house was shaking. Doors being slammed, open and shut, cabinets being open and shut as well, pots being moved around. It was seriously like a horror movie. I remember one time this happened and it scared me half to death, almost literally. I ended up having a mild heart attack and I ended up waking up in a hospital. All I remember was feeling the energy of what was happening that day and then I lost consciousness and that's when I was in the hospital bed. The doctor told me that the neighbor noticed something was wrong in that house and noticed me lying on the floor. So she went and called the cops for me and the ambulance arrived. They even told me that my heart stopped for a moment and they had to use a defibrillator to bring me back to life. I was clinically dead, even though they only classified it as a mild heart attack. Anyway, I know this all sounds absurd, but I'm telling you, it definitely did happen. I'm just glad that I don't have to deal with it anymore. I don't live in the same place I do now. It was not worth it in the end. And after the heart attack, I don't think it'll ever be worth it. Scary stuff, poltergeists, and black beings on the walls. Definitely not something I want to deal with. One night, me and two guy friends were driving into Howard City, Michigan. We were driving down the road, and on each side, there's cornfields. And we saw two girls, one standing at the opposite side of the road, and another walking directly into our path. The girl walking into our path was wearing a gray sweatshirt, blue jeans, had blonde hair, and white eyes. The girl that was standing on the other side of the road was wearing a red sweatshirt, had brown hair, and wore blue jeans. As we're driving towards them, I tried as hard as I could to tell my friend's boyfriend to look out for her, but I couldn't. I couldn't say a word. I tried, and nothing came out because I was so terrified of what I thought I saw. The girls had completely vanished. After we got to the stop sign, I said to my friend's boyfriend, did you see that? He said yes, and the other guy that was in the truck with us asked me what, so I told him, and he said, we have to go back and check it out. So we turned back around and went back down the road and found no signs of them. I come from a long line of psychics, and I must have been about seven when during an afternoon nap, I woke up after a very frightening dream. At the time, we were living in Mount Butler in Hong Kong Island, and mom's family lived in Capiz in the Philippines. I ran out of my bedroom into a room full of family and friends to tell my mom about it. I saw this Filipino man in a wooden box, dressed in a cream shirt and brown trousers, and lots of our family were around him crying. As a young child, I'd never seen a dead person before and was distraught by the experience. My family consoled me and told me not to worry, but it brought to their attention that I too had the gift. It was only a few years later that I was told that the person I saw was my uncle who had been shot by the local militia in my mom's village in the Philippines. And it surmises that the clothes I saw him in were the clothes he was buried in. So it turns out that I had a psychic snapshot of the actual Filipino funeral rites, whereby the body is kept in the family house for a period of weeks so grieving people can pay their respects to him. This brother of my mom's, she had been having prophetic dreams around the time, warning him to leave town because something bad was going to happen to him. He didn't believe her and was shot by the local militia after a dispute. It is Filipino superstition that during this period that the body was stored in the family house, 
then the spirit visits the family on the third, fifth, and seventh day after their death. This, as it turns out, was during this time that we both had these visitations. Mom was in the kitchen washing dishes when she heard who she thought was daddy coming back from work. That's when she saw a man from the corner of her eye standing in the doorway wearing a light shirt and brown trousers. So she chatted to daddy for about five minutes about his day and what he had been up to when it occurred to her that he didn't answer her back once. She turned around to ask him a question and then she realized that there was no one in the doorway at all. It was at this point she was a little bit spooked as she remembered my description of Uncle Fred in his coffin and hurriedly went to check on Daddy. He had come in when she had heard him come in but had just fallen asleep on the bed fully clothed in knit wearing brown trousers and a white shirt. So it was her brother's way of saying goodbye and I guess to say sorry for not having listened to her when she warned him. A few years later, it was 1987, around about the time that Edward Yule, Hong Kong's governor at the time, passed away. We were still living in the same flat in Mount Butler, but my sister and I had moved from the room we were in, as that had been converted into mom's nursery, where she looked after preschool children during the daytime. We were now in the room where I would have my bedroom, until we moved over to the new territories. I must have been about nine, so my sister would have been four. We shared a bunk bed, and her being smaller stayed on the lower bunk. I awoke to pitch black, and the sound of flip-flops walking up and down our corridor. I thought, this is strange, as it is custom to remove your shoes at the front door and to wear slippers around the house. As I heard these flip-flops getting closer and closer to my door, sheer terror took over. I whispered to my sister, Chris, can you hear that? No one answered back, so I was trapped on the top bunk with nowhere to go, with this noise coming closer and closer. I hid my head under my blanket, like most kids do, wishing it to go away. I said this time, more incessantly, Chris, can you hear that? And something hissed back at me, yes. That did not sound like my sister at all. At this point, I was terrified. I tried to gather all my strength to get out of the bed, but I was too scared. After what felt like a millennia, I eventually gathered enough courage to jump off the top of my bed, ensuring by no means that I touched the lower bunk and charged into my parents' room across the corridor from our room. I was so embarrassed being so old and being scared, I didn't actually get into their bed, but spent the rest of the night curled up in a ball at the foot of their bed. It turns out that my sister wasn't in our room at all that night. My question was, what was that in the corridor and in the bunk bed with me? The strange pink light. Around this time of the strange occurrences with the flip-flops, we were still living in flats in Mount Butler. My daddy, a complete atheist, had an experience of his own. Daddy does not believe in the supernatural, and if God actually spoke to him, he still wouldn't believe it. He was lying in bed one night, when he woke up for no reason, to this pink sphere to appear on the wall opposite their bed. It seemed to come out of the wall and sit there and go back into the wall again. He was puzzled by this and went to investigate. 
He had checked out where the possible light source could be coming from. The curtains. No. We were on third floor, so it couldn't have been vehicle lights. He went into the bathroom. All lights were off and couldn't have come from there either. He got back into bed and tried to wake mom up to show her. She was having none of it and kept her head under the sheets. Well, the sphere appeared again and came out of the wall, suspended somehow, then sunk back in and disappeared. He never did figure out what that was or where it came from. Running Ghost. When he was working in the Royal Hong Kong Police, he had another experience. At this point, he was the superintendent and managed a section of the traffic police. They were doing their rounds when a speed camera on the road flashed for no reason. They went to investigate and it flashed again with no cars in the near vicinity. They thought nothing more of it until the pictures were developed, and on one of the photos, there is a distinct picture of a person, blurred apparently running very fast, so fast it set off a speed camera. The Ghost Dog When we were living in Mount Butler, I had one other experience that reaffirmed my belief in the supernatural and two other people I was with experienced it also. I must have been about 14 when my sister and my best friend at the time decided to go for a walk in the countryside. So where we lived was surrounded by Hong Kong countryside, which was perfect for me as I was a tomboy and spent as much of my time as possible out and about exploring and climbing trees. Just before I started university in the UK, I was visiting some friends in Cardiff. I was feeling very odd that night, and as we are heading out into town, a premonition hit me. I turned around to my friend and said, something very big is going to happen tonight. He just looked at me like I was stark raving mad, so I dropped it. So when we went out and had a lark and came back, thinking nothing more of it, imagine our surprise when we woke up in the morning and splashed all over the news was coverage on Diana's death. This of course, being the famous Princess Diana of Wales who died tragically in a car accident, but I predicted it the day before, at least I feel like I did. Could be a coincidence, but I don't think so. Oodle Extra Cemetery Experience So, I started uni in Derby in the Midlands, and where I was living was student digs on Oodle Extra New Road. I was heavily into my goth influence back then, not so much now, but I still love old cemeteries and dramatic clothing. There was this beautiful one on our road that I used to visit regularly and read and draw with many beautiful statues and old, old gravestones. One day, my ex-boyfriend and I went to visit it as it was a lovely day turning to evening. So I wandered around looking at all the gravestones and the statues, trying to find the oldest tombstone we could find. It must have been coming up to winter time as the sun set quickly, and we realized in a panic that the gate had been closed so we were locked in, and I had to find another way out. So we walked along the perimeter, looking for a likely tree to help us over the wall, when the sun just disappeared and we were pitched into almost complete darkness. Then, for no reason at all, the mist appeared over the headstones, so it was hard to avoid the graves themselves. So it suddenly looked just like a horror movie set, trying to avoid broken tombstones 
and holes and graves and that danged mist in the dark. By this point, I was pretty panicked, frantically trying to get out with this feeling of overwhelming dread descending over me and all cells in my body telling me to leave right now. We eventually scrambled over a wall into the student bar and that feeling just lifted, just like that. It's only a few months ago that I was looking online about Ghost and Derby that I found out that the very cemetery is haunted. Brilliant. My dreams. I thought that was the end of my experiences, but looking at the dream section, I've remembered some more I want to share with you. I've always had very vivid dreams, some not necessarily all coming true, but all seem to have symbolic importance in the coming days, weeks, or even sometimes years. I more often than not have deja vu experiences, even if I haven't ever A. done this before, or B. seen places or people before, or C. really ever thought about these things when I am conscious. I haven't really wanted to tell people about them, as most people, I worry that most people think I'm quite mad. Haunted house. So this also happened just before I finished university in Derby, I think. It was just before my ex-boyfriend and I broke up. The importance of this dream is one that I've been able to break it down and understand it in its composite parts. So both of us were walking around this dark woods and I was taking all that I had learned from watching horror movies into mind and was very careful of not wandering off my own, made sure I had a weapon in hand in case anything happened. We eventually came to this clearing where this ominous house stood at the end of this garden. However, I needed the bathroom and even though we knew it was a haunted house, I was not one of those people who would go to the loo in a haunted forest. So we walked in and there were people there. Thankfully, none looking like psychopaths or zombies. Strangely enough, they were people we knew too. There was a feeling of dreaded sadness throughout the house though and I refused to go anywhere by myself. We are directed to the bathroom, which was at the end of this corridor. He decided to sit and chat with people whilst I did my business. So, I started walking, but the corridor was like the one from the poltergeist. It just kept getting further and further away, until I had to break into a run, desperately needing to go and leave this house as soon as possible. I eventually made it and threw the door open and did what I needed to do. Then I woke up and realized that I still needed to go, so I ran for the loo. Luckily, I had the foresight to write this dream down once I had gotten back to bed and knew that we were doomed. The haunted house was a reflection of our relationship, being hounded by our mutual bad doings and that the end was near. It was just a matter of time, and so it was. Finally, before I finish another of my epic storytelling sessions, I have one more prophetic experience to share with you, but not one from my dreams. It has to do with my pet dog, Sophie. Her name was Sophie. She was lovely, with her white and black patch over her eye and black patch in her back. She was only six months older than me and had been with her family for 16 years. She was the loveliest, sweetest dog in the world, apart from having a penchant for biting socks, eating tissues and rubber bands, and attacking the Hoover. She was suffering from basically her insides giving in. She had serious kidney problems and she couldn't walk very well 
because of arthritis in her back legs. And because she couldn't help herself anymore, she was kept outside. So one evening, when her parents were out, my sister and I were playing with her in the garden, and I had this weird feeling come over me. I seemed to be able to predict death, unfortunately, amongst other things. I turned to my sister. When I saw the shadow fall on her Sophie, that looked like a cross. It was like it was a sign saying she was going to die tomorrow. So that's what I told my sister, and she kind of brushed it off. She didn't believe me, being much younger than me. But sure enough, after a hard day at school, I was only 14 or so at the time, we came back and our parents were in pieces. And that's when I knew it had happened. They had to take her down to the vet and have her put down, as it was too cruel to keep her suffering like that. I've never seen my daddy in pieces like that, but because I was strengthened by my foreknowledge, I supported him in his time of need. My poor cat was distraught, as she basically brought him up from when we adopted him as a very small kitten. On a happier note, I had a dream after this terrible day. I was watching my crazy dog run from the front of the house, in and up the stairs with much zest and energy like she would have had as a younger dog, running up to our level of the house, looking like she was having the time of her life, back and forth, giving little yips of happiness, grinning in her quintessentially silly Sophie way. As because of her health problems and her incontinence, she was not allowed in except for very cold weather. I think this was her way of saying that she was free and happy at last, and I knew she was in peace. She still does come and visit us occasionally, when we walk by the front of the house, and you can, still after all these years, smell her and we know she's still looking out for us. I keep meaning to write a dream diary. I'll do that this year, as these dreams seem to be too important to miss. My husband and myself and my brother were all watching our mother's house while she was out of town on vacation. We had been there for a few days, and all happened to be on this particular evening and night. Well, we had finished dinner, and we were all just hanging out in the living room watching TV. My brother said he was just going to sleep on the couch, and my husband and I said goodnight and went to bed in my mother's bedroom, because that's where we had been sleeping. We kissed goodnight like usual, and turned off the bedside lamp. I myself just can't close my eyes and go right off to sleep, so I was just laying there, looking off into the darkness and trying to wind down. Suddenly, I noticed a very, I mean very dark black mass, right by the bedroom door. I blinked my eyes a few times, trying to make them adjust to the dark better, but realized they already had, because I could make out the mass that was so much darker than the dark. I began to feel afraid when I saw it moving. I laid there and watched it approach the bed over our bodies. It looked larger than it had by the door. I began to nudge my husband, but I decided to lay there a little bit longer to see if it continued to move or even get larger. I laid there and marveled at its darkness and its extremely dark color, as opposed to the regular darkness. It was pitch black, and just floated there above us. Unbelievably, I fell asleep. The next day at lunch, my brother said, Hey, last night I saw the weirdest thing when I was trying to fall asleep. A large black mass was hovering above my head, and scared me half to death. 
I stuck my hand in it, and it was freezing cold. Before I had a chance to speak, my husband said, Me too. I thought I was seeing things. I spoke up, and I said I saw it as well, and was frightened by it. They both said, Wow, I wonder what it was. I had read some more that these could possibly be evil. Needless to say, we didn't spend the night there again. Unfortunately, this is a true story. This was back before the internet was a news source, so I don't have any articles to link, but I do vividly remember reading about it in a newspaper afterward. I was really young when this happened. 1990s the ballpark the time. Back when I was in elementary school. I'm 27 now. Back then, I lived in an apartment complex some ways away from school. So every morning, I would hop on my bike and pedal begrudgingly to school. Same route every morning. I also had a Hindu family for my next door neighbors. They were nice people and I often had their kids over because they didn't really have any toys at their house. And you know, kids can't hang out without their toys. This particular morning will always stand out in my mind from any others. I was biking to school, coming up on a cross street. My neighbor and her son were walking ahead of me. I remember seeing them a couple feet from the curb, in a car turning from the far lane on the street leading into the one they were crossing. I must have looked away, because the next thing I remember is looking up and seeing the boy laying flat on the ground right next to the curb his mother kneeling, leaning over him, and screaming. This was a while before cell phones. I remember with acute clarity being in shock and riding past them. Time seemed to slow down. The boy was face up, staring blankly at the sky with blood trickling out of his nose. His foot was twitching, but other than that, he seemed motionless. I will never forget that face. His mother's wails will never leave me. I went to school that day because I didn't know what I should do, what I could do. I ended up reading in the newspaper some days later that he'd slipped into a coma and they'd found the person who had hit him. It was a female drunk driver. Thankfully, the boy did survive and came out of his coma, but he was paralyzed from the neck down thereafter. I don't remember talking to him or playing with him again after that. Maybe they moved, but this experience will always stay with me and will always be a reminder of why you should never, ever drink and drive. No excuses. My place of work is very haunted. I work in an old veterans hospital that has been converted into offices. It does feel a little bit strange consistently entering a room only to realize that it isn't a hospital anymore, but an office building equipped with cubicles and computers. On my first day on the job, I encountered some really unsettling activity. I consider myself a pretty logical person, so I don't want you to dismiss this as merely fiction or chalk this up to seeing things or hallucinating. Anyway, I was in my usual office tending to my daily activities. I was alone in the building that day and had to close up, when I heard what I thought was a male voice coming from down the hall. The voice sounded raspy, but soft. Again, I was the only one there at the time, so I walked down the hall to trace the source of the sound. I was able to catch a glimpse of a male spirit peeking out from what is now the photocopy room, but I'll never forget the look in that man's eyes. It was a look of helplessness, a feeling of absolute despair, and before I could even think anymore, the image of the man faded into thin air. Then there was perhaps the most peculiar experience of them all, and happened a few days after seeing the raspy voiced man. I know before I get into this particular one, you're going to laugh, but I shit you not, I was not laughing at this particular moment. Sure, you can tell me that this was bullshit that I was making it all up, and all that other crap, but all I can give you is my word. I was running behind schedule on this particular day at the office, and getting frustrated. On top of that, 
My boss asked me to work overtime and close up for him, and I reluctantly agreed to do so. Finding myself alone again, it was just after 9 p.m. when I finally got caught up with all my paperwork. I quickly tried to close up everything and head out through the hallway and out the door to the parking lot, but I stopped before that. Again, this was highly unusual because there was no logical explanation for this, but what I saw next was perplexing. I looked into the conference room and I could have sworn I saw a bearded man dressed in all white with long brown hair, kneeling over another man as if trying to resuscitate him and the man throwing up a peace sign a millisecond later. It was creepy to me at the time, but I felt an overwhelming sense of peace too. This all lasted not even 30 seconds. Now, I'm not going to say that this was Jesus or something like that, but the timing was too impeccable. I couldn't tell if this was the same man from the day before, or if it was another spirit, but it almost seemed as if the bearded man came to his rescue, possibly taking him up to heaven. Again, I'm not even close to being a religious person, so I don't know how these circumstances work. The following experiences weren't as climactic as the ones above, but still unsettling to say the least. A couple of months later, I could have sworn I saw two shadow people at the end of the hall early in the morning, then immediately notice another bolt in front of a desk halfway down the hall. Wasn't able to get a good look at them, just knew they were shadow people. At the same time, my husband got the chills when I told him. Months later, I even saw a soldier standing outside of what was the operating room at one time. His head was down as if praying. The rest of the experiences here are still filled with much activity. I've had my husband visit the office, and he's experiencing things as well. There used to be a morgue on another floor, and he once heard a yelp coming from the used-to-be morgue room. My husband had even encountered seeing shadows in the men's bathroom, and would constantly experience spirits turning off the lights in the bathroom. The only sensible conclusion I could come up with was that there was no way that a person could sneak in because the doors are very creaky. We're not the only ones who have experienced these things, as other employees have openly discussed spirits being in this building. One gentleman took the elevator up and had a conversation with another gentleman. When his floor came, he turned to wish the other man a good day, and no one was there. Some have spoken of footsteps late in the evening, one guy got to a point he would tell the spirit it was just him, and the steps stopped. Yeah, to say this is a haunted area is kind of an understatement. Thanks for reading my story. I had to come back home seven years ago to help my mom. My dad had passed the year before, and it was becoming too much to go back and forth. I was working at the time, and mom could still get around. I have to mention that mom has since passed away. She's been gone for nearly four years now. Anyway, this particular event happened on a Wednesday, and I will forever remember it. My mom had already gotten up and was going downstairs to fix herself something for breakfast. I went into the bathroom to wash up. I had a funny feeling come over me. I can't explain it other than to say I felt something was very wrong. For one thing, I haven't heard any noises from the kitchen. The bathroom is at the top of the stairs, so I opened the door and listened. Nothing. I grabbed my robe and was about to go down the stairs when I saw this woman at the bottom. She startled me and I froze. We stood staring at each other for maybe 10 seconds. She had shoulder length brown hair and a white floor length gown. She never spoke. She did, however, point towards the kitchen. My heart sank. I understood immediately. I ran past her and into the kitchen. I turned into the dining room and screamed, Mom. She was lying unresponsive on the floor. I ran over to her crying like a baby. I kept calling her and trying to pick her up. I pulled up one of the chairs and tripped while trying to get my mom into it. We both crashed to the floor but I finally got up and pulled her onto it. I was hysterical. I kept trying to talk to her, but she just stared at me. 
I ran to the phone and dialed 911. The fire department is right around the corner, so they got there in no time. Her blood pressure was sky high. We went to the hospital and I called my sister. My mom stayed for three days and came back home. We found out she had a clot in her heart. She had gone into the dining room to sit down and catch her breath and just collapsed. Later that day, I went home and only did I remember the lady. I got on my knees and thanked God for letting me be at home that day and for finding my mom and myself worthy enough for him to send an angel to alert me about her situation. That was May 2013. She died November 13th, 2013. Let me finish by saying that I've been in the healthcare field for over 20 years, but when you see what I described, everything you ever learn goes right out the window. I with my two brothers and my dad fishing at around 12 in the morning. Me being maybe 12 or 13 at the time, William was older and Jason was younger. We were on a bridge that stood over a large body of water, and I was honestly becoming a bit bored since we had been fishing for the past hour. The only real exciting thing that happened was when my dad hooked a skate. It was a kick watching him struggle to maintain the pole. He had let out a mean steam of curses when his line snapped, singling his loss in the battle. The area was surrounded by forest, and was beautifully lit by the night sky. I would look over the bridge's wall countless times just to see the moon's light reflecting off the dark, steady waves. The bridge wasn't made of wood, but concrete. It was strange looking. Now that I think about it, instead of being only about 3 feet off the surface of the water, it was maybe 10 or 15. I assumed that it was made for walking or riding across. It was narrow, but just wide enough to fit 3 average people side by side. Upon stating that I wasn't having much fun, William led Jason and I down to a large blackberry bush. It was set just next to the beginning of the bridge, so my dad could still see us. With our group, we had four dogs. It seems like a lot, I know, but we currently still have only two of our said four dogs. Tragedies happen, I suppose. Back to the story. Two of the dogs are German Shepherds, the dogs we have currently. Other than them, we had a border collie and a foxhound and muda mix, a very beautiful dog, tall and slender, but with just the right amount of muscle. He was all white with the exception of fall points and freckles, also very, very fast. Here's the confusing but necessary part. The female German Shepherd was Charlie, the male German Shepherd was Simon, the foxhound mix was Buddy, and the border collie was Sophie. Okay, now that we've gotten that down. On with the occurrence. We weren't really collecting the berries. It was more of a pick and eat thing. Every now and then, one of us would shout out, startled by the sudden prick of their finger from a thorn. Charlie and Buddy were my personal dogs, leaving Jason with Sophie and my dad with Simon. As I was feeling around for berries with Charlie sitting at my side, Jason left to get my dad some. I turned around to watch him go, Sophie at his heels. Before I could turn back around to face the bush, something caught my eye. Something big. My first thought was that it was a tree, that is, until it turns its head towards me. It locked eyes with me. I felt paralyzed by fear. I barely managed to wave my arm around in William's general direction, trying to catch his attention. He must have noticed as he responded with a quiet yeah. Turning to see what I was looking at, he began to say something, but immediately stopped. All emotion drained from his now pale face. Who is that? He would ask me. I could only mumble what? Not that I didn't hear him. No, I was correcting him. This thing was massive. Really, the only color you could see on the creature came from its eyes. They were wide, human-like. From where I stood, they almost looked orange. The rest was basically a silhouette. I could feel the presence of the dog next to us. Charlie snarled stalking closer bit by bit. I wanted to jump at her, do anything to keep her away from it. Simon was staring intently, as was Buddy, but kept his position in front of William and me. The thing was standing on its hind legs, but looked like a big, hairy dog, at least something with long, pointed ears. It had lengthy fingers, or more than likely, claws. It leaned forward a bit, but not much, almost as if it wanted to intensify its glare, or maybe just to get a better look at us. 
I jumped at the sound of Charlie snapping her jaws at the thing before bounding towards it. I nearly choked on my breath as Buddy followed her. I frantically looked around for Simon, who was cowering behind William with his head bowed down growling. William started to run faster after them and I started to cry from both fear and slight anger. I heaved a breath and willed my lungs to run as fast as I could. William was on the track team and played baseball, but he was the least of my worries because I was too. It was the fact that we were chasing two dogs and a terrifying animal-like creature. Now that I think back on what I did, I must have been insane. Nevertheless, I chased them in the woods. We eventually slowed to a stop as we saw the dogs ahead of us. They were standing defensively, barking and snarling the cryptid. I couldn't see exactly, but it looked as though the creature was now on four legs and smaller. The dogs fell back as though they had been pushed and scurried away from it as an ear-piercing scream sounded. Buddy took off back to the bridge where we later found him and Charlie crouched in front of William and I. The scream sounded strangled unlike anything I'd ever heard. I had let out a fearful shout before I felt something grab hold of my wrist, which believe me, did not help my situation. William was trying to pull me along, trying to get us the hell out of there. All three of us ran towards the bridge. The whole way there, it felt as though the creature was on my heels, me being in the back by maybe a foot. Once we were free from the trees, we didn't stop. We bolted into the water, William and I. Charlie merely followed, not knowing what to do. I whipped my head around as we stopped and saw nothing but pine. I choked on my tears, feeling both relieved and terrified of what had just gone down. Back on the bridge, we told our dad. He called bullshit, that we were just playing a prank. But you heard the scream, right? We would ask him. He would blow us off completely and continue fishing. He was, and still is, a skeptic. Gotta see it to believe it, is his paranormal motto. I honestly don't know what that thing was, and I don't think I want to. Part of me is curious, but all of me wants to know what I'm dealing with, so I have more information on the subject. I can't be the only one who's seen it. Today, I'm going to tell you a story I haven't told anyone before, simply because they will think I'm crazy. I don't know why all this even began, but what I do remember is when. It was 7 a.m. in the morning. I was all alone in my house, which I share with my family. I was sitting in the dining room while reading a book. I knew that I was alone. I heard someone. I heard my brother's voice. He was calling my name and asking me where I am. I was extremely confused because I checked his bedroom and saw that it was empty. I stood up and walked towards the voice. It was in the hallway. There was nobody there. I suddenly saw someone's shadow. I was so scared I ran out and waited for my bus outside. For the next two years, things moved in our house. My bed moved. My bedroom was also colder than everybody else's. I always had a feeling somebody was watching me as I fell asleep, but yesterday, there was something far worse. I fell asleep with a huge feeling of being watched, but I also smelled some kind of cologne, a man's cologne that I have never smelled before. I shook it off and soon fell asleep. Around 3 a.m. in the morning, I woke up gasping for air. I couldn't move, breathe, or even scream. I felt my arms touching my head, neck, my belly, and legs. I heard some kind of language being spoken in my ear. I tried so hard to scream, but I wasn't able to. That went on until the morning. They would let me go for five minutes and then continue their torture. After they finally let me go, I had a huge panic attack. I didn't sleep. Today I'm scared. I don't want to eat. I see them. I'm scared. I don't know what to do. I'm afraid to sleep and I'm afraid of the dark. My husband and I moved into a house built on an old battlefield ground. This field goes on for miles and miles, then there's nothing but graves. Such a bloody massacre happened a long time ago during the Civil War in Nancy, Kentucky. When we first moved there, strange activity immediately started happening. We began hearing voices outside mumbling to each other. Note that we have no one that lives close to us for miles. We go outside to investigate and find nothing. We go back inside. It starts up again. We try to fall asleep and hear old music, kind of like an old music box. This keeps us awake for some time. We were never able to pinpoint the location of the music. 
every there on out, activities increase. We go on outside on our porch and sit. At night, we see shadow figures moving along the trees within the woods. We'd also be in the living room and hear something walking on our front porch often. We run outside to investigate. Nothing there. My body was numb from fear. My husband trying to act calm was looking at me. I could tell he was in shock like I was. We knew this was something paranormal. And we are very skeptical people about paranormal stuff too. Until this happened to us. It changed everything. A whole new door opened up that we were not familiar with. We thought maybe if we don't think about it much, maybe it would just stop. So living there for a week now, we decided to make a flower garden together and enjoy the beautiful weather. I put some little bunny figurines in the garden and also little chickens and turtles. That night we started hearing footsteps again on our front porch. This time I told my husband let's not go out. I was hoping maybe it'd just stop if we just ignored it. It kept going on for a good while. We also notice it's now pounding loudly on our windows. Okay, we had a candle on the window seal outside. We lit it nightly to keep mosquitoes away, but we hadn't lit it for days. The pounding was getting aggressive after a few days. I look out the window and the candle was lit. My husband and I were surprised to say the least. So we went outside to investigate and look at the candle. I noticed that my little chicken fingerings in the flower garden were turned upside down. The next night, I put an app on my phone that allows me to capture EVPs and video in low light situations. My husband thought I was crazy and was skeptical about capturing anything, but I started talking and asking what do you want and who are you? My EVP app was going off in the direction where my husband was standing. I snapped a picture outside in the dark with my husband posing against the wall. We went inside and reviewed the photo. Amazingly. We saw a dark shadow figure of a man floating behind my husband in old clothes. Now we got proof. We showed it to family and friends and they agreed something is going on here. The place crept me out so much, we decided to move. I found out later that someone died on that property in a garage fire a long time ago. I don't know if that death is related to the civil war or is the cause of our hauntings or it's the old soldiers still there or maybe both. What I do know is that strange things happen there. This whole ordeal happened when I was around 10 years old to 13 years old when I lived in a particular house. The house was quite old. It first belonged to my grandmother when she was younger and at the time we were renting from her. Many of my grandmother's antique personal items still occupied the house that had belonged to much older relatives that had passed. The importance of these objects was that objects of those who passed away could channel their energy and this shadow man I had seen could have possibly been an old relative. He could have even been one that had passed away in my lifetime since there was actually quite a few deaths of older male relatives whom I still quite miss a lot. The first I was aware of this man, I was around 10 years old. The memory is faint but I am positive what I felt and saw at the time. I was in my room with a friend and we were chatting away when we heard sort of a distinct creaking sound. When we turned our heads, we noticed the shade on a lamp that was on my dresser had somehow flown off of the lamp to a nearby spot on the dresser. Being the young child I was, I was freaked out and we stayed in the living room the rest of the night. I was about 12 years old I believe when I first actually saw the figure who had done plenty of subtle disturbances throughout the years since my first encounter with it. I had stayed home from school since I was pretty sick and was watching Drake and Josh on television to pass the time. I heard the front door open and then saw as well as felt a tall man out of the corner of my eye passing by the entryway to the TV room which I was in. Automatically I called out hey dad thinking he had returned from work early. There was no response. I paused the show and the house was dead silent. The feeling of the man's presences was gone too. I knew, I knew that I had seen something tall and shadow-like walk somewhat quickly past the entryway. I got up to investigate and found that the house was indeed empty. My whole body was shaking so I did what came to mind. I cuddled up in my blanket on the couch and turned the volume up to try and erase the so prominent fear that had filled me and waited for my parents to come home. I had seen the shadow man a couple of times after that, each time thinking it was my father and each time finding out it was not. Those memories are far less prominent in my mind.
but are still there. We moved from the house later the next year, and since then, I have not seen nor felt the Shadow Man. Have you ever seen a shadow figure like this? This is my story of what happened to me at work. I don't know if it's a ghost or anything, but I hope that someone may have opinions. Okay, so, I was walking back from giving someone their food to go back to the kitchen. Then I saw a little boy outside of the door. He looked like a normal little kid, so I smiled and walked on. I didn't think anything of it. But then, he was at the drive through window. Then again, was back at the door. And so on, until the last part, I saw his head at the same time in the door and the window, with a little smile. Then it, well he, went back to one and I saw him running. Then he disappeared into the parking lot. The weird thing about it was, it was 9pm and it looked to be about 5 years old. No adults around. It's not the first time I've seen a little boy appear before. One time I was at home and I'd seen a little shadow boy. I went to tap him on the head because I thought it was my brother. My hand went through his head. Description, around 5. Not pale skin, but not tan either. Bluish gray eyes, sandy brown hair. Wore a striped shirt with gray pants. Cute little smile with a few crooked teeth. Was he a ghost too? Thank you. New Orleans, the Bayou, Cemetery Tours, witnessed the devastating effects of Katrina and right on time to watch my son play college baseball. Then my guests entered into my experience. My first experience started when I captured the most beautiful sunset from home plate facing the swampy area where we were playing. As I looked at the picture, I noticed two orbs. One was quite noticeable as it was a small ball of light in the bottom of the photo. The second was a strobe of light coming from the sun behind the clouds. Okay, okay, I'll get to the best part. So I checked into the Whitney Hotel, located in Midtown New Orleans, rich in history. An old bank that is still in use, but is also the hotel that has been renovated with nine floors of winding halls, leading one to get very confused and turn around, so to speak. Let me mention, the entire time I stayed at this hotel, there was not one other guest ever spotted by myself or my parents. In fact, the only people you saw were the same five employees that all seemed to be interacting amongst themselves in an odd sort of way. They were always there. One was the chef, yet never saw one person sitting, eating, or drinking in the restaurant and bar. These same characters were always around, out of nowhere. They were eager to share stories of the hurricane, history of the hotel, and the architecture and other tidbits of the city. What I thought so peculiar was there was nothing ever mentioned of ghosts or hauntings. I will preface this by saying there was a strong sense of something, but I could not quite place my finger on what it was exactly. I finally put it out there and asked, what about ghosts? The two staff members shared a look and stated, oh, you can say that. They shared hearing silverware falling in the middle of the night, sounds from the hundred year old basement and the bank vault closing and locking when no one was around. I retired to my room, 6.11, at around 8 p.m. I noticed the complete quietness of the floor. Again, not one other room guest was around. I laid down and fell asleep, approximately 2.13 p.m. I became aware of a feeling between my legs, as if I had been punched. I was in somewhere between sleep and wake, and had remembered the feeling in the pit of my stomach that told me, someone is in this room. I laid there paralyzed as I tried to rationalize what was happening. Was there someone in my room? Why is in the spot where it was hit not as excruciating as it should be? There was still the feeling but no pain, rather a strong pressure feeling. Then I felt the most gut-wrenching, gut feeling, sick to your stomach feeling began to rise in me. The feeling that someone was there and this was not going to be good. My heart was racing, I was frozen. Unable to roll over to look in the direction where I felt the person was standing. 30 seconds in, I am now fully aware and awake and scared to death. I thought, I need to get control. I can either lay here or take action. At this point, I leaped out of the bed and walked three feet to where I felt the person standing as it was in the direction of the restroom. It was at this point that I swear there was a figure, see-through, dressed in black and white, streaks in the face area. It wasn't a pleasant presence. This feeling I had was of sheer terror. Then it was gone. 
As I gathered my bearings, slowed my heart, and tried to rationalize what I just experienced, I felt a sort of calm presence come over me. I laid back down, and I instantly fell right back to sleep. I awoke refreshed and wondered why it was so easy for me to fall back to sleep. In the past with nightmares, it's always been difficult, not this time. I didn't mention this to anyone for a few days, but that feeling of complete terror, dread stayed with me. I returned to work and shared the experience with a coworker. The fact that it was so real and the feelings it caused me is what prompted me to share my experience and hopefully can find others with similar stories so I don't feel like I am crazy. Thanks for reading. Several years ago as a child, around the age of seven in the town of Wheat Ridge, Colorado, there was a Mexican restaurant that was operational in the same building that is now known as Clancy Irish Bar and Grill. I'm 34 now, so that tells you how long it has been. It's been so long that I actually have no recollection of the event that I'm about to speak on, but my sister swears that the story is true. It was questionable until several years later, my five-year-old daughter had a similar experience in the same restaurant. Now let me rewind to the beginning of the story. Keep in mind the building still exists under the current restaurant name of Clancy's Irish Pub and Grill. My sister is eight years older than me, and every now and then, she would always talk about the event that happened when I was seven. At that time, it was a Mexican restaurant that was very popular and well-known. As a family, we had gone there one night to eat, and being the ordinary little punk that I was, I had wandered off to explore and ran up the stairs to the next level of the restaurant. The upstairs was apparently closed to customers and is where the restaurant office was held. My sister said she saw me run up the stairs, and so she chased after me to take me back downstairs. All she remembers is seeing me stop, as if I was frozen at the very top of the stairs for some reason. She called out to me from the bottom of the stairs. However, she said it looked as if I was staring at something and was in a trance and would not budge or acknowledge her. She then walked up the stairs to grab me, thinking I was ignoring her. Immediately upon reaching the top, she felt a cold chill and said she had felt also extremely uneasy and even scared. A few years later, the restaurant closed down and the building was left abandoned for over 10 years until another restaurant decided to take it over again. My family and I were living only a few blocks away at the time and saw that there was a construction crew remodeling the inside and just doing minor touch-ups to the exterior. Seeing the remodel, I couldn't help but think about the story my sister would speak about from time to time. I told my wife about the story and of course, she did not believe it. A couple weeks after the restaurant had been open for business, I decided we should go eat there just to see what it looked like after the remodel and to also try the food. When we arrived to the restaurant, I picked my daughter up and carried her toward the building. As soon as we got closer to the building, my daughter instantly started screaming and yelling and having a fit even though she was perfectly happy while in the car. When we got inside the restaurant, my daughter started screaming even louder, and as we passed the staircase, she looked up and pointed up to the top of the stairs while still screaming her head off. We decided to leave shortly after because she would not settle down. As soon as we got in the car, she instantly stopped screaming and calmed down. This may be a coincidence. However, the next week, my wife and I talked to my wife's mom while visiting her and told her of the story of when I was young. We also told her the situation with my daughter when we went there recently. Her mom asked where it was located, and after we told her, she gave us a very serious and shocked look and told us a story of her own. Her mom told us that her friend at work had recently spoke about her son doing an electrical job at the same building during the remodel. Her friend's son apparently was an electrician and was working upstairs when he heard someone whisper in his ear, look outside. Just after hearing that, he heard a loud crash outside. He ran to the window and saw that someone had crashed directly into the parked work truck. He also had told her that he was the only one upstairs at the time when he heard the voice and then the crash happened. This restaurant also later closed within a month and was then bought out by Clancy's. Clancy's is still there and I also believe it is still haunted upstairs. I've always wanted to visit again 
and speak with the employees just to see if they had any stories of their own. However, I've never been back since. Thank you for reading. When I was a teenager, I had kind of a chip on my shoulder from family problems, etc. So often, I would not be very emotional with friends or show my feelings. I had a best friend. Her name was Rhonda. We just clicked from the moment we met two years prior to her death. We both liked talking about things like life after death and paranormal stuff. We once told each other that whoever passed away first, we would contact the other. Little was I to even imagine at that time that this would indeed come true. I remember one time we went swimming with a few friends, and one friend took me in the deep part of the water, knowing I could not swim, and let me go. I almost drowned, and Rhonda was the only friend who came and sat with me while I was crying because it scared me so bad. She was very empathetic to me. Rhonda herself was an excellent swimmer. She had awards on her bedroom wall that she had earned from swimming events, yet she understood what it must have been like for me to have almost drowned not knowing how to swim. That is the quality of a best friend. In 1982, I was 15 years old and my best friend Rhonda was 17. She was looking forward to turning 18 in three short months. We talked daily, went for walks, did all the teenage stuff together. One day she called me on the phone and asked me if I wanted to go to an outdoor type of party at Cullen Park, a small boat dock park at the Maumee River. It was a very hot day in July, the 27th to be exact. She said about five other people were going and that they were going to have a cookout, play volleyball, and go swimming. I said to her, swimming? Why would you go swimming in the Mommy River? She said she had done it before, and that you just had to wear your sneakers or water shoes to not get cut by rocks or glass under the water. I still did not like the idea of going in that fish-smelling dirty water, so I told her, and she said, well, you don't have to go in the water. I know you don't swim anyway. She said I can just go for the cookout and maybe playing volleyball. I said okay. I have $20 in my pocket and I could chip in for food and drinks. Yes, I will go. We hung up the phone. I sat there thinking to myself and thought, I just don't know if I want to go. I called her back and I said, Rhonda, I don't know. I think I'm going to pass on this. And she responds by saying, oh, come on, Rose, you will have fun. At first I said, okay, I will go. And then I changed my mind again. Finally, I said for sure, no, I'm not going to go. Sorry. And she responds again, fine, be that way, and hung up the phone. That would be the last words I would ever hear from her. I sat there in my kitchen and I felt so bad. I had nothing else to do that day and I thought to myself, maybe I should go. I called her back and her mom answered the phone and she already left. So I pretty much dropped the idea then and there. The next day, I was sitting in the dining room of my home, where I live with my dad, and there was a little black and white TV we had on a table that was turned on. The new news was on. I looked at the TV and saw a picture of my boyfriend, Doug, who was 18 at the time, and it said that he had gotten electrocuted to death by climbing an electrical fence the night before, July 26th. I was in shock. I could not believe what I was seeing or hearing on the TV. The first thing I did was dial Rhonda's phone number. I wanted to tell my best friend what had happened to my boyfriend. I guess you could say I really needed my best friend at that moment. Her phone was busy. I tried another three or four times and kept getting a busy signal. I ran down the street two blocks down to another friend's house. He was an older friend of the family. I was very distraught and just in total shock. I ran all the way there. He answered his door and I spurted out what had happened and he said, Come on, you need to calm down. We can go for a car ride and a talk. So we go to get in the car and a neighbor of his came running up to his car and said, Did you hear what happened? He said, What? The neighbor said Rhonda, who lived one block from him and that he also knew, had drowned in the Mommy River. He said that they were looking for her body. Now, I was already in shock about my boyfriend. And then I hear my best friend is dead. I didn't believe it. I said, no, you are a liar. That's my best friend. My other friend got me in the car, where I proceeded to fall apart crying. I can't remember the ride or even getting home after that, 
or even what we said. The next thing I can remember is standing at Cullen Park, looking at the river where many others were looking for my friend. I told myself, no, she couldn't have drowned. She was such a good swimmer. With all the wards she had hanging on her wall from swimming, there's no way she could have drowned. But what I didn't know was the river has currents in it, and that is what took her down. I had told myself, she must have swam to one of the little grassy islands around there, and she is knocked out, but someone will find her. It was two days before they found her body in the river. All I can remember is not being able to sleep, shaking a lot, for months and months. I worried that my best friend and boyfriend never knew how I felt about him. Because I didn't show my emotions or say things like I love you or you are my best friend, my biggest worries were that they left this world and did not even know how much I cared about them. There was no funeral showing for either of them, for obvious reasons, which made it kind of hard to accept they were really gone. So now, skip ahead five years, I've been bothered by them not knowing each day of my life. It was something I felt horrible about. One night, not even specifically thinking of either of them, I went to bed. I had a dream. I was sitting in my bedroom and the furniture was arranged just how I had never had it before arranged. And Rhonda, my deceased best friend, was sitting next to me on the bed and we were talking. I wanted to tell her she was my best friend and that I missed her so much and how much it had hurt me that she died. But I could not get the words out. And then I just realized in the dream that my left arm was itching really bad. Before I went to scratch my arm, Rhonda said, you need to scratch your left arm, Rose. I looked at her and I said, how did you know my arm was itching? And she said, I know, I know how you feel. She had a smile and that unique giggle she had that I missed so much. And she kept saying, I know, I know how you feel. The dream ended there. She was telling me she knew the things I was feeling without me actually having to say it. This was a visitation in my dream. I know that for sure. Very shortly after that dream visitation, I also had one for my boyfriend, Doug, who had died the day before my best friend did. In that dream, we were in my bathroom and I was crying. I was crying harder than I ever cried in my life, and he was holding me saying, It's okay, Rose. It's okay. He also said, I know how hurt you are, and I know you cared about me. I kept telling him I was sorry, so sorry, and that's where that dream ended. These were not dreams that I willed to happen. I've lost many other relatives, including my mother and father, and I've never had a dream like that about them. I'd never had a dream before those two that were so real to me. I'm 50 years old now, and I remember every single aspect of those two dreams, and I know my boyfriend and my best friend and boyfriend visited me in a dream state because it would have scared me any other way. In the dream, I felt safe and everything felt normal. It was like I knew they were gone in the dream, but it seemed normal to see them and to be talking to them. Wow, I have to say, it has taken a lot out of me to write this stuff out, to go through those emotions again, reliving such tragedy, but I felt it important to share this with you. It is a 100% true story which can be proved from newspaper archives about both their deaths and I have copies in a scrapbook and stuff from both of them. Blessings, Rose. It was raining heavily that night. I was on my way back from the night class. I boarded a double-decker bus. Thinking that I might be more quiet to take a nap upstairs, I took a seat on the center of the bus in the upper part. The bus takes 30 minutes to reach the terminal, which was near where I stayed. I closed my eyes, thinking of taking a short nap. After about 10 minutes, I heard a boy talking to his mother. I was sure that I was the only passenger aboard that bus. Then the little boy was speaking in a very different language, from which I could hardly understand. Looking at his mom, half of her face was covered by her long hair, so I didn't really have a chance to see her face. When I closed my eyes once again, I felt like the boy was sitting beside me and was whispering in my ear. I opened my eyes again and he was at a seat and pointing at me laughing loudly. It felt so eerie. Then suddenly, I felt a gust of cold wind blow past me, followed by a sound of a girl in a low pitch talking to her boyfriend behind me. 
I turned my head, and at the same time, the rain and thunder outside the window sounded heavy and loud. I could hardly hear what they were saying. I remember I was the only one on the upper decker when I boarded, and I closed my eyes less than 10 minutes. Why were there four others on the bus? I did not doze off, and I'm sure the bus did not stop. This time, I told myself I need to keep my eyes open. I was worried if I closed my eyes again, another two people might appear. The rain was heavy and the night was quiet, so therefore the bus driver did not stop at most of the bus stops. There were three more bus stops to go. I walked down from the upper deck and stood near the driver's seat. The driver said to me, What a lonely night. You are my only passenger. And I responded by saying, I beg your pardon? There is some other foreign passenger on the upper deck. The driver did not answer me. Then suddenly, the bus skidded and crashed into a tree. I knocked against the metal pole in front of me and fainted. When I opened my eyes, I was still sitting at the bus stop waiting for the bus. It was still raining heavily. I thought I had a dream, but my head was swollen. How can that be? When I turned my head to the left, a heavyset man was sitting at the first seat. A lady and a boy was sitting right beside me. The lady's hair covered half of her face, which I cannot see clearly, and a boy and a girl were hugging each other behind my seat. I shivered and stood up. The little boy said, Are you leaving? Our bus is not here yet. I did not turn my head. I waved to the coming by taxi and quickly got inside. When I entered the taxi, the driver said, What a lonely night. You are my only passenger. I was shocked to hear this twice and felt uneasy. I quickly aligned from the taxi and entered a night coffee shop, took out my mobile phone, and called for my dad. Then the waiter came near me and asked for my order. I ordered two cups of coffee, thinking my dad would be here soon. Then I heard the waitress whispering to another, This lady is ordering a coffee for that little boy also. I turned my head and looked at them, giving me a weird look. The other waitress walked near me and asked, Are you going to ask your boy to come in? or let him stand outside my door. I just ignored her, pretending I did not hear what she said and hoped that my father would be here soon. After the coffee was served, I saw my father enter and I felt safe. On the way home, I saw the taxi that I just halted was in the accident. It was badly crashed against the tree and there stood an overweight man, a couple, and a mother holding a boy staring at the taxi and the nurses were busy carrying the injured man into the ambulance. Lucky, I was not in that taxi. The little boy turned his head, stared at me pointing and laughing. When I reached home, I was sick for almost a week. My mom brought me to a medium, and the medium sent me and my mom to that bus stop to do some spirit chanting and offering. I guess you could say, this was one wild night. A lot has been happening lately. Comfortable and uncomfortable things. Some of these happenings just leave me curious and confused as to why all of this is happening. I've been experiencing things to the point where I've broken down, and I shall tell you how and why right now. One day, I was sitting in front of the door to my brother's room, just casually sitting there, listening to music, as I waited on my brother to come back. When he finally came, just as I turned my head towards him to say something, I was kept completely shut and frightened over what I had just seen. I let out a small scream, which left my brother worried and motivated him to ask me why I had let out a sudden reaction. I explained it all to him about how I saw a solid figure of a man that stood right behind him. Now, I really didn't believe in the paranormal, and to see something like this just shook me. I did, and still do believe that spirits are real, but my view on seeing them had totally changed around after this incident. I am religious, and I pray more often than I used to back then, which has helped me a lot, because I feel more protected and safe. But it doesn't end there. When I found out that my brother was experiencing the same things as me, we told our mother, and she sat us down to explain it all. We found out that she had similar things happening to her in the past, too, and I had also learned 
that when my mother was trying to get pregnant with her first child, me, that she was targeted by black magic and had been attacked by a shadow person, that gives me a feeling that something or someone, the spirits, may have gotten through some closed doors. I'm not a professional or anything, but it's something I assume may have happened. Anyway, we've had our house checked out by different mediums, and they all said the same things. They told us that something was in this house. But the thing is that I feel like there's more than one spirit in this house. One I sense is good and the other I sense as bad, but not demonically bad. I can feel it in my gut. Most times, out of nowhere, I will occasionally see a black mist pass by the corner of my eyes, but I end up dismissing them as my imagination. The way these spirits contact me are through my dreams, most of the times, rather than in my awake hours, although I've seen the solid figure of a man twice in the same hallway I had an encounter with the first solid figure that appeared behind my brother. At night, I feel cold touches, especially on the side of my head, and the feelings of pins and needles stuck into my hands. Very recently, it was as if I was completely drained of my energy, and no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't think straight. Hours later, I was totally fine and slept well, but this isn't the only time that something like that has happened. One night, I was sleeping, and I felt this voice speak into my ear. It was vividly clear enough to make me understand the words being said, and the voice was soft, yet in a little harsh tone. It said something like, You think you're clever, don't you? I'm stronger than you, girl. Try me. That's when I woke up. My heart was racing so fast to examine if one of my siblings played a harmless yet frightening prank on me. But when I realized there was no way for my siblings to do that to me, I froze in shock. My bed was against the wall, then, and since my door's a bit broken and the floorboards haven't been fitted back in properly, if you open the door, it would create a loud sound that would make anyone jolt. I'm a light sleeper, by the way, so there was no way that anyone could have pulled it off. Plus, I don't sleep against the wall. I always sleep away from the wall, so I wouldn't have known and felt something get onto my bed and lay beside me. It's just confusing me, all of this. I found myself crying one day because of it. I don't know what to do. I've decided to keep myself devoted to God and to follow the light, as I know that's the only thing that assures me safety. I'm sorry for posting such a long story, but I would like to know your opinions and advice on what I should do or about what's happening to me. Thanks. Number 2 my name is April. I'm 21 and have a story to tell you about the experience I had with the infamous Ouija board. You have heard stories of Zozo the demon, right? Well, he is real, and I have read stories on him, but didn't actually think it was true until it happened to me. Three months ago, I had moved in with my sister, and I had brought a couple friends over to hang out that evening. We were all smoking a cigarette when I came up with the brilliant idea to play the Ouija board and ask otherworldly spirits questions about the afterlife and questions about the future. Now, I have played the board by myself for many years with little to no negative spirits speaking with me, but this evening was in fact different. We sat at the table and put our hands on the cursor and moved it clockwise around the board as we said Ouija out loud three times. My friends weren't avid believers in the paranormal or using the board from rumors they had heard. I asked, is there anyone there? The cursor moved slowly to yes. Who are we speaking with? The cursor repeatedly went from Z to O and continued to do so after the question was asked. What do you want? It quickly spelled out her. Who is her? I asked. It spelled out my friend's name, and I was freaked. What do you want with her? It spelled out, 
I want her. Very quickly, the cursor returned to moving from the Z to the O yet again, and I was getting annoyed with this because it wouldn't tell me why it wanted my friend. It just spelled out, I want her, repeatedly. My friend, the one that Demon wanted, stupidly called him a pussy, and the board spelled out, death. That's when things got bad. I got angry and told her not to provoke him because he was capable of bad things, and I sure as hell didn't want anything happening to my friends. The other friend just sat there freaked out, not speaking the entire time, as we continued to ask it questions, which I don't recall. The cursor began feeling hot under my fingers, and I asked my friends if they felt it too. They said they did. I asked it another question, but its answer didn't make any sense it spelled out. The word it spelled out was mama, over and over, and would not move to any other letters, so I cussed at him because I was getting annoyed. The one friend took his hand off the cursor and refused to play any more, and the atmosphere immediately changed. I could feel Zozo in the room now, and the air was heavy, and I began to get scared. All of a sudden, I didn't feel like myself. I felt if something was inside me. I felt the most intense hatred I've ever felt before. I began to laugh hysterically and then cry like I had no control over my emotions. My mood then turned to hatred again, and I turned to look at my friend, the one the demon wanted, with the most evil smile. I felt it inside. It wasn't me smiling. It was the demon. We all stopped playing the board after that, but the heavy feeling in the air and its presence remained. It took a bit before everything felt normal again that night, and I felt like myself, but when it did, I was certainly relieved. I feared for my friend's safety that night, but fortunately, none of them experienced anything after leaving. My advice? Do not mess with the Ouija board. Evil Presence in the Flat Since moving out of the flat, when I was going through my divorce, I've made a point of not going back in there unless it was really necessary. When we had tenants renting the place, I had no need really, but the tenants left and my mom decided to move in there. Suddenly, I had to go there quite often. The atmosphere in the place was always thick to me. It was like the air was harder to breathe. On one specific night in April 2015, my mom sent me a message and told me strange things were going on in the flat. Not one to leave my mom alone when she was far less open than I was. I ran to the flat. She was sitting in the lounge when I came in and she asked me to step into her room and tell me if I smelled anything. As I took the one step into her room and came to the closet on my left, bed to my right, there was the very distinct smell of cigarette smoke hanging in the air. I walked towards the bed, and the smell decreased towards the closet, and the smell was stronger. No one in the yard smokes, so the chances that it could have been carried in from outside are zero. The closet is also not close to any windows, so the fact that the smoke was centralized to that spot was enough to get my hair standing on end. I went back to my mom and asked her if this was all she had been experiencing. She said no. The whole week, she could feel someone take hold of her ankles as she lay in bed. Until one night, where not only did something take hold of her legs, it pulled her halfway out until she got panicked and started kicking. By then, her legs were completely off of the bed. She swore to me for a second it felt like she had kicked a solid human being, but no one was there to be seen, although she clearly smelled the smoke. The weekend, I had Tim and Eileen over and explained the story to them. Tim went into the flat alone, leaving us by the pool, and after about five minutes, he came out. He said that the person in the flat was a man, middle-aged. 
He gave features to this man that had my mom and I looking at each other. For my South African compatriots, the man looked like a thinner version of Eugene Terror Blanche. I asked him if he could see the man's right arm, and Tim told me that the man made an effort of staying in silhouette. I went into Adam's room and fetched my mom's wedding album. I found a picture of my paternal grandfather and showed it to Tim. Tim nodded. The man in the flat was my mom's father, Johnny. Johnny had lost his right arm in a car accident. Considering he had been instrumental in the abuse I suffered in the flat, not to mention that he was responsible for the death of my gran when she was 32 years old. My mom was five at the time. Neither my mom nor I were very happy about the fact that he was in our home. My mom told me to take every picture of him out of the album. She took the pictures, gave them to Tim, and told him to burn them. After he had destroyed every picture, Tim told us what he needed to cleanse the flat, and he went in alone. He was busy for close to two hours. By then, it was late afternoon. As night came around, my mom went into the flat. For some odd reason, the main switch of the electricity was off. Strange. She switched the power on and went to her bedroom. My son, T, came into the flat and told her he smelled smoke. Since they are both asthmatics, very bad timing. My mom ran out of her room and saw the box that she had set down on the stove catch fire. Yes, not the smartest move putting flammable materials on a stove. Curious though, my mom never cooks in the flat, so the stove mains are always switched off on the circuit. Yet, every plate on the stove was glowing red, turned up to full heat, and the box and its contents were on fire. Mom yelled and grabbed T, rushing to get out. Tim rushed in, grabbed a box, dropped it in the sink, and doused the flames. Outside, both my mom and my son were having full-on asthma attacks. When Eileen and I were able to get my mom and my son calmed down and breathing, we speculated as to why the stove would have been turned on when it is never used. Tim stated very simply, You burn my pictures, I will burn you. A sick parting gift from a bad old soul. At long last, the 14 hours of flying non-stop from Singapore to London was over. Max managed to get the key to his hotel room. The thought of having two days off in London overcame the trauma he endured during the 16 hours of duty time. The flight was packed with demanding passengers, and it was hard coping with his senior crew. After having a shower, Max took a train from Gloucester Hill Station and left for Picky D Station the nearest tube station to London Chinatown. Max's favorite duck rice was in a restaurant in Chinatown. He would never fail to visit Chinatown for his favorite dish. The restaurant was crowded with diners from all over the world. It was noisy too. There was only one small table available and the waiter ushered Max to that table. Chinese tea was served and before Max could sip his tea, an old haggard-looking lady of European descent sheepishly asked Max whether she could share the table. Max gestured her to only the left seat. She took a bow and thanked Max. The old lady and Max had placed their dinner order, and it took a long time before their dinner was served. While waiting for their meals, Max and the old lady did not speak to each other, except for the occasional smile they exchanged with each other. After dinner, the old lady was pleasantly surprised when Max paid for her meal. She insisted on paying Max, but Max politely declined to accept. During the time when they were waiting for their dinner to arrive, Max noticed that the old lady was dressed in old tattered clothing. The dress was old and patched up, but it looked clean. She had an old worn out handbag. Max took pity on the old lady and decided to pay for a five pound dinner which was nothing more than a plate of fried rice. After all, Max told himself that the allowances he earned on his London flight was more than $1,000. That night, Max was woken up from his sleep by some noises which sounded like someone talking to him. He looked up, and in the dim room light, 
could see an old lady seated across from his bed in a chair, smiling at him. Max noticed it was the same old lady who had shared his table at Chinatown. At this point, Max could feel the goosebumps all over his body. He was scared stiff, but the old lady lifted up her hands, smiled, and vanished into the thin air. Max could not sleep and remained so until dawn. Back at Singapore a week later, Max found out that his wife was pregnant. They had always wanted a baby, but Max's wife could not conceive. They have been married for a couple of years, and the knowledge that his wife was pregnant was indeed good news. The following news his wife was pregnant, Max also won a big sum of money by betting on lotteries. Indeed, Max and his wife suspected the old lady whom Max met in London must have given them good luck. Three years ago, I used to study in France, and I worked part-time at a restaurant in winter. This is a very old restaurant and an expensive one. My job was to clean the whole restaurant before it was noon. So every day early in the morning, around 5 a.m., I used to start my job and it would take around two hours to complete. I like to share the strange experiences I had in this place. In the morning, when I'd start work, it was always dark. Every day, the first thing I did when I entered the place was to lock the door from the inside. After this, I turned off the alarm systems and then would turn on the heating systems. Each and every window was kept closed in the building. The restaurant opened at noon, so all the other employees started work after 11 a.m. I mentioned this to prove that there was no possibility of someone else entering the place from outside playing a role in my experiences. While working there most of the time, I got the feeling I wasn't alone. I remember many instances where I suddenly turned back because I would feel as if someone was behind me, a feeling of thin air brushing me. Most often, I got confused but never got scared, maybe because I didn't have much time to think about it. When I worked upstairs, the building is two stories. Sometimes I heard footsteps coming from downstairs or heard someone running up or down the staircases. And at those times, I come to the ground floor to see if my boss or the chef had come. Only three of us had a key, but strangely enough, not even once they were present. The next thing I did when it happened was run towards the main door and see if it was locked properly, and it was always locked. Those times, I just eased my mind, telling myself maybe I didn't hear anything. Since no one ever told me about the building's haunted history, I never wanted to believe there were paranormal presences. Other than this, sometimes I heard doorknobs turning. At times, strange sounds from the kitchen were heard, but whenever I checked, nothing was there. This building had some particular locations where it got so cold even though the heating systems were on. When you are at those places, you tend to get the feeling someone or something is always there, and it never moves from there. One of the creepiest places was the huge cellar in the basement. I had to visit the basement often to refill wine. The cellar and the basement were unusually cold. I often felt humming kinds of sounds from the cellar. It is hard to explain how, since these sounds were not heard, but felt. I worked in that place for three months, and in all those three months, I had noticed lots of strange things happening. My instincts were saying to me all the time that there were entities in that place which never belonged to our world or dimension. Regardless of that, I dismissed this instinct every time. I also need to say, I never ever experienced something which threatened me. If I saw something as a threat, maybe I would have quit my job. Now, sometimes I think that what I did back then by rejecting or neglecting the presence of paranormal entities, I saved myself from lots of unwanted haunting, which might have disrupted my lifestyle. I strongly believe that the fact I never showed any weakness was the main reason I was not harmed or threatened. After three months of work, I found a better job which suited my education, so I decided to leave my job. 
Something happened on the last day of my work, which changed my whole attitude towards that building. It was a conversation with a barmaid who was working there for more than a year. The last day, I was waiting for my boss outside the restaurant to get my last pay and bid goodbye. It was almost 11.30 a.m., and one of the barmaids, Sophia, was already there. Since I had the key, I opened the restaurant door for her, and she went in. While I was outside, within 15 minutes, she came back running outside, and I could see she had a pale and panicked face. She sat next to me, and I could see from her looks she was terrified. She lit a cigarette and started smoking. I asked her what was wrong. She replied to me, It's as usual. The things inside scared me. I was confused hearing this and asked her what she meant. She looked at me with a puzzled face and said, Don't you know? Ghosts. And said she heard the usual footsteps and voices. She also said she felt as if someone touched her shoulder from behind. At this point, I noticed she was sweating like hell. I remind you it was winter and freezing even with thick jackets on. Once I saw this, I knew for sure she was damn serious about it. I tried to calm her down and told her that I too had experienced these things, but I never took it seriously and that I never accepted the ghostly presence inside. She said I was lucky I wasn't harmed. She was also shocked to hear that I usually start work as early as 5 a.m. In fact, even my boss didn't know I start work that early. I had to finish work before noon, and they thought I started work at 10 or 11 a.m. If someone had known the timetable I used for my conveniences, I'm sure they would have never allowed me. According to Sophia, throughout its history, the building was notorious for haunting. It was believed ghosts belonged to various centuries were present in that place, and also some other entities as well. People believe the presence of alcohol, food, and other luxuries were the reasons for this building being a hotspot for haunting. The building had always been a restaurant, a hotel, or a bar in its lifetime. Some people would flood to this place to have fun, and it seems the souls of those who never saw light still visit this building. There were also some ghosts who were trapped inside the building for unknown reasons. Most of these employees and guests, when being alone, have felt the presence of these ghosts. This includes voices, touches, and moving shadows. Sophia also mentioned that a murder or a suicide had taken place in the basement long ago. She wasn't sure about it, but said the basement had the strongest sightings. Some employees were working inside the basement and had seen moving shadows and strange whispers in their ear. Unlike the voices heard, these whispers were very clear. After my conversation with her, I really felt terrified, but also lucky to not have been threatened by ghosts. Now, Sophia was only 18 and was one of the fun-loving people in that restaurant who loved playing small jokes, so it was possible that she was trying to fool me. So that afternoon when I met another employee, Adela, who was a friend and was someone respectable in her 60s, I told her about my conversation with Sophia, and this old lady friend confirmed everything Sophia said. She also yelled at me for working so early alone in that building. She said the ghosts were very violent sometimes, and she mentioned an incident. One day when Adela, my boss, and another employee were having their last drink for the day, almost around midnight, suddenly they heard huge bangs and very loud noises from the kitchen. She said it sounded like someone was screaming out of anger. They were all scared because the whole place was locked from the inside, and there weren't others present in the restaurant but these three. Then after around five minutes, once everything had calmed, the three of them together with some people from a neighboring hotel had gone to the kitchen to see what had happened. She said the food trolley kept in the kitchen had banged the door for the rear entrance of the restaurant, which was through the kitchen. In the rear, there was a small garden, followed by a huge wall. The door was locked. It had occurred to them that something had been banging the trolley against the door. 
What frightened them was the kitchen knives, which were very sharp, were seen scattered around the kitchen as if someone had thrown them all over the place. Had some employee been present at the kitchen when this happened, then most probably he would have died or severely gotten injured. After this incident, my boss had brought a priest and purified the place, and things have calmed down a bit for some time. Then everything had started up again. Luckily, the kitchen haunting had never repeated. The year was 1980, and I was 14 years old. My parents and two younger sisters were living in Saudi Arabia, where my father was stationed as part of a phone system upgrade project for the kingdom. The School for Expatriates, Americans, British, Canadians, and others from all over the world only went up to grade 9 in Saudi Arabia, and so for the grade 10 school year, I was sent back to Canada to live with my grandmother in a small Ontario town, not far from Ottawa. My grandmother lived alone, my grandfather having died long before I was born. She was very religious and very involved with her church community, along with her regular Sunday attendance. My family didn't practice any religion and never went to church, so it took some time getting used to on my part being away from my family for the first time, living in a small rural town and living in a religious household. Further complicating things, I inadvertently crossed the school bully early on in the school year and found myself a pariah at the local high school where I was the new kid. To be exact, I had a hard time adjusting to this environment, and as a result, I stopped going to school. This upset my grandmother deeply, and she sent me to go see a doctor, who prescribed me some kind of antidepressant. I just threw the entire bottle out the window. Drug me was not the solution. I would take my bike and go to the library or find a park on a nice fall day and read books. At night, I would stay up and watch late night TV like The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. The apartment was on the second floor of a house by the railroad tracks on the north edge of town. It was old and musty, and the floorboards and steps up creaked. There was only one entrance to the place, and if anyone came in, I would be able to see them coming up the stairs and pass by the living room where I watched TV. One night in November, I heard my grandmother sobbing from her room, which was down the hall. I knew I was the reason for her distress, because I had stopped going to school, and she didn't know how to deal with me. Then I heard her talking. At first I thought she was talking to herself, as this was 1980, and there were no cell phones, and she did not have a phone in her room. The only phone was in the hall, and she wasn't in the hall. Then a man's voice responded to her. Don't worry, Anna, he said. Chills ran up my spine, and I froze in my chair. The voice was deep and clear, and in the house, and yet I had been in the living room all evening, and no one had come into the house. I heard her sobbing some more, and one more time the voice spoke, everything will be alright. I remained in that chair until dawn. I'll never know if that was my imagination, my grandmother speaking in a different voice to herself, or perhaps, as I imagined at the time, it was the voice of my grandfather's spirit comforting my grandmother. Whatever the case, I've never forgotten that moment, nor the feeling of creepy dread that crawled up my spine, as something from the other world seemed to pass into this one for the moment. This is an experience that occurred over several months. In the autumn of 2012, I was home from university one weekend. On the outskirts of my town, there is an old graveyard called the Red River Cemetery. It is very old. The earliest graves are from the 1790s and associated with an abundance of local history. The Great Revival of 1800 occurred there, the first camp meeting in Christian history. A lot of spiritual activity happened at that event. This cemetery is a regular spot for me. It is a pleasant drive into the fresh country, and the entire graveyard is surrounded by ancient trees. In the back of the cemetery is a reconstruction of a log church that was once there. You feel as if you are going back in time when you go there. 
It is serenely silent and still, and there is a nostalgia with all the graves and arrangement of trees. In the center of the cemetery is a separate walled graveyard. It is an elaborate family plot, and the old wall dates back to the 1830s. There are many graves in there, and one has sunken in and opened. Vandalism or other natural occurrence? Not entirely sure. I walked around the plot for a few moments. I had come here many times before, and nothing strange had ever happened. But this time, I felt an unpleasant feeling. It wasn't very strong, but I felt that I should get out of this plot. I did so and continued to walk around the cemetery. Then it started that night. I mostly had insomnia, but I did drift into sleep eventually. The line between the two is blurred, but I definitely know that I was awake most of the night. In lack of a better term, my mind was tormented. Seemingly out of nowhere, my mind burned with the image of these two particular graves in the back of the walled plot. It was scorched in my mind. I had nightmares when awake of these two graves and never could I get my mind off of them. It was something I've never experienced before. The thought and image of these graves blared and blared in my mind and I felt terrified. I knew I was awake and I was afraid in my own home. I felt I wasn't alone. I covered myself in the middle of my bed with this torturing thought of these two graves. As the night wore on, the thought or nightmare, I can't recall which, I had a dream of the people buried there. I remember specifically seeing a man, young, but I couldn't tell how young, and his face was a blur. He wore brownish beige clothes, pre-1850ish style. He may have held pale hair, but I can't recall specifically. He was a little heavy set, not fat, just big. This image is crystal clear in my mind, and in my torment, I knew it was one of the people buried in those graves. This incident was absolutely dreadful. The next day, I was emotionally disturbed. My parents didn't know what to think. If I thought about my experience, I would start to cry. A few odd things happened that can be attributed to coincidence, but nevertheless odd. My dog was barking at nothing. Then the washing machine went crazy and started moving. The repairman said a part inside had gotten loose. It never done that, nor has it again. Again, this could be coincidence. Eventually, I put it out of my mind. It was disturbing, but I couldn't let it get in the way of my studies, so I carried on with my life. Then came the spring of 2013. I became curious again about those graves. I wondered, just who are buried in those graves? I thought if I found out, some sort of mystery would be solved or a question would be answered. So I gathered my courage and went back to the cemetery. I found the two graves. They were there. I wrote down the names but misplaced the exact information, but the individuals were two siblings. There was a Jane, and she passed away when she was 28 and had three children. Her brother's name was Chatham. He died when he was 21 or 22 in the 1810s. They were the children of a Kentucky senator, who is also buried nearby, and the site of their old family home is nearby. Nobody special, and I thought little of it. That very night, I woke up at exactly 3.30 a.m., insomnia again. I had been awake for a few moments and then my doorknob wiggled. I stared wide-eyed at it for the longest time. It had just wiggled. My first thought is that it was my cat. Sometimes she opens the porch door then tries to open our doors. I prayed to God, please let that have been my cat, then I can sleep in peace. I convinced myself it was my cat, of course. The next morning, my cat was on the porch, and the porch door happened to be locked. Kitty had not snuck in, 
So I interrogated my mom, dad, and brother. They denied my accusations. They wouldn't do that. Then the next night came, and I awoke again at 3.30 or 4.30. When I went to bed, my brother, who was in the den right outside my room, was watching TV. But here I was awake again, and I could see the light coming in where I could see under the door. Then my door opened. I heard the doorknob turn, and it slowly opened about halfway. Then it began to close again, but didn't close all the way. Then there was a flash of light in the den, and it went dark. I stared at it for a while. I thought it was my brother, because I thought he stayed up all night watching the show and opened my door for some reason. Thus, I wasn't scared, and I got up and closed the door. I attempted to go back to sleep, but was a little bothered. I asked him about it the next morning. He didn't know what I was talking about, because he swore he went to bed at midnight, and he has no history of sleepwalking. I did my usual interrogation, and everyone denied it. I was ambushed and became frightened. Later that day, I was on the computer and heard my mom scream my name twice, as if from outside, like she needed help. I rushed outside to get her aid. She was calmly tending the garden. She looked startled when I got there. What's wrong? I asked out of breath. I heard you scream my name. She said she never did and looked at me like I was crazy. She thought I was playing a joke on her. She'd never play a joke like this on me. Since this moment, nothing has happened with the incident. I even went back to the graveyard and got no bad feelings. It was a lovely autumn noon. Me, my parents, and my granny were on our way to visit relatives. Everyone was a bit on edge, as these family gatherings tend to be extremely awkward and competitive, so they thought it was the perfect time to express their views on political matters, which is always so delightful. For these reasons, I was rather annoyed when we arrived at the cemetery. Our final destination was visiting live relatives, although visiting dead ones can be competitive as well, as our culture has a knack of graveside landscape design. But my granny also wanted to pay our respects to the deceased because she can't go there by herself too often. I used this opportunity to keep my distance and to gather my wits before standing in front of the grand jury on matters of finance and romance. I raked the leaves and started looking about. I was pleasantly surprised to notice I felt at ease. Previously, I've always felt uncomfortable in graveyards, jumpy even. I started looking around, observing the old, shadowy trees, leaves swirling down. There are mossy graves with old German names, barely possible to read now, Lithuanian names. It's close to the border. Sometimes, I would notice a name I have heard, probably from local gossip. I was mostly enjoying the nature, though. At that point, I think it's important to admit, I felt anxious and a bit depressed because of the visit, but the graveyard felt to me like a park. Graves, just like some monuments dedicated to soldiers. However, when we were about to leave, I approached the graveside, almost from behind. Suddenly, I thought to myself, ah, a young girl. Then I got scared because I didn't know if it was really a young girl. I rarely visit there and I've consciously memorized just our family spot. A few graves around it and some grave with, I think, Lithuanian names on the way in because it is so close to the path you almost step on it and that makes me feel bad. The more I tried to brush the impression off, the more persistent it got. I don't really know how to explain it. 
the kind of presence that I felt was like, it wasn't even physical. Let me give you a clear picture here. You were hanging out with your friends, watching a movie, laughing about this or that. Suddenly, someone says, oh, it's too bad John isn't here. And you feel like it would just be the perfect time if John was here, like he is truly missing at your party. That is the kind of presence I'm speaking about. You don't miss John's appearance. It's such a pity he's not here. The sofa looks awful without him. You don't miss any particular quality. You miss his presence, his being. That is what I felt. Like there was this presence of a particular young girl that I felt. It wasn't threatening or anything. I just got freaked out by my own old self. Then I also noticed, or perhaps before, I can't place these two in order because maybe that directed my attention to the grave, that a candle had fallen off the edge of the gravestone and I felt I should have probably picked it up and place it back. There was this little angel fingering too and I thought maybe that was why I decided it was a young person, although I'm not sure I saw it from where I was coming. I don't know why. People just don't place angels on the graves of adults and elderly. Maybe it's because jobs and wrinkles don't seem angelic and old people mostly don't like flying. Sorry, couldn't resist a joke. I approached the front and counted the numbers that added up to 23 years. A girl. The graveside was neatly raked, not just raked to sweep away the footsteps from the sandy oil, Someone had even made ornaments in the sand in the traditional manner. I thought it was a perfectly good practical reason not to get involved. I was scared to do something awfully wrong and cause something terribly bad. I didn't want to ruin someone's thorough work. So I started stepping away slowly, having that internal fight with myself. I knew I had to go and put that candle back, but I told myself... Come on, it will fall off again when it gets windy. Who cares? The candle's probably burnt out anyway. This isn't an abandoned grave. Someone will come. The grave was cared for. I can't go around picking up everything. As I later explained to my friend, I was probably worried that when you go to heaven, you still have to be preoccupied with order. I'm messy and I've been persecuted all my life for that. I hope when we die, we don't care anymore about such nonsense. I don't want anyone to visit me in my dreams, telling me to clean up under my bed. Finally, I rather unwillingly went back and placed that candle on the stone. I prayed to God to take care of this young soul and to protect me because I mostly had no idea what I was doing so God had to take care of me. And as I walked back to the car, I suddenly felt really happy and warm around my shoulders. It wasn't a jolly kind of happiness, more like this, all is right kind of happiness. And it stayed with me until we found out my cousin had lost a lot of weight, which made everyone feel plenty of things. Thank you kindly for reading this experience. P.S. My granny saw me by the girl's grave, and she told us about her. It was some kind of tragic, unexpected death. I'm saying this because it might be that she had told me this before. The girl had died several years ago. As the grave was on the way out, and maybe I had unconsciously memorized it, it would be honest to mention this option. I just started experiencing whatever is going on, and it is really scaring me. A few weeks ago, my sister and I went to the local graveyard to test out this ghost raider I got in the app market for my droid. That's my phone, if you didn't know. I didn't think it would really work. It's just a circle with lines around it and a scanner, and if there is a so-called apparition nearby, a dot appears on the scanner in the direction it is. There was a slight breeze that day, and it was sunny. We got near the graveyard, and the scanner started going crazy. 
Dots were appearing everywhere, red, yellow, and green dots. The colors and meaning and the strength of the so-called entity, red being the most present and green being the least. A word or phrase appears at the top of the screen sometimes, like something to do with their death and whatnot. A large amount of phrases and words began appearing, some names and some frightening words like hanged or murder. The creepiest part of the whole equation was when a name appeared. The name was Peter. My sister and I started wondering if the Peter that appeared was an inhabitant of the graveyard. We started looking at gravestones, and we actually found one that said Peter Longs. It was a little scary, but then again, there is a lot of people named Peter in this world. We started talking to the so-called spirits. Like I said, is there anyone here with us that would like to share things via my radar? I started getting replies like crazy. Random words and phrases were blazing around like a wildfire. We then started to go home because it was getting near dinner time. Everything was good from then on for about two days. My whole family started hearing footsteps, knocks, bangs, etc. My sister said that she heard her name called, and then a bottle of her perfume flew off of her shelf and across the room. I later started seeing shadows and hearing muffled talking in the room next to me, even when nobody would be in there. Everything was starting to scare me, so I spoke out to them and told whatever was plaguing my family that it had to leave my home. Everything was quiet and back to normal until the next night, when I was laying in bed trying to sleep. I felt really cold all of a sudden, and my TV turned on really quick, and then it turned off again. I went to my sister's room and saw her sitting up in her bed looking really frightened. I asked her what was the matter, and she said that her TV turned on and off again. I told her that the same thing happened to me. We were both scared as can be, so I just slept in her room that night. The most recent and scariest experience I have was when I was home alone one night because my family was out at the store and I didn't want to go. I was just watching TV and then the channel flipped. The remote was all the way across the room when that happened. Later, I got in the shower, and as I was washing my hair, I heard a knock on the bathroom door. The door swung open, and one of the knobs in the cabinet hanging on the wall fell to the floor. I was so scared that I called my mom, and I went to my neighbor's house until they got home. But are these experiences attributed to me going to the graveyard recently? I don't know, but I'm really terrified of all these events that occurred. But I guess in a way, it is kind of entertaining. Not in a good way, but an interesting one. Thanks for reading. I've lived in New Mexico my entire lifetime and never moved. As a result of living in the center of the Southwest, I've heard the story of La Lorna multiple times and in many different versions. I live very close to about two rivers, and when I was little, I heard a version of the story where she drowned her children in the river that I could easily walk to. I never thought I would pay much attention, nevertheless see her, hear her, and slightly see, but recently, all that changed. I have three friends that are brother and sister to each other. It was summer of 2008 and we were having a sleepover. We had been planning this for about a month and earlier in the day. We had bought all the food and other snacks we could imagine. We had planned to fire up the grill and make s'mores at about 8pm and just sit outside and have a good time. At every sleepover we have, it seems that the Halloween decorations seem to get taken out of the closet a lot. 8 p.m. came around and we made s'mores in the front yard. It was fun, seeing as I was the first, second, third, and last to set mine on fire. We walked around barefoot in the driveway for a bit. I set the skull on the wall of our patio. After a bit, we sat in front of the door, talking silently. During a small moment of silence and nothing to say, we heard a moan come from up the hill. 
It sounded outside and very close, but still far away. We ran inside, and in the haste, I nearly got shut out. We were all accounted for, and we ran into my room. When we heard it, it seemed like it was coming our way fast. We all believed it was La Lorna, but we shook it off as one of my neighbors trying to scare us. The two streets we lived on had ex-criminals and people with mental disorders everywhere. I eventually noticed that he didn't have the plastic skull with me. About two or so hours later, I walked through the dark hallway, switching on as many lights as possible right when I was in my entryway. I looked out the narrow window next to the front door. I saw what looked like a misty shape of a person hovering there. It kind of looked like a woman, but I couldn't tell very easily. It was all very light. I didn't stay to find out. I turned tail and ran back to my room. Right before I got to running half of the two feet into the hallway, I looked down a bit and saw my plastic skull right next to the door. I'm still not sure if that really was La Lorna, but one of the friends at the sleepover, the older sister, had heard once before, and the moaning sounded just the same, and she heard her. The other sister with us was hearing bells for the rest of the night. This story goes way back before I was born. My uncle told us the story on one Christmas day, when I was like seven years old. He told us that when he and his work friends went to a bar to relax after a hard day at work, he saw the scariest thing in his entire life. When he got near to the ravine, he saw a lady in white weeping and crying looking down, standing at the edge of the ravine. So he said, Are you okay? Be careful, you're going to fall. But no words came out of her. My uncle described her. He said she was wearing a long white dress and she had no feet, actually floating in the air. He could only see her back. After a few seconds, my uncle felt really bad and he started backing up. Her weeping became louder and louder. Then she turned around and my uncle screamed. Her face was indiscernible and she had horse legs. She was part human and part animal. After that, he never walked home alone at midnight around the ravine. He said that, at night, he could hear her weeping soft in the air, and he still gets the chills down his spine. People say that when you hear the weeping lady far, far away, she is right outside your house or near you, and when you hear her really close and loud, it's because she is far away. My mom is a first-generation American. Her parents moved from Mexico to El Paso, Texas before she was born. The supernatural was very prevalent in both sides of her family. My grandfather claims that we are descended from the Apache warlord Victorio and that the spirit of Victorio appeared to him and his brothers when he was a young man. My mom had many experiences with ghosts and spirits, but she said that none was more terrifying than her experience with La Lorna. Her family lived in a decent-sized house on the banks of a canal on the south side of El Paso. At the time, the family had three dogs. My mom describes all of them as the toughest dogs in the block. One night in the dead of winter, my grandfather was telling my mom one of his great stories when there was a loud commotion in the front yard where the dogs were. The dogs were barking to wake the dead. My mom and her dad went outside into the front to see what was going on. They were joined by my grandmother. They had not noticed this before, but a fog was slowly creeping around the street. The air was chill, but different from the cold of winter, the cold went down to the very bone. The three dogs were barking towards the fog, or more accurately towards the canal that was by the house. Suddenly, a blood-curdling scream pierced the night air. My mom described it as the most terrifying cry she has ever heard in her entire life. She says that it lasted for a full minute before finally dissipating. When the scream left, the fog lifted and the dogs returned to the way they were before. My mom asked her dad what the scream was, but all he said was, La Lorna, and told her to go back to bed. Naturally, she couldn't sleep and instead listened to her parents debate over whether or not to call the cops and report her murder or something. In the morning, when it was light out, 
My grandfather went down to the canal, but unsurprisingly found nothing. When he came back, he told my mom the legend of the woman who drowned her own children and has now faded to cry out for them on the banks of the river where she killed them. And to this day, my mom is convinced that she heard La Lorna on that night so many years ago. Another close associate of mine who has had a close encounter with La Lorna is my former karate instructor and confirmation class teacher. He is Irish and a devout Catholic, but firmly believes in the existence of ghosts and the paranormal. When he was a teenager, he lived in New Mexico, close to the borders with Texas and Mexico. Like any good teenager looking for a rush, he liked to ride around with his brothers after dark and watch for ghosts in the old graveyards. One night, he and his brothers managed to convince a couple of girls they were sweet on to come along. They were sitting in the car in the middle of the desert when a deep fog started setting in. They were unsettled and decided to leave, but the car wouldn't start. Suddenly, he says that everything went completely and utterly pitch black. My friend flipped, but his brothers were frozen in their seats, unable to move a muscle. He yelled, but they still didn't move. He reached over and managed to finally start the car. He was 15 and didn't even have a license, but he drove out of there like a bat out of hell. When his heart finally stopped racing, he stopped the car. He turned to his brother and asked him what the hell happened back there. His brother, with his face still white, asked him incredulously, Jim, did you not see her? He shook his head no and asked his brother what he was talking about. His brother told him that when everything had gone black, a strange translucent white woman appeared outside of the car. She looked like a wicked witch. She reached her hand into the car, threw the closed window for Jim's neck, but stopped and drew back when she touched it. She then disappeared, and that was when the car started. Jim reached up to his neck and fingered the St. Michael medal he always wore. He firmly believed that the archangel responsible for defeating Satan protected him on that night. Whatever the spirit was a demon, La Lorna or some other frightful specter does not matter. Jim is firmly convinced that it was La Lorna and that she was stopped from whatever evil she intended. And he never stops praying to St. Michael. Hi, my name is Michelle. I'm a mother of four children, but when this happened, I only had two. My oldest was five, my youngest was just a baby. When my second child was about four months old, we lived in a trailer park across the street from an open field in Sotus Point, New York. It was supposedly a battlefield in the War of 1812. One night, around midnight, he woke up crying. I heard someone or something singing, or rather chanting to him. It sounded so weird. I couldn't understand her, but she kept singing until he went back to sleep. This proceeded to happen every time he woke up in the middle of the night, up until the night before we moved. Needless to say, he slept with me every night. I was really scared that something would happen to him. I never figured out what it was. Some people tell me it was the ghost of a slave, and other people say it might have been the ghost of a nurse. Yet, other people said it could be the ghost of La Lorna. She threw her children into the water and drowned them and was condemned to walk the earth until she finds her children. She supposedly steals babies in the night trying to make up for the children she murdered. It still scares me. It was the weekend after Thanksgiving, Saturday, around 3 a.m. 2011. My sister and I were watching movies on Netflix, enjoying our days off due to the holiday. Everyone was sleeping because, after all, it is very early in the morning. All of a sudden, we began to hear a moaning or crying coming from a woman. It was very loud and it was terrifying. It sounded ugly like a woman in pain or despair. It went on for about 20 seconds, then it stopped for 10 to 15 seconds. Then it began again, even louder. Told my sister to grab the phone to be ready to call the police because I thought a woman was being raped or being assaulted near our house. I stepped outside, scared, to see if I could prevent a crime. Shouldn't have done that, could have been dangerous. 
When I got to the front of the house, there was no one outside, yet the crying was literally in front of me. It was a foggy night as well. My sister came out, and the crying lasted for about two minutes. We were puzzled. We looked at each other, and we both got chills. We were both thinking the same thing. I don't want to come to any conclusions. I'm Hispanic and grew up with the legend of La Lorna. Many people in the Hispanic community swear that that malevolent spirit does exist and even say they have heard the cries in their native countries and in Southern California. I am not sure what I believe in regarding paranormal activity and such, but I do have an open mind and like to do as much research as possible before making any firm decisions. This experience happened in November of 2010, a month after having my youngest. I just had a procedure to remove a kidney stent two or three days prior. I was sick almost right after leaving the hospital and felt horrible, but it was my first time going under anesthesia and a nurse had told me it was common to feel ill. I was running a low grade fever about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. The baby had awoken for a 2 a.m. feeding, and I was holding him standing in the living room in front of the heater. I was chilled to the bone because of the fever and feeling a bit dizzy. I thought, oh geez, I'm going to cook the baby. Just then, about five feet away from me, appeared this man. He was tall, over six feet, buff large muscles, a stern face. He wore old brown looking clothes. It reminded me of stories of fur trappers out on the frontier. Maybe it was animal skin, but I'm not sure. He had the same style satchel that crossed his body. The strap on one shoulder and the satchel rested almost on the opposite hip. He had long brownish hair and brown wings that went almost to the floor. He was standing beside me, one of the dining room chairs that was pushed away from the table with one foot on the seat. He did not smile, but I wasn't afraid of him, surprised for sure, but instead of freaking out, I just said a muffled hello and then he disappeared. I felt like I needed to sit and cautiously sat on the chair his foot was on saying, I'm sorry if you were using this chair, but I need to sit. I thought later, maybe that's why he was there. I was holding a baby with a fever and standing too close to the heater. Maybe he wanted me to sit, but I also understand that I was ill and it could have been some sort of fever hallucination. I did many internet searches trying to find out who this was, but I found nothing that matched. I suppose I was wondering if anybody else has ever seen a man like this or may know who he is. Thank you for your time. I hope I described him well, but let me know if there are any further questions. So when I was younger, about 11, my family and I lived in a two bedroom trailer. We had a small little hallway coming from the living room to the main room. My mom is Christian and she listens to a Christian music radio station and we would listen most of the time in car rides. Keep this in mind. In the room I shared with my brother, our feet were pointing towards the door which showed you out to the hallway. If you were to go to the left, you would go into the living room, and if you'd go to the right to my parents' room. This one night, I woke up in the middle of the night randomly. I looked up towards my feet and saw a slightly tall man singing a song I knew I had heard in that radio station before. He just sang and stared at me, but his voice was so beautiful. I don't think Zahn or anyone else could sing just like he did. Also keep in mind, my dad wasn't home at the time. He was in jail. So the man started walking out into the hallway and walked towards the living room. I was not scared. I was more mystified of the man's presence. I got up and went to my room and asked her if she had seen the man and she said no. And so I explained to her that he was singing the song on the radio station. I don't remember the name or how it sounds. Up to this day, I firmly believe that it was an angel watching over my family and I. My grandma has gone to explain that the way you know it's an angel is if you don't feel anything but peaceful, and if it's a demon, that you get bad, bad chills and are scared to the max. This story didn't happen to me, but it happened to my sister. 
In our town, there is a bridge that is on a dirt road that is said to be haunted. It's called Hollow Bridge. They say a couple were murdered, and the wife still comes around every night about 2 a.m., which is the time they died. This was about a hundred years ago, or so I am told. Do I believe this story? Not really, but I'll go with it. They also say that if you are there at night and you see her, she will tell you something you don't want to know. When I was 15 and my sister was 17, I've seen something. One night, my sister, her boyfriend, my boyfriend at the time, and myself were all there around 2 a.m. It was a very clear night. Well, all of a sudden, there was a fog that was rolling up to the bridge from the tree line about a quarter mile back. I couldn't believe my eyes, so I freaked out and we left. So forward a year, my sister who at that time had a different boyfriend had called me bawling her eyes out. After she calmed down, she said that the hollow woman told her she would die on the hollow, which is a very dangerous road since it was not paved and it was very narrow. I told her to calm down and that it was just her imagination. She would be fine. A few nights later, we shared a room. We were sleeping and she woke me up out of a dead sleep from her crying. I woke her up annoyed and asked her what her deal was. She told me my grandmother, who neither of us met since both grandmothers passed away before we were born, had come to her in her dreams, telling her that one day she will need her and she will be there to protect her. At that point I was kind of freaked out, but I dismissed it, telling her she needed to go to bed. Two weeks after the dream, about 5 p.m., my brother comes rushing over to my friend's house, which was right behind our house, crying, and kept saying, Amber, Amber, Amber. My sister being a very rebellious child and into bad things with bad people, I asked, okay, what did she do now? It wasn't new that she had gotten picked up by the cops. He said she's in the hospital and that she was in a bad car accident on the hollow. I felt my color drain from my body. It felt like my soul left me. I dropped to my knees, remembering everything she had told me about the hollow and my grandmother. I knew at that time my mom, cousin, and oldest brother were rushing to the hospital and a half an hour away because she was life flighted. I grabbed my two younger brothers and held on to them for dear life. Thinking I could lose my sister, I wanted to be as close to them as possible. The next five hours were hell to me, getting my brothers to sleep trying not to cry while I waited for the phone call to know what happened. She had broke her neck, a hangman's fracture, along with her wrist and her upper arm, which went right through her elbow. The doctor said that she had a 30% chance of surviving the surgery, and if she did, she would be in a halo. Once she came out of surgery, if she survived the night, she would only have a 15% chance of ever walking again. The next morning, they took her out of the coma and she was talking and being her stubborn self. They realized that she was moving her feet and legs. We all cried. We couldn't believe that she had survived this and will walk again. The doctors say she had a guardian angel on her shoulder that night because there is no medical reason as to why she should have survived. Almost 10 years later, she has a beautiful 8-year-old little boy. Yes, still has problems with her neck and arm, but has never went down that road again. That road is now paved in certain areas, and a very strict speed limit is attached to it. But still, to this day, I say that she was warned, and she had a loved one at her side that day. Sorry this was so long. I hope you enjoyed the story. First, as far back as I can remember, I've always been fascinated with the paranormal. When I was around eight, I believe, I started seeing a blue lady out of my bedroom window. She always seemed to be walking towards our house. I thought maybe I was imagining things at the home. One night, I finally went outside to make sure it was something with my window, but I still saw her. When I came back in, I told my parents, who they said they saw glimpses of her going into my bedroom. Hearing that got me excited, like there was something special about me, but not long after I stopped seeing her. I do recall hearing my name a few times clearly, but no one was home. This blue lady had a majestic aura about her, a very serene, 
very peaceful and tranquil aura. I can't explain it more than that, but it just felt good. Not like it was a bad presence or anything like that. Then one night, I had a dream where a lady in a white dress and long curly blonde hair looking like the lady in blue appeared out of nowhere. She had gave me a kiss on the cheek, and I woke with what felt like ice cold lip marks on my cheek. After that incident, I had nothing paranormal happen again that I recall. Although my family says all paranormal activities quit as soon as I moved out, I happen to find this coin in my house that says Guardian Angel on it. This coin has followed me around for 18 years. There have been times I've lost it, but somehow found it randomly later on. Recently, I had lost it at my previous house and never found it. I recently happened to find it in a used car I purchased from a family friend within the time I've been at my current residence. I've had a few experiences in the last six years that are paranormal, but those stories, yeah, they're, they're for another time. Thank you for reading this, and I hope that you may find comfort in the story. This all happened six years ago, when I was visiting my great-grandmother in the free state. I've always been scared of the dark or sleeping alone, so I asked if I could sleep with my aunt, and she didn't have a problem. I'm 30 years old, by the way. The first night wasn't so bad, as I had the comfort that I wasn't alone in bed. I heard dragging footsteps in the kitchen and the door opening and closing, but was too afraid to wake up and investigate or wake my aunt up for something that's not there. I just laid there on the bed, listening to this thing and person dragging feet around in the kitchen and opening and closing the doors between the dining room and kitchen. I ultimately fell asleep. The next morning, I asked my aunt if she'd heard anything, and she said no. The second night was what scared me the most. As we laid there sleeping, I just suddenly turned and my eyes opened wide and there, inside the wardrobe, I could see since the door was half open, was a dark male figure with red eyes peeping through. Our eyes just met and I couldn't scream or move. I just stared right back at those red eyes and it spoke in Soto, South African language. It said, I'm not here to scare you, but to scare that one, meeting my aunt, and I can't remember what happened after or how I fell back to sleep. I told my aunt about it, and we had to sleep with the light on for the rest of my stay. I still can't get the black figure with red eyes hiding in the wardrobe out of my head. The first strange experience I had was during my sister's 10th or 11th birthday party. At the time, my family lived in a house in a blue-collar town in New Jersey. The house was set up where the front door was, up a flight of stairs. Once inside, there was a landing that led to another flight of stairs upstairs and another leading to the lower level. Downstairs was a long hallway with a doorway leading to the garage. At the foot of the stairs, which formed one end of a long hallway, there was a closet under the stairs. There was a laundry room at the end of the hallway and finally large living room. My sister had invited all of her friends and everyone was having a good time. After eating cake, the grown-ups went upstairs for coffee and the kids stayed downstairs to play on their own. At a certain point, we all decided to scare each other by telling ghost stories in front of the laundry room. My sister and I had always thought of it as the creepiest spot in the house, and it proved to be the perfect spot to tell ghost stories. When you open the laundry room door, you stared down a long, dark room with a shaded window at the end. The doorway to the laundry room was a small recess at the end of the hallway. The house quieted down as we started talking about scary things. After a few of those stories, everyone started to get into the spirit. My sister and I were sitting at the end of the hall, looking down its length. From our vantage point, we could see the wall along which the door leading to the garage was. We were midway into someone's ghost story when my sister suddenly noticed that the door leading to the garage had suddenly popped open just a bit. She remembered that the door was definitely locked. 
We walked over and closed the door and made sure to lock it again. By then, all of us were terrified and thoroughly petrified in our own little recess. As little kids, not one of us wanted to move out of our spot or make a noise. Just then, someone rang the doorbell, which made everyone jump three feet, but was enough to kill the moment. Everyone started laughing. Our house was new when we bought it, and nothing strange had ever happened to anyone in my family there. Now that we're older, my sister and I still bring up this incident with my sister, and we both have a good laugh. She still swears that she locked the door. Growing up, I spent a lot of time reading true ghost stories and still do. When we were little, my sister and I would borrow the ghost books from the library. The best were the ones with real pictures. I remember reading one of those ghost books when I was in middle school. It was right during the time when midterms or finals were coming up, and I had a pile of school books on my desk. A ghost book was tucked away there somewhere, and for a break, I'd pull out the ghost book. At the time, I was part of the school basketball team and proudly received my practice jersey, which I still have, that I kept hung on a hook at the back of my bedroom door. That night, I was studying for finals with the bedroom door closed. My desk faced the wall, and the door was four feet to the right. I had my Walkman on, do you remember those things, and started getting into the rhythm of doing my English homework to the tunes of rap. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I was distracted by some movement. I looked up to see my jersey swinging back and forth on the hook. It looked just as if someone had tipped the hanger to one side with a finger, causing it to swing. Right away, I checked to see if the door was locked. Maybe my father had opened the door after I didn't hear him knocking. I didn't want to be bothered while studying, so it was logical that I would have locked it. When I checked, the door was definitely locked, and there was no noise behind the door. All the while, the jersey continued swaying back and forth, eventually stopping after losing speed. Next, I checked to see if the window was open, but it was November, and the windows were all closed to keep out the cold. Right before I noticed the jersey swinging, I had just put down a very large, hard-covered dictionary onto the desk. The dictionary was about 10 inches long and three and a half inches thick. I thought maybe it made a slight wind as I put it down, but no matter how many times I tried, I couldn't cause the jersey to move from four feet away. I didn't feel scared and just continued studying with the Walkman on. Nothing like this has ever happened again, but I can't explain what caused that jersey to swing. One of the most bizarre experiences I've ever personally had was with my family while staying at a hotel in Atlantic City, New Jersey. It happened around 1997, and I was lucky to have most of my family there to experience it with me. Atlantic City is an interesting location for strange experiences. The casinos draw many from the New York area and beyond, but along with this brings the good and bad of social ills that come along with games of chance. The summer of 1997 was a typical one. Like we did many summers before, my family drove down the shore to spend a few days enjoying the beach and casinos at Atlantic City. As usual, my father arranged the trip and found a new hotel with a very reasonable price. The name of the hotel is called The Flagship and is still located at the northern end of the boardwalk, far from the other casinos. After a long, cold winter, my family was anxious to see the ocean and asked the front desk for an oceanfront view. We were told that the only room available wasn't facing the ocean, but with two queen-size beds, the room was very comfortable and that we could see the ocean from the side of the balcony. It was the perfect size for my parents, my sister and I, and we agreed and the man at the front desk gave us two door cards. Our room was on the 10th floor. Looking back, none of us recalled running into many guests in the hotel at all. However, we thought that since the hotel was new, it was just beginning to attract customers. Once we found our room, we used the room card to open the door 
and went inside. Right away, things went wrong. The room was very dark. The curtains for the sliding door to the balcony were pulled and extremely cold. It was a typical hotel room, except for a small kitchen area right in front of two queen-sides beds. At the foot of the second bed was a sofa bed. Then beyond the second bed, there was a sliding glass door leading to a small balcony. Although we were facing the interior of Atlantic City, just as the front desk mentioned, we could see the ocean on one side of the balcony. Very soon, we found out why the room was so chilly. The air conditioner, which was located on the wall above the sofa bed, was turned on full blast and wouldn't turn off. As I mentioned this to my father, I saw my mother fidgeting with the front door's electronic lock. Like she often said and did, she checked to see if the door was locked when closed from the outside. It wasn't. Inside the door, there was a sticker that explicitly stated that the door was always locked on the outside. Not so. We also realized that the stove in the small kitchen wasn't working. Then we saw that there was a small leak coming from the mini fridge as well. My father called downstairs, and soon a repairman came up and fixed the AC, the stove, the refrigerator leak, and even the front door. He mentioned that the lock should always be locked from the outside and seemed puzzled by the device. We gave the man a big tip and then quickly made our way over to the casinos. When we arrived back to our room, well after dinner, we immediately felt how cold it was in the room and turned off the AC. After washing up, we watched some television before turning in. I remember one of the programs was about ghosts, and we watched that one for a while, not realizing what was to come. My mother and sister were the first to go to bed and turned off the lights. They slept in different beds, with my mother in the bed closer to the kitchen area and my sister in the one near the balcony. I stayed up reading on the kitchen table with the dim light on. I had some trouble falling asleep that night since the sofa bed mattress was new and was still covered in plastic. I must have felt lazy because I left it on and suffered because it was very hot and not very conducive to a good night's rest. At breakfast the next morning, my sister told us about something strange that had happened during the night. All night long, she said she felt someone brushing past her bed as if trying to walk to the balcony door. At the foot of her bed, there was about a foot of space between her bed and the end of my sofa bed. She said it felt exactly like someone was squeezing through the tight space and rubbing against her bed. At first, she thought it was me trying to get outside the balcony. Then when she looked up, she saw my father and I still sitting at the kitchen table reading. At the time, none of us really believed her, and we went out again for a day of walking on the boardwalk and then gambling at night. That night, I stayed up later than everyone else. I talked to my sister about what she experienced the night before. I also told her to let me know if she felt it again. As soon as she got in bed, I sat down by the kitchen table to read, glancing over towards her bed every once in a while to see if anything happened. After a while, I gave up and continued reading before getting up to wash up in the bathroom. When I came out of the bathroom, my sister was sitting up in bed. She said that she again thought I had squeezed past the bed to go to the balcony, but then she opened her eyes and saw me come out of the bathroom at the other end of the room. I was positioned on the sofa bed so that my head was right next to the little space at the end of my sister's bed. If someone walked past, I would have surely felt something, but that night I didn't notice anything at all. As usual, it took a little bit of time for me to sleep. I listened intently and tried to feel any wind or changes in the room but eventually gave up and slept. I had by then taken off the troublesome plastic cover and finally had a good night's rest. The next day, my father woke me up early to rent bikes for an early morning boardwalk ride. Then he went to my sister and woke her up as well. As soon as he did this, my mother, who planned to sleep in, 
suddenly sat up in bed and turned on the lights and the TV. We asked her why she didn't want to sleep, since it was still only about 5.30 a.m. She told us that she wasn't very tired and that she felt like waking up, which is unusual since she usually likes to sleep past 11. We all thought this was pretty odd. My mother loves to sleep late. She kept giving us vague reasons about why she wouldn't go back to sleep and even turned on the television. Later on, she told us the reason why. At breakfast, my mother told us about the strange incident that happened that night. She had woken up in the middle of the night. It was late, and she could hear all of us either snoring or breathing the natural rhythms of a very good night's rest. She was sleeping on the right-hand side of the first bed and was lying on her side facing inwards. But gradually, she realized that she felt the sensation of someone's back lying against her own. At first, she was convinced that it was my sister, but she was pretty alarmed to realize that my sister was in the other bed, four feet away. Slowly, without opening her eyes, she moved closer to my father. The feeling was very real, but very slowly, the other person's back gradually went away. My mother said that in the morning, she hadn't expected my sister to go riding bikes with us, leaving her all alone in the room. After we left, she tried her best to stay awake. She turned on all the lights and turned on the television, but eventually she fell asleep anyway. As my mother told us this story, my sister chimed in saying that the person walked past her bed all of last night as well. This time, though, she also felt her sheets being gently pulled away to the corner of the bed towards the balcony. For some reason, whenever she turned to face the balcony, it would stop. When she turned back around, she would feel the bed bulge a little, as if a person were rubbing past it. Also, she felt energy waves from the foot of her bed. After we came back to the room from breakfast... All of us were not so sure about our room anymore. Despite this, we still had a day of vacation and, and fun to look forward to. After we got what we needed, my father went downstairs early to get some brochures. Then my sister and I walked to the elevator while my mother got some last minute things. We were both standing there by the elevator doors when we heard my mother anxiously calling us back to the room. When we got there, she looked a little shaken and said that the front door wouldn't lock from the outside again. She said that all the while, as she was rifling through her suitcase looking for something, she had a bad feeling and couldn't wait to get out of the room. Once safely outside, as an afterthought, she turned the handle to see if the door was locked from the outside. Once again, it wasn't locked. This time, we went downstairs instead of calling for a repairman. The front desk seemed puzzled about the lock. They said that the lock should always be locked from the outside. They were at a loss as how to fix it and finally recommended that we get another room. Everyone felt very relieved and we quickly gathered our things to get out of the room immediately. We got another room upstairs and this time our new room was perfect in every way. Not surprisingly, the rest of our trip was pretty relaxed, but we sometimes joked about what would happen to us if we stayed another night in that room. All of us agreed that there was something in that room that wanted to be left alone. It didn't want to scare us, but instead just gently showed us that we had to go. For some reason, my mother and sister feel that it was a child or a little boy. If this is true, perhaps something happened to the boy in the room. Everything seems to point to the balcony where things seem to emanate from. Perhaps the boy fell off the balcony, or maybe someone died in the room. Maybe the spirit felt an affinity to the woman, as opposed to my father and I, who didn't experience anything. The flagship is now a luxury timeshare condo. I'm not sure if it's still partly a hotel. While we were there, the hotel operators aggressively tried to sell us a timeshare, but of course, we turned them down every time. I wonder who bought the timeshare for that room on the 10th floor, and if anything similar happened to them... I have a brother who works in Hong Kong. Many of his clients are from this area in China. 
One of his clients was a Hong Kong businessman in his 40s. This client often went on frequent business trips to Shanghai and Beijing for his company. My brother was very familiar with this man, as were many other of the people working in my brother's office. My brother worked closely on him on several large projects, and they often made small talks during breaks. On one occasion, he told my brother that on one of his visits to Shanghai, he was staying in a hotel and had just returned to his room at night after a long day's work. He washed up, turned down the lights, and then got into bed. He had drifted off into an exhausted sleep when he was violently awakened in the dead of night. In the pitch darkness, he felt the ice-cold hands of a woman clasped around his neck, strangling him as he tried desperately to break free. After a few seconds, the hands finally let go, and the man jumped up and turned the lights on. As he scanned the room, he found himself absolutely alone. The room looked just as it had before he got into bed. Upon his return to Hong Kong, he was profoundly shaken by the incident and consulted with a very good fortune teller that his family knew well. The fortune teller told him that there was a woman following him around. He didn't know the reason, but that was the case. My brother's client was a businessman and in spite of what had happened to him, scoffed at the idea of some mysterious ghost lady following him around. My brother and his client had a good laugh about this during their break. Still, my brother warned him to be careful and to make sure he was a gentleman to a lady ghost. A few months had passed before my brother heard what had happened to his client. Many of my brother's colleagues were talking about it in my brother's office when the topic came up. They had heard that the client had died in a hotel room in Shanghai. The cleaning lady had discovered his body in the room, alone and lying in bed. We sometimes wonder what really happened to this client. We wonder if he just died of natural causes, or if those cold hands returned during the night. If so, who was she? I don't know, but it's a strange story. When I was in my early 20s, a friend and I decided to rent a house together. We found a lovely old house near the Mississippi River, and I was immediately drawn to it. After we moved in, we both began to notice banging on the walls and lights blowing out constantly. The lights we attributed to bad wiring and the banging, I truly believed, was my friend, and she truly believed it was me. The layout of the house was one we had never seen before. There was a hallway that led from the front living area to the back bedroom areas that was at an odd, slanting angle. I always felt uncomfortable going down this hallway and found myself going around by way of the kitchen. After months, my friend and I decided to take in a third roommate to help with expenses. During the next month or so, after this third roommate moved in, we noticed the increase in frequency to the noises, banging, and lights going out. We also began to notice that every month, and this is really weird, Right around the time that all three of us began our menstrual cycles, a very large stain began to appear in the middle of our living room floor. We tried constant shampooing, but it would always reappear immediately. Then after our cycles were finished, the stain would disappear on its own, only to reappear the next month. Our third roommate then became very withdrawn after only a short time of being in the house. She began to go directly to her bedroom, and never came out except to go to work. Her personality has also changed drastically. She went from being very funny and outgoing to a complete loner. She would also say very inappropriate, weird things to us. We had known this girl for some time and her behavior was quite unsettling. She finally told us that she was not comfortable in this house and was moving out and she did so that very day. Shortly after she moved out, the banging noise began in earnest, and we started noticing our things being rearranged. We began to laughingly and nervously admit to each other that something was not right in this house. However, neither one of us felt threatened by any kind of the weird happenings, and in fact, I personally actually felt almost protected by it. We started to call our ghost George, and would talk to him whenever the banging would begin. 
We were trying to watch something on TV, and George would start banging or knocking. We would say, please, George, not right now. We're trying to see this. And he would actually stop, at least until the show was over. Unfortunately, no matter how much we begged him to stop putting the stain on the floor every month, that never ended. In fact, it got bigger and darker the longer we lived there. One kind of amusing episode happened to us one memorable evening. I decided to let my boyfriend at the time stay overnight with me, although I usually didn't do this. Just as we were dozing off, a very loud bang sounded, coming from the hallway. My boyfriend sat up and asked, what the heck was that? Immediately, a knocking began at the far end of the hall and rushed towards my room very fast, knocking louder and louder the closer it came. My boyfriend said, that has to be your roommate being funny. I just laughed and tried to explain about our ghost, and that I thought he might be angry that I had a male friend overnight. He said that was bull, and got up to investigate. Just as he came to the hallway, the knocking began again, all around him. Needless to say, my brave 6 foot 4 inch boyfriend ran straight out the front door, and never came back in the house. Anyway. After a few years, my roommate and I decided we were going to move to a cheaper apartment, closer to where we worked. As soon as we started packing, the noises, and especially the lights going out, began to get really bad. I was even starting to get a little frightened. One day, as we were finishing up packing, we decided to go check in the basement and see if we had anything left down there. While we were down there, we decided to go in the old fruit cellar since neither one of us had actually looked in it. We found some old fishing equipment. We also found an old shirt box that was sealed with tape and felt kinda heavy. So we brought it upstairs and opened it up. Inside was a bunch of old pictures. Most of the pictures were of a young man of about 25 or 30. In many of the pictures, he was in our house and standing on the porch of the house. There were also some antique glass lines with pictures of him in the military uniforms. We dated the stuff around World War II. We decided to call our landlady, an elderly woman, around 80 years old, to tell her we had found the box. When we called her and told her what we had found, she hung up on us. We called back, and her daughter answered and said that they didn't want that stuff anymore, and we could have it or throw it away. We thought it was very strange, since normally our landlady was a sweet old lady. So we decided that some of the stuff in the box might be worth more money, and we would sell some of it. Some war medals, and even an old stock certificate. That night, I put the box on the kitchen table, and we went to bed. In the morning, we were going to move the last of everything, and as we were preparing to go, I asked my roommate what she had done with a box of stuff. She said she hadn't touched it. We looked everywhere, and couldn't find it. Finally, around lunch, we got hungry and decided to cook a frozen pizza. We turned on the oven and immediately began to smell something burning. When I opened the oven, there was the box. Okay, I swore my roommate did it and she swore I did it. So we left the box on the table again and left to move some things to the new place. When we got back, the box was gone again. This time, we found it immediately in the kitchen pantry, so we kind of laughed it off and put it back on the kitchen table. About 10 minutes later, I walked into the kitchen and it was gone again. I decided the heck with it and decided to just go finish the bedroom closet I had just minutes before been working on. When I stepped up on the chair to wipe off the upper shelves, there was the box. That did it. I said out loud, okay George, we promise not to take your stuff and put the box back in the fruit cellar where we had found it. We left that day and have never been back, but I've always wondered if the next tenants ever heard from George. I've worked for a domestic violence shelter for approximately seven years. While I personally have never seen anything, there are always odd sounds and unusual occurrences. Let me start at the beginning. 
The house is two-story with an attic, in a basement, and over a hundred years old. I really don't know much else about its history. The local domestic violence center purchased the building, which had been uninhabited for a number of years, did some renovations, and began operating an anonymous shelter for battled women and their children. Over the years, there have been numerous sightings of a young couple. A woman in a long flowing dress can be seen periodically walking up the long staircase. A man in dark, old fashioned clothing has been seen in the living room and at the top of the stairs outside the attic door. It is usual for all who went into the attic or the basement to feel uneasy and not alone. Recently, the sightings seem to have increased. A church group came over to the holidays to sing Christmas carols to the residents, and a young boy pointed to the ceiling and said, Look, there's an angel. The only thing seen by the others in the room was a hazy, grayish fog that wasn't in any particular shape. A few months later, one of the employee's daughter was in the living room, alone, working on a school project, and looked up to see a gray, transparent figure looming in the doorway. She screamed, and her mother raced in to see the figure moving slowly upstairs. It was as if the ghost was checking in, and didn't mean to frighten the young girl. Perhaps the most interesting aspect of this haunting is that the couple together, fitting the same descriptions of the man and the woman seen in places of the house, have been seen in one bedroom upstairs. To my knowledge, at least three residents in the last year have been awakened at night to see the woman sitting on the edge of the bed, with a man standing behind her. The couple has been described as comforting and reassuring to those who have seen them in this manner. And these apparitions have seemed to know when these residents were about to face a particular trying experience. One woman was going to court the next day for an order of protection. One lady was facing a decision about the custody of her new little baby. And one woman was about to embark on the dangerous underground trying to change her identity in order to hide from the husband who tried to kill her. All three of these women felt as though the ghosts were trying to tell them that everything was going to be alright, and, as it turns out, the dire situations facing each of these women worked out in their favor. I personally find their presence reassuring as well. Women and children who came through the shelter are very often depressed, sometimes hopeless, scared, insecure and anxious. I think that the fact that they are comforted by these spirits is a sign that these are good spirits who seem to approve of the work being done in their house. They've never tried to scare anyone. Sure, lights turn on and off by themselves, and the dishwasher is forever turning on by itself. Maybe they are just trying to figure out what these gadgets are. I do not know anything about the history of that house, but I assume these spirits were once residents of this house. Based on their actions, they seem to be good and well-wishing. I hope they continue to watch over the shelter and help the current residents. I just sent you info on the old Kelly house in Houston, Texas. I used to rent there with four other people. It's a three-story, turn-of-the-century house built by Mr. Kelly. He owned Kelly Lumber Company and used this lumber to build the house. The rent house goes for about $2,300 to $2,000 a month as of current. It has a long history of hauntings that started right after Miss Kelly committed suicide. We found out about this info by accident, which I will describe later. I was the first to experience the haunting. I just moved in and had a friend over. The front window blinds at the entrance slam shut and closed by themselves. It scared my friend so bad, he ran out of the house. I shared the house with four other adults. Two of them, ladies, were amateur mediums. Just local psychic fairs and healing centers was their occupation. We overlooked the house together before we rented. Upstairs in the master bathroom is a set of old French windows above the sinks. It has a crank to open the windows. Two of us tried to open it, but it was weathered and painted shut. We forced it and it would not budge. That year, the hard freeze came early 
and our first evidence to share together of the haunting became known. All five adults and two children were accounted for. Matt, one of the roommates, came down from taking a shower and asked was there any reason for us having the other bathroom windows open. Sandy and I looked at each other with raised eyebrows, with disbelief. We asked Matt again to be sure we had heard him right. We investigated. Sure enough, when we got to the top of the stairs, you could feel the cold winds blowing. As we entered the bathroom, Sandy and I stood shocked to see the French windows fully opened. We debated the issue in our heads, but there is no way Matt himself could open the French windows by himself, even if he was on steroids. I tried to reel in the windows using the crank. It was rusty and hard to close. I had to use tools to shut it. That moment on, we all knew we had a problem on our hands. A few weeks later, Sandy wanted to use the house as a gathering of friends to share vegetarian meals. Her ambition expanded to the public. For public relations, she wanted to write something about the house, but steered away from haunting stories. She struggled with different concepts, but succumbed to telling the story of a couple and their tragic love for each other. The story is about a recently engaged, mischievous young lady that plays a practical joke on her fiancé at their engagement party. From the upstairs balcony, she pours water on her boo down below. This enrages him and he scolds her with fever. Shocked and dismayed, she bursted out into tears and ran to the other side of the house to the porch which was located on the second floor. Heartbroken and drunken with wine, she hangs herself. It wasn't until violent weather did the secrets come out. On October 13th, 1993, a tornado paid us a visit. It was all over the nation in CNN. It was simply unheard of. A tornado touching down near a large downtown area, especially in Houston. The tornado struck our neighbors next door in the apartment building across the street. Because of her national cover, and Sandy's interview with news reporters being broadcast over the nation, it prompted an old resident to pay us a visit. The granddaughter of Mr. and Mrs. Kelly came by to see if we were all right, and wanted to share pictures and stories about the house. We wanted to ask her questions too, without sounding nuts. We already had a couple of occurrences of the haunting since then. We decided to manipulate her in going upstairs to the upstairs master bathroom. Then, we unfolded to her the news about the house and its little gifts. She hesitated on entering the bathroom, which raised questions in our minds. We told her about the windows and suddenly she started to get very nervous. She finally told us that the house was in fact haunted. It was in that very room where she found her grandmother hanging from the ceiling. One night way after the death of her grandmother, she went into that room and saw the apparition of her grandmother laying in a fetal position in the corner of the room. She could hear faint sobs in the room many times before, and in another encounter from that same room, she saw three ghosts hanging from the ceiling. She said they were too dark to make out, that they were just silhouettes. It was like they were hung like chandeliers and were swinging gently. The room used to be a screened-in porch overlooking her grandmother's garden. She was so overwrought with pain in her knees so much, so she couldn't garden anymore. It crippled her to the point where she was using a wheelchair and had an elevator installed. She couldn't take it anymore and took her own life. Margaret, one of the other roommates, always complained about her knees. I started to have problems myself. She told us about their dog, which is buried out back near the pool. The granddaughter heard scratching noises when she was a little girl at the back door. The dog had been dead for years. 
She would hear a cabinet open and shut when the scratching sound occurred. Then the sounds would stop. She says of seeing an apparition of her grandmother in the garden, and it was too much to bear, and never stepped foot in the house again till this day. I would be more than glad one day to show you the house. Many people that lived in the house had shared similar stories and are still around the neighborhood. Drop a word or two. When I was in my 20s, I'm 30 now, I used to always go camping with my older brother during the autumn months in Washington State. This story won't be very long, but it'll always be an unforgettable experience. On one of the days we were venturing out to go camping, we ended up taking the back roads on the way to the campground. The total drive was about three hours long and got up early in the morning to make the drive. If you're unfamiliar with Washington State scenery, it is breathtaking. Lots of trees towering over you as you drive through, mountainous landscapes, green pastures, etc. It is in my humble opinion, the best place to be in America. Well anyway, we ended up staying for a couple of nights and set up a tent in the middle of these woods in the campground. It was just us and nature. I remember we sat on a log and built up a fire every night, roasted s'mores, admired the beauty of the nature here, and just took in the impressive scenery, as we usually do. One of the nights we were doing this, my brother thought he heard another person scream help me from afar. Josh, you think that person is in trouble? He remarked. I didn't hear the sound. So I dismissed it and told him how absurd it was because I was certain we were the only ones here. Come on, Tim. We always camp here. Nobody is here. At that point, my brother insisted that he heard a voice pleading for help. He even said that while we were asleep in the tent one of the nights, he could see a shadow moving around just outside the tent. He grabbed his flashlight and shined it in the direction of where he saw the shadow moving, but it was gone. Another night, he could have sworn that someone was unzipping the tent while we were sleeping. He took out his flashlight and got out of the tent to investigate. He said that he saw mist slowly disappear and dissolve into the trees. I remember the last night we were there. My brother and I had a debate on whether or not the campgrounds here used to be an Indian settlement. We later found out that the Native Americans were known to frequent these lands, and that there was a story long ago that a little boy drowned in a nearby river. He has been known to haunt the campgrounds. Anywho, as we were talking, the campfire that we just started went out the moment we mentioned anything about Native Americans. It was not windy at all, and the fire was very strong. It startled us so much that after a couple hours, we said we had enough and ended up driving home later that night. It was about 3 a.m. as we were heading back home, and we started the car up. I ended up driving us back home because my brother was too rattled from all the events. Now, this is the freakiest part. My brother told me that as we were leaving the campground, he saw an old Native American man with a beard in the rearview mirror with a tomahawk in his hands. He was pointing towards the car and he looked completely human. I looked into the rearview mirror myself and saw absolutely nothing. Either my brother was playing games with me or we just invaded the territory of natives and they were very upset with us. Hi, my name is Diane. Growing up in Detroit, my family lived in a house that was haunted. On several occasions, my family would hear loud crashes that could only be described as boxes of dishes being smashed. 
Everyone in my family experienced several ghost contacts in one form or another. On three different occasions with three different family members, a man about 60 was seen wearing a plaid flannel shirt. This man merely stood there, looking at the person, never attempting communication or harm. I was about eight when he appeared, and I was the first one to see him. Although my sister was seven years older than me, was not present. I'm telling you this right now so later you will understand. My relatives from out of town were visiting, and the adults were sitting in the living room after dinner. I was extremely quiet, in the hopes that only a child can have, that they would forget that I was there. I was sitting on the couch, and the front door was open, with the screen door closed. I saw the man wearing a red plaid shirt, standing at the front door, and looking in. I told my family about this, and they thought I was overtired, so they put me to bed. Later that same week, my older sister was getting into the shower when she saw a man in a red plaid shirt standing in the bathroom with her. She freaked out and told my mother, who this time listened more closely. She then revealed that she too had seen the man in the red shirt standing in the kitchen by the sink, looking like he was getting a glass of water. All family members routinely heard footsteps throughout the house, especially going upstairs into an attic bedroom. The steps would continue across the floor. All family members experienced this together and separate on several different occasions. My sister, whose bedroom it was for a while, admitted she was scared to sleep in that room and was frightened, very often thinking that someone was coming into her room. I later had that same bedroom and became so afraid of it that I began sleeping on the living room sofa. On several occasions, dishes in the house would break when put in a certain china cabinet. On two separate occasions, a silver meat platter in the china cabinet, whose doors were kept closed, flew across the room at my mother. Lights turned off in the basement would be on when we woke up every single morning. The dryer would routinely come on by itself, and even after the electric was checked, this still continued. The basement had an old coal room that had been converted into a storage room with paint cans and stuff. This room had a negative feeling, and no one in the family liked to even go in there. Likewise, no one in the family wanted to go under the stairs although no one ever had a mysterious occurrence in those places. Every family member in that house had their name called on different occasions, many times when they were home alone. One occasion comes to mind. My father, who was home alone, was working in the basement. My mother, sister, and I were out shopping at the mall. He distinctly heard the front door open, even though it was locked and someone walked across the living room and kitchen. He went upstairs and found the front door locked, as he knew he would. It was then that someone called his name. He answered, and no one said anything after that. Another old family experience came when we all went to visit my grandmother, who lived across town. We even brought the family dog. We were returning home, and as we pulled in the driveway, I saw the drapes move back, like someone was watching us return. I remember distinctly asking if anybody had seen that. My father countered, what did you see? I told him, and he and my mother and sister agreed that that is what they saw too. My dad went into the house first while we waited in the car. Everything was just as we left it, with the doors locked. On one occasion I awoke to having a woman standing at the foot of my bed. She disappeared as soon as I got a good look at her. She said her name was Anne and she had lived in that house. No one in that house ever saw Anne again. This house had an addition that was a formal dining room off the back. It had built in china cabinets that would fly open on no occasion, even after my mother put hooks on them, thinking the wood was swelling. 
music was often playing softly. All in all, it was a weird place to live, and we are all very glad to move, but we did live there for over 20 years. My parents moved into an apartment, as I did in a different location, while staying with them because I had become extremely ill. I had a unique experience of a ghost nurse who took care of me. My parents were asleep, and I was lying on the sofa, so hot, but lucid. I could hear them snoring from the bedroom. I heard soft slippers shuffle across the floor, and felt a cold hand lovingly touch my forehead, checking my fever, a comfort. I was not afraid, and somehow thought grandma is here, but I had no evidence of this. I remember keeping my eyes closed just knowing my nurse did not want me to see her. I was very conscious of my parents snoring and knew it was not them. When the feet shuffled off, I opened my eyes and got up and looked at my parents. They were sound asleep. The whole situation lasted maybe two minutes, yet I started to improve that night. I now live in Indiana, and a few years ago, my husband and I rented a little farmhouse. Our landlord lived right behind us, and the farmhouse used to belong to his grandparents, now both deceased. Not long after we moved in, we began to hear things, and my two-year-old daughter would wake up in fear, crying about a man in her room. I would say where, and she would point to a corner of the room but I would see nothing. We would often hear footsteps coming up the basement stairs with no one there. This is happening in front of other witnesses also. We would sometimes hear a man in the basement talking, but couldn't make out what he was saying. Now, the basement was a creepy place where I always sensed being watched and followed. There was a little room that used to hold well water with a heavy door that had the window painted white. I felt this room was evil, and I hated it. Unfortunately, my washer and dryer were down in the basement, so I had to go there often. For a long time, the ghost just made noises, not meant to scare, just moving about the house. Later, he would come into our bedroom at night. I never realized it until I saw your sight in David and Sherry's sight. But he came in the room a lot more than the two times I saw him in human form. I would either be asleep or almost asleep, and I would see a ball of light drift slowly into the room. It would sometimes move to the side in front of my closet, or to my horror, it would come right at me and hover right above me. I didn't realize then that the orb was the ghost. I thought I was dreaming a weird dream that seemed like I was awake, because I saw the room exactly like I was awake, apparently because I was awake. I would be half asleep and angry at myself for having such terrifying visions, so I would angrily think in my mind, get out of here, stop, and it would disappear. Twice after that, I woke up to see a 30 to 40 year old man with dark hair in a red and black lumberjack shirt, I would catch him staring at me beside my bed. Oddly, I was so tired that I just rolled over and went back to sleep. I found out later from my friend who used to live next door to the house that my landlord's grandfather had died in the house. His name was Pete. Also, he had been a grumpy old man. Funny thing was that both times I saw him, he was a younger man. Anyways, he never really bothered us, so we had no problem. We only moved out because we bought a new house this past year. To this day, I still can't believe I calmly co-abided with a ghost. I've been reading stories on this page for over a year now. Why? I don't know. I'll always find myself scared at night. But I, until... Look forward to the new entries every month. I thought it might be time to submit my scariest. I'm very sensitive to the spiritual world, so I have many. Okay, 
A few years ago, I met my current husband, Joe, during the beginning stages of his nasty divorce to his wife, Jennifer. Jennifer was raised in a Jewish family that had a lot of problems. Before they married, they lived in the downstairs apartment of Joe's father's house. His sister and her family lived upstairs. They had experienced some ghostly activity when they were children there, but it was all positive, like smelling roses throughout the house. Jennifer's brother, Andrew, had joined a devil worshiping cult and moved to California. Eventually, he realized it was crazy and sick, so he hopped on a bus and journeyed home to Massachusetts. At every stop, one of the members was standing outside the bus, just staring at him. He made it home, but did not escape. They came to him at night, played head games, and did not allow him to let go of the devil. He was also very heavy into drugs. Joe was, and still is, a member of AA, so he invited Andrew to live with them while he tried to recover and get off the drugs. Unfortunately, Andrew couldn't, and one day he said to us, I just want to live to see you two get married. A few weeks after their wedding, Andrew was found hanging from a tree in a nearby park. After the funeral, Joe was consoling Jennifer when he heard three knocks on the door. He went to answer it, but no one was there. All of a sudden, a rush of energy entered his body and then everything went black. Joe awoke to his brother-in-law, holding him down and trying to stop him from convulsing. He had come downstairs to find out what the knocks were from. Joe and Jennifer got Andrew's wonderful leather living room set. They moved to Connecticut and split up shortly thereafter. I came along pretty quickly and also got pregnant pretty quickly as well. So we were not allowed to see the family, for they were ashamed of Joe's actions. One night, I had a nightmare of being chased by an evil and angry spirit through a house I had never seen before. I was flying from room to room, up many stairs. Finally, I went into a room where there was a child spirit on a bed, and very scared. I remember holding it while watching the spirit fly up the stairs at us. Then, I awoke. I told Joe about this because it was so vivid. He just about died. I described every room down to the wallpaper of his father's house that his sister still lives in. We were invited over shortly after. His family began to forgive him and understood his reasoning, not to mention they had a beautiful niece, granddaughter, that they did not know. When I walked in, I knew I had been there before. Amy, Joe's seven-year-old niece said, I knew you had blonde hair. I had a dream about you last week. Strange. A year later, I went to a psychic who I had never met before. She told me a lot of stuff about my guides and messages from them. Well, one was this. That spirit that was chasing you, it is the sibling of your boyfriend's ex-lover. And that was it. We just finally sold that dang leather furniture. I hope Andrew leaves me alone now. This is a true story that happened to me. It is one of many, and I mean many stories, that happened to me that involves spirits. It started one night. I was spending the night at my grandma's house in the spare bedroom. She has two spare bedrooms. One is mine and one is my older sister Tammy's. I used to sleep in my room, but after that incident happened about a year ago, and no, no one died or anything. The room just went wacko from the presence of a spirit when me and my friend Damien were in it. I haven't gone in there since. So now I stay in my sister's room, since she doesn't visit as much as I do. 
I was laying down, looking at the white ceiling like I always do when I can't sleep. All of a sudden, I saw a black shadow coming from the bottom of my eyes. It slowly covered my whole vision and it turned black. It was holding my head down so I couldn't even move. I got so scared that I swung my hand at it and it was just like swinging at smoke. It just separated and then moved back together. The most terrifying and weirdest part of this all is that it really seemed like there were eyes, glowing red eyes, that were coming from this black shadow. The next time I met the black figure was when I was at home. I was having a sleepover with my friend Sarah in the basement. We were both on the pullout couch across the room from the bar. She turned and looked over and then saw the black figure just staring at her with glowing red eyes and leaning up against the bar right in front of her back. She slept facing the other way for the rest of the night. Again, I had a sleepover with Sarah in the basement. This time, I saw it. It came through the roof right above me with its arms and legs straight out to its side as if it was in the shape of a star. When it popped through the roof, I could see smoke come from around its body. What is this thing? Why is it following me? What does it want? Will it hurt me? And then slowly, it lowered itself towards me. I was so frightened. I didn't want to tell Sarah because she might get scared. So I pressed my head into the bed, trying to stay away. I was right in my sleeping bag, so I couldn't swat at it again. And then Sarah leaned over and asked, What are you doing? Then I told her, that thing is right above me. She looked around me and saw nothing. There's nothing there, Trisha. And I thought, how could she not see this? It's right there. How could she not see this? And then I said, hey, it's right there. It's right above me. She then tried to prove that there was nothing there and waved her hand over the top of me. Just as she did that, the figure jumped up and spread its arms and legs again and just popped through the roof. That was the last time that I saw that figure. I have many other stories. Most of them I'm going to submit to this page. If you have any questions or if you want to talk to me about spirits, ghosts, or angels, email me. Odd things have always happened to my family. As a child, I was raised by my grandparents on the hoops of a reservation. There was no question to there being spirits on a reservation. My grandfather came from a long line of medicine man. Although he doesn't practice medicine, he says he remembers everything he witnessed while he was learning to practice. Something scared him to death and some things he says are very comforting. He says it was a practice of good versus evil. Some ceremonies were so intense that they were physically attacked by apparitions. Large, small, white, sometimes gray or black images. He says the spirits are present all the time, as if waiting for the right moment to strike. He always said if I was harmed in any way, I shouldn't point blame to anyone or anything. He said to express in words, you aren't getting the best of me, just loud enough for me to hear it. Even when whispered, it was a means of protection. He said sometimes late at night, family members that have passed away would come knocking at his window, mostly his brother. He said he knew when it was his brother and when it wasn't. His brother gave him a sense of happiness or protection, but the others came with evil intentions. He said that all encounters are warnings and signs of bad things that are about to happen, or when sickness was about to fall on the family members. He said he knew when evil ones were around. When they came to his window, he would feel a cold breeze, then a strong sense of fright, 
chills would overwhelm his body, and then a split second before he saw or heard anything, he would be paralyzed, completely taken over. The chills got worse, and when he would try to yell, nothing would come out. Sometimes he said he felt like he was dying and feeling every bit of it. Of course, this only time this happened was when it was pitch black in his room. Sometimes they reached in for him from outside his window or from right underneath his bed. He said it wasn't the same feel as someone grabbing you physically. Their grasp pierced right through to the bone, much like a snake wrapping tightly around you. Only every bit of the inside would also feel constricted, right down to the bone. We always had traditional singing gourds hung up around the house. These were used for funeral wakes. Almost every time a force was present, it was through a dead family member. Even if it was just a dark shadow, the dead were used as portals to reach the livelihood of our people. He said the gourd served as a warning system. If a force entered our house, the gourds would rattle like crazy, much like an alarm system, protecting the house from theft. He said this would cause the dead to return to the resting place. It was a reminder that the person was dead and that he was only causing distress. The evil using it had no way of evading or entering our house. If the force was strong enough, the gourds would not work. He said if that happened, we would all experience cold chills and a sense of fright. He said you'd have to feel so scared you wouldn't want to move, and that if you didn't convince yourself to move, it would only get worse, and that one person would be taken as an outlet for the family. Sickness or death would fall that person. To this day, I've never seen or experienced anything of that nature, but deep down inside, I know it's all true. I've heard the gourds go off, but never felt anything. My grandfather says they still visit him. I love my grandfather for everything he has shared with me. He says that all of this is only fair warning, and that this happens to everyone. Some just don't notice. The next time you fall, or get in a fight, just think, who is really behind it all? I could go on, but I think it's best to stop here. Okay, here's a story I heard from my dad. My dad used to work at a warehouse at the Goodyear facilities in Akron, Ohio. There were stories floating around about various ghosts and whatnot associated with the various buildings in the planned campus, which, if you ever visited Akron, you know, sprawls over a vast area. Anyway, one of these stories involved a ghost that followed you through various warehouses as you walked and was never seen, only heard. My dad was always working swing shifts at this plant, very little seniority, and so, he was there at all kinds of wacky hours. One night in the winter, he was working the midnight shift in one of the supposedly haunted buildings. There was only four guys in this particular building, and my dad, being the rookie in the place, was given all the crappy jobs. At about three in the morning, my dad's supervisor instructed him to go to the third floor of the building, back in the oldest part of it, to pick up some fluorescent lights because the small storage area in the machine room was out of them and they needed to replace a few. So, being as superstitious as you can be, my dad was sure he was gonna see a ghost in that very dark, very scary, old building. Up the dark stairs my dad went, one by one, sweat pouring off his face, even though this part of the building was barely heated. When he finally reached the third floor, he felt a little stronger, probably adrenaline. So he bravely pushed open the door to the adjoining room between the stairwell and the storage room. This room used to be a rubber cutting room. It wasn't used for anything anymore 
Since manual rubber coating was no longer done, there were a few large containers sitting around, but for the most part, the room was empty. There was a thick layer of dust covering most of the room, except for a small path where people walked to get various items from the storage room. Spiderwebs everywhere, and the occasional squeak from a disgruntled rat were just enough to give my dad the total spine chills. But he pushed on, and being a man, and not supposed to be afraid of anything, he started walking across the abandoned rubber cutting room towards the storage area, when very faintly, he heard footsteps behind him. Whirling around ready to fight, he peered into the dimness. Nothing was there. He assumed it was his nerves, which he had worked into a frenzy by this point, and he turned quickly, embarrassed, and continued towards the storage area, when sure enough, more footsteps. He slowed. They slowed. He sped up, they sped up. With his heart racing, he slowly turned around. Still, nothing was there. Drenched with sweat and scared nearly to tears, he bolted towards the storage room, his feet pounding heavily on the thin metal floor. The footsteps were even louder now. Every step he took, another step followed. Not an echo, but right behind him. He made it to the storage room, fumbled with the lock, ran inside, and slammed the door behind him. The room was very small. All he could hear was the pounding of his heart, threatening to blow right through his chest. The only way out was the way he came. After calming down a bit and smoking about five cigarettes, he was feeling brave again. He grabbed a large box of lights decided to fling open the door and run like hell as fast as he could cover the 50 to 75 feet to the stairwell. Getting up his nerve, he grabbed the door handle. He slowly turned it. As soon as he heard the click of the latch opening, he flung open the door and sprinted towards the light in the stairwell. There were the footsteps again, closer than ever, right behind him. That's when it happened tripping over something. He sprawled headfirst into the darkness. Total quiet met him. Darkness and quiet, he slowly rose to his feet, putting one hand behind him to help him get to his feet. Once again, the footsteps crept up behind him. That's when he finally got the guts to look in the direction where the footsteps were coming from, and what he saw astonished him. He saw an old man wearing an eye patch and had a cane in his hand. He had suspenders and overalls on and a blue hat on that resembled Mario from Super Mario Brothers. The guy only appeared for about 30 seconds, but it was long enough to notice the presence. The figure disappears. He rose to his feet and walked back to his co-workers, never telling any of them of what he found. Years later, he still tells stories about sending the new rookies up there in the middle of a dark night when all is quiet to walk across the metal floored room to get light bulbs that aren't really needed. It all started when I was about 10 or 11. This story is very true by the way. We had moved into a new house in northeastern Wisconsin. Let me explain where my room was. There was a porch and then the door into our house. To the left was the kitchen, to the right was the laundry room. And if you were to go straight when you entered the door, there was a staircase. It led to the attic where my room was. The staircase was not very long at all, 12 steps to be exact. When he went into the attic, there was a bathroom if you went straight. My room if you turned left, into the right, was a living room with a TV. One night, while I was laying in bed trying to sleep, I heard creaking up the steps. I thought it was my cat or one of the dogs, so I wasn't scared. 
I counted the number of steps I heard. There was 12. I noticed it sounded like a person coming up. I remembered every creak the steps made. I looked at the staircase, which I could see from where my bed was. I noticed some sort of dim light from the top step. The lights in the kitchen were off, and so was the upstairs light. I hid under the blankets, hoping for it to go away. I listened closely and heard 12 steps going down the stairs. Every night from then on, I heard the steps. One night, after I heard the steps going down the stairs, I got out of bed and looked at the bottom of the staircase. It was very dark, but I thought I could see a crumpled figure. Then a few days later, I saw a figure in white glide up the same staircase. It actually looked like a floating sheet and sort of resembled the Grim Reaper. I would start to see a lot of different types of spirits moving along the staircase. The last one I remember was a floating head that darted down the stairs. Three years later, we moved into a new house in Indiana. One night, my mother told me that a little boy had died in the house in Wisconsin because he fell down the stairs. She didn't want to tell me when we lived there because it might frighten me. To this day, I'm still very haunted by that. Back in September of 1982, my boyfriend of four years named Keith and I were visiting his sister Julie, her husband, and family in Orneco, Minnesota. He was 17 and I was 21, an odd age range, but he looked every bit my age and was mature as well. Sitting up late, we were talking and for some reason, we got on the subject of death. I asked him if he believed in the afterlife, and he said that he did not. He believed that when it was over, it was over, but he knew I believed, and I asked that in case there was an afterlife of any sort, and that if we were able, that if one of us should die before the other, that the one who died would come back and watch over the one left behind. He agreed. As time passed, Keith needed a space, and I gave it to him, reluctantly at times, to the point where we would get into heated arguments, and I would move out of his house, where we lived together with his father. In June 1983, on a windy, extremely hot Wednesday night, Keith died in a fire that consumed their trailer house. I hadn't been with Keith for about three months, as our breakups and makeups were getting more sporadic. I recall trying to hitchhike to his place that night, 12 miles away, but as I stood on the highway for what seemed like 45 minutes, I just wasn't getting a ride. It was strange, because I hitchhiked the highway regularly and never had a problem getting a ride within 5 or 10 minutes, but that night, it was mostly humid and so hot that within minutes of leaving my apartment to go to the highway. I was soaked with sweat, like I had just taken a shower and didn't dry off. So I went back home. The next day, my sister contacted me, saying that Keith had died the night before. I was devastated. My whole world fell to pieces. I spent the next few days with Keith's dad at Julie's house, preparing and attending the wake. At the wake. I was alone in the viewing room with Julie, and everyone else was downstairs visiting. It was a closed coffin service, but I had written a letter to Keith and wanted to place it in the coffin, but due to the extensive damage to Keith's body in the fire, the funeral home director would not let me see him, so I decided to put the letter in the small groove between the top and bottom halves of the coffin. As I was putting it there, a gust of wind came out of nowhere. It seemed to come right from the groove where I was about to place the letter. It was so strong and sudden that I screamed. People came from downstairs to see what the matter was, and I told them I had seen a mouse. No one in their right mind would believe me, and besides, 
Maybe it could be explained some way. I could not figure out. The night before the funeral, I was having a tough time trying to sleep due to the emotional turmoil I had faced from hearing the tragic news. I couldn't stop crying and I was absolutely devastated. Just then, I felt a cold breeze brush past my face while I was still laying down in bed and hysterically crying. I then felt the weight of the bed getting heavier, like someone else was sitting on the bed. I screamed Keith instinctively and laid up in bed. The bed instantly felt lighter and I could have sworn I saw a small ball of light move around the room before disappearing. During the wake, I had a 110 camera and took several pictures of the coffin. These pictures I will have to retrieve from Julie as I've gotten married six years ago and gave my photo album a key to her as a means of trying to let go of the past and move forward into my new life with my husband and daughter. But when I do, if I can't figure out how to scan them and get them on here, I will send them in. I believe I have something here. Also, in closing, I realized the depth of the promise we made to each other that night, just months before Keith died, and have spoken aloud hoping I will release him if we are bound in any way, that I release him of his promise and set him free several times in the past few years. Thank you for reading. In this story, my wife and I had moved and we rented a 60 year old plus house because the landlord allowed pets. My wife had misgivings about the house from the first day we viewed it, but she agreed to move in. We lived there for six months, August 1997 through January 1998. She had a strange feeling about the staircase, as if something bad had happened or would happen to one of us. I couldn't blame her, for the staircase was dark with no railing and carpeted so that it could be easy for someone to fall down the stairs. She also swears she heard old time music playing in her bedroom late at night. I never heard it and I don't believe it was our neighbors. She also said she would see people out of the corners of her eyes when she was alone. This hadn't happened to her before and hasn't since in our new house which we have lived in for 9 months. The strange coincidence is this, one afternoon I was in the bathroom taking a shower when I saw movement about the size of a human move across the floor in front of the sink towards the door. I thought it was my wife so I opened the door but she wasn't around. About a week later we were talking about how cold and where the house was. My wife told me in addition to the music and odd feelings, that when she was taking a shower, she had seen movement in the front of the sink going towards the door. I told her that the same thing had happened to me. I thought that perhaps reflections off moving cars in the street in front of the house could explain the movement, but it wasn't sunny when I showered. At this point, I was freaked out. so. In addition to poor insulation, bats in the attic and mice in the walls, we had ghosts. We moved out within a few months. It started when I was just a little girl. I would see things in my room at night, movement, shadows, and dark forms. I was told that it was a dream and I should not watch scary things on TV. Now that I am 29 years old and I am not dreaming, I know this for a fact. The ghost started to intensify when I was pregnant with my first child. I was 21 and still at home. I would wake up in the night with a feeling of being watched. Afraid to open my eyes, I would anyway and the same man would be there looking over me without an expression and cold eyes. I tried sleeping with the light on, but this did not stop it. 
I knew it could not be a dream, because it was the same image every night. My son was born, and we moved into our own place, about eight blocks away from my home. The man did not appear for a few months, but he did eventually show himself. Frightened every night as to what I would wake up and see, my husband worked out of town during the week, so I had my best friend come stay with me. I warned her that in the night, I sometimes scream because of what I see. Hesitant at first to believe me, then the screams came and she too was a believer. My friend eventually moved into her own place. What happened next, I can't explain. My friend has never experienced any ghosts or such, but one morning, while lying in her bed, she felt something jump up on it, like a cat would. The only thing is, she didn't have a cat. Before she knew it, she was frozen as if someone was lying atop of her and restricting her movement. The incident left as soon as it came, but she was well aware that this was an event that she could not get over. She moved shortly after. The stranger thing was that the man I'd seen for four years was gone. Had he been the one at her house? Did he move on with her? I will never know. I've never seen him since. My husband and I eventually bought our own home and began to move. The last night in our apartment, I awoke to at least six to eight apparitions above my bed. The spooky thing was, was that I was pregnant with our second child. It was as if they came to say goodbye. We got settled into our new home, incidentally, is three blocks from our apartment. It was about a year before the first incident. We knew when we moved in that the lady of the house had died here. That is who I expected to see, but quite the contrary. It was a man in police dress, like you would see at a funeral or graduation. His image appeared in the mirror next to my bed. He's the only one of the many ones that I've seen here. Now I only see an image once and never again do they appear. Some months, it is every night, and some months, none at all. Just when I think they are gone, I wake up and scream. They never touch me or try to talk to me, they just stand there and stare at me. The lights can be on or off, it does not matter. I think that my younger son is experiencing the same thing but I do not know how to ask him without scarring him. Some nights, he sits straight up in bed and cries and points with terror on his face. I look, but there is nothing there. All I want to know is if I'll ever be able to go to sleep and be confident that I won't wake up screaming. Thank you for your time, and hopefully someone out there can relate to me. I've had numerous experience with supernatural entities, but one that sticks out in my mind happened to my brother and I about two years ago. I have a cleaning service and clean many buildings at night, but the case in point occurred at a clinic in an older district of South Fort Worth. One night, my brother and I were finishing up at this clinic. I have a habit of walking through a building before we lock up to be sure everything is secure and the lights are off. My brother was in the lobby area of the clinic, preparing to leave, when I informed him I was going to check the building. There are four hallways in this clinic, with many examining rooms, so I proceeded to walk the building. About halfway through my walk, I heard another pair of steps, about ten foot or so behind me. I assumed it was my brother coming to help me, so I started talking to him. At the last stop of my walkthrough, there was a break room. I reached in to turn off the light of the break room and turned around, facing back towards the direction from which I had come, expecting my brother. What I turned to was not my brother, but the upper torso of a male figure 
somewhat see-through and misty white. I blurted out a few choice words and the figure was gone. After this experience, my brother as well heard many strange things as well as the figure of a female. I was talking to one of the doctors one day in the receptionist area when I noticed the picture on the wall. Instantly, I recognized one of the people in the picture with the figure I had seen. A cold chill came over my body at this point. I pointed out the picture to the doctor and asked who this person was. The doctor stated that he was the doctor who found in the clinic in 1929 and had died in 1985. I thought to myself, I knew doctors worked a lot of overtime, but this was going to an extreme. In the mid-1980s, my wife and I bought a home in Hanover Park, Illinois. It was a neglected house, which had a hard time selling and was being rented. The owners lived in a different state and the tenants let the place go pretty bad. We saw a lot of possibilities and the price was right. So we moved in and things were, to put it bluntly, bad. The place was filthy. There were spiders everywhere. The gas wasn't on in late October, and it was raining continually. So I'm sitting in the living room area questioning my sanity when I see this blob of haze, a little larger than a basketball, round in shape, start moving across the living room about seven feet away and just sort of floats into the dining room and out the patio door. It just went through the door and out of the house. I'm like, am I seeing things now? Or was that an apparition? It was weird because I wasn't scared. It was more like, wow, what the heck was that? We finally got the place in shape and it turned out to be a nice home. We had our first child just before moving in and it was nice to have a place of our own. I never mentioned the apparition to my wife lest she think I was really losing it. A few months later in the spring, other things started happening. My son, who was now a full year, would wake up in the night laughing deliriously. My wife thought it was hilarious. I never mentioned what I'd seen to her. She couldn't figure out what was so funny. I remained tight-lipped. This happened on a regular basis for about a month. And then one day, she calls me at work in a panic, saying that Chris, our son, got out of his crib and was sitting on the floor playing with his toys. Fine, except Chris couldn't walk just yet and definitely lacked climbing skills. So how did he get out? If he tumbled out, he would have most likely have been hurt or screaming at the very least. To this day, we don't know how, and he has no recollection of the event. Other events included the TV turning on at night, a strange happening of voices in the night, strong flowery odors, a feeling my wife once described as having passed through by something, and the car shutting down in front of the house once we moved out. We sort of visited, and when we passed the front of the house, the car just shut down. It restarted with no problem, and had no problems before, or any time soon thereafter. Weird. I was dating a guy when I was 14, about 5 years ago. His house had been built over an old well. The story goes that in the early 1900s, two children were playing near this well and the little girl fell in and her brother tried to help but fell in too. Their parents didn't know they were missing for a while but by the time they got there, it was too late. Well, they moved and another house was built over it. My boyfriend's closet was built over this well. One night. It was raining really hard and he was playing his guitar. 
A bolt of lightning struck right outside his window and lit up the whole room. About 10 seconds after that happened, we heard children laughing. I looked in the corner of his room and saw two children standing there, staring at us. I just sat there and stared back. They stood there for about 30 seconds and then vanished. After that, he would find things misplaced and then find them later. He came home on several occasions to find his room messed up. He would pick it up, leave, come back, and it would be messed up again. We broke up soon after that, and I've never heard about the children again. When I was 14 years old, I was living in the heart of San Fernando Valley with my parents and my younger other, 13 years old. We lived in a typical three-bedroom tract home in the picture of suburbia. My parents decided to put the house up for sale and move to a bigger house, and that's when all hell broke loose. There is a space room attached to the garage that used to be painted all these psychedelic colors and bizarre symbols that we covered up with white paint. Soon after the house was listed on the market, we had some rain and my father knows the ceiling in the shed was sagging from water damage, exposing the wooden beams underneath so we tore it down. Strangely enough, lodged among the beams, we discovered a pair of binoculars, some commemorative coins from Apollo space mission, and a cheap watch. Nothing of any particular value, except perhaps sentimental, but all of us felt a collective chill go down our spines as we wondered who these items belonged to, how they managed to get above the ceiling, and why anyone thought they were worth hiding. Soon after, my mom received her monthly bank statement in the mail and noticed a couple of checks that were not written by her, but someone had signed her name. Puzzled, she picked us up from school and asked us about it on the way home, but neither of us would ever forge a check, so she went to retrieve the check to show us, but both of them were missing from the stack. Pretty soon, all of her personal items began to disappear and reappear in the oddest places. At first we thought someone was playing a practical joke, or that one of us was responsible and the accusations began to fly. But some of the events that took place were so mind-boggling, we became sure that no person could be responsible. One antidote. My mom and I came home after grocery shopping, and as we were unpacking the groceries, we discovered that a whole bunch of non-food items had disappeared, even though we specifically saw the checker bag them. By this time, we were used to this, and figured that these things would reappear in the middle of night in the oven or under the bed. My parents then went out to run errands for a couple of hours, and I settled myself to a long gab with my girlfriend. As I chattered, I idly opened and closed one of my desk drawers. It was completely empty, but when I closed it and opened it a second time, I saw a bottle of shampoo lying inside, the same bottle of shampoo that was missing from our groceries. I told my girlfriend what was going on and closed the drawer after removing the shampoo, bracing myself. I opened it again, and this time, there was a tube of toothpaste, astounded. I tore out the other two drawers and peered below the drawer, looking for any explanation of this phenomenon. Even stranger, my top drawer is a lockable drawer, so since it's closed, it's completely inaccessible from behind the desk or below. Wanting a witness to verify that I wasn't hallucinating, I called my brother in, and without explaining anything, I showed him the empty drawer and closed it. I opened it, and inside rested a six-pack of ivory soap. He freaked out and ran screaming out of the room. At this point, I was too excited to be frightened, so I continued to open and close the drawer, and sure enough, each time, a new item appeared, sometimes two. I even requested some specific items, like my nail polish or hair gel to materialize, and it did. After every single missing item was retrieved, I stared at them all lining up in my desk in excited wonder, and then the awareness of what just happened hit me. I began to wonder if this thing, ghost, or whatever it is, can dematerialize and teletransport these items. There's no telling what else or who else it could be doing the same to next. Gathering up my hard-won toiletries, I joined my terrified brother on the front doorstep and waited for my parents to arrive. My girlfriend came running down the street to keep me company as well. This is just one of the many bizarre, implausible yet true events that my family and I have come to live with for the next five years. Certain things like cash were always missing no matter how closely you kept it against your body or how carefully you hid it. Important documents, term papers, school books always managed to disappear when you needed them most. 
This ghost was clearly present and knew what was most important to you and most inconvenient to steal. No matter how many times we moved, this presence made our lives miserable, but with each passing year, as my brother and I got older, the activity slowed down. By the time I left for college, there were only two incidents I can recall, and now that I am married and 27 years old, nobody in my family has been affected. I could fill a book with all the things that happened, but if anybody out there can offer an explanation for a kleptomaniac ghost or has any similar experiences, I'd love to hear from you. Oh yeah, I've never heard or seen any physical manifestations other than things disappearing when I was looking the other way. Thanks for reading. So I'm sure you heard of the great witch city Salem, Massachusetts. If not, let me enlighten you. The witch trials of the late 1600s took place in Salem, Massachusetts, in part of what is now known as Denver's Massachusetts. Due to the colorful history and the presence of many new age types, Wiccans, warlocks, etc., Salem has an abundance of strange and frightening stories to share. Here's one that I personally was involved in that took place in the summer of 2002 when I was 19 years old. One of the oldest cemeteries in Massachusetts in Salem's first cemetery, Old Burial Hill, is a tourist hub during the early fall months, but during late summer, it is empty except for passerbys and local kids, like ourselves. My best friend, her brother, their cousin and I had spent the day riding our bikes around, shoplifting, smoking cigarettes, and generally being a nuisance to the Bay State. We decided to cop a few 40 ounce and called an evening in the back of the graveyard. We had enough booze to give us a nice silly feeling, but not enough to cause visual hallucinations. There was no navy rum involved in that evening, and none of us smoked pot. That was hippie crap. Dust turned to dark, and we were cracking jokes, wrestling, and planning where to get more beer, when suddenly, the mood changed. Chris, my best friend's brother, began to tell us about a ghost that supposedly haunted the graveyard, and how his friend's sister cousin or someone like that had seen it last April. We were all spooked but didn't show it. Instead. We called his reliable source a wuss. Chris got annoyed and stormed off to take a leak. Me and Bianca and her cousin sat in silence, listening to Chris shuffle around. Suddenly, Chris came bolting from the corner of the graveyard. He jumped practically on top of us and sputtered out what was wrong. Jesus Christ, there's a dude, a freaking dude. Yeah, so, Bianca scoffed. There are lots of dudes in Salem. No, in the tree, like hanging. Chris was visibly shaken and not generally an easily scared guy. Bianca looked at me and Andrew looked at Bianca and I looked at Chris. What? Chris began to crawl towards the tree he claimed the man was hanging in and mentioned for us to follow. I don't know why he had to crawl, but we all followed suit. From where we sat, the tree was not really visible because a building was directly behind it. Roosevelt's pub and grill. Chris led us to the spot he had gone to relieve himself and from this angle, the tree was silhouetted against the purplish sky above the harbor. It took me a second to register what I was seeing. There was something on the largest bottom branch swinging. The tree was huge and very old, and by itself scary, but now, sure enough, a figure swung very slightly. I didn't think it was a ghost, and turned to Bianca, who at this point, like her cousin, was frozen terrified with a free hand covering her mouth. Should we call the police? I hissed. Chris answered for her, we don't need the damn police for this man, and something told me he was right, and something told me we should definitely leave. None of us spoke, but we all booked it at once, ran to the iron gates, and went straight to Chris's and Bianca's house, dropping off the shocked and very silent Andrew at his house down the street. We didn't really talk about it for the rest of the night. Instead, we played Uno and crashed in front of the TV. The next day. We went back for our bikes and belongings we had ditched in fear the night before. Andrew's half 40 ounce was gone and so was Bianca's bike. Gotta love the locals. The paper said nothing of a body. The graveyard was not the site of the witch hangings and from what I have found out from asking around town, there has never been a reported suicide or hanging in that graveyard. The only no hanging site was Gallows Hill where the innocent were hung during the trials. Gallows Hill is another whole story for another time. But until then, 
Come visit the quaint and creepy town of Salem, Massachusetts for history and some spooks later. My wife used to work for Oxford Suites in Hayden Island, just off of I-5. She had a complimentary stay as a new employee, so she thought it would be nice to let our son spend the night with Grandma, and we would have a nice night together alone. About 6 a.m., I was sleeping on my left side facing the alarm clock and had a ringing sensation in my right ear that slowly turned into the whispered words, Die. 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 I couldn't move, and it was all I could do to even open my eyes. Finally, I was able to shake off this stranger bound feeling, and it stopped instantly. The experience only lasted a few seconds, but it was totally unnerving. I've had other experiences like this. I just learned from this website that it is called Old Hack. I never even knew anyone else who has experienced this. I was 22 years old at the time in 1997. I'm now almost 31. Thank you. Back in the summer of 1994, my family and two other families attended a dance competition in Santa Cruz, California. We rented a suite at a local hotel. The suite had one huge upstairs bedroom with a big jacuzzi tub. The downstairs had a living room and a kitchen. It had a large red iron stairway that led up to the bedroom. Together, with the other families, we had six children with us. Five of the children were age eight and nine, and my daughter was the youngest, age four. From the minute I walked upstairs, a weird feeling came over me, a feeling of uneasiness. The children claimed the large bedroom upstairs as theirs, and they played up there the whole night. For many hours I stayed in the upstairs room with the children. I felt uncomfortable leaving my four-year-old daughter up there because of this uneasy feeling I had, a feeling I could not explain. My husbands and friends told me I was being foolish and talked me into coming down and joining them. Several hours went by and the children all had fallen asleep. There were three of us adults left awake and we sat on the living room floor talking. We then heard footsteps coming down the stairs. They were extremely loud and there was no doubt that one of the children had woken up and was coming downstairs. All three of us turned to see who it was. In the middle of the staircase stood a small girl, the same exact size as my daughter. I called to her by my daughter's name and asked her if she was okay or if something was wrong. I then asked her if she had a bad dream. She didn't answer me as I said her name again, my daughter's name, and she disappeared. My friend and I both looked at each other in disbelief. We both saw the same thing. The third adult heard the footsteps, but didn't pay attention after that. My friend and I both discovered her exactly the same way. A small girl with long curly hair, wearing an old-fashioned white nightgown. She was turned to the side where you could only see her profile, but you could see the sadness on her face. She was white or transparent in color. The time I was talking to her, I did not even realize that she was a ghost. She seemed so real. But as soon as she disappeared, I could not understand how I did not know she was a ghost while I was talking to her because being white and transparent, she obviously did not look like a real person. It was a very scary, overwhelming feeling. I quickly woke up my husband and had him check the children. They were all sound asleep. I crawled deep into my sleeping bag, scared to death, and eventually fell asleep. The next day. I contacted the hotel to see if anyone had ever reported a ghost. The worker said he was new and didn't know anything, but he said that Santa Cruz is believed to have many ghosts. I've always been hesitant when telling this story because nobody truly believes me except my friend who also saw it. Most people just kind of laugh or respond with a mmm or wow. I've always believed in spirits, but never believed you could actually see them. Well, I am a true believer now and will never forget this experience. I started doing paranormal investigating about two and a half years ago and have had tremendous success thus far. I've always been interested in all paranormal avenues, but I never thought I'd be doing this one day. My 7th Cemetery outing turned out to be one that I'll never forget. I went out to Forest Home Cemetery in my city of Fitfield, Wisconsin. It goes back to around 1850-ish and is centered in a wooded area, which makes it kind of intimidating to venture into at night. But being the persistent risk taker, I went anyway. I ended up bringing a good friend of mine along, just in case. We started out exploring the front of the cemetery 
and kind of caught the feel for our surroundings, making sure we are aware of the obstacles in our way, gravestones. After that, we headed out towards the middle of the cemetery, armed with only a camera and a flashlight. Though nothing happened yet, we were pretty nervous anyway. So we went over the entire cemetery taking pictures and hoping to see something strange. We didn't see anything strange that night, but something did happen that scared the hell out of us anyway. I was ready to call it quits for the night, but there was one more area we hadn't quite covered. Now, in this particular cemetery, I don't like going in the very back, not even during the daytime. It just gives me a strange unwelcome feeling. But that night for some reason, I thought it would be worth it. In retrospect, I wasn't sorry I did. Back to my friend that I brought with me. He asked if we should leave, and I said I thought we should check out the back of the cemetery before we go, and he agreed. So you can understand what we experienced, I'll try and describe what the back looks like. The cemetery itself is pretty big for a small town. There's probably around a thousand people buried there, and it's set in the woods, as I mentioned before. In the very back there's a road, and on the other side of the road is a huge field. At about 100 to 150 feet into the field starts the tree line. So you would have the field to your left and the road and the cemetery to your right with the last row of stones right next to it, the road. As we made our way onto the road and walked down, maybe about 5 to 10 feet, all of a sudden, and I still can't fully explain it, there was a very loud growl that seemed to reverberate all around us. I must have jumped at least 3 feet into the air because I literally landed on my friend and just about knocked the flashlight out of his hand. Chris, my friend, had a total shock on his face as he studied the flashlight beam towards where the sound came from and there was not a single thing, animal, or person to be seen. Just eerie silence. We were stunned and dumbfounded. I managed to stammer out what the hell was that. Chris said he had no idea, but thought we better leave. We both wasted no time in leaving, but upon leaving, both of us were experiencing a tight feeling in our chest and we both had trouble breathing. It was like being in a bear hug or something, very strange. Also, just before we left, after we had gotten back to the car, we took a tiny rest and gathered our thoughts. Chris had lit a cigarette, which technically is a no-no while ghost hunting, but we could really care less at that point. He took about three or four puffs of it and then threw it on the gravel road. For whatever reason, we both watched the cigarette fall to the ground and as it hit, it started spinning and then abruptly stopped. Then, as if flipping off a light switch, the orange burning tip died out. We left that night with a lot to think about and since then, I've gotten numerous pictures and EVPs from that cemetery and others as well. I'm not as scared of ghosts as I once was and I consider them to be just like us, only a little different, obviously. I can't wait until summer gets here, and I can go back to doing what I love, hunting ghosts. Okay, this is kind of a long story. It happened when I was on vacation from Chicago, visiting my cousins in California. My cousins have a huge backyard, and have a basketball court in it. They also have a tree house that is complete with electricity, TV, and a PlayStation. So me and one of my cousins named Danny were playing basketball. It was late, and it was beginning to get dark outside. But while we were playing, Danny's brother, Mike, was in the treehouse playing PlayStation. After we balled it up for a while, we heard Mike screaming at us through the treehouse window saying, Damn it guys, stop shaking the fort. We simply looked at him in confusion because we were at least 30 yards away from him and didn't even touch the legs of the fort. We just continued our game until it became too dark to see. We noticed that Mike had left the fort, so we went in to play some video games. We played a game until we started to feel some shaking. We yelled at whoever was pushing it to stop. It instantly stopped and we continued. About 5 minutes later, it began shaking again. I went out with a flashlight and looked under and around but saw nothing. I looked at the direction of the house, which was far because their backyard is so big, and saw that Mike and the rest of the family were in the living room. Kinda freaked, I climbed back up the ladder into the fort. We started playing a board game when we saw that the fort's security light went on, which meant that something was near. We briefly froze, staring at each other and both noticing the fear in each other's eyes. 
Danny went and peeked through the window but saw nothing, even with the help of the security light. I told him that it was probably some animal. He responded by telling me that the light only detects larger things, such as people. I told him to stop worrying, and we got back to our game. After a while, we got bored and decided to go back to his house. Danny got up and tried to open the door. It didn't even budge. The stupid thing is jammed again, he said, as he pulled out a belt from behind the door. He must have had this problem before because he had a method of solving the problem. He wrapped the belt around the doorknob and began to pull as hard as he could. He looked so confused and frustrated and told me that it should be opening easily. I helped pull it, but still, it didn't even budge. It was as if someone was holding it from the outside. Sounds crazy, right? But it was then that we heard steps, as if someone was walking around the little porch of the fort. We both looked at each other and nearly broke down with fear. The first thing Danny did was pull out some powerful BB guns he had hidden under his bed. He then opened up a table for us to hide under. We were freaking out. Then I summoned the courage to peek out the window, and when I did, I saw nothing. But the steps continued, this time, up and down the ladder of the fort. I nearly screamed. But being the optimistic and fun-loving guy that I am, I took advantage of the situation to scare Danny and joke around. I kept peeking out the window and screaming as if I saw nothing, just to freak Danny out. But then, he retaliated. He grabbed the string hanging down from the window curtains and tugged them as hard as he could, causing the curtains to go up shooting up and exposing the whole window. We both sat under the table in fear, thinking of what to do. After a few minutes, the security light went on again. We sat in silence, watching the light that reflected through the window and onto the wall of the fort. That's when we heard footsteps coming up the ladder again. We drew our guns, thinking they could do something, and continued watching the light. A few seconds later, for a brief moment, a shadow passed through the light, sending a terrifying chill through our spines. We looked at each other blankly for seconds until I spoke, telling Danny that we have to get out of here. I slowly reached out from under the table and grabbed the string to close the curtains. Once I did, we got up and cleaned everything up so we could be ready to run like hell out the door. But the door still wouldn't open. I knew for sure that something was preventing us from opening it. I then got annoyed and my anger took over my fear. I began pounding on the door, screaming cuss words and saying let us out. After my tantrum of screaming and swearing, the door simply slid open with a single pull. We ran out, shut the door, jumped down, and ran like madmen towards the house. It was later that night that my uncle, Danny's father, told us that the fort was built upon an ancient Indian burial ground. I knew whatever happened that night was for real. So that morning, once it was light out, we managed to force ourselves back into the fort. We began discussing whatever went on that night, and our paranoia caused us to keep looking out the little holes in the curtains. But when I looked, I saw nothing. I can't really explain what it was. It looked like a dark figure or an orb, but it had the physical structure of a person, arms, legs, and hand. It was crouched down behind a skinny tree. I shot my head back and told him to look. He said he saw it, but then, when it looked again, it was gone. Whatever happened that night caused me to believe in supernatural spirits, and I will never forget it. Thanks for reading. This was around the summer of 1990. My best friend lived about four blocks away from where I lived, and I usually walked or rode my bike to his house when we hung out. We were pretty young and pretty wild, and we'd seen our fair share of weird stuff growing up. Long days and late nights of exploring the neighborhood and seeing what kind of trouble we could get into. Growing up in the city, there were some rough neighborhoods around, and I had a very specific route of back streets I took home each night. Still, I knew to always be on my guard and aware of my surroundings, just in case. One night, as I was walking home from my friend's house, I encountered something I could never have prepared for. It was well after midnight, probably closer to 2 a.m., when I was casually strolling down the middle of the street on my way home. There weren't really any cars on the road at that time, so I walked right down the center line of the street. As I said, even though it was quiet and I knew the neighborhood, I always kept my eyes and ears open for signs of trouble. 
Rival groups of kids who might want to claim the area as turf are always a concern. As I made my way down the road, I began to get the feeling that I wasn't alone. I resisted the urge to stop or even look around, choosing instead to keep walking at an even pace and listen for the sound of someone following me. Footsteps, clothes rustling or breathing would give it away. I heard nothing, but I couldn't shake that feeling of being followed. I became more and more sure that someone was behind me and my adrenaline started to build. I still resisted the urge to turn around and look back. If someone was following me looking for trouble, there was a good chance they would rush at me and they would have the advantage. This was not my first rodeo. So I kept walking, but began bracing myself for a confrontation. Nothing happened. I turned a corner onto a new street and took a chance to quickly look over my shoulder. I was hoping to just see another random person out for a stroll, except there was no one behind me. Maybe they had gone into a house. I kept walking. Moments later, I felt it again. The hair on the back of my neck stood up and my arms broke out in goosebumps. Someone was following me. I was absolutely sure of it, only now they were clearly trying to stay hidden. Every instinct I had this was going to be a confrontation and I braced myself for it. My fight or flight instincts were screaming as I continued walking, trying to appear calm. I felt it getting closer and now I thought I could hear movement in the distance behind me. Finally, I decided it was time to turn and confront my follower. I balled up my fist and quickly turned around, ready to act. Again, there was no one there. My eyes searched for signs of movement among the curbside trees and among the handful of cars parked along the street. Nothing moved around the cones of light being cast by the street lamps. Still, I knew someone or something was out there. I stood there for what seemed like forever, determined to wait out the hiding stalker. I couldn't believe they were staying hidden for so long without peeking out to see if I was still there. I thought to myself, what the hell is going on here? After another minute of watching and waiting, I began to wonder if I imagined the whole thing. I was about to turn around and keep walking towards home. Then suddenly, about 50 feet away, I caught the shape of someone running out from behind a car and darting behind a tree. Again, my adrenaline surged and I was caught between wanting to run for it and being frozen with panic. I kept my eyes fixed on the tree that the shadow ran to, waiting for him to make another move. Nothing happened. The tight knot of apprehension in my stomach began to melt and was replaced with anger. Who the heck was this guy screwing around with me in the middle of the night? Without thinking, I yelled out, I know you're there, you coward. Step out and face me. From behind the tree, what I can only describe as a vaguely human shape mass leaned out from behind the tree. Apart from its outline, it had no defined features except for a pair of glowing red eyes that flashed in the dim light of the street lamp. What the hell? I yelled, stumbling back a step, not understanding what I was seeing. The dark form stepped fully out from the shadow and took a step towards me. I don't know what came over me, but all of a sudden, I felt more angry than I ever had in my life. It was crazy. I had the sudden urge to fight, and as I looked at those dull glowing red eyes coming towards me, all I felt was anger. I wanted to tear it apart. Still within the dim light under the tree, the dark figure took one more shambling step towards me, and I was overcome with rage. Unbelievably, I stepped forward and yelled out, come on, challenging it to fight me. But instead of coming closer, the dark form reared up slightly, and I swear if it had a mouth, I knew that mouth would be grinning at me. And then it vanished. It was just gone. The feeling of rage, it was gone as well, faded away. I stood there for several more minutes trying to understand what had just happened. Slowly, I finally turned around and began walking towards home again, only this time, there was no sense of being followed. Nothing weird happened at all for the rest of the journey. Night after night, I walked that same path home, always wondering if that red-eyed entity would return, wondering if I would be confronted and experience that same crazy rush of anger, but it never came back. I've never told anyone this story because, well, who would believe it? Thanks for listening. I have a strong interest in ghosts. Not that I always have, but I gained it recently. I'm a sheriff's deputy in Arizona. In a large city with a high crime rate, if you're a cop, 
then all of your friends are cops. I went to the police academy with a guy named Jeff. He was a short stocky kid about my age. We were the only ones in the class who were the same age, so we bonded. We pushed each other through the academy. After we graduated, we were surprised to find that we would be working in the same district on the same shift for the same supervisor. We worked the late shift and always went to lunch with one another, usually around 11.30 p.m. We would go to my mother's house and eat. Jeff didn't trust cooks at fast food restaurants at 11.30 p.m., especially when they looked at us as if they had just gotten out of the state prison and were serving a cop. My mother worked at Walmart as a manager. She got off at work at 11 and was extremely delighted to have us every night. She lived in a rather bad area of the city. My mother and Jeff would laugh and joke. They would swap stories and try to convince each other that their job was worse than the other's job. Jeff would always let her win the argument. She called him her son. Jeff and myself went skiing every year in the mountains of Utah. It was a vacation that him and his father took every year, and he made it with me after his father passed. Jeff loved my mother so much that he invited her to Utah one year. As my mother was with an instructor learning to ski, Jeff looked at me and said, Jerry, I can't take it anymore. The big city is draining the life out of me. Puzzled by this, I asked him what he was talking about, that he had loved his job and was the best cop in the valley at what he did. He explained that he was sick of seeing car accidents with dead bodies, chasing down a crack addict in the dark, getting shot at, etc. I said, fine, what are you going to do, quit? I was rather pissed off. He said, no, just quit working there. I want to move to an area like this, cold, quiet, and comfortable. I yelled at him something very childish. What about my mom? You'll kill her here. She loves you. He said, don't worry. I'll stop by from time to time to check on her. People just don't understand the strong connection that police officers get with their partners who watch your back every night. We returned from the trip, and Jeff did as he said he would. He packed everything up and moved to Colorado. Not long after I was transferred to day shift, I told my mother that Jeff had just transferred to the other side of the valley. It's what Jeff wanted. He couldn't stand me and my mother hounding him this day. And with that, here is the story. Jeff died about four months after arriving in Colorado. Truly how every police officer would want, he saved a little boy that had fallen through the ice in a river. Shortly after retrieving the boy, the ice he was laying on gave way. I never told my mother. She was getting up there in years and would not have been able to stand losing her son. I received a call from my mother in the middle of the night, about three weeks after Jeff's funeral. She said, Jerry, I want you to come over and spend the night. Jeff just ran off a burglar, but I'm still scared out of my mind. I was very confused and asked her to explain. She started the story. My mother was in her living room. She had just gotten off of work. Remember, it's after 11 p.m. She was watching TV and eating her dinner. From the other room, she heard the sound of metal grinding. She got up and went into her bedroom and seen that there was a man at the window with a screwdriver trying to get in. She ran back to the front room and picked up the phone to call 911. There was no dial tone. My mother said at that moment she just panicked. She had remembered that I had told her that burglars who break in to take things usually don't cut the phone line, but burglars who plan on hurting or killing someone do. She started to scream, help, 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 over and over. At that moment, she heard a loud crash and some thumping around. She heard a man's voice scream and then heard someone running away. She stood there, unable to move, not knowing what was going on outside. Bang, bang, bang from the door. Still, my mother didn't move. Mrs. Smith. She heard someone call her name from the outside. Yes, who's there? She yelled. It's me, Jeff. She opened the door and seen Jeff standing in a blue uniform. Weird, because we wear brown and tan uniforms. My God, she said. Thank God you're here. Did you get him? Nah, but he won't come back, I promise. Come inside and get something to eat. You look tired. No, I need to get back. Okay, she said, but keep an eye on my house for me. I'm calling Jerry to come over. He said, no, don't do that. I'll keep an eye out. I raced to my mother's house in a panic. I didn't know whether to be scared or mad at the burglar, or just that my mother had seen someone else. I got to my mother's house and ran in. She was still visibly shaken from the burglar. 
I sat down next to her. I grabbed her hands and placed them on my cheeks. I started to cry and told my mother Jeff is dead, Mom. He died over three months ago. I couldn't stand to tell you. She refused to hear of it. She explained that he was just here about an hour ago. I explained that Jeff did not want her to try and stop him from going to Colorado, so he had forced me to lie. I went on to explain that Jeff had promised me that he would look after her, and he was fulfilling that promise. My mother collapsed and laid on the couch all night crying. I found out that Jeff was in a blue uniform that night because he had been buried in a blue uniform, the color he wore in Colorado. My mother figured at the time he was working something like a special gang unit or something that night. I will never forget Jeff or what he did for my mother when he was alive and even after. It should show how much a promise is concrete in the heart of a respectable man. So every year when the time comes, when Jeff and his dad used to go on their ski trip, I go to his grave and I think about him. I thank him. I thank him for the times he had saved my life, times he saved strangers' lives, and the time he saved my mother's life. May God hold you in his arms. Thank you for reading. Whilst in the army, I've posted too many a place, but nothing like Hammersmith Barracks, Hartford, Germany. Originally a Nazi camp back in the Second World War, the camp has a lot of history to it. The buildings in the actual camp are actually like the ones in the film Buffalo Soldiers, just to give you some idea. I arrived there in September 2004 and thought nothing of the block at first glance, but one thing that would puzzle me was in the basement. There were still the old steel cell doors of when it was still occupied by Nazi Germany. What were such doors needed for? Anyway, as time went on, I started to find out some very interesting facts about the camp itself. Like one for instance, was the cobblestones which were very subsided. Why hadn't those been replaced? Well, the reason why was due to the fact that when occupied by the previous owners, they took it upon themselves to bury the dead underneath the road, then brick over the bodies, I kid you not. Anyway, that's just the inside of the history of the camp. There have been various sightings, and people have heard noises, which mostly occur at night. There used to be a small corridor situated on the second floor where the females lived, and in this time, they have reported on numerous occasions of seeing a young girl aged about 8 or 9. One girl states that she would sit on the end of her bed while she slept, and when she awoke, she would find a dark body-like shadow of a young girl with long hair watching her. There were also talks of this ghost when she returned to the UK. On leave for two weeks, the room was adjacent to hers, which at the time was occupied by two other females. When they started noticing that a dark shadow would enter the room during the nighttime, and things would be moved from one place to another. When the females were moved out of this block and males were moved into this corridor, all the strange things happening occurred stopped. I'm no expert on this matter, but I believe maybe the young girl felt a motherly love or connection to these females. I, on the other hand, was living at the opposite side of the block at the time, when I found myself awoken one night by a noise. When I was fully awake, there was total silence, and immediately thought to myself that I must have been dreaming. I got out of bed to go to the bathroom, which was only down the corridor from my room. Just before entering, I could hear a voice, which seemed as if it was talking to themselves in a foreign language. I entered thinking that maybe someone may have just had a little too much of a drink that night, and I found the bathroom deserted, and the lights were all switched off. I was shocked and turned the lights on immediately to find a dark shadow moving from one side of the room to the other. It was the strangest thing I had ever seen. Well, I'll tell you now, I did not use that bathroom that night. I decided to go on to a different floor. Shortly after that, I returned back to the UK, and so I did not have to undergo any more midnight hauntings. Thanks for reading. I've always believed in ghosts, witches, and the paranormal, etc. My grandma has always been involved with ghosts, and it seems that they always follow her. I now think that I have one following me. Anyways, to the story at hand. It was a few years ago. I was about 17, and I was having my best friend and my cousin over for the night. It was only us, my mom, and two younger sisters were visiting my aunt in another town. Well, that night we were in my room, and when the door is open, you can see the bathroom across the hallway. Also, with the way my bed is set up, you can see into the hallway when sitting there or lying there on my bed. 
My cousin Destiny got up to go potty. Sam and myself were lying on the bed watching a movie. I heard the bathroom door open, and I looked over, just as Destiny came running back into the room looking scared. Sam and I looked at each other puzzled, then asked what was wrong. Destiny said that when she had gone into the bathroom, she had leaned over the sink to start brushing her teeth after going potty and washing her hands, and when she stood back up, it felt like someone was behind her watching her in the mirror. I'm getting chills just thinking about that day. Well, Sam was like, yeah, right. She is not a big believer in ghosts, I don't think. And me, being a believer and wanting to help out, got up to go to the bathroom to show Destiny that she was just tripping and that there was nothing wrong. Destiny stayed in the bathroom and watched as I walk across the hall to the bathroom. Well, right before I went to step over the threshold, I stopped, dead in my tracks, and for some reason my body froze and refused to go any further into the bathroom. I was a bit creeped out because I hadn't ever done that before. I hurried back to the room and I was like, oh my, Sam was still skeptic and she walked into the bathroom plain as day. I didn't get it. Destiny made Sam stay in there as she finished brushing her teeth and I just stayed out of the bathroom the rest of the night. The next morning everything was fine. I could walk into the bathroom no problem and even Destiny could close the door when she went in there now. Later on that morning though, I walked around the corner to get into the bathroom to take a shower, my clothes and towels in my arms. I stopped. It felt like my eyes bulged and I couldn't get my breath at first. There. Standing in front of the drawn shower curtain, drawn as in closed shower curtain, was a black outline of a man a couple of inches taller than me. I am 5'9". Well, I freaked out and I ran to the phone and called my grandma who I figured would know what to do in this situation. She told me to go back to the bathroom and I did, and the outline of the man was still there, standing right in front of the bathtub. My grandma then asked if all the doorways had been crossed with holy water. I said yes, because all of them had, including the windows, that is, until it came to my room. I'm not a Satanist or anything, but that's my shrine, my room, and I don't need holy water to protect me. So, only the outside of my room's door had been crossed. Well, my grandma then told me to start chanting these words. I don't remember what they were, but they made me feel at ease. Next thing I know, the black outline of the man starts to move and it goes through the bathroom wall, right into my room. I was happy to have it out of the bathroom, but now it was in my room. What was I supposed to do? Well, it ended up that I didn't have a problem with it in my room. I didn't get the creepy crawly feeling, so I think that I either left my house through one of the walls in my room that hadn't been crossed with holy water, or maybe it was just stuck in the bathroom and was trying to get back to my room. I hadn't told my mom and sisters about the ghost, my baby sister was young and I didn't want to scare her real bad, but ever since that incident in the bathroom where the ghost or whatever it was moved from the bathroom into my room, my two younger sisters always refused to be in my room alone. Weird. And that's my story about the ghost in the bathroom. Feel free to write me if you like. More stories to come. I have more, plus I have some that my dad, mom, uncle, and aunt and grandma have told me. All true. Thanks for reading. I grew up in an orphanage, having lost both my parents in a car accident when I was 6 years old. This paranormal encounter occurred in my third year of stay at this orphanage. I must describe, the orphanage was pretty dilapidated and had only 4 dormitories, one for girls, infant to 8 years old, for girls, 8 to 18 years old and where I belonged, one for boys, and so on and so forth. This happened right at midnight when me and two of my friends went out of our dormitory to head to the kitchen to grab a glass of water. It was a very chilly night I must recall, and the three of us wore nighties. After we'd gotten a drink, we hurried upstairs trying to avoid being caught by the caretaker. Just as we were about to enter our dormitory, me and Hannah, I can't really remember if that was her name, knows that Elizabeth was not with us. Out of nowhere, we saw her enter the boys dorm in top speed. It was like seeing a curtain on a very fast horse. Out of curiosity, we peered into the boy's dorm and found Elizabeth jumping on an empty bed, as if it were a trampoline, while the boys were sound asleep. We called her, but received no answer. Then, in just a snap, she faded into nothing. At that, me and Hannah were scared out of our wits and ran to our dormitory. Once there, 
We covered ourselves with our sheets shivering in fear. I can remember I think Hannah was actually crying and praying for the Lord's Prayer at the same time. That morning, when we were off to prepare for our classes, we saw Elizabeth who was well and smiling. She even greeted us and sat with us in class. Me and Hannah just figured it was all a dream, but we were nine back then. Now, I'm 30 years old, and I know surely it wasn't just a dream. I think it's what paranormal experts call an encounter with a doppelganger, and let me tell you, it was pretty horrifying. Other experiences I had in my 10 year old stay at the orphanage was the spontaneous on and off activity of the lights in the classrooms, dormitories, libraries, dining halls, etc. Grown ups talking as if they were having some conference in a flower garden outside the back of the orphanage in the middle of the night, and the beautiful churls singing of palms, which I believe came from the dining hall, that occurred in different times of the day. I strongly believe that the orphanage was haunted. But what gets me wondering up to now is that why the people in charge never did anything about it when some children, especially the adolescents, started complaining. Well, that's my story, and I hoped you liked it. I apologize for the length. Thank you for reading. The following story happened to me when I was four or five years old. This experience occurred during 1944 or 45 in Kissimmee, Florida. My mother and I were waiting by the side of the highway, Orange Blossom Trail, for my father and grandmother to drive us to Orlando. Back then, there was very little traffic on the trail as it was known. We watched as the black Ford approached from the south, with the two of them inside. Neither person appeared to notice the old lady and small child waving at them. I saw both their faces through the windshield. The two people looked like my father and grandmother. Same clothing, etc. The car disappeared around the corner. We were both surprised that the car did not stop. My old lady, mother, started rambling and talking some very unkind comments about my father and grandmother. Several minutes later, another black four appeared from the south. This time the car slowed down and stopped, several feet ahead of us. It was my father and grandmother. We got into the car and asked them why they drove past us the first time. Their response was that they just got there. My father indicated that it must have been another couple that looked a lot like them. After a few minutes of arguing, my old lady just went blank and stopped talking about it. Twelve years later, I asked my father if he remembered the incident. He still remembered the fuss my old lady made when she got into the car. He indicated that the kind of situation had happened to him before, more than once in Kissimmee during the 1940s. This kind of thing, being seen before arriving, appeared to run in the family. These are just some of the observations I noticed about the incident. This was my first experience at seeing something that would happen in the future. The car and people were clearly visible and solid. The people looked like my father and grandmother. I do not remember hearing the car. No engine sound. I do not remember seeing any smoke from the tailpipe either. The people in the car did not respond or react in any way to the two people that were waving at them from the side of the road. Back then, Everyone would have waved back to a small children that waved to them. My old lady sometimes remembered the incident. Other times, she could not. After this incident, I've never trusted my ability to identify people by sight. Finally, this situation appears to be common to my father's side of the family. I've also been seen in places before I arrived too. Note, my relatives on both sides of my family are psychic, psychotic, crazy, and or a combination of the last three. I'm probably the only normal one in the family. I'm sorry if you had to hear this, but I had to tell you. Thank you so much for reading this story, and I hope you don't run into anything that I experienced too. A friend of mine is a veterinary technician and has worked in numerous vet clinics over the years. There was one place that was strange though, all the techs at this one clinic would have frightening dreams about being chased through the clinic by something at one time or another. My friend had told me this, and I asked if she ever had this dream, and she said no, not yet. I would often go with her when she had to take care of the animals over weekends or holidays and help out. One night, it was my turn. It was a clear dream, and everything appeared real. I found myself running through the clinic with the feeling that there was something behind me, just beyond my sight and that this entity didn't want me there. 
I also think it enjoyed the chase because I was somehow in its place or frame or more closer to its existence where it could reach me. I was overwhelmed with fear, but I remember wondering why this was happening to me because I didn't work there. I remember stopping just before I got to the kennel room, turning around and yelling, hey, I don't work here. Suddenly, I was awake, like someone had flipped a switch and I never had that dream again. This place had a higher number of deaths associated with surgeries than any other clinic my friend had worked at. They also had problems with some of their equipment turning on and off, batteries draining, tools missing, that sort of thing. Anyway, the owner sold the place and now it's an eye clinic. I've often wondered if any of those people had strange dreams. Thanks for reading. This is a story related to me via my father. He told me yesterday, as we were speaking of ghosts, Dad said he was walking home one fall evening while he was in high school, in the late 1950s. He had been in downtown Portsmouth lollygagging around with some friends. It was now time to go home for dinner. If anyone is familiar with Portsmouth, New Hampshire, they know it is rich in history and an old port town, hence the name. There is an alley that cuts behind the school, and it passes by the South Mill Pond. He was halfway down the alley when he saw a bright light coming out of the sky. He had no idea what it was. This was back in the day where schools were building bomb shelters and kids were scared of some sort of disaster. The light got brighter and brighter. As it came closer to him, it was speaking to him. Dad listened to it and was mesmerized. He said it looked like an angel, but not anything like you would assume it to be. It spoke to him for quite some time. He doesn't recall how long he was there. The concept of time ceased to exist, and it left in the same manner as it came. He continued home and told his mother. She told him it must be his guardian angel. To this day, he can't remember what it said or what it really looked like. He had such a glimmer in his eye as he told me. He was smiling like he hadn't told me the whole story. In the years after that event, my father has cheated death at least five times. The last time being this past year. He should have died, but he didn't. I wonder if the angel guided him through all of the obstacles he has faced. If it did, I'm glad, and I do believe. Thanks for reading. One night, I was hanging out with my friends in an apartment in the small town I lived in. Three people lived there, a married couple and one of their friends who was a young teenager. I would hang out and stay overnight there frequently, as there was not much to do in such a small town. This night was just like any other or so it seemed at first. We were just hanging out, talking and laughing about whatever came up. Soon it was late, and the young girl decided to go to bed while the rest of us were going to stay up longer. She walked down the hallway and entered her bedroom and screamed. We immediately jumped up and ran to her bedroom. She was looking down at the floor with an expression of terror on her face. She was staring at a medium-sized porcelain angel that was lying broken in three pieces on the floor. She kept this angel on the top of her Bible on a nightstand. Both the Bible and angel were on the floor. A broken angel is nothing to scream in terror over. And at first, I was confused. But she picked it up, and streaming from the eyes was what looked like fresh blood. Immediately, I assumed that she was pulling some prank on us. An angel crying tears of blood sounded so generic to me, so unimaginative, that I thought for sure she was trying to get some negative attention. I took the angel pieces from her and said yeah right. She swore that she had nothing to do with the broken angel and its tears of blood. I gave her a scrumptious look and looked closely at the angel's face. The blood looked like fresh nail polish and I still did not believe that she had nothing to do with it. Knowing that nail polish smells strongly of chemicals, I put my nose close to the angel's face and smelled it. I could not detect a familiar nail polish smell, but I was still very doubtful. I noticed that the blood was running perfectly from the base of the eye, that it followed the contour of the round eye, and that none appeared on the eye itself. It was then that I started to think twice about what was happening. I knew that this girl had not left my sight for at least an hour and a half before she entered her bedroom and promptly screamed, knowing that applying nail polish in such a way that it would not get on the eye itself, and then to make it run down the face in such a short time, a matter of seconds, was nearly impossible. As I held the angel in my hands, I grilled the girl about what she had seen when she entered the room. She said that she walked in to see it broken and the blood just beginning to run. 
I asked her several times if she was faking us out and that a joke like that would not be funny at all. She was clearly shaken and refused to touch the angel again. After asking her many questions, I looked at the angel again. To my complete shock, the bright red had turned darker with a slightly rough surface. I touched it and it was dry. Nail polish stays smooth and bright even after it dries. This unnerved me and I scraped the blood with my fingernail and flaked it off. I have seen coagulated blood before many times and this red stuff was just like it. I gave the girl a look of seriousness as my mind started to swim. We spoke a bit longer and she said she would like to be alone. I decided to place the angel on top of the entertainment center in the front room. The married couple were standing in the hallway watching me place the angel on the entertainment center. They were extremely doubtful too, even more so than I because I believe I had made some logical deductions that they had not. I placed the angel gently on top of the center and began to walk towards the married couple. Now, I placed these pieces about a foot from the edge of the entertainment center. This I know, I did it purposely. About halfway to the married couple, I watched their faces turn to an expression of pure astonishment. They pointed behind me and I looked back at the center. The angel pieces lay on the carpet in front of the entertainment center. I stood staring at the pieces in complete disbelief. The couple approached me and said that they did not see the pieces actually move from the center, but they saw them bounce on the carpet as I walked away. As we stood there, we all got a very eerie feeling that we were not alone. I sat on the couch and got a feeling of malevolence. I sat quietly and felt the presence of a very angry man in the room who was trying to scare me. I spoke out loud and told him I knew what he was up to and that it would not work with me and that he should leave. Out of the corner of my eye, I caught a glimpse of a face of a man who had the most terrible scowl and angry eyes. I believe he was truly upset that I was not going to allow him to have that effect on me. The feeling of the room returned to normal and I relaxed. I went back to the girl's room and told her what had just happened. She was crying and said that ever since she had been going out with this certain young man who was very controlling and had lots of bottled emotions, a spirit of an angry man had been following her around. I suggested that she leave this boy and pray for the spirit to leave her alone. She ended up breaking up with him. But a few months after the incident, this story sounds incredibly generic, I know. I did not believe in myself, but I was there and there was definitely something there that night that did not like us. Thanks for reading. One April morning, I had to go and meet a woman and take her to a doctor's visit and translate for her. We were to meet in front of the translating office. When I turned onto the street of the business, I noticed a minivan with two adults and a child in the middle of both adults, and I parked and approached the couple to ask if she was the woman that I had to go and help translate. The child and husband just looked at me and smiled as I spoke to this woman, and the child was just all jumpy and playful and all smiles. Cute three-year-old boy with his thick blue jacket, dark brown hair, cute as can be. The woman then agreed to go in my vehicle and left her husband and child. At this point, I was unaware of who this child was. We continued in my vehicle towards the doctor's office, and she started to tell me more about her doctor's visit. This woman was diabetic and had lost already a baby at birth and two had been miscarriages. All she wanted she told me was to have a baby. Hmm, I thought. How strange. Then I asked her, and the little boy in the minivan? Isn't he her son? She replied no. Then I asked if he was a relative, or maybe it was just babysitting for someone, and she was just looking at me kind of weird, like that what is she talking about look. I caught on and asked what was wrong, and she said that there was no boy in the minivan, just her and her husband. I was shocked and a little speechless, and said to her, now look, there was this little boy in the middle of you and your husband. He would look at me when you were talking to me, and he would smile and be playful. I even described him to her and what he was wearing. And she said no, that there was no child with them at all. You know in the beginning, I thought that she was joking with me, but she was serious. So then I became serious and very thoughtful why this occurred. Because sometimes you think now, I know I'm not that crazy, and I know I don't hallucinate, and I know I was not seeing things. I'm in my right state of mind, so what is going on? All I could tell her was that babies many times when they pass, 
they continue as angels to be by their parents' side, and that now she knew that her little guardian angel was this cute angelic brown-haired boy. Months passed, and she returned to the office and her husband was with her, and she told her, remember her? She's the one that saw her angel in her car. This happens to me often, that I see, feel, or even sense people or children that have passed, but at the time it is happening, I don't think they are past. I see them like I see anyone else. It is after that I know that I just saw someone that is deceased. Thanks for reading. Call me crazy, but as a teen, my friends and I loved exploring abandoned properties. There was a house just outside of town about a half mile off of the city that intrigued me since childhood, and I had to go see it. One afternoon, two of my friends agreed that it would be a great place to check out, so we loaded up and went. It was a typical creepy old farmhouse type place, made of wood that had begun to rot decades ago, dirty, mostly broken windows, rickety porches, two stories high, plus an attic. Getting in was no problem. The doors were gone, so we just walked in. There was evidence of other people having been there, as the room we concluded to be, the living room, was full of empty beer cans and potato bag chips. Uninterested in these findings, we made our way into the kitchen. It was broad daylight outside, but this house was pretty dark inside, adding to the intrigue and creepiness. The kitchen was a wreck, it seemed as though the mice had taken full advantage of whatever had been left there, so on to the dining room. Finally, we saw a set of stairs, the first ones we had seen so far, and up we went. On the third step from the top, I set my soda can down so we'd be able to remember that's where we came up. I'm glad I had the foresight to do that. We meandered to the top floor and found that it was much brighter and warmer up there, probably because it wasn't under the cover of the low tree branches as the downstairs had been. We weren't feeling too afraid, just a little uneasy as we walked around until we got to a large room on the east side. I can't really explain what I felt, mostly I felt as though I wanted to cry. Someone was very sad and that much I could feel. Whoever it was hadn't been ready to die when they did and weren't able to say goodbye and let go. My friend Chris left the room, stating that he was finding it difficult to breathe, must be the dust. My friend Megan was very pale and shaking, so we decided okay, it's time to go. We walked around the top floor, looking for stairs to the attic, and never found them. We found a set going down, which we had missed on the first few go-arounds, so down we went. They led to the living room. How was that possible? We walked around the downstairs, peeking at all the little doors for stairs, only to find closets. There wasn't a door to get out of the living room, so we went back upstairs and walked around some more. Finally, Megan spotted the stairs where my soda can was, and we happily bounded down them and back into the dining room. We made our way around the downstairs again just to be sure. The dining room led to the back porch, and the kitchen had the stairs to go up. The kitchen only led to the dining room and the living room. The living room only led to the kitchen and the porches. Okay, so where were the stairs we walked down? This was the same room because the mess on the floor was the same, and the mantle above the fireplace was the same. So what was the deal here? We went back upstairs and Megan stayed at the top of the stairs while Chris and I walked around again in search of the mystery steps we had gone down. We never found them. As Chris and I were walking back towards Megan, I heard someone in the large bedroom that made me feel very sad. It sounded like a soft crying and I felt very bad. I felt that we intruded into this person's life and it was time we left so we did. Most places we ever visited. We went back for a second and sometimes third look. However, this place, we didn't. We all felt after we left that maybe whoever was there really just wanted to be left alone, and we never went back together. The oddest thing is that on Easter day of the following year, I had this unstoppable urge to go to the house and leave flowers on the porch. I got some daffodils and headed out there, only to find my friends Chris and Megan also had come to bring flowers. We all had that urge, and we all headed out there without the others knowing with a big bouquet of fresh daffodils. Something there touched each of us, and I will forever feel a connection to that house in the woods, and whoever that is who lives there in the large room on the east side of the upper floor who seems to like daffodils. Thanks for reading. 
First, I need to give you some background history. I can see auras. If you don't know what that is, it's the energy a body gives off. There are different colors, and those colors have meaning such as blue and green is relaxed. I started to see auras around the same time I had my experience. I was in 8th grade, at church, the first time I saw an aura. I can't see them as well now. It's been 6 years since I started, and my ability has faded from lack of use. My experience happened the same year, 8th grade, in French class. My teacher was working on the overhead, so she had all the lights off. I was sitting in the back of the class. French didn't excite me much, so I was not really paying attention to what she was saying. Instead, I was playing with the light around her. This is rather hard to explain. Her body was reflecting light from the overhead. I think I could see this because I could see auras. Anyway, I would stare at the light around her and move it to the dark beside her. Kind of like when you would stare at a bright light for a while, and then when you would look away, you still see the light. Well, I could see the outline of her body, and then it would just fade away. I would then look back at my teacher and do this all over again. The point being, I was technically staring at nothing for a while. It was after doing this a couple of times that I noticed something else. It was a thin, blue, outline of a person standing opposite my teacher watching what she was writing on the overhead. I was looking at its side profile, and I could see a perfect outline of a nose, mouth, etc. I could only see it from the waist up because the desks were blocking the rest of my view. I froze when I noticed this thing. I couldn't stop staring. I thought I must be seeing things. When it turned towards me and started to approach me, it didn't walk, but came towards me in a flashing motion like a strobe light was on. I freaked all my muscles tensed, and I wanted to bolt, but was too frozen. That's when it stopped approaching me and just laughed at me. This is when it starts to get really weird. The laughter was inside my head, and I know it was not mine. It was cold and evil, and I was about to start crying. The rest of the class, it just watched my teacher and was smiling over my fear. Once class was over, I bolted from the room and told my friend what had happened. Nothing else happened for the rest of the day. When I got home, I told my mom what happened and said I was scared of going back to French class. She said if it happens again, I was to say a prayer and ask for God to protect me. The next day, I went back to school. French was my third period class and math was my first. Sitting in math, I was miserable. I couldn't stop thinking about what had happened and I was scared. It was then that I hear the laughter again. My body tensed up again just like last time. That just made it laugh even more. I asked it inside my head, what do you want? It told me, and this is happening all inside my head, mind you, to torture you. I know I sound crazy talking with myself, but it was definitely not my voice I heard. It was deep and cold and very evil. I then said, fuck you, you have to give me a break. I was only 14 and not very mature yet. Right after I told it off, I got very sick, very sick, to my stomach. I then apologized and took back my comment. The stomach pains went right away, and it started to laugh hard. It was feeding off of my fear and seemed to be gaining strength from it. As soon as math was over and I had to go to my second period class, I found my friend who I had talked to yesterday and told him I did not want to go to French class. He said he'd go to counseling center with me. Second period went by fine. When French time came, I had to go ask my teacher if it was okay for me to go to a counseling center. Well, as soon as I walked into the classroom, it felt like walking into a cloud of evil. All I wanted to do was get out of there. I started to cry while asking my teacher to leave, and the laughter started again. This time, it was echoing in my head. My poor teacher was trying to write out my slip as fast as possible so I could leave. I went to the counseling center with my friend and the two of us sat alone in a small computer room. We just sat there. There was nothing else to do. I could feel it in the room somewhere with me, enjoying my pain. Without really thinking about it, I thought to myself, oh God, help me. Right at the instant, I heard a scream, and I could feel that someone else was there. I turned to my friend and told him, then a teacher came in and said we had to go back to class. I didn't know what was happening, but by the time I had walked across the commons to my French class, I was in a box. That's the only way I can explain it. 
I felt like I was in a box and it was scratching from the outside to get in. While inside my box, I was feeling safety, good, and peace. I heard a voice that told me over and over, you're safe now, nothing's going to get you. I couldn't stop smiling. I felt so good. As the day went on, my box got bigger. It grew to the size of the school and then so big, I couldn't even feel its boundaries, but I knew I was still inside. I talked with the spirit for two days. It told me I would always be safe and it was a messenger from God. I believe it was my guardian angel. Look, I know this story sounds crazy and I've tried my best to believe I had an overactive imagination, but it was too real to not be true. The voices, the things happening around my classroom, things that are happening in general. I just couldn't fathom what was going on. And I know it's disbelievable, like I said, but still, in my head, I know it was real. I used to be a police officer for the city of San Benito, Texas. One night, my shift was working 11 to 7, graveyard shift, when I heard one of my fellow officers call out over the police radio at about 2 or 3 a.m. that he was going to check out what appeared to be a fire within the fenced area of the Old City Cemetery, which is located on Old Sam Houston Street. I then advised our dispatcher that I would be en route to back up my fellow officer. I was across town, so I traveled about two to three minutes tops when I heard the officer say 10 to 8, which means back in service. I then thought to myself, why didn't he call for the fire department? So I then called him over the radio and told him to meet me at the parking lot of the Blockbuster video store. When he pulled up to my police unit with his patrol car, I could see that he had a scared look on his face. I asked, hey, what happened at the cemetery? And he said defensively, I don't want to talk about it. I again asked him what happened to the fire, and he said again, I don't want to talk about it, and drove off in the police unit. I thought to myself that I would give him the chance to clear his thoughts from his head, so I waited to the end of the shift to ask him what had happened. He told me that I was patrolling on North Sam Houston Street when he saw a small fire in the Old City Cemetery. He then stated he went around the railroad tracks at Old Sam Houston Street. Since it was around one of the holidays when they sell fireworks, he thought someone might have set off the fireworks and it had landed in the cemetery causing a grass fire. He then called the dispatcher over the police radio and advised her that he was going to check out the fire. He said he told me he exited the patrol unit and walked into the city cemetery towards the fire. He said that the flame from the small fire was about 8 to 9 feet high. He then told me he noticed as he was walking towards the fire that the closer he got to the area of the flame, the smaller it was getting. He said to me when he got up where the source of the fire was, it suddenly disappeared and he noticed that there was no smoke or traces of anything burning. He stated that when he looked down where the flame had disappeared, he was standing in front of a grave where I had just been buried days or a couple of weeks before. He then stated that he felt scared and that is when he got back in his patrol car and left the area. This occurrence is my one and only paranormal experience. I'd love to have more. For the past year, I've had a part-time job working for an ambulance company. This company is one of the few running combination funeral home EMS services in the region. One day, I was sitting in the ambulance bay resting between calls. The ambulance bay is in the same building as the embalming and body preparation area. I was in a meditative state, but had my eyes open. Out of the corner of my eye, I observed a girl about 9 years old walk through the back wall of the ambulance bay towards me. I remained motionless and when she arrived at my side, she smiled and blew a puff of air onto my cheek. I could distinctly feel the breath and, at this point, I realized that day I was not daydreaming. The child was dressed in a slate blue jumper with a white blouse. The outfit she wore could have placed her anywhere from the late 19th century to the middle of the 20th century. It looked like a school uniform. She was slender with mousy brown hair and dark eyes. After blowing on my cheek, she smiled and walked past where I was sitting and disappeared through an exterior wall just to the left of a door. Later, I asked some of the other paramedics if this apparition was familiar to them. It was not. However, Two of the medics stated that they have seen and or heard ghosts in the ambulance bay building and an adjacent former residence, now used as a dispatch center. 
Although I've tried sitting in the same place and being quiet and meditative, I've failed to see the little girl again, but I will keep trying. There was no fear involved with the paranormal event, only a sense of love and gentleness. Thanks for reading. I had a few experiences in this one house I lived in from the time I was 5 until about 14. I lived in a city about 20 minutes away from Los Angeles. Anyway, one night, I was sleeping and for some reason I woke up. I don't ever wake up in the middle of the night. When I woke up, I saw a white figure which looked like a soldier standing in front of my bedroom door. He was just standing there saluting me, just staring at me, and he didn't move. What I remember the most is his eyes. They were bright white. I was scared because yeah, it was a ghost and it's not normal for me to see something like that. But at the time, I felt safe. I knew that he wasn't there to hurt me or he wasn't trying to scare me. What I wanted to do was run to my mom's room, but instead, I pulled a blanket over my head and prayed. The next morning, I told my mom about it and I remember she got this weird look on her face, but then was like, it must have been the lights from outside. You probably imagined it. Now stop scaring your sister. After that, everything was fine until about a year later, I had the worst experience. My mom had rearranged my room so that my bed was right in front of the door. One night, I was sleeping and I heard what sounded like a baby wearing a diaper crawl by. My baby brother still wore diapers, so I thought it was him. I looked out my bedroom door and didn't see anything. I checked on my baby brother and he was sound asleep in his crib. I went back into bed and started to doze off when I heard it again. I didn't feel like getting up again so I called out his name and just like that the noise stopped. Then about 10 seconds later I felt something tug on my blanket. Now remember my bed was right in front of my door so if my brother came in I would have seen him. I grabbed onto my blanket but whatever was talking started pulling on it harder. I was so scared, but I wasn't about to let whatever was pulling me on my blanket take it. That's my favorite blanket, so I laid on top of it. Then the tugging stopped. I guess I passed out because I woke up again on top of my blanket. Something had woke me up. I didn't know what though. Anyway, I had long hair and it was hanging off of my bed because of the way I was laying. All of a sudden, I felt like something was pulling my hair very gently though. Then all of a sudden, it felt like someone had started at the top of my head and put their fingers through my hair, but it didn't feel like fingers because it scratched my head. It was sharp. I know I was not imagining it either because my head jerked back since I had a lot of tangles to my hair. That was it. I ran so fast out of my room. I ran into my parents' room crying hysterically. It took them a while to calm me down. When they finally did. I told them what happened. Again, my mom told me it was my imagination. I was not imagining it. Well, I slept on their room floor for about 6 months after that. There was no way I was going to sleep in that room. That was the last time anything bad happened like that. I remember I was always freezing in my room. The rest of the house would be hot, but as soon as you would go into my room, you were freezing. No matter what time of the year it was. One day, me. My mom, my brother and sister came back from my aunt's. I was the first to walk in. My mom was right behind me and bro and sis were still getting out of the car. It was dark in the house, so I was walking to go put the light on when out of nowhere, this bright white ballish figure flew straight from the kitchen into my room. My mom saw it too because I looked at her and all she said was don't say anything. We finally moved when I was about 14. One day, my mom and I were talking about that house. And I brought up that soldier I'd seen. That's when she finally told me what happened. The street we lived on had this one gang. They were always doing drive-by shootings, fights, and cops everywhere. Anyway, a year we both moved in, I guess there had been a little shootout between the gangsters and the cops. Well, a cop was shot and he called up to my front porch to get help, but before an ambulance could get there, he died right there on the steps. My bedroom window was right next to the front porch. So it turned out that it wasn't a soldier, but it was a cop dressed in full service dress that he was buried in. I actually felt fortunate to have had him with us. I feel like he was protecting us. A lot of the kids on my street that I grew up with had been beat up bad, shot, 
join a gang, got pregnant really young, etc. Everyone except for me and my siblings, there's six of us. It was a dangerous neighborhood, but I always had this feeling when I was in that house, like I was safe and I had nothing to worry about. But at the time, I always felt like something or someone was watching me. Well, that's my story. Back in 1972, my family moved into a house on Upland Avenue in Fontana, California. The house was haunted. Just after that, the house at the other end of the street also became haunted. I'll start with the house down the street. I was friendly with the woman that lived in the house. She had a passion for gardening. The house is or was on the corner of the street. In front of two sides along both streets were two flower beds. I would see her outside caring for the flowers. I think in 1973 she died. I saw an ambulance out in front of the house one day. I just thought she got sick. Later, one of the boys that lived on the street told me that she had died. At the time, I didn't believe him because I had seen her just the day before taking care of her flowers and the ambulance had been there about a week before. The next thing that happened was one day, I was walking past the house and I saw a woman tending to the gardens out front. I stopped to say hello to her. To me, she looked just like the woman that had lived there all along. I told her I was glad that she was better. She told me that she had not been sick and that she had just moved in. I don't know if I ever saw her again. A couple of years later, a family with a boy moved into that house. In the meantime, I was still seeing the first woman from time to time. I didn't know at the time that a family had moved in. I saw the boy in the driveway playing with a ball. I told him that the woman that lived in the house would not like him playing with the gate open and she said she would be mad about it. He then told me that he lived in the house and could play in the driveway if he wanted to. I then pointed out that the woman was in the window watching him and that she looked mad at me. He then looked at the window and saw the woman turn white, started to run around to the front of the house yelling for his father. Later that year, the woman that lived next door stopped to talk to me about the house. She told me that the first woman had died years before. She also told me that all the women that lived there since 1972 had all gotten sick. She told me that she had seen the woman in the window also and she thought she was mad because the other woman kept taking out the flowers she put in. Also, the flowers were starting to grow into her yard. Later they put up a very high fence so they would not be able to see the window from their yard. Her husband, the neighbor, told me later that his wife was sick. He also wanted to know if I knew of anything that could be done about what was happening next door. Plus that, they were moving. In 1979, I told my doctor that I thought the house my mother had lived in was what made her sick. He asked me where she had been living at the time. I told him on Upland Avenue. He then asked if the house was on the corner and why he was asking me. She said that the first woman that had lived there had died of cancer and so did the next two women that lived there of the same cancer. The young mother of the boy did not die of the cancer that she got but she was still very sick because of the treatment for it. He also told me that the first owner of the house was not the first woman. He told me that the town didn't know what to do with the house as they didn't want any more women to live there because they all were getting the same cancer. I told him about the first woman and that she didn't like anyone to mess with her flowers. He did say that the town might make it into a park. I said that might work, but she would probably not like it and that others could still get sick. I have no idea what happened because I moved out of town not long after that. Even today when I still think about it, it always creeps me out. I'm 28 years old and I'm currently an honorary member of a volunteer ambulance corps in New Jersey. Honorary because after 10 years of active service, I resigned to pursue training in advanced life support as a paramedic. After four years as a paramedic, I left EMS to focus on what always has been my full-time career, a credit rep for a major electronics company. These stories have taken place over years and are not daily occurrences, and while other members have similar stories, I will not speak for them. Fortunately, I have had witness to see some of these happenings. Most of the occurrences seem to focus around the garage area of the building, where the ambulance is parked. I happen to believe a man and a woman occupy this building. 
I believe this because of the following. While watching TV alone one night, I had a strange feeling that someone was watching me. Out of the corner of my eye, standing by the door leading from the building room to the garage, I saw someone just standing there. When I looked, no one was there. This happened a couple of times over about 45 minutes and upon glancing a third time, I made out some features. It was a man in his late 30s maybe standing about 5 foot 10 with full dark hair and a mustache. I left for the night at this point. This was fall of 1992 if I'm not mistaken. In 1991, I was sitting on the couch with my girlfriend at the time watching TV again. We distinctly heard the door from the garage to the outside slam shut. It was a wooden door at the time and unmistakable with its sound. When no one entered the meeting room, we wondered what member may have come down. When no one came inside, I went into the garage to look. There wasn't anyone there, but heard the door slam once again back inside the meeting room. This continued about five times, the last time when my back was turned and standing about 12 feet away. There wasn't anyone in the garage or outside. Nicole wanted to leave pretty quickly. In the spring of 1994, I think, I was again on the couch with yet another different girlfriend. The door to the garage was propped open when we both heard the sound of footsteps coming from the garage. It sounded a little odd in the sense that it almost sounded like someone walking on leaves. Lisa had me go check and of course, I found nothing, but this continued for about a half an hour. Whenever I would reach the threshold of the garage, it would stop. When I dragged Lisa into the garage to show her that nothing or no one was there, the sound started again. We were looking directly at the spot where the sound seemed to originate. About 20 feet in front of us, we heard the footsteps walking towards us. We both left right away. In March of 1996, I was dating yet a different girl. Yeah, I got around a bit. We had thrown a surprise party for my father. Jen was really tired after working a double shift the night before. She's a nurse as well as Lisa. After the party, I was finishing cleaning up when I jokingly said welcome to the haunted building. She freaked a little and went to leave immediately. This surprised me a bit because I didn't relay any of these stories to her. When we got outside, she told me that while she was zoning out, she noticed a man and a woman standing near the door to the garage. She said that the man was in his early 40s with dark hair and a mustache. She couldn't make out the woman because her back was turned. She noticed them because they seemed out of place to her. My cousin snapped her out of the zone and the couple disappeared. She didn't see them again, and nobody at the party fit this man's description. As I walked into the building through the back door one evening, I heard as plain as day a woman speaking. I simply thought someone left the TV on. When I stepped over the threshold, the voice stopped, and the TV wasn't on, nor anyone was in the room. There was no remote to the TV, so nobody could have turned it off from afar. I walked across the room to the garage. When I walked through the door, I noticed two friends, Patty and Allison, standing outside near the door. Looking rather shaken, I asked them what was wrong. They said they both heard a man's voice distinctly say Allison, twice, only moments before. They accused me of playing trick on them, although I did not. This was the summer of 1996. I have heard conversations take place in the garage a couple of times when no one was around. I can never make out what was being said but it did sound like a male and female. Whenever I would walk into the garage, it would stop. Additionally, there have been instances when the light on the phone would blink on and off as if someone was picking up and hanging up the receiver in another room. This happened when either nobody was present or anyone was present in the meeting room together. This of course could have been an electrical problem, but who knows. Thanks for listening to my story. This is less of a haunting and more of a notice that a friend is not completely gone from me. Back in May of 97, my husband's, then my fiance's, mother died. In April of that year, on his birthday, she had an artery bypass surgery of her leg. Unfortunately, soon after she came home, the site at the top of her leg where the graft started opened up and bled. That time, she survived. The wound wouldn't heal and it had gotten infected. In May, hemorrhaged again. This time, it was so fast that in less than five minutes, 
she could not speak or respond to my husband next to her. The EMS got there just as I had gotten downstairs. She started to go into coronary arrest in the ambulance in front of the house. I had to drive myself to the hospital. Not too long. We got the word that she had died. Both of us were in shock. She was only 69. I thought it was so unfair. I loved her very much and had only known her for about a year. She was always so good to me, a very good friend and mother to be in law. It just wasn't fair. Now, so you know, I am an atheist. I have a very hard time when loved ones die because I don't believe that I will see them again. But every time something happens, I kind of look to God for solace. Somehow, my faith returns, if only to get me through a difficult time to which I cannot control. I pray to her, hoping she would hear me if there is a place for those who have passed on. I asked her to give me a sign, if she was okay and if there was another sign. One night, I was alone in my bedroom. Since I am an artist, I thought that making the thank you notes for her funeral would be a good tribute to her memory. As I was sitting there, I said out loud, Rose, I'm making your cards, what do you think of them? At that moment, I hear a noise from the stairs that traveled into the room to the wall next to where I sat. I didn't feel scared. I'm a scaredy cat by nature, just happy. Then, just as the sound ended, a puff of cold gentle air hit my back. Okay, so I had the air conditioner on and that is behind me to my right. So I sat still waiting for yet another increase in air movement, never happened. Now this house is very creaky and noisy. But I have never before or since heard this traveling sound. Well, I had to go to work for the next week. While in the car, I asked Rose to once again give me a sign. The other one wasn't too convincing. I had to be sure. One of my husband's friends told us a hilarious story about the first time he met Rose. She was a short second, generation Italian American. She was cooking dinner when he came over. He told us that he went to say hi to her when she looked up at him with fish in both hands and said schmelz. She was basically asking if he wanted smelts for dinner, but the friend exaggerated it in his telling. He told me about that while she was still alive. While in the car, I noticed that I had not turned on the radio yet. That is rare. It goes on right after the engine. I turned it on. ADJ said schmelz exactly the way the friend did, that everyone on the station laughed. I did not catch the ending of a word. It was start and finish. They were indeed talking about smelts. Now, I didn't convert, though I do think more of her as being alive somewhere else. What I don't understand is why this is only with her and not with my grandmother who died the year before or my husband's father who died two weeks before our wedding. By the way, my wedding gown is cursed. The day before Rose died, I bought it and showed it to her. The day I tried it on for a fitting after my bridal shower, Joe, my husband dad goes into the hospital never to come home again. The day of my husband's bachelor party, Joe dies in a nursing home close to my final fitting. Not too long after my wedding, my dear seamstress was battling cancer died. That was the last dress she worked on. I don't believe in curses, but this one takes the cake. Just so you know, I'm hearing a number of bumps that normally don't occur here, so maybe I'll stop now. I'm starting to get freaked out. I've been a reader of the Shadowlands for quite a while. This is a story that my people of the Keskadena First Nation in the southeastern part of the Yukon experienced. They experienced spirits that can imitate people, animals, and even vehicles sometimes. These are called Frozen Voice or Gitsi in the Kaska language. As I was growing up, I've heard many stories concerning the Frozen Voice. These spirits can imitate a person that you know, or an animal, and even machinery. Well, the interesting part is a person could not see these spirits, but animals can. This story was a while back, and thinking about it again sends shivers up my spine. Well, my cousin was traveling to Watson Lake from Ross River, and their vehicle broke down late at night, so they decided to stay at this abandoned cabin nearby. As they were getting ready to sleep, they could hear voices inside the cabin which sounded like a dog walking around with long nails. It also sounded like it was bumping into things, like a pop can in the darkness within the cabin. My cousins quickly turned on the flashlight to scan around the room, hoping to find what was causing the noise. 
Yet, he could not see what was happening, but the noise continued. My cousin's father knew about what was going on and told him to just ignore it. The spirits can sense fear and will get even worse. That's how my cousin was feeling and getting more scared, and that is when they started to hear noises going up and down the stovepipe, like a squirrel. The scary thing was that the stove was going at the time, and you could see the redness from the fire inside. My cousin's father knew that his son was getting freaked out by this and tried his best to calm him down, but it wasn't doing him any good. Later in the night, the frozen voice was in full force as it was feeding off of my cousin's fear. Then all of a sudden, it stops for about 20 minutes or so. Then without any warning, my cousin and his father heard something that they weren't ready for. A loud cry of a newborn baby underneath their cot. That is when they had enough and left the cabin without looking back. My grandfather said a long time ago, they used to kill people and said that they could see a person get torn to pieces in front of them. But this was a long time ago when Sagigi, a good person, was a person with good medicine that made them stop. To this day, there are many places that these spirits reside. I was told to never speak of the spirit because if a person talks about it, it will come and bother you as well and not to make loud noises in the wilderness as well. If you are interested in this story, I have many other stories that I would be gladly to tell. I have never seen a ghost, but have felt the presence of one a few times. It is at my stepbrother's house. I went there because my dad was taking my stepmom out. When I got there, we were messing around for a bit. Then we sat down to watch TV when we heard banging in the bedroom above like a ball bouncing. We experimented with a ball and found the sound was just like that. I was scared and the room was freezing cold, not because of the ghost, because she forgot gas and couldn't get it anywhere. The next time I went it was worse. It sounded like someone had opened the door, ran upstairs and slammed the door shut again. We both went into the kitchen and the kitchen door was not open and was no longer locked. I went again, and this time, the telly kept turning on and off, and the volume kept going up and down and off altogether. Then we heard shuffling in the kitchen like someone was messing about in the cupboards, but again, no one was there. That night, I slept over the night, but was so scared we slept in the same bed. Then, in the middle of the night, her dog was waking up staring at a spot in the room. Then the banging started again. I have to truly say that this was a truly horrifying experience and I would never want to experience it again. Even though it seems innocent, it was truly terrifying to me. Me and a group of friends went to a small college up in the mountains of Pennsylvania called Manfields University. At night, there was nothing to do. So we would sometimes drive a half hour or so to random graveyards in the middle of nowhere. One night, we drove up to a graveyard, which I think is west of Mansfield. We had been to that graveyard before, so we were familiar with the surroundings and the sounds and phenomena that could take place there. That night, there were a bunch of people who just went along because they were bored and my friend Dan and Dave, the leaders of the group, believed in ghosts but didn't really get scared about anything. Dave had an EMF detector. We were out in the middle of nowhere, and that night, there were no EMF alerts from it at all. Some of the people we were with, mainly one girl, was very disrespectful. And while we were there, the EMF detector started going off with strong readings. And right about that time, we heard a growl, or shaking, or both, coming from the graveyard. Needless to say, the people that usually weren't scared ran to the cars along with me and my girlfriend and we drove away as fast as we could. It turned out later that we found out that the disrespectful girl couldn't hold her bladder and went to the bathroom in the graveyard. I think the spirits didn't like that and that's why it happened. It was the freakiest night of our lives. We went back to that cemetery again and nothing happened because unlike that girl, we are always respectful of the spirits. I just wanted to relate this story to you and see if you've encountered anything similar. Thanks for listening.
I was raised by my grandparents in a very small town north of Marshall, Texas. At the time of my grandmother's death, I was engaged to a man that I'd been dating for a few years. Obviously, she had known him. In October 1999, two and one half years after her death, my fiance and I split up and I started dating another man. He moved in with me in the house I grew up in with my grandparents. About a month into the relationship, he was sitting in our living room watching television. He saw me walk by the doorway into the kitchen and asked me to get him a drink. When I did not respond, he asked again. Once again, with no response, he got up to see why I was ignoring him. To his surprise, the kitchen was completely empty. He figured I left the room without him noticing. He came to the bedroom where I was folding laundry and asked why I didn't answer him when he was talking to me earlier. I told him that I had been in the bedroom the entire time and had no clue as to what he was referring to. He asked if I had changed clothes as well. When I said no, he became a little edgy. He told me he saw me walk by him to the kitchen. Then I said I was wearing a green t-shirt and white shorts. He also thought my hair was pulled back because it seemed short. What he was describing to me was how my grandmother usually dressed when she was alive. She had short hair and she always sat at the kitchen table to read while my grandfather watched television in the living room. I told him this and he got a little nervous. About a week later, he was coming out of the bathroom and heard his name being called from what used to be my grandmother's bedroom. I only used this room as storage. I couldn't yet bring myself to use the room. He opened the door, thinking I was in there going through the boxes and needing his help. Once again, there was no one in the room. He slammed the door and came running into the kitchen where I was. He told me he loved me, but my grandmother was really scaring him. There were instances of us misplacing the car keys and the like. I thought long and hard about the things that were happening and came to a conclusion. I figured that since my grandmother never got to meet my new boyfriend, this was her way of testing him to see if he was going to be a good match for me. I had experience with a friendly ghost for about 12 years. I grew up in a small city in Michigan. My parents bought their first house in the mid-1970s. It was a bungalow built in the 1950s. Sometime around 1979, may have been earlier than that, the ghost first appeared to my mom during the night in my parents' bedroom. The ghost was a man in his 30s. My mom was the only one who have ever seen the ghost. My dad and I did not believe her at first, although I would hear what sounded like someone walking around upstairs and going up and down the steps I never thought much of it. My mom would not tell anyone about the ghost because she thought people would think she was weird. The ghost would put different items in different places or she would not be able to find an item for a long time and then suddenly it would pop up where it was supposed to be. The ghost would go to work with my mom. She owned a hair salon and when she was there alone, the hangers on the coat rack in front of the salon would move like someone was playing with them. When I got to be a teenager in the 80s, I began to realize the ghost was real. I would hear him walking around upstairs and going up and down the steps. I always felt the ghost was around. It was like I could feel his presence. I was never afraid of him. My mom was making cookies in the kitchen early one morning and he appeared in the dining room and she would ask him to go away and he would leave. She came with us on vacation one year. When we went to Niagara Falls, he would turn on the motel room lights in the middle of the night while we were sleeping and turn on the radio in the room. For the longest time though, my mom was the only one who had seen him. Finally, around 1991, when I was 21 years old, the ghost woke me up one morning. It was about 7.30 a.m. and I woke up to something touching my face. I opened my eyes and the ghost was at the side of my bed and he had touched my face. My bedroom was now in my parents' old room, where my mom had seen the first ghost. I was really excited that I finally got to see the ghost. He only stayed a few minutes, like he was just curious as to who I was. He was probably in his 30s, and he was wearing a hat and had a mustache. He was always with us the entire time we lived in that house. I moved out in 1993, and then my parents had a new home built in 1995 
Since then, we have not experienced any more ghosts. I do not know who lived in the house before us, but I did hear that many years before we lived in that house, that a young man who lived in the house next door was working on his roof and fell off the ladder into what would be our backyard and died. So I'm thinking that maybe that is who the ghost is. He was never mean and never scared us on purpose. It was kind of like he was hanging around to be a part of the family or something. I always wonder if he is still in my old house. My parents bought some underdeveloped land in the country, in southern Texas in the mid-1970s, and built a three-story house, two above ground, one below. Not far away from the land is a small cemetery. It contained a few infants and one older person's headstones. I guess I'm the first to experience our friendly ghost. While up late at night reading, I heard some cabinets in the kitchen right down the hall open and close, but couldn't see the kitchen light on under my door. I immediately got up and went into the kitchen and turned on the light. No one was there, and after talking to my family the next day, no one had gotten up in the middle of the night. My parents' room was above mine, so I always heard when they walked across the room and down the stairs and my brother's room was right across the hall. I'd have run into one of them when they had been up. My family started teasing me about hearing things. My next experience was when I was home alone. I was in the living room reading. The couch was against the wall with the stairwell going up. All of a sudden, I heard steps coming down the stairs. I was so terrified. I slowly looked up, expecting to see a hand on the handrail. Getting up my nerve, I walked up to the front of the stairs and no one was there. My father claimed for years that I was just hearing the walls creak. I'd lived in the house for a long enough time to tell the difference in wall creaking and stair walking. My family continued to tease me until the day of my brother's experience. They were alone in the house, downstairs playing pool. They heard the front door open and close and heard someone walking into the kitchen above them. They hollered at my dad, whom they thought it was, when he didn't respond. They looked at each other and walked upstairs to the first floor. The front door was still locked and there was no one in the house. Since that time, my mother has heard several things. My father has heard a gonging in the house, something you just don't hear out there in many instances. My parents have both felt someone kneeling on the foot of their bed while they were in bed and not asleep. When the light was turned on, no one was there. Now they don't tease me anymore. We just joke about Casper, our friendly ghost. We've never seen him or her, but we have heard plenty of noises he or she makes. Anytime I'm visiting now and am there alone, I always walk in with a greeting, hello Casper, I'm home. As the home was built by my parents, and we don't really know the history of the land, we've no idea who it could be. Hi, I have an experience I would like to share, and perhaps get some answers to my questions. Three of us went to check out the Amity Hall Inn, listed in your Pennsylvanian hauntings directory two adults and one teen. We didn't intend to enter the building or take any photos. We just turned around in the parking lot and shined the car lights on it. We didn't see anything there, but we smelled a freshly opened can of coffee and an odd smell, like a decaying smell. We were only there for about five to 10 minutes and left. We proceeded back on the highway to Lewingstown, Pennsylvania. About three to five minutes after leaving the inn, we saw a bright light flash in the passenger side of the window, but there was no cars on the highway at that time. Almost immediately after that, I saw a hand appear from my rear bumper as if to grab something and tag along. I was startled and then saw an old man's face floating in my back seat. I was crying and closed my eyes in hopes it would all go away. I calmed down and we drove a little more. Another bright light directly in front of us zoomed up and flew over the top of the car. We heard something let loose from the car and sounded like a large rock hit the bottom rear end. We continued driving and felt like our hair was full of static, like after a balloon is rubbed on your head. There were tingly sensations all around. It lasted almost the whole trip home. We pulled in at our local 24-hour grocery store and checked out the rear end and passenger side of the car. My hubcap looked like someone put an out-of-body grinder against it, 
we found some scratches on the paint and a small handprint on the rear passenger window. The handprint was made from the outside, so it was not made by the teen in the car because no one of us got out of the car until we got to the supermarket. I've had many ghostly experiences, like ghosts following you house to house, but never one that tagged along on a moving car. Can anyone please tell me what may have happened and why? Thanks for reading. Hello. I believe I've been sensitive to ghosts since I was a child. I grew up in a rather odd family. Seances, tarot card readings, tales of the afterlife, etc. I was taught to believe what I saw and felt. So here is a story that truly occurred back in 1988 in Riverside County, California. I was living in a domestic violence shelter in an old home built about 1880. One night, all of us women were watching movies downstairs, and the restroom downstairs was busy, so I went upstairs in the dark to use the other restroom. Well, there at the top of the stairs was a latching gate that was to remain locked at all times because of the small children. Well, I latched the gate and ran to the restroom and proceeded to park myself on the toilet with the bathroom door open onto the landing. As I was sitting there, looking into the landing and hallway, I saw the figure of an elderly woman in period clothes from the 1800s walk over and latch the gate that I had just left undone. I was intrigued and remained calm, just watching. She then turned to me and smiled, then just disappeared. So I went downstairs. I asked the counselor if I could have a moment of her time, and I relayed what I had just seen to her. She said that yes, the house was haunted by an elderly couple whom they believed to be the original builders and owners of the home. She said that yes, she hoped I would keep this to myself. She did not want the others to be frightened, but she said that many people had seen the ghosts and they all felt they were benign and only watching out for the children. The other thing that occurred here was that my three-year-old son began talking and playing with someone I could not see, but to him, this child was very real. My son would sit out in the backyard apparently talking to himself, entertaining himself. The counselors even remarked how well he played by himself for his age, but upon closer examination and observation and listening, I began to think he could see something. So I asked him on one day, who was he talking to? And he said, my friend. I said, where is your friend? And my son said, you can't see him? He's right there. So I proceeded to ask my son other questions and he was adamant his friend was there. So, this leads to a question that I have. Once we moved into our own apartment, my son insisted that his friend had come with us. He had me set a place at the table for him, and he was always talking to someone. Is it possible that this little ghost followed us to our new home? This took place about a year and a half, then he was just gone. To this day, my son, who is 20 years old now and in the army, he still tells me his friend was real, at least to him. I just wanted to share this, maybe get a little feedback. In June 2000, my husband and I moved into the treehouse apartments in Conroe. I was four months pregnant with our first child and really excited to move into a two bedroom place. We had the time of our lives decorating the nursery. I started noticing strange things about three weeks after we moved in. I was taking my afternoon nap while my husband was at work when I suddenly awoke to find a child calling for mom. The sound was coming from the nursery. I opened the door to find nothing out of the ordinary and just dismissed it as our downstairs neighbors. The thing was, it happened at 1 p.m. The children downstairs were still in school. We had a kitten at the time and he acted as cats do. After that incident, he began to act very strange. He would hide under the furniture of whichever room he was in. I had to start feeding him under our bed. We didn't have a washer and a dryer, so we took our laundry to my in-law's house and stayed the night. When we returned the next day, our television was on. This was strange because the television was plugged into an outlet that was controlled by a switch. We left the switch off. When turned on, the TV automatically came on to channel 3. You had to turn it to channel 4 to get the cable box to work. Also, the channel on the cable box had been changed. 
No one else, older than the apartment complex, had a key to our apartment, so it was really strange that this had occurred. We never saw anything like a ghost in the apartment, it was just those two incidents. After that, I had to put the litter box under our bed as well. My poor kitty would not leave the security of under the bed. One night, while we were sleeping, my cat jumped up onto the bed with us, yowling loudly. We could not get him calm and he refused to come out from under the covers. We moved by the end of the week. I've had a few encounters with what I considered to be ghosts, but this was by far the scariest. In June 2001, my husband, son and I moved into Bay Harbor Apartments in Baytown. The week before we came, there was a shootout between the police and a resident and that apartment was still boarded up and had many visible bullet holes in it. Our apartment was a few buildings over, closer to the back of the complex. A couple of months after we moved in, we started noticing things in our son's room. He was one at the time and still slept in a crib. The crib still had a mobile and a toy that played songs and lit up when he rolled the bar at the bottom of it. John and I were up watching TV one night when we heard the toy start playing. We went in to see if the son was awake and he was sound asleep. We just shrugged it off and went to bed. This same thing happened the very next night and again, he was asleep. We decided to put his crib in our room. It didn't happen again. We eventually took the crib down and put him in a toddler bed. We put him down for the night and had left our door open to hear him if he woke up or was getting into anything. I suddenly had an irresistible urge to check on him. I did not hear any sound coming from our room, but there was a weird odor in the air. As I came around the corner into the doorway, I saw my son standing against the wall. We had a very heavy lamp on the right side table between our beds. The lamp was laying in the middle of the toddler bed on its side. The bulb had burned through the shade and was beginning to burn the top sheet of my son's covers. There was no possible way the lamp had fallen or been knocked over and landed in that way on his bed. It was equally as impossible for him to have picked it up and put it there himself. I removed the lamp from the room and our son began sleeping in bed with us. I had his old room set up as a playroom and he would stay in there all day long. One morning, he fell asleep on the couch and I left him there for his nap. I was making my rounds in the apartment, doing my daily cleaning. When I finished his playroom, I shut the door behind me. There was no person or animal in that room when I left. My son's great grandfather bought him a toy that had a motion sensor in it. When it was activated, the toy would whistle and say I love you. As I was in the kitchen washing dishes, I heard it go off. Thinking my son was awake, I opened the bedroom door. I saw nothing. I shut the door again and went to check on my son. He was still asleep on the couch. During the course of his one hour nap, the toy continuously went off. I went into the room, grabbed the toy and changed the batteries. I thought this would solve the problem. It did not. I finally took the batteries out and removed the box entirely so that there would be no way it would come to life again. The majority of toys that he played with were moved into the living room. No one ever really went into that room again. I remember what happened before we moved in and I went to ask the management if anything similar had occurred in our apartment. I was told that management had recently changed and the current people had no record of anything happening there. We stayed until our leave was up. And then we got the heck out of Dodge, our lease ending permanently after that. Hello, I thought this experience was worth sharing as it freaked the hell out of me and a few people I've shared it with. I was 19 at the time and me and my best friend Sally had just moved into a flat in an old dilapidated building block of flats. The flat was a bit run down but we were really excited about redoing it and we were so happy to have a place of our own at last. It was the middle of July, so we weren't thinking of school yet. Sally was working at her day job at the local department store. I was alone relaxing with a cup of coffee in front of the TV in my bedroom. Despite the hot day outside, I found myself shivering. An intense cold air had filled the room. Suddenly, the end of my bed sank as if someone had sat down beside me. I was really freaked out and ran for the main room. 
It was warm again, and I was filled with relief. I didn't tell Sally because I didn't want to sound stupid. This happened at least a dozen times in the next week. I was so sick of it. I even thought about calling an exorcist, but I knew that I didn't have much to tell him. One night, I woke up to find an old man sitting on the bottom of my bed looking at me. I tried to scream, but nothing came out. Eventually he disappeared. This happened several nights in a row. I was so freaked out, I knew that there was only one man for the job, the retired priest that lived down the road. The next evening, when Sally was out, I called the priest and he arrived at once. He entered my room and immediately detected an entity. He lit a circle of candles and placed them on the floor. He called on the spirits and I suddenly realized I did not want to witness the exorcism. I waited in the living room until about 15 minutes later. I heard the priest giggling and talking softly. I didn't know what to do, so I waited until about 10 minutes later when the priest emerged. He said it's going to take a lot longer than expected and that he will return this time next week. This went on for the next two months until I finally asked the priest what was going on. I demanded to know. I've been afraid to sleep for the past eight weeks, for God's sakes. He finally expressed and told me he had been having an intimate relationship with my ghost. I couldn't believe it. I told him I wanted him and the ghost out, now. He reluctantly agreed and entered my room. He spoke gently and said, come on now, Albert, it's time to go. By the way, I've got a spacious bedroom and a double bed. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. The priest turned to me and said, okay, he has agreed to leave with me. Sorry for your trouble. As the priest bent down to pick up his candles, as he was doing that, I noticed the most disturbing thing that I ever seen in a paranormal event ever. His voice changed to really dark, deep, and sinister, and he said, I will be leaving myself out of this place soon, and I'm taking my friend with me. I then froze. I didn't know what to believe, or even if that was coming out of his voice. I said, what did you just say? And he returned to normal. To this day, I can't really explain what that voice was, or if it was the entity that possessed him, but I know that was really strange, and he acted like as if it was nothing after that, like nothing ever happened. The story I'm writing to you involves myself, and many other people as witnesses. There were many events that took place in the same old brick farmhouse outside of Black Earth, Wisconsin. The first story is one that I will never forget. It was late in the evening on a summer night. My friends and I were playing a game in the old farmhouse. Beth, the girl who was living in the house at the time, decided to go to bed. She went upstairs alone and the rest of us just sat around talking. Moments later, I heard the most blood curdling scream ever and immediately after the scream, the wind chime inside the house chimed. Bridget, another friend, ran up to see what was wrong. They both came back downstairs and Beth told us what happened. She told us that she was laying in bed and she saw the shadow of a man in her doorway. She called out John, that is her brother's name, who also lived in the house, and there was no response. She said that she thought it was her brother and turned over to go to sleep. Then, what happened next gave chills down my spine and I felt very uncomfortable. Beth said that she felt someone crawl into bed with her and she was frozen. When she reached over, she said she could feel someone laying next to her. She tried to speak, but nothing would come out. My sister lived in the same room for a while. She said she never saw anyone in her room. She did, however, notice imprints in her mattress as if someone had been sitting there. She also saw a man with his head bent down in an old car on the property. One other night, my sister, a friend named Scott and myself were having a few beers and Scott asked to use the bathroom. We told him it was at the top of the stairs, so he relieved himself and came back down and told my sister that she left her curling iron on, but that he turned it off. A little later, my sister went to use the bathroom and returned and said that Scott must have not turned off the curling iron because it was on when she went in there. We didn't think much of it, but when my sister went to the bathroom again, it was turned back on. No one else was in the bathroom between her visits, and no one else was in the house.
In May 2001, I got a job working as a dispatcher for a cab company. Adjacent to our office was this garage, and it was 10,000 square feet. This company also had charter buses. When I first started working there, the owner told me I might hear weird noises. And growing up, my father was a truck driver, so I was aware of the air brakes, ticks, etc. But I didn't expect what was adding to the noises in the garage. This would be my third ghost experience. It all started on the third night I worked there. My boyfriend had called me on the phone when all of a sudden, there was this loud banging noise coming from the garage. So loud, I could barely hear him on the phone. I was working midnights, so he came up there. By the time he got there, the noise had stopped. We hung out there in about midnight. My boyfriend went to go lay down in the garage. There was a front bed just outside the office door. He was out there about two hours. Then he came into the office in a tad bit of a hurry and sat down. The look on his face was a Kodak moment. He asked if I had just tried to wake him up, and I told him no. He said he was lying there, and someone kept saying hello. Then he said he sat up to put his shoes on, and the voice was right up in his face and sternly said hello. Also at that time, a driver had called me and asked if he had jumper cables. I asked my boyfriend to go look. He wouldn't go out into the garage till I went in and turned on the lights. Then he told me what happened, and I was just like, wow, too cool. Then in the days after this, I started experiencing my own little visits from now who we called Casper. It was weird. I could get out in the garage and sit by myself. I could actually feel the energy moving, like a sweeping around the room. Then he would go and knock on things. His best one was turning on the air compressor. It was unplugged. Then one day Casper must have gotten upset about something. He started being on the garage overhead doors, and my boyfriend and my son and myself were in there. Between the two overhead doors was a regular door. When the beating started, my boyfriend went out the regular door, because he really thought someone was out there, and he opened the door, and no one was there, but the beating continued. After that I was working one night, and one of the bus drivers came in. We were sitting in there talking and watching TV. Then all of a sudden, the channel changed. The driver asked why I changed it, and I said I didn't. The remote was next to the TV. I got up and changed the channel back. A few minutes later, it was changed once again. This went on for an hour. That's when the driver told me that he believed there was a ghost. I was convinced already. Me and my boyfriend used to sleep in the garage when things got quiet. Of course, as you guessed, Casper was there with us. Back in the corner of our garage was a portable basketball net, and we would go out and shoot hoops. Then one day, the basketball vanished. We couldn't find it anywhere. About two weeks later, at about 6.30 a.m., me, my boyfriend, and two other drivers were sitting in the office talking. The door from the office to the garage was open. We were sitting there, and we were starting to hear a basketball bouncing. Me and my boyfriend looked at each other, and we were like, what the fuck? So we ran out there, and the bouncing stopped, and no basketball was anywhere to be found. The other two drivers heard it too. Then one night, my boyfriend and I were sitting in the office. We were asked not to smoke in the office, so we would go out in the garage. I was on the phone. I saw my boyfriend grab a cigarette and go into the garage. When I got off the phone, I went out there to join him, but when I got out there, he wasn't there. Above the office was rafters used as a storage space. I sat in the chair. I heard someone walking around up there, and I kept calling for my boyfriend, but he didn't answer me. I thought he was trying to scare me. I kept calling up to him, and then he came walking out of the bathroom. I told him to listen. There was someone in the rafters. He started to go up there. He got about two stairs up and Casper ran across the ceiling of the garage. I mean, we followed the sound with our eyes. Then we looked at each other and ran back in the office. There were so many other occurrences that I could be up all night here, but that's my story and I'm sticking to it. I quit that job at the end of summer. When I was born, I had a twin sister. She died shortly after we were born. My mom and dad didn't talk about her much, but I always knew that she was my sister and that she had died. In fact, I remember talking to her all the time. I don't remember talking back, but my mother told me a story that suggests that she did. 
I think I was three or four at the time. Mom heard me talking to someone in the bedroom, so she came in and asked me who I was talking with, and I said Mindy, my twin. Mom wanted to know what we were talking about, so she asked what we had been talking about. I guess it was around our birthday, because I told mom that Mindy wanted a birthday present. As long as I can remember, we had plastic toys put on our grave on our birthday, but I never knew why. When mom told me the story, it explained quite a bit. Just over two years ago, my darling dad died from two cancers. When he finally died, my sister, mother, and I were there holding him as he left his life. The hospital window was filled with sunlight, the radio was playing a classical piece, and my father died the way he should, with family holding him close and not leaving him to die in the sterile hospital environment where most die unseen and alone. Dad was a Roman Catholic, but one who had lost his faith and truly believed that after death, there was nothing. My family of three had spent four days and nights in South End Hospital, Essex, England, hearing the rasping breathing and waiting for my dad to go. When we finally returned to my mother's house, we were, naturally, talking of what had occurred. Exhausted and drained, my sister joked about how dad may come back as an angel. We didn't believe in those. We're British after all. At that moment, a large, white feather came floating past the French windows and landed, oh so gently, upon the patio. We just looked at each other and said, oh. Since then, my non-believing father has come through to my ex-partner in a dream. For his treatment of my daughter and myself, he has been seen walking in South High Street. He has helped me above my shoulders after my heart attack. I was only 41 at the time, and when I was recovering, I asked him to be there if I died. At the anniversary of his death, my daughter saw a white feather and felt the presence of her granddad. This was only after she realized the significance of the date. My most previous partner heard my dad telling him to lay off, even though he had never met him. This man was a total non-believer, just like my dad. As a woman who has the shadow of the Grim Reaper's blade above her head, it has strengthened my belief that there is life after death. That when I do have that massive heart attack and leave this earth, there will be someone waiting for me. I might be in trouble with my dad, but at least it will pass the time to be lectured and hugged while I make my way to the next place. Thank you for reading. One of the haunted places I've experienced is Route 24, between Jacksonville, North Carolina and Swansboro, North Carolina. On Christmas Day of 1997, my buddy, Roger, and I, we're driving back to our motel room in Jacksonville after spending Christmas Day with his parents in Swansboro. It was 10 p.m. and Route 26 had light traffic. As we approached the area around Hubbard, we both heard the sound of a two-stroke engine coming up from behind us. We assumed it was a motorcycle. I looked in the rearview mirror and saw no headlight for a cycle behind me. The buzz of the two-stroke engine became louder and louder and seemed to be overhead. We both looked and saw nothing. Soon the buzz seemed to be on top of the cab of the truck, causing it to vibrate fiercely. We were both sure something was going to crash down on the cab of the truck. The roar of the mystery engine was deafening. Suddenly, the sound seemed to pass in front of the truck and vanish. We saw nothing at all. The sound was from outside the truck and not inside the truck or from the engine area. Another strange encounter on Route 26 in the vicinity of Hubbard happened in July of 1998. Roger and I were up for a visit to his parents' house and were returning to our motel room in Jacksonville at about 7 p.m. I noticed that the flat road seemed to be going downward, like descending a hill. The oncoming cars appeared to be going uphill. I thought that maybe I was seeing things, but Roger said he noticed the same phenomenon. We traveled the road other times and never had this happen again. Could Route 24 be a haunted highway? I don't know. It was Christmas time just before my 18th birthday. Me and a couple friends decided it would be a laugh to do the Ouija board. It all started off okay. We were pushing the glass around to freak each other out. A few hours later, we stopped playing, but the glass didn't. It kept moving. We were all in shock. I ended up tipping the board just to stop it. From that day on, I've seen this face in the wall. It is not human. It looks pure evil. I can only describe it as a beast, 
like it has moved from wall to window to mirror and keeps threatening me. It chants its screams at me. It told me its name, but I refuse to say it or even write it down. As I've read, if you take notice of it, it gets stronger, and I don't want to invite it in. I no longer have any mirrors in the house, but it has started visiting my dreams. I am alone in a room when it appears and tells me that I am its meal. It will have me and won't rest until it has gotten me. I am 25 now, so this has been going on for a while. I am scared it will go after my children as my oldest won't sleep in a room and is too scared to tell me why. I have always had an obsession with the strange and paranormal and also a fear with some. I had a miscarriage on Christmas 2011 lost a baby girl. A year later, I found out I was pregnant again. I remember one night, I had a dream a little girl with brown hair and glowing green eyes came to me. I was floating above my body, watching her play with my hair. She looked no older than six. She then whispered to my ear, I'm ready to be born mommy. Then she looked up at myself floating. Then I woke up. This past July 5th, I gave birth to a baby girl. At birth, she had bright green eyes. Then, they went yellow and looked like a cat. She is almost two weeks old, and her eyes are black, and the white part is dark gray and gets darker every day. She does not laugh or cry or anything. In fact, she's actually a good baby. She sleeps seven plus hours at the time. She is developing very fast. Doctor says she sees very well out of her eyes. It's just strange. I don't fear her. I just think it's weird how her eyes did that. Thank you for reading my short story, and I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. I'm not one of those whose beliefs are for or against the paranormal. During the time of the event I will tell you about, I was your normal freshman in college in Oklahoma. Anyway, myself and three other fraternity brothers were looking for a house to rent in Ada, Oklahoma when we found this great house not far from the college but still pretty isolated. It was a two story brick house with four large bedrooms. It had been empty for several years which should have been our first clue that something is wrong but we were young and cash is cash. We asked the retailer if there was something wrong with the property and why was the rent so cheap in college town but got no straight answer. Regardless, we took the deal and moved in. I and Skip took the rooms upstairs while Randy and Alvin moved downstairs. Nothing much happened at first. Nothing that we took is remarkable. For one thing, the front door, made of heavy wood and very difficult to open or close, would sometimes just open, stand open for a moment, then close. We would laugh it off, even though one of our roommates worked as a carpenter and would examine the door and say that it was not possible to do that on its own. After one of these incidents, he went over to the door and tried to open it and had a difficult time opening it like always. He looked it over very close as it said he had warped with time and would always be hard to open and close without planing the ends off. Soon after, some other things began to occur. All of us, at one time or another, had seen a small ball of light go from the bottom of the stairs to the second floor. Still, we thought this was odd but not something to be concerned about. Being in college, we figured it was a reflection from one source light causing this and that was kind of cool. This is when things started to get very strange. One night, we were all in the living room watching a football game on TV when a loud noise started coming from the wall separating the living room from the kitchen. It was a banging noise like someone was hitting the wall. The strikes were so strong that our flat crest hanging on that wall was bouncing off of the wall. We all got up and ran to the kitchen figuring we would find someone playing a trick on us, but when we got there, found no one. The banging continued for only a few minutes, then stopped. Alvin, the carpenter, said it was from some pipes in the wall causing it, and we had better all tell the landlord. The next day we called them and we were told that there were no pipes in the walls. This still was nothing more than a strange event to us, but we did start to compare notes about things that happened in the house. One thing was that in my room upstairs, you could not keep the window closed. These were old wooden windows, hard to open or close. My window was open about an inch the day I moved in, and with great effort, I closed it, only to find the next morning it would be back open to the same place. This got a bit uncomfortable because it was winter. Each night, I would close the window 
and the next morning it would be open. I got very angry with my roommates about this and asked them to stay out of my room, but they each denied opening the windows or even being in my room. Finally, I figured the window was warping during the night. That is why it opens, so I put a cut-off broom handle wedged at the top. The next morning, the window was open again, and the broom handle was sitting propped up near the door, 12 feet away. It gave me chills, but decided just to leave it be. As I told my story, my upstairs roommate reminded me about his room, although exactly the same as mine. No matter how many lights or stronger watt bulbs we put in there, it would never lose the darkness. Not enough to be able to see, but not enough to read. Our other roommates told me some other stories, but you get the gist. As things progressed, we noticed some other changes in the house. For one thing, some girls would not even go into our house. Now I know what you're thinking. No, we were popular and had girlfriends and such, plus had some great parties. Yet, some girls would not even go into the house. As soon as they got to the door, they said they just could not go in. A couple even broke into tears at the thought of entering the house. When asked why, they could not give any answers. All they could say was that they were not going to the house ever. This is getting a bit longer than I expected, so I guess I'll cut to the chase. I have not thought about this in 30 years, and it's still going to give me the creeps. Anyway, things were happening, and Alvin and Randy were ready to move out. Randy's girlfriend was one of those that could not come into the house. It was Christmas time and our house was pretty dressed up for a bunch of guys. Big tree with too much decorations, and the Xmas presents would be taken home to our families in a few days under the tree. Nothing remarkable happened this night. As a matter of fact, it was particularly quiet. We had all went to bed about 2 a.m., and nothing woke us till morning, when I heard Randy yelling from downstairs. It was about 7 a.m. We thought maybe the house was on fire or worse, but when we got downstairs, the look on his face was scary. There, in the middle of our large living room, was our tree with all the tinsel and trimming stripped off of it. All the presents, all the furniture, all the dishware, every stitch of clothing we all owned, everything piled in a heap that reached the ceiling. Sixteen feet of ceiling, I might add. In the haste to get downstairs, none of us had noticed that everything in our rooms had been removed as we slept. After a few minutes of just staring at the site in our living room, we checked the house from top to bottom. Everything we had brought into the house was there. Everything. This was it for a couple of the guys. We all said it was a trick. Another frat had played on us. Or some of our friends that had heard some of the stories that had started to get around about our house. Still, Alvin was done. He moved his stuff out that day. And the rest of us said we would do the same when we got back from Xmas break. That night, my girlfriend and I was lying on the couch that faced the stairs. She was one of the girls that was not afraid to come over, when suddenly, the door did its trick by opening and closing, but this time, it was followed by the dim light darting up the stairs. I could feel her body tense, and she was trembling, and I told her not to be scared. She is highly aware of what goes on in this house, and this was no different, but she let out a scream that I'll never forget. She pointed to the top of the stairs, where steps joined with the ceiling, and there, in plain sight was a face looking straight at us. No body, no expression, just a face between the top rug, stair, and ceiling. No one could have contorted themselves to a point to get into that position, but there it was. I remember my muscles were tense so much, I had a black bruise for weeks. Just as soon as we both got a good look at it, it moved from sight upstairs. No, it did not vanish. I've never wanted to run more in my life, but being a young man at the time, I grabbed the baseball bat and ran upstairs ready to kill someone. I tore the house apart looking everywhere to find no one. Jane was still in tears about to have a complete breakdown. I grabbed all my clothing and everything I knew I could live without and left. I knew I would not go back there again. Not sure I would want anyone to believe me or not. I guess if I had a choice, I would choose not. Never had any experiences like that before or after, and I guess it just does not matter. I just thought you might get a kick out of the story by someone with no reason to tell it. Also, postscript to the house, they were never able to sell or rent it. It was finally torn down and now is just an empty lot. The follow up to Alan's true ghost story is this. Several years ago, our friend had a reunion and I and a couple of the guys from the story were having a few when Skip brought up the house. We had never talked about it afterwards as if it never happened. 
Way too proud to admit we were scared, you know? Funny how difficult the conversation was. Maybe not difficult, but guarded. Anyway, after a few more drinks, we opened up a bit and Alvin told a few events that he never revealed before. Said he thought we'd think him nuts. He said that one night, he was in bed asleep. This guy sleeps like a rock, when suddenly, he woke up. Did not know why, but he felt like something was in the room with him. He said he was so scared he could not move. By the way, this guy was not afraid of anything. Big, strong, and never told a lie in his life. His room was just off the living room closest to the front door and stairs. He noticed his bedroom door was open, and from his room, he could also see the front door was wide open. He figured that was what woke him up. One of us had come in late from a party and had left the door open. He said he got up and went to the door and yelled, Who the hell left the door open? To this day, I think he spoke the truth when he heard a voice that seemed to be right behind him say we did. He said he spun around there and there was no one there. As a matter of fact, he checked the rest of the house and we were all asleep. Y'all remember Alvin was the first one to say he was leaving, but he never said why until that day at the reunion. 20 years later. I've always believed in ghosts, and if anyone says I'm crazy, well, that's just their opinion. It's nothing I've ever seen, mostly just feelings. I think if I actually saw a ghost, I just might pass out cold. My son passed away two years ago, and I get visits from him once in a while. Not the cold sensations most people feel with a ghost, but a warm, Pleasant sensation of being very loved and safe. He's my guardian angel, and he proved it to me just last night. My fiance and I had gone to his aunt's house in Warren, Pennsylvania, which is 70 miles from where I live, which is near Erie, Pennsylvania. It was snowing pretty badly by the time we left Warren, and the roads were awful. No visibility, slippery, and drifting snow made for a very unsafe experience. Every time we thought we lost the road, Another vehicle will come along and show us the way. I just knew it was my baby protecting me. I'm pretty sure my house is haunted. By who? I have no clue, but it is an old house, and I'm in the process of investigating its past. I used to work 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. and would sleep till 2.30 p.m. when my fiancé would come home from work and wake me up. My bedroom is upstairs, and to get to it, I have to walk through the other bedroom. I would keep the other bedroom's door shut to keep my cats out so I could sleep in peace. One day, I heard the bedroom door open and footsteps walk through the other room to the side of my bed. I thought it was my fiancé coming in to wake me up, but when I turned over, no one was there. The clock read only noon, so it was way too early for him to come home. Needless to say, I got the shivers and was awake for the rest of the day. This has happened several times. I also see things out of the corner of my eye, like movement or someone standing there, but when I turn to look, of course, no one is there. Sometimes, I go to check out my cat to see if it was them, but they're usually asleep downstairs, and these things always happen upstairs. I refuse to go into the basement, because I get really bad vibes down there. Don't know why, but I won't mess with it. Same with my attic. This is a duplex house, and a couple of months ago, the neighbors moved out. Lately, I've been hearing someone going up and down the steps, but when I go to check if maybe the landlord or new neighbors are over there, the place is totally empty. What do you think? Is it my imagination or am I haunted? I was living with my grandmother and mom and two sisters while we were looking for a new house in a different state. I was in the fourth grade when this happened. It was snowing outside, and the school bell rang as I left the building and headed towards the bike racks. I got a very sickening feeling in my stomach, and immediately, I knew that something bad was going to happen. As I rode my bike out into the middle of nowhere, and on the long dirt road that led out to my grandmother's house, the feeling got worse. I was really freaked out by the time I got to her house, and I discovered that I was at the house alone. I had a million things running through my mind as I entered the house. The main thing that was running through my mind was when will grandma get home. I picked up the telephone and called my grandma in her store. She said that she would not be home until the two hours after the store was closed, which would be around 8 or 9 o'clock in the evening. My mom and baby sis were with her, and they had to wait to go home with her. My uncle and other sis were spending the night at the friend's house. 
My grandpa at the time was at his job and he wouldn't be arriving home until 8.30 that evening. So I asked my grandma if my friend Nikki could come over. She said it was okay, so I hung up and called her. She told me that she could, but I would have to meet her halfway down the paved road that goes all the way through the little town my grandma lives in. So I left. It was still snowing when I met up with her. She said, I don't feel right. I feel like something bad is going to happen. Do you feel that way too? And I said, yes, I'm really scared. We rode up the long dirt road to my grandma's. As we pulled into the driveway, the snow got thicker. We propped our bikes against the tree next to the doorway to my grandma's doorway. We went into the garage and gave my uncle's dog Blondie a doggy treat. When we came out, we shut the garage door behind us. My grandma's garage door is temperamental and it will come up again. So we stood there freezing cold waiting for five minutes to see if it was going to go up again. After five minutes, we went inside because it wasn't going to go up again. We put in that movie Grumpy Old Men to get that ill feeling of danger to go away. At the funniest part in the movie, I got this sudden funny feeling which isn't unusual for me, so I asked my friend what flavor of crystal light she wanted. I went into the kitchen and got out the lime flavor and started making it. By this point in time, I'd forgotten all about the sick feeling. All of a sudden, the sick feeling washed over so fast I almost threw it up all over. I shook it off to the point where I could stand it and continued to make the drink. My friend cried out, oh my god, what was that? She startled me by using that kind of language. I turned to her and said, what? She replied, I don't know, but it was running very fast and it was really tall. I said, don't try to scare me, you know how I'm feeling. And she said to me, I'm not trying to scare you. We kind of brushed it off and for about five minutes, everything was fine. Then I got another whoosh over the feeling over me. She squealed and said more like a shrill whisper. What the hell is that? I turned and looked at her and turned my head back to my drink and looked up at the window in front of me just in time to see a rather tall man running by the window. I said, holy god, what was that? I immediately dropped to the floor in fear of whatever it was that was running around would see me. I told her to drop on all fours. She did as I said and I crawled over to her and picked up the phone and called my grandma at the store. She said that she would send someone over to check on us. Shaking uncontrollably, I hung up the phone. Almost two seconds after I hung up, a loud bang was heard coming from the door. I, terrified, crawled over to the door to see what it was. The figure was banging on the door with the handle part of a hatchet axe. The blinds were bouncing wildly around from the harsh banging. I told my friend to start crawling up to my uncle's stairs that led up to his room. I crawled over to the door to see the face of the guy so I could give a description later. I saw the face and crawled frantically to the stairs. Nikki was crawling up the stairs between bounces to the blind so the guy couldn't see us. As soon as we got into my uncle's room, we turned on the light in his closet and went inside it and locked the closet door behind us. As soon as we were in the closet, we hugged each other and shook. We could still hear the banging on the door. Then I noticed that it was still clutching to the phone. It rang. I answered it. It was her grandpa calling her to check on us. I told him what was happening. He said he would be right over. We waited for about two more minutes and the banging had subsided. All of a sudden, we heard our names being called. We were still terrified to come out, but we did anyway. As soon as we did leave the house, her grandpa surrounded us with hugs. We told him what happened and I didn't think he believed us. The funny thing is, the snow had stopped falling and there were no footprints in the freshly fallen snow. 8 to 10 different dents in the door that weren't there before, and the garage door was open. I truly believe it was death coming after us. I was going to get my friend. It had just snowed. I got towards the end of the street and saw very faint footprints on the new snow. I looked at the footprints I had just made and looked in front of me. The mysterious footprints looked like mine. My friend was running towards me. I greeted her and we turned the corner of the street and began walking. She was making skidded footprints in her boots. I told her what I saw on the way. She looked forward and saw skidded footprints just like hers. Mine were heading away from my house and hers towards it. My friend got a dreadful feeling that we weren't supposed to be there. We started walking faster away from the footprints. We saw more ahead and we started to investigate it. She then realized it said IMVW. 
Then she saw something pointing to the yard ahead of us, so she went over there to see what the footprints wanted. I stayed and saw my own footprint. I screamed and told her to come over here. She came over and she was freaking out too. I never walked here at all. I said half crying. She said she saw something on the grass which looked like a young girl's body. Then we both turned and saw barefoot prints in the snow. Just one. I don't believe in ghosts, but I started crying and running like never before. My friend said leave us alone. You are not welcome here. We can't help you VW, now leave. When we were finally safe, my heart and my friend's heart was beating like never before. And as I sit here typing this, I still can't breathe as easily. I only have one ghost story in my life, but I still think about it often. About 12 years ago, I lived in Westland, Michigan, where I was born and lived until I was 32. Westland is as boring a suburb as you can imagine, and my encounter was about the only thing interesting to relate from my neighborhood. I was driving home late one night in late December. Anyone who spent a winter in Michigan can tell you that it gets very, very cold, and the night in question was one of the coldest I remember. It was hard to even breathe when you were out there in the bitter wind. It was probably just after midnight, and I'd just spent a few hours with one of my college friends working on a graphic design project that was due shortly after I returned from a short holiday break. I was only a block away from my house and was driving very carefully because the streets were icy and narrow. Any swerve would cause me to collide with the cars parked along the residential street. All of a sudden, I became aware of a flash of white in my peripheral vision off to my right. I looked very quickly and saw a girl in white running down the sidewalk, a flowing white nightdress trailing behind her. She was pale and had long black hair, which also blew wildly in the harsh wind. She was obviously not dressed for a Michigan December, and I remember distinctly noting that she was barefoot. She had a red ribbon tying her hair at her neck and a loose ponytail. I still remember that there was a strange quality to the vision, as if I was seeing an old memory. There was some strange otherness to it that I can only attempt to describe. She seemed to move at a slightly slower speed than normal, but not quite as slow as you may describe a slow motion. Also, I've no recollection of any sound at all during that brief moment, not even the sound around me, like the car engine or the wind gusting. I looked back and saw her again, her pace now leaving her almost behind me. I had turned my head to spot her. Again, I couldn't look for long without risking an accident so I slowed the car down and tried to spot her a third time. She was gone. I did not see any doors closing on any of the nearby houses or any persons in the immediate vicinity. I stopped the car near the corner and, after pondering for a few seconds, got out to investigate. I went to the area where I had seen her. It had been snowing pretty steadily since sunset and the sidewalks were covered with about 3 inches of fresh snow. There was absolutely no tracks either on the sidewalk or on the lawns nearby. I stood there for a minute and then walked around the perimeter in a circle covering about 40 feet. This was definitely the spot I had seen her, but there was no tracks but my own. In the weeks and months after this first happened, I tried to write the experience off as a trick of my mind, but I've never had any vision since and I've now accepted that this was a ghost. I didn't know the people on the street and never investigated who this girl might have been, but thank you for reading. My story starts in 1969. I was five years old. My brother and I shared a bedroom. Our twin beds were arranged side by side with the foot of the beds facing our door which entered into the upstairs hallway. If you were in a room facing the doorway, to the right of the door hung a picture of a map of the world. If you were laying in our beds, to your right would have been our closet door. This was a walk-in closet. I'm describing the layout so you can get a sense of how this all seemed to happen. Anyway. My bed was the one nearest to the closet door. The first time I saw the man in the barrel, it was around 3 a.m. It was a summer night in Iowa, not too hot and not too cool. I awoke and saw something that has haunted me to this day. I'm now 32 years old. To describe this figure will take some work. The figure looked very much like a troll. He appeared to be approximately two to three feet tall. He seemed to be either wearing a barrel or standing inside it. His feet were exposed outside the bottom of the barrel, and he was wearing shoes much like that of an elf. The toes of the shoes were curled at the end. At the top of the barrel, straps were connected and hung over his shoulders. 
He had very sharp and long fingernails, dirty hands and arms, jagged sharp teeth, a very long dirty beard, and wore a hat that, now as I reflect back, looked like something from a Rumpelstiltskin fairy tale. The hat had a round brim and a long pointed top. His eyes were eerie and piercing, a gray color with people shaped like a cat's, but as black as the devil's. This troll figure appeared at approximately the same time on each of his visits to haunt me and was always floating in front of the map of the world. He was pointing his finger at me, floating up and down very slowly. He was laughing, but no noise was heard. I can remember quickly covering my head with my sheets during this first encounter. It was my hope that when I uncovered my head, he would be gone and I would be dreaming. When I removed the sheets from my head, he was indeed gone. However, for about a period of a year, from night to night, this man would return and I would go through the same routine of covering my head. Usually, when I saw him, he would be in front of that map. On other occasions, he would be to my right, in front of our closet door. Always, he was laughing and pointing at me, never really talking or explaining why he was tormenting me. No noise was ever made. During many nights, just before I was fully awake, I knew he was there. I didn't even have to look to know. I could feel his presence. Several times, I would wake up my brother, yelling and asking my brother if he could see him. My brother, older than me, would tell me to go back to sleep as I was just imagining him. To this day, my brother can describe in as clear as detail as I can how this man looked. The reason he can is because in the middle of the night, while I was looking at this man, I would describe him to my brother to convince him the ghost was there. I had told my parents about seeing this man and asked him to remove the map of the world from the wall as I felt it might have something to do with seeing him. They took down the map, but the man kept coming back. I asked them to move me into what was our guest room. They agreed to my wishes, but things only got worse. In that room, there was also a walk-in closet. If you can picture a clothes bar that was hung with U-shaped wall mounts, the clothes bar rested in those mounts connected to the wall. One night, a loud crash came from my closet. I ran to my parents' room without investigating first. I woke them, and they went to my room's closet. When they opened the door, everything was lying on the floor. The shelves that held my games and toys, and the clothes and bar on all my clothes. How this all came crashing down, nobody knows, but I have a strong suspicion it was the man I had been seeing. For several nights from that day forward, he would return to laugh at me and haunt me. Although I haven't had many visits from him since, we have moved from the house in Iowa. I can still remember the chills he gave me. I've been seeing and feeling things since I was 17 months old. My mother was raised to believe in the paranormal, and so was I. My first encounter happened when I was 17 months old. My great-grandfather had just passed away. I don't remember seeing him or talking to him, but I do remember the smell of his cologne. My mom told me this when I got older. She said that she just put me down for bed, and a few minutes later she heard me talking. Oh, she came back to check on me and I told her it was Papa, and that was that. I never saw him again until he moved into the house we are living in now. My second encounter happened a few months after my great-grandmother passed. This was when I was 12. When I was little, she had given me a jewelry box. I was little and I had put the baby powder in it. Well, a few weeks after she had passed, I was vacuuming my room, and nothing was near that jewelry box, and it just fell off my drawer. It even fell off when I was in the living room watching TV with my dad. The last time it fell, I was at my nanny's, and my mom had the door shut, so no one was in there. When it fell, my mother got up and cleaned it out and put it in her room, and well, that was the last time it did anything. My great-grandmother was telling me to clean it. Now my papa was beautiful to me because I knew him for 11 years, and he was my everything. Unfortunately, I was 13 when he had passed away. That night in the hotel room by the hospital after he had passed, we were getting ready for bed. My mom was crawling in the bed with me when my step-grandmother said, Shell, is that you standing there? My mother replied, No, Mama, I'm in the bed. Well, my grandmother told us what she saw. There was an angle where my mother had stood. My mother couldn't see it, but I could barely. I know it was him telling us that everything would be okay. 
My papa always messed with me, so I wasn't really surprised if he did that after death. One night I was in my nanny's living room at 11 o'clock, waiting for CJ to get home. My nanny was in bed, and I was watching TV. Well, there's a desk close to my nanny's room. That's where my papa used to do bills there when he was alive. I remember before I sat down that the chair was pushed in. A few minutes later, I heard a cracking noise, and I looked over, and the chair was out of place. Of course, I was scared, and it made me forget that it was pushed in. I told Nanny, and she said it was probably your papa. The last time I was at her house before she moved, I just got out of the shower. I was drying my hair, and I heard a name. I don't remember if it was Randy or Rodney, but I asked my granny, and she told me that it was probably someone he knew, so I left it at that. I had used this old phone because mine was dying. Well, we took it home before CJ and her boyfriend Joe could pawn it. This was before a few months before my nanny moved out from up there. CJ and Joe were stealing stuff and pawning it. Well, we had the phone, and one night out of the blue it started ringing, and it said dad. My mom answered, and nobody was there. Well, the funny thing is, it was dead and shut off. Well, the next time it rang, I was at home, and this time it said Joe, and I answered. Of course, nobody was there. We took the battery out, and my nanny moved, and now no one knows what has happened to Joe or CJ. My dad's father just passed away recently, and I was very close to him. I did everything with him when I was little. I'm even named after his daughter who passed away when she was three. I was like his daughter, and the one chance he got to know what it felt like to have a little girl again. He passed away December 8th. I was 16, and I miss him dearly. When I was little, they had lived in a trailer. I knew his daughter was there because I could feel her, even though I never saw her. When they moved to that house that is on the hill above the trailer, I could feel something that wasn't good. I still feel it when I go over there. I don't feel Diana, his little girl, or even my papa. The week my papa passed away, my mom asked me to vacuum his room. Well, I started the vacuum, and you know that feeling you get when you know you're not alone, and it feels like someone is going to hurt you. Well, that's how it felt, and I started the panic. I hurried and looked down just for a moment, and then I looked up, and my mom scared the living crap out of me. I left the room and let her finish. To this day, I never go back there or even go to the bathroom there because I never want to feel that feeling ever again. I know I am very blessed to have had the chance with them all, and to know that they are watching over me and protecting me, because sometimes, when I'm alone or scared, I can smell their perfume or feel their presences, and I know that I'm not alone, or that I shouldn't be afraid anymore, because they're always going to be with me. I just emailed you a ghost story about my boyfriend's death and the orbs related to it. If you haven't read it yet, basically I saw orbs of my boyfriend hovering around me every night after midnight. I have no idea why this even happens at this time, but anyway, to continue my story, my friend stayed in her music throughout the night and did not feel welcome to stay in his room. She is familiar with ghosts and I have not been well since his death. I have grieved so hard I became a threat to myself to the point in which I was thinking of doing the unthinkable. I am just now coming to grips with the situation with my boyfriend. Well, maybe I hold him here, if you know what I mean. I want him to pass through and find some peace so he can go to the light, but I'm not sure what I should do to help. I am so distraught over this. He has visited me and also four people I know by dream. He even visited my five-year-old to tell him he loved him, and that he had to go to heaven now, and his nephew had a dream with some of our memories in it. He told him to take my wife, meaning me, and said God bless you at the end. My friend dreamt of him where he walked through, and said sorry, I don't know why I'm here, and my uncle had a dream with my boyfriend urging him to remind me to let him go, 
so I can move on. But it is really tough when someone has become a huge part of your life and has played a major role in it for so long. And to have that person vanish before your eyes and be gone is just unconscionable to me. We used to have long talks about mortality, or about how one of us couldn't last if one of us were to depart. And it just kills me to know that we can't have just one more conversation, or that we won't be able to live to see my son grow up, get married, and be successful. I swore I was going to marry this man. I did have a dream where someone I believed to be him was trying to walk me through a mist. It's kind of hard to explain, but the dream was foggy and his face was partially obscured by the mist or fog, but the outline of his body was the same as my boyfriend's, and I could make out his hair. He reached out his hand to me without saying a word, and when I did, I awoke, and just like that, he was gone again. I must admit I have been on meds. But still, I felt like it was him. The coroner said that what he did to himself was accidental, but he just took it too far. Maybe he just didn't understand his own limits and did something to himself without thinking. But it's the way that he took care of himself that was too suspicious to be accidental. He told his family that day right before he did it that he was going to do it and that was final. They didn't come to check on him, and I was gone from the house to come home and found him the way that he was, lifeless, and just gone. After his death, I would scream for him in that room. It was just so horrific. Please, if anyone can help guide me through this, it would be so helpful to me, as I've been so distraught, and I feel like his soul is so lost. I talked to a psychic medium. She said he came and rubbed my hair at night, and he said to stop the tears and he could come through. But she said he didn't want me to live my life stagnant. I have many lessons to learn. And other things to figure out with the entire loss. We were complete soulmates. But I believe in an afterlife. And I believe that we will reunite one day. And live many more lives together. As crazy as it sounds. Hence his death I have now turned to a monk for guidance. I am currently studying Hindu philosophy. My boyfriend believed in God. I've been living in this house for close to three years. For the first six months, nothing happened. One night, my hubby and I were laying on a spare mattress in the living room watching a movie. This was around 11.50 at night. We started hearing these heavy footsteps in the home. We have two doors leading into the living room. One of the sliding doors was right beside us, and the other one is approximately 5 meters away from us. We heard footsteps in the hallway outside the door furthest from us. At first we thought it was my older brother who was also living with us, but he has this routine where he goes to bed at 10pm, and it's the same night every night and he doesn't change his routine. Weird, I know. We looked at each other thinking, is that Mika walking around in the hall this time of night? We sat there listening to the footsteps that next walked into the kitchen, which has a door that leads into the living room where we were closest to. The footsteps came closer and closer until they stopped just outside the sliding door. We waited. We listened. We were expecting my brother to open the door and have a whinge that our TV sound volume was on far too loud, even though it wasn't. But he's like that, you know. We waited, and then my hubby pushed the sliding door and opened it, and we found nothing. The other door on the far side of the kitchen was also closed, which leads into the hall that the footsteps originated from. We were a bit spooked because we both heard the steps, and laying on the mattress on the floor could sure as heck feel the vibration in the floor from those footsteps. We decided to search the home, minus my brother's bedroom, and we found nothing. An old man lives next door, and I was starting to imagine that perhaps he passed away and wandered over to our home. We saw him a few days later alive and well. That threw that notion out the window. The next morning we asked Miko if he were up last night, and he says no. We told him what we heard, and all he could do was shrug and insist that he was in bed and didn't even come out. 
I believed him simply because there was no way he could have walked away without us noticing when Hubby opened the door. And the footsteps never left. It just stopped outside the door. But nothing was there. One thing that does happen though, is that birds are always hitting our front window. This has happened so many times that it lost count. I'm not sure if this is significant, and whether it's a common occurrence with houses with weird things happening inside. Another thing that we notice on a few occasions is phantom smells. Sometimes they are really, really pretty, but other times it is foul. They rarely last more than 10 minutes. For a while, things were back to normal, but my brother said one day, I don't know who is always walking past my window or what they want. I asked him who, and he says some kid. He believes it was a girl, probably no older than eight or nine. He walks past his window and heads towards the backyard, and he never sees her walk back. This has happened about four times that he can recall. I told him, why don't you go out there and check it out? He always has some excuse of he was busy, plays online games, and says he was in the middle of something. Okay, let's continue. About nine months after hearing the footsteps, we heard them again. We were in the bedroom this time, and it sounded like coming from the laundry and kitchen area. Again, we investigated, checked all the locks and the doors, but everything was secure and fine. I asked my hubby if he believed that the house was haunted. He said that it was a very real possibility. Not too long ago, I was taking a bath around 11 p.m., and I heard a really loud thump just outside my bathroom window. I got out of the tub and wrapped the towel around me and met my hubby in the hallway. He thought I might have fallen, and I told him that it seemed to come from the outside window. We switched on the backyard light that had an outdoor seating area, but the place was clear. We didn't go outside, but we could tell nothing was on the floor that could have made that sound. We went into my son's room to look out the window where the garage and the rest of the yard is, but couldn't see much, save for a few feet from the house because the outdoor lights aren't strong enough, and the trees are too dark and cast many dark shadows. We just put it down to maybe the neighbor was outside doing something, though it was dark, and if that were the case, wouldn't have the light been on? But recently, I got a real shock of my life, about three months ago. They put the house on the market, and around this time, I went into my son's room about 7 p.m. to wake him to get him ready for school. It was still quite dark, though the sun was starting to come up, and you could see enough. I pulled his bedroom curtain open and saw what looked like a girl child in the yard, looking directly at the window. That's when she just stood there watching, and then she turned her body and made her way towards the back of the garage. She kept looking my way for a few seconds before looking away and disappearing behind the garage. I didn't know what to think to be honest. What would she be doing out there at that time in the morning, wearing inappropriate clothing for that time of morning? I'm not even sure if she was solid or not. I was just thinking, who are you and why are you in my yard? I think she wore a light blue dress it could have been white. I didn't have too much light, but it almost seemed like she had a bit of a glow. I could even tell that she seemed to have long blonde hair. By now, my brother and my hubby had left for work, and I was alone in the home with my son, and there was no way I was going to go into the yard to investigate. What if she wasn't a little girl? Can a little girl create such heavy footsteps? She is always spotted outside, yet the footsteps are inside. Or is that something else inside? Is she trying to warn me? I've seen shadows here and there, and many things have been breaking down recently. Since the home was put on the market, our little portable oven broke down. Our microwave is breaking down. My washing machine isn't working well anymore, and it won't do the final spin cycle. The hot water mysteriously stopped working as well, and the landlord came by to fix it, and says he doesn't even see anything really wrong with it. The hot water started working again. The toilet was blocked up with the root of a tree. But why now? The kitchen faucet broke and fell off. Our video player stopped working. It chewed up a tape and had to throw it out. Birds continue occasionally flying into our front window. Always that same window. 
happen on the day of the house auction too. And it's not just these, but also illnesses. My son was choking on food the other day and needed an ambulance since living here. My hubby has needed two surgeries, one being spinal, and he's always been strong. And then he spent a year out of work with a bad back. He developed diabetes while living here, though a test a year ago said he was fine. I also developed problems. Pikey locked in ovarian syndrome, an umbilical hernia, requiring surgery in near future, and high blood pressure that recently got even higher, ankle swelling that can't really be explained, chest infections that occur frequently, and a few others. Before living here, we were fit and healthy, and it's like being here is making us sick, and it could be a coincidence, but you can't help to think about these things. I've read that there is a house somewhere in Europe, I think, and that people that move in there die of a heart attack within two weeks of living there. I don't know if it was in Switzerland, but the thing is, even those had no history of being ill. They say the house is cursed, and who knows if this is why we're getting these issues. We are moving out in a couple of weeks, and we are counting the days. I feel more like a 7 year old these days than a 36 year old. And all these changes have happened in the past three years of living here anyway. But this is my story. I have an experience to share with all of you. When my grandfather died, we went to my grandmother's house to check on her. She had a clock that when my great-great-grandmother died, it stopped ticking then. When my grandpa died, it started again. It had not ticked for a long, long time, for about over a hundred years. My grandpa had always wanted to hear it too. Maybe it was him that did it, or just a coincidence. My gym basement at my school. When I went to the bathroom in gym class, my friend came too. It used to be a locker room for a high school. We were about halfway down the stairs when the lights started flickering on and off. Then the water at the sinks turned on, and the stall door slammed. Then we turned to run up the stairs, and in the corner, we saw a boy that you could see through, and he had a hunter green shirt with black dress pants. We screamed and ran up the stairs where most of our class was there, and no one believed us, but we knew what we saw. Me and my other friend we went down there and had to use the bathroom, and she was scared to go by herself, so oh, I ended up going down there with her. We were standing at the bottom of the stairs, noticing how freezing it was, and it was so cold. Oh, she went over to the first stall, then she started to open it, then I screamed, and then she said what? I said turn around, and that's when she did. What we both saw was a girl wearing a dress with bright red eyes, with a black outline of some sort. He had a possessed smile. That's when she said leave. The way she looked into our eyes when we saw her was straight evil. And my friend and I had nothing to say. One time I went with another one of my friends down to that basement. And when we were there we saw something strange and unwanted. We were standing at the very end of the stairs. And we were walking into the bathrooms. And at that very moment we saw a strange looking girl just standing there. And she was just staring at us. Now keep in mind this used to be an old school that was at least 90 to 95 years old. Oh, me and my friend just stood there for a moment and stared at her. Then we suddenly saw her eyes were plain black. It was so scary. Then me and my friend slowly, and I may slowly walked away. But as we were going up the stairs, we noticed that she was following us. We looked back. I mean we wanted to, but at the same time we did it. And there she was. It was truly freaky. This was so freaky that she was right behind us reaching for us and wanting to touch us so we ran we thought no one would believe this horrible frightening incident but luckily quite a few people did and that's why many people didn't like to go into the basement anymore one summer my three children my sister and all and i were traveling to my hometown in south carolina we live in new york Oh, it is a pretty long way to go. It was foggy that morning, 
and my car had been experiencing trouble. We broke down near Pennsylvania and found ourselves sitting on the side of the road, maybe about eight hours from home. A police officer pulled up behind my car. My youngest was two months old. He was screaming very loudly, but when he saw this policeman, he started smiling and laughing. Dressed in an older style police uniform, it looked to be a style from the 70s. He had the most beautiful face and voice. He walked around my car and then laid his hands on my car. My car started to back up. Then he just disappeared. I can't explain it. I looked up from the dash seconds after I saw him standing in front of the car and then he was gone. No policeman car. No police car. Nothing. No one. We didn't even see him leave. As a matter of fact, we didn't even see him pull up. I thank God for that angel in disguise. We made it home safely. I grew up in a house that was always open to everyone and warm, but it did have its secrets. When I was very young and the house was empty, I would hear my name being called and I would run from room to room, thinking someone was home. My brother said this also happened to him on Saturday mornings, when everyone was asleep and he watched cartoons. One night as a 12 year old, I was sleeping in the upstairs hall while my room was being finished. I was sleeping with my face to the wall, and softly my shoulder was being pushed, thinking someone in my family was wanting something. I turned around to face the room, there in front of me was a small couple, a man in a suit and a 1930s hat, and a sweet looking woman with a pillbox like hat. I think they liked what they saw because they looked at each other, then smiled, and then turned around to go down the stairs. I never saw them again. Many years later in a conversation with my mother, she told me the small house with the low ceilings and low working areas was built for a couple in 1939, and before they could move in, they died in a fatal car accident. I guess they were just checking up on their home. Well, my boyfriend is a non-believer, but he says he wants to believe. Oh, back before we started dating, we would find things to do where he might see something and come around. I was very picky about these places because I am a firm believer and also I scare easily. Oh, I didn't want to get myself into a situation that I would have a hard time with. As a result, I choose places that I've been to many times and was comfortable with. We had been to a few and I'd heard something or whatever but generally I have attributed this to my imagination because I was worked up, but one experience stands out. We were on the USS Constellation, known for hauntings, but I had taken him there more as a glimpse of my own past. As a native Baltimorean, or Baltimoreon, as my father likes to say, in a lover of history, I practically grew up on it. I was completely relaxed as I usually am there and Rob and I were standing on the Orlook dock, looking over the rail. It's my favorite place on the ship. Don't ask me why. My least favorites are outside the Champlain's Corners and in the infirmary. Given the history of the ship, the Orlop really shouldn't be my faith, but it is. Oh, we have been standing there in silence for a few minutes, just kind of taking it in. It was a cold day and we went there right after work so there was hardly anyone else on the vessel. And so after a few moments of quiet, I say, cut it out. What, he replies. Well, he knew what he did. He put his hand around my waist, hopping the curve of my hip. As we weren't dating at this time, and in fact, I believe we we're both seeing other people when this happened. I thought this was pretty dang inappropriate. I turned to tell him so. He was standing too far away for me to have done that. He didn't move as I was standing directly next to him and would have noticed. What? He said again, a little more forcefully, looking rather concerned for my sanity. Nothing, I said. I didn't want to think about it and ruin one of my favorite childhood retreats. After we were off the ship, I told him what had happened. He still really wasn't convinced, and I'm the one who experienced something. Not him, 
But he did admit that. The ghost has good taste. That's sweet. I think. I just want to say that I love your website and couldn't help but to share my story with you. A few years ago, my great-grandfather was very ill and in a nursing home. My family and I live far away from him, and we only made a trip up to see him around Christmas and his birthday. One day when I was 15, and my brother was only about two, we were sitting in my living room watching TV, when all of a sudden my little brother started crying. I asked him what was wrong, and he said he wanted to go see Papa. I thought it was weird because he had only met Papa a few times. My mom came in the room and told him that Papa was very far away, but that we would go see him soon. My brother started crying harder and was screaming, I want to see Papa now. My mom held her in her lap and kept telling him not to worry that Papa was fine, and we would go see him soon. When he started to calm down the phone rang, it was my aunt. He told us that Papa just passed away. My whole family was creeped out by this experience, and none of us had really talked about it since. My little brother does not even remember it. This took place in 1993, and I have two separate stories, same place and year. When I was about 16, I was living with some friends in Cleveland, Texas. I was attending school there with my best friend Mary, and living with her and her family. We had a couple friends that we went to school with, but one girl was very strange, shall we say. We will call her Claire, and there was the other friend named Barbie. We lived almost at the end of a long, narrow, dead and dirt road. There was only about six houses on the road and we were surrounded by woods. We lived in the next to last house on the street, and Claire lived in the house that marked the dead end road, and her family rarely came out in the daytime. They were more night creatures, if you will, and they had about six stray cats just hanging around the house. Mary and I decided to stay the night with Claire one night, and in the nighttime when it all got very weird, Lair was talking about witches and witchcraft, and sorts, when suddenly I saw right behind Claire that there was a witch's head just hanging from the ceiling. I mean, it was staring right at me with big bulging red eyes, and it seemed real. When I told Claire Lair was right on the ceiling, she looked, and there was nothing, and to this day, I have no idea if I was hallucinating or if I really saw something evil. Our family had an experience several years back in our old house. I tried to submit the story a few years back, but I don't think it ever was posted. I am the last one to say I believe in ghosts, and normally when people tell me they saw a ghost, I listen, but figure they are full of it. Well, this time I am glad that my entire family heard it. I don't care if anybody else believes me because at least we know it happened. It happened several years ago, maybe a good 28 years ago. I was around 7, if not younger. At the time I was sleeping in my parents room with my dad, and my mom went to lay down with my brother since he had the flu. The way our house was is that we have three bedrooms and two doors that we kept closed that closed off of the back of the house to the living room and kitchen. We had all just started to fall asleep when we were woken up by a really loud thump, then the sound of something heavy, running and ripping up the carpet. It reminded me of our old cat that used to run down the hall, and her claws would get stuck in the carpet, but this was much, much louder. The noise came and went very fast. My dad had jumped up and got his gun, and went outside thinking it was someone running on our roof, but there was nothing. He came back and asked us all if we heard it, and we did. To this day, we have no idea what it was, and it never happened again. My brother and I talk about it to this day, and we get chills thinking about it. I'm sure it is something that could be explained. But what? It was too loud for any house noise. Our plumbing we never had issues with. Like I said, I'm glad our entire family heard it. 
it's all that way. They know I'm not making something up. I've never had another experience like that again. And now I'm interested in the idea of hauntings. But I normally am more on the factual and fantasy side. But that has made me think that just maybe there is something to all the supernatural. One thing I know about my story, I know it is real. I have read other stories on the site and think a lot of them are fabricated. And I am sure of reading mine. People think I am making it up. Or my entire family is making it up. But we know it happened. My stories were told to me. The first was told by my dad. My dad was an 18-wheeled truck driver. The stories he told seemed far-fetched, but I swear to God he's telling the truth. One night driving a long stretch of highway, he came upon a beautiful dog. The dog barked, but he knew he had hit the dog. He got out of the cab of the truck with his flashlight, who gave the dog a proper burial. When he looked up and down the ravines, and what he found was not a dog, but a family with the dog. They had crashed down the ravine two hours earlier. The family survived, but the dog didn't. The next story was told by my brother, and now sister-in-law, then girlfriend. In 1995, my brother came to Texas, then Georgia, to be with our dad. At that time, he was very ill. My sister-in-law, then girlfriend was in Georgia. Our dad passed away late at night. My brother decided to wait till morning to call my sister because she had to be working early the next morning. My sister-in-law called crying instead. She was scared and shaking. Then she said that about 2 a.m. she got up to get a drink in the kitchen, walked into the living room, and that's when she saw dad sitting on the couch. Then she said hi to him, then continued into the kitchen and then realized that he was supposed to be in Texas, not knowing he had passed yet. That's when she walked back into the living room, where he was sitting, telling her he needs to tell her something, and she screamed no, and runs back into the bedroom, then slams the door, locks it, and calls her best friend cousin who was a cop to come to the house, and no one is there. When my brother tells her our dad had passed, that is when she freaks out more. I just wish I knew what he wanted to tell her. Oh well. I'd like to refer to this haunting as the haunting in Duxbury, Vermont. We bought the house from the niece of Leo Morse in the fall of 1999. Leo lived here his entire life. Shortly after we moved in, we heard strange footsteps on the second floor when we knew no one was up there. During one such incident, my husband, myself, my two children, and a couple friends heard someone walking across the floor in the upstairs bedroom as we all stood in the living room below. One night, when I was taking a bath and was lying back in the tub with my eyes closed, I suddenly felt very uneasy, like someone was staring at me. I looked behind me to where the door was and saw this transparent mist, and it disappeared. Within a second, the door creaked open just an inch, and I screamed my head off. My son, while still in high school, had similar experiences of being watched by someone who couldn't be seen. Our television has also turned on by itself on more than one occasion. Our channels have changed, with the remote sitting out of everyone's reach. In the fall of 2007, my husband had just walked upstairs to go to our bedroom when I heard him hollering at someone and asking him what he wanted. We all ran upstairs to where my husband stood in the doorway to our bedroom. He was staring at the back wall of the other bedroom, pointing to no one and yelling, tears in his eyes, for someone who no one else could see to get out. This lasted for several minutes. Until the man, who my husband said was in his early 30s, brown hair, clean shaven with round, wire frame glasses, dressed in a flannel shirt and blue jeans with the bottoms of the legs rolled into cuffs, disappeared. It was a very restless night that night, and my husband, who was not drunk or on drugs, 
and isn't prone to hallucinations, doesn't like to talk about it much, but is very adamant that it truly happened. We haven't had any more sightings since then, but I still hear footsteps and unexplainable bangs and thumps coming from upstairs every morning after I get up, and I know my husband is still sound asleep in our room. My name is Andrea, I'm from New Mexico, and I'm 17. I've had numerous experiences throughout my life with the paranormal. I'll start from the beginning, I suppose. Before moving to Deming back in 2000, I lived in Hatch, which is about an hour away. We used to live in what was called the White Brick House, near the park, and not even a half mile from the schools. Hatch is very small. Anyway, living in the house was my mom, my very abusive dad who I call Alex, I don't even call him dad, my two-year-old sisters, and my older brother, and me, the youngest. I don't remember the experiences in any specific order, but I remember them as if they happened yesterday. They are all very true, believe if you want. We had a certain room called the back bedroom that no one really liked to go to, at least not alone. This room had an extremely strong presence in it, and it was only when you entered it, you could feel its presence. You could stand in the doorway and look in the bedroom and feel nothing, but as soon as you stepped, that all changed. You feel like you're being watched by one great evil spirit, or a great number of evil spirits. You would have to leave, it was so uncomfortable. We couldn't even get any of the dogs that we had throughout the time we lived there to enter that room. While there was that room, there was also other things that happened in the rest of the house. One night, my mom swears up and down this happened, and so does Alex. They were getting along. The rare occasion, I love these nights. My mom put all four of us to bed. So her and Alex had some alone time and were relaxing together in the spa, talking one night. In the middle of their conversation, both my mom and Alex saw the shadow of someone walk past the doorway of the spa room. My mom thought it was one of us that had gotten up in the night and went to check in on us, only to find us all snoring in bed. Her and Alex then asked us the next morning if we had gotten up and none of us had. Another time, me and my oldest sister were playing in what we called the second kitchen that had a room off called the craft room. My mom paints ornaments in there. We suddenly smelled a strong perfume that didn't smell like any perfume made today. Then we heard a conversation between maybe four or five people. We looked in and saw five older upper class people in clothes from the early 1900s time. I remember one man specifically. He was bald, with a brown beard, and a looking glass eyepiece like the rich people would wear back in the day. He was wearing a black penguin tailed suit with a white button up underneath. He looked somewhat pale, but not very transparent. He turned his head slowly and looked straight at me, not my sister, and nodded his head. Shortly after, he continued to speak with his company. I ran to my room and stayed there for the rest of the day. We had an organ in the living room, along with a drum set and Alex's guitars. We were all musicians. Amps would turn on, even when they were unplugged. The organ played as though a very experienced pianist were playing it. Piano was one thing none of us really learned how to play so it was obvious none of us was playing it. There were times when the dogs would follow something we couldn't see down the hallway to my room and Alex's room. My older brothers one night got up to get a drink of water in the second kitchen, and that's where the laundry room also was. He's 22 years old now, and still swears this is true. He saw a tall figure standing by the washer and dryer near the back bedroom, and he felt it as an evil being. It just stood there, glaring at him, but never moved, as if it was frozen, 
but with the evil expression looking at him wherever he moved. He figured it was Alex, he shouted out Alex's name, but didn't hear a response, so he figured he was mad and went back to bed. The next morning he asked Alex why he was so mad at him. Alex just looked at him and said he was at the bar. My other sister said she was walking by the back bedroom one night and swear she saw a black figure out of the corner of her eye standing straight up against the wall and it tried to grab her with its arms but couldn't reach as if it was restrained. After Alex left, we moved out of the house and into a little apartment. There's only been one thing that has ever happened to me there. I got up in the middle of the night to get something to drink, and as I was going back to my room, I saw what looked like a little blue orb, glowing in intense blue. It moved around for a few minutes, before ultimately dissipating into thin air. Aside from these apartments we lived in, we also moved into a trailer, not too far from the white brick house. This house was always said to be haunted because the man who used to live there died of a heart attack in either the yard or the bathtub and he had two dogs that died of mysterious causes after he did. It was almost as if they died of a broken heart. There would be nights when we could hear the clicking sounds of a dog's nail on the tiles. I was in my room reading one night when my whole dresser just fell over. No reason for it just to fall over. My friend and I, Rosario, and my sister were all in the living room one night when we heard a window shatter come from my room. We never found a single shard of broken glass in the house or even outside, even though the sound came from inside. Finally, I would always see the shadow of someone walk into the laundry room and no one would be there when I looked. All of these incidents were fairly alarming to all of us, and I'm convinced that they were being followed by the same evil spirit that resided in the red brick house. These days, I never experienced any hauntings, and I'm very glad that this is all over. In the fall of 2001, my parents bought an old Victorian house in a quiet suburb. It was a huge relief for us because that year was a very tumultuous time for our family. We couldn't find a house that was affordable and nearly every house we found in the area was either in need of major repairs or super expensive. When we moved into this home, there had been mumblings around town that nobody wanted it due to its supposed hauntings. By the way, I'm 21. The house had a history of violence and death. The city is very safe now, but years ago, it was considered one of the worst cities to live in. It was said that a man who had lived his entire life as a loner took up residence in the house in the early 1920s. One night, he apparently hired a prostitute to stay the night with him. She was unaware that he had no money to pay her for her services. He led her into the kitchen, playing off that he had some spare cash lying around the house. He ultimately ended up strangling her to death and chopping up her body. He was apprehended months later and ended up dying in prison. When the cops questioned him, all he could say was that he needed love. In the first months, we had stereotypical noises that any house would make and dismissed it as nothing more than just noises. However, doors would open and close, lights would flicker on and off, and there was this funky odor that always seemed to linger throughout the house. It was very hard to describe, but it smelled a lot like rotten eggs on a very subtle level. The most terrifying thing that occurred was when I was in the kitchen in the middle of the night. It was about 11 p.m., and I had just come home from work and entered the front hallway of the house at first. That's when I heard whispers, which sounded like the word lonely. I figured I was just exhausted from a long day's labor, so I decided I needed to get to bed. But before I did, I fixed myself something to eat in the kitchen. I walked into the kitchen, 
But that's when I heard moaning sounds, almost like someone was struggling. As I sat on the chair by the kitchen table, I saw the transparent figure of a woman with an anguished look on her face. She appeared for a few moments, then disappeared. She looked like she was from another era and wore all black. Her face looked disfigured and beaten. It terrified the living hell out of me, so I ran upstairs to get my parents. I guess I just needed some comforting, and I found out they weren't home yet. There were other incidents that occurred in the house. My mom actually told me that she was in the laundry room, when she could distinctly hear the sounds of a growling man in the laundry room late at night. This was something that seemed to happen quite frequently around the same time and always only in the laundry room, nowhere else. It was never something really loud and startling. It was always faint, but insanely scary. There were times that we would see two shadows in the corner of our eyes, constantly walk back and forth from the kitchen to the living room. Again, this was subtle. When anybody would actually turn to directly look, these shadows would be gone. Most of the time, we always thought it was just our eyes playing tricks on us, and even after my incident, I still thought that. Anyway, that's my story. It might not be too exciting compared to others, but it is creepy and insane. I'm glad I don't live in that house anymore. Sadly, my parents still do, but it seemed that nothing happens anymore besides the subtle doors creaking open slowly from time to time and the continuation of lights flickering. Thanks for reading. I feel kind of silly writing this, since I haven't talked much about it since it happened. I'm 17 now, and still can't come up with any explanation other than spirits. I've always been a believer, and hope to one day have my own encounter with ghosts. I never thought it would be as terrifying as it was. Eight years ago, summer of 2000, my dad's family was having a reunion, and we all decided we would stay at Oak Island Beach in North Carolina. I'm not sure if that is the exact name. I know it was something to do with Oak in it. The week we were there, the weather was very fickle. It rained most days, and the sun was only out three or four times. Most of our time was spent indoors, my parents, sister, and grandparents shared one condo. My dad's brother and sister and her family shared another, and his step-siblings were in the third with their children. One night, while it was storming, my cousin Josh and I went to the condo to play video games and watch TV. Everyone else was in our condo, playing cards and drinking. We played Dino Crisis in an X-Men game and decided to watch cartoons after about an hour. We spent another couple of hours just goofing off when the storm really started picking up. We were sitting on the couch, talking and laughing, when we heard a creak on the balcony outside. Neither of us is scared easily now, and we weren't then either. I looked out of the sliding doors, but everything was pitch black. We went back to our conversation and had no interruptions for a couple of minutes. When a bolt of lighting lit up the beach, we saw a man standing on the balcony dressed in a trench coat. He seemed to be looking out at the sea. It all happened so suddenly, we didn't believe what we saw, no matter how skeptical we were. We weren't about to go and check like I had with the noise. After a couple of minutes, we noticed the door was fogging up, not the entire thing, just a little patch about six feet off of the floor. We were very spooked now. During the next bolt of lightning, we both saw the man standing against the door, looking in on us. He screamed, and I screamed, and we jumped over the couch, headed for the door. We yanked it open, and as we did, we heard the sound of glass breaking. We didn't look back, just ran across the parking lot to the other condo. 
When we came in, we were soaked and out of breath. Our parents started to freak, asking us what was wrong. When I told them, they just laughed and brushed it off. We kept begging them to call someone, but they refused. After about a minute, they got fed up with it. They grabbed us and their umbrellas and dragged us over there. When we went in, the place was just as we left it. The door was intact and no one was on the balcony, not even a footprint. I know I didn't imagine it. I believe that the spirit was drawn to me for some reason. My cousin has had no other experiences that he has told me about, and I've had quite a few, but not as intense as the first. Anyone that has had a similar experience, know that you are not alone. Finding the sight has opened my eyes to the world of ghosts and those that have been affected by them. Thanks. My Aunt Terry, from my father's side, lived in Oklahoma. When I was about 16, she came here to Memphis, and she told me about a house that she lived in. She said that when her husbands and kids moved in, there was a barn out back, and she said when she walked in there, there was an upside down pentacle on the barn floor. After she saw that, she never went back out there. One night, when everyone went to bed, my Aunt Terry heard the dogs barking in the kitchen. She went into the kitchen and watched her dog bark at a corner in the room. The next night she went to bed and the TV in the living room came on by itself and she said it did it every night. So one night, she decided to unplug the TV and she went to bed as normal and the TV still came on. Then another day, after everyone ate dinner, they were all sitting in the living room. My aunt looked out the window and saw a pair of red eyes. Her husband saw them too, and it really freaked them out. On yet another night, my aunt and uncle and the kids were leaving to go see a movie. And on the porch stood a beast with red eyes, and half his body was human but the rest of him was like an animal. She described his hands and feet as hoofs. Well, after they got home that night, my aunt and uncle made the kids sleep with them, and Catherine started to get really sick. When my aunt and uncle tried to take her to the hospital, the car wouldn't start, so they had to push the car all the way down the street, and it started right up. The doctors couldn't find out what was wrong with Catherine, my aunt and uncle decided to move, and every morning the car wouldn't start when my aunt had to go to work until my uncle pushed it down the street. After my aunt and uncle found a new place to live, when they got everything they owned out of the house, Catherine got better immediately, and the car never gave them a problem, and the TV never came on by itself again. Some strange occurrences, but I swear they're true. Thanks for reading. The Hampton Inn on Warner Road, off Route 279, has a haunted room, which is number 417. My husband stayed in this room while on a business trip in March 2008. He frequently stays at this hotel while in Maryland, but never had an experience like this until he stayed in room 417. This was his room for three nights, and for the first two nights, he was very restless and didn't sleep well, which was not a normal occurrence for him. On the third restless night, he realized that he was hearing noises inside the room, not from adjoining rooms. These noises were hangers moving around in the closet, the refrigerator door opening, noises from the bathroom, and the sound of glass being set on the nightstand next to the bed. Final thing that really spooked him, was that something grabbed his side as he laid on the bed, trying to ignore the sounds and fall asleep. He was not imagining any of this. 
He could still feel the sensation of his side after jumping out of bed. He looked around the room and checked the deadbolt lock on the door, and all was secure. He considered packing and checking out, but it was 3 a.m. He finally fell asleep and checked out the next morning. He has since stayed at the hotel and was offered the same room upon check-in, but he refused it. The hotel clerk wanted to know why, but he didn't want to sound foolish and wouldn't elaborate on his experience. For the record, he didn't believe in ghosts or spirits until this happened. We believe that someone must have died in this room, heart attack or something, and their spirit is trapped there. We dare anyone to stay in this room. It is creepy. Last year, I was living in an apartment on the far northwest side of town in Chicago, Illinois, and had one experience in an apartment that for the most part was pretty quiet, but for this experience. I lived in a frighteningly active apartment on the northeast side before this occurrence, so this didn't really totally freak me out. But, I was sitting in my living room, on the couch reading. The sun was reflecting through the blinds, which I halfway closed, in the TV, which was directly in front of me, and perhaps 8 to 10 feet away, was off. I sat reading for quite some time, and at one point, looked up and into my reflection on the TV screen. Sitting a few inches from me was a woman with a page boy hairdo, perhaps in her early 40s, with glasses on. I could see her curves as she sat, so there was no mistake that she was a woman. I turned instantly to my left side, irrationally expecting to see someone sitting next to me in my lockdown apartment where I knew no one but myself had been the entire day. No one was there, of course. I looked back into the TV reflection again, and she was no longer there. May I point out that there was absolutely nothing in that apartment that could have made such a reflection. I was on the second story, so there was nothing inside that could have reflected that way. No nearby trees, etc. It was a bona fide experience. There was this one terrifying experience though, that has haunted me ever since while being in that apartment. I was sitting in the bathroom doing my business, as usual. I left the door open because I felt very uncomfortable with the door closed. I don't know why, it just gave me that feeling. I saw that same lady, early 40s style, with the page boy hairdo, right outside the door. It was like she was fixated on me, and she appeared momentarily, just staring at me. Although the bathroom light was obviously on, the hallway outside the door was pretty dim, so you could just barely make out the outline of her face and her body. There were some slight changes with her this time. The only difference being this time was that she looked like she was in some kind of nun outfit. It was really creepy. This was the moment where I was terrified. I didn't know what to think. She kind of looked like Mother Teresa in a way. It also looked like she was trying to open her mouth, but somehow couldn't, like she was unable to speak or something. Maybe she was in danger. Just like that, she disappeared. And later on in that day, I also saw Orb float around. It was pretty eerie. For the record, this was a highly Polish neighborhood and had been for years. So I have a feeling it was some old Polish lady that couldn't leave her building. I lived there for a year, and am now gone. I also have a theory that because she is Polish, that she was wearing the nun attire due to her religion. You see, Polish people are Roman Catholics usually, so it all made sense to me at the time when I thought about it. Thanks for reading. I had a personal experience at this bed and breakfast and it was so exciting. A friend of mine and I were staying in this B&B, the Henderson house, while we visited her daughter at a nearby Baptist University where she is a cheerleader. 
We stayed in the downstairs guest bedroom by the dining room. When we arrived, they were setting up for a big sit-down dinner and reception with round tables covered in white tablecloths. It was a big affair that went on for a while, while we were at a football game. When we arrived back at the B&B later that night, it was late and the staff was cleaning up and putting up the tables. They apologized for making so much noise and said that they'd be finishing up for the next hour or so, washing the tablecloths and putting them away. We were exhausted, so we each took a shower and my friend crawled into this beautiful mahogany bed and I pulled out the sleeper sofa and settled in and watched TV for a little while. Finally, it quieted down somewhat out in the parlor, so we turned off the lights and immediately fell asleep. I woke up some time earlier as three women in gowns brushed by my bed, carrying things. We had gotten quite friendly with the innkeeper and her staff earlier, so I really didn't think that much about it and wondered why they had put things away in our room before morning. The next morning, I asked my friend what the women were doing in our room the night before. She said, what women? No one came in here. And she motioned towards the door where the deadbolt was still locked. She went out to the dining room for breakfast a little before I did. And as I was walking out into the hall, she walked up to me and said, Come here, the owner has something to tell you. When I walked into the kitchen, the owner looked up and said, So, you saw them, huh? I told her I saw three women in gowns, and she said, They are dressed in wedding and bridesmaid dresses. She then walked into the parlor and opened the big old photo album and turned to the page that showed a wedding party lined up on the staircase. It was them. They are seen from time to time, getting ready for a ceremony, and the bedroom where we stayed at was once a porch that leads around to the front of the house. Because it is a Baptist college, they don't promote these ghost stories, as the college frowns on it. But she said many people see them. There is also a ghost of a captain, army or sea, I didn't quite get, but he haunts an upstairs room with a big bay window and is seen often too. It was not a frightening thing. I loved it, in fact, and hoped to go back again. They were not see-through people, and had I reached out, I could have touched their dresses. Maybe. In the year 2000, my husband and I moved to LaGrange, Georgia, to a fairly new apartment on Old Airport Road. His job had transferred him from New Hampshire, and he was able to be on a five-day shift, five on and five off. That meant he would not be home every other week, as he was a truck driver for a major store chain. Anyway, after being there a month or so, we decided that it was a great little town to settle down in and began looking for a house. During this time, we had no incidents at the apartment. After another two months of searching, we finally found the house we wanted. It was a three-bedroom ranch with a small underground pool located in a rural part of LaGrange. When our offer was accepted, we were ecstatic. This is when my four-year-old son began falling out of bed at night, something he had neither done before or after living at this apartment. Eventually, this led him to waking up in the middle of the night, and I would have to go in and confront him, which was usually fairly easy to do, and he'd go back to sleep, only to wake up later again in the night. When I put them to bed, I would sit in the hallway between both of their doors. Daughter's bedroom was at the end of the hall, which was about 10 feet long, but their doors were close together. I would have all the lights off except the hallway and once they were asleep I'd go and get on the PC in the dining room adjacent to their hallway. This hallway had a bathroom at the opposite end of the bedrooms and a laundry closet where my washing machine were. One night my son insisted I lay with him in bed 
so I laid down behind him, closest to his closet, with him closest to the door. My eyes were closed, and we were both resting quietly, when suddenly he half sat up in bed and said, Who is that? Naturally, I asked, What do you mean? He said a woman in a long skirt just walked by his bedroom door and headed to his sister's room. Of course, this is the week my husband's gone, so I'm alone in the apartment, thinking someone must have broken into our second floor apartment. So I got up and looked. My daughter, who is nine years old, Thinkley was sound asleep, so I checked her room, closet, and under her bed to make sure no one was in there. I questioned my son again, and he said no one passed back by his door, and there's no exit from my daughter's room, just right by my son's room. I brought both kids to sleep in my bed on the other side of the apartment that night. Another night, I sat in the hall again until they were both asleep. Now keep in mind, all the lights are off except the hall, which includes their big walk-in closets. No lights on. When they were both sleeping, I got up and used their bathroom at the end of their hall. While in there, I heard what sounded like a toy hitting the wall in my son's closet, which shared a wall with the bathroom. Thinking that he woke up and started playing, which was not like him at all. By the way, I went to his room to find him sleeping cozily, but the closet door halfway open, and the light inside open. Okay, so now I'm freaked out, because I know that the door was closed, and the light was off, and yes, his bed's right next to that closet, so yeah, I took them into my room again. Again, on another night, my son wakes up again, but this time my husband's home, and we're all asleep in our own beds. I can hear my son crying, so I go to comfort him, but he's not there. My husband and I can't find him, but he's still crying, sobbing, a terrified cry actually. In a minute or two, we find him hiding under the sink in the bathroom at the end of his hallway. He told us the mean lady won't let him pass. He had tried to come in her room, but she stood in front of him. Again, he described her exactly the same long skirt, hair up behind her head, and she makes faces at him. Now I know for a fact I'm dealing with a ghosty here, but husband thinks I'm just going nuts and putting stories in the kid's head. My daughter, meanwhile, never notices any of this and is not disturbed. While on the computer one night, late around 2 a.m., I hear three distinct loud knocks under my feet one on the left in the small kitchen, one directly below my feet, and one to my right. Sounded like someone downstairs used a broom to knock on the ceiling in extremely rapid succession. I sincerely doubt that anyone can move as quickly in the downstairs apartment and get by the furniture they undoubtedly had there, just as I had mine arranged. I know for a fact the lady and her kids were in bed by 10 at night, so the bank has decided that they will give us a loan on any house in LaGrange, except that one, because it's rural, so we try another place and another. One night, I'm sleeping, and have a more vivid than any other dream I've ever had, kind of like a dream nightmare. In it we live in the house, and I'm looking for my son, only to find him floating face down in the pool. I woke up crying, and made up my mind that there's no way I'm ever moving into the house. So now I must convince Hubby, who thinks I'm nuts anyway, and is determined to get to the house. Well, having bought a puppy when we started looking for a house, this collie is now almost fully grown size, but he still has accidents, so we keep him penned in the kitchen with a large baby gate. When we go out, this doggy somehow gets past the gate by pushing a corner or whatever, and is running around our apartment. So one night, we're going out to dinner, and Hubby and I lock up Poochie, and set two high back dining chairs against the gate. Keep in mind, our apartment is carpet, thick, and plush everywhere, except the kitchen. When we return, Hubby is looking at me from my kid's hallway, and the gate is still exactly as we left it, 
and the chairs are too. Not one thing had moved, but somehow, according to Lovey Hubby, I'm supposed to believe the dog vaulted over the chair backs and somehow landed without killing himself or breaking my dining room table, which was a mere foot or two from the chairs. Yeah, okay. My downstairs neighbor's kids told me that their mom was upset because I let my kids run around my apartment, banging at all hours of the night, mostly after 10 p.m., and she can't believe I let my kids stay up so late. She has to get up early, yada yada yada. Except, my kids are in bed every night at 9 o'clock, and asleep no later than 9.30ish. I see a shape leaning out of the kitchen door, watching me as I watch TV and tell it, come sit by me and leave my son alone. It didn't sit with me, but it didn't bother my son that night. I never noticed my dog noticing anything. The only cold spot in the house was the kid's hallway, and not always, just mostly. Hubby slept in son's room one day, in the afternoon, and, even though we had central air, complained that he sweat like a hog, and had the worst nightmares ever, but the place still isn't haunted, and yes, he steadfastly refused to ever sleep in there again. I saw blinds move on their own, doorknobs that rattled when I was alone, in the place, and no, it wasn't a teeny shake caused by some truck rumbling by, which was there some 50 to 100 feet between the side of our apartment and the road. This was a defined and voracious shaking, a definitive hello, I'm trying to open the door. But no one in the apartment but me. Finally, my husband grew tired of trying to get a loan for that house. And mysteriously, everything stopped. No more rattling of this or that. No shadows. But by now, it is also true that the four of us were sleeping in my waterbed. In the one room that never seemed affected by the haunting. But I noticed everything in the apartment changed and felt cozy again. But by then... I'd also decided that tornadoes, large cockroachy looking bugs, and the ghost belt were too much for me, and we packed up and came back north. Interestingly enough, when we returned home to my parents' house, which we later bought, we just never ever felt anything but perfect there. There were three knocks on the bottom half of my bedroom door one afternoon. I was alone in the house. Immediately. I felt that was the spirit or something, telling us we made the right choice by not getting the house. My father believed that it was his mother who had lived and died in North Carolina, who knew something bad would happen to my son if we bought that house, especially since it all seemed to stop when we stopped trying to get financing for it and gave up on the house. My son has never been affected by any other ghosty type stuff since then and he's never fell out of bed again either. Feel free to email me if you choose. Earlier this year, I attended a camp in Rubin County, Georgia. There, I was told the story of Timothy Dalton. The story is that, in the late 1970s, the Daltons lived in a rural area of Harbison County, Georgia. Supposedly, Timothy was about 11 years old, an only child, and his parents didn't really like him. They abused him in every way possible and kept him in the basement due to them not thinking it was worthy of a room upstairs. This wasn't even really a basement, more just like a cellar with one small window that was about two feet in length and a half foot up. Mr. Dalton's wood workshop was down there, so at night, Timothy would work on whatever he could. His father didn't mind him working with his wood because his father would take whatever Timothy made and sell it without giving Timothy any of the money. Well, one day, Timothy was at home alone weeding the field when the postman came. His parents had got off into the next city over to get some supplies for the upcoming fall. Now. Timothy knew that there was such a thing as mail, but since his parents didn't tell him where it came from and neglected to send him to school, he never knew what it honestly looked like. The postman approached Timothy 
and asked him if his father was around. When Timothy answered no, the postman handed over a package. He had never seen a package before and was informed not to open it or even shake it. It was his father's and not his. Timothy went inside the house and set the package down on the kitchen table. He couldn't stop thinking about it, so he opened it and made sure that he could seal it again. Around this time, power tools started to come out, and Timothy's father figured that he should have one since he does work on wood sometimes. Timothy saw that it was a power drill and was in awe. He couldn't wait until that night to start making something. So, for the rest of the day, he just went around and collected logs and sticks so that he could make something. Once he found them, he set them by the window and at night would open it and pull them in. That night, once his parents locked him in the basement, he started the work. He worked and worked for about three hours until he came up with this beautiful rocking chair. He had never seen something this beautiful and never been this happy about something like this. So every night, throughout the summer and the fall, he would sit and rock in it until he would fall asleep. Well, a horrible blizzard blew through, and it was a horrible sight. All the crops of the city had died, and nothing was left of them. So one day, Mr. Dalton told Timothy to go and find firewood for the fireplace since they didn't have electric heating. Timothy knew that all the firewood would be wet, but decided not to fight with his father. After about two hours, Timothy had found some dry pieces to possibly hold them over for the night. So he turned back and started to walk back towards the house. As he approached the end of the woods, he noticed that there was a smoke coming out of the fireplace. He found this very odd and didn't quite know why his father would send him out to find firewood if he already had some. So Timothy walked into the house, and as soon as he walked in, he was horrified. He saw his rocking chair, the only thing he had ever been proud of, chopped up in the fireplace, burning to little bits. Timothy snapped, that's all to say. He didn't start to yell at his dad or anything. He just mentally snapped, so he sat down the firewood and did his chores. Before he was locked down in the basement, he managed to sneak some chicken wire under his shirt, so he took it down to the basement and was locked in there. After about an hour, he knew that his mom and dad had just turned off the light to go to bed. After maybe three hours, he had constructed this power drill into this killing machine. He had found an X-Acto knife and bound it to the power drill so that when he turned the trigger on it, it would spin around and around. So he used some chicken wire to unlock himself and walked up the stairs to his parents room. He slowly bound his parents hands and feet to the bedpost and footboard. It took him about an hour just to do this without either of them stirring. So. Once that was done, he just stood over his father, staring him dead in the eye with his hand and power drill behind his back. As soon as his father awoke, he started yelling at Timothy, calling him a freak and wondering what he was doing there. So Timothy didn't do anything, just pulled out the power drill and jammed it straight into his father's heart and turned it on. His mother was screaming bloody murder. So he pulled it out of his father and slowly walked around the other side to his mom. She was crying and was in absolute hysterics. Timmy looked over at her, then revved the power drill once and shoved it straight into her neck. He just dropped everything, didn't wash his hands, didn't even try to clean up. He didn't care if he was caught. All he cared about was that rocking chair. So he went over to the fireplace and sat down in front of it and stared into it for three days until the police got suspicious and noticed that they hadn't seen them for a while. When they came to the house, they didn't even have to ask any questions. 
they knew what happened. So they admitted Timothy into the psych ward, where he stayed into the late 90s. Now that you know the story, I can get to my experience. It's important to understand that story so you can understand the experience that happened to me. When I was with my camp, our cabin of 20 boys and girls were on a bus headed to Helen to go tubing on the hooch. It was really rainy, so they didn't want us going in the water, so they took us to go bowling in the Habersham County. The night before, we had hiked up Blood Mountain and was told that story, so we were all pretty freaked out. Well, me and my friend Kelly and her boyfriend Jake decided to go walk around the bowling building since a lot of the counselors were already back there. So as we're walking back there, there was an old man with slightly grayish hair standing out there and smoking. We had been informed that if you see anyone outside your camp, that you kindly say hello, don't say your name, and only tell where you're from, camp-wise. The man did what any other person would do and ask us our names. We sat down on the curb that was parallel to him, but the length of a car away from him. We told him that we were from CHH Lake Burton, and that we were here with a camp. Well, that still doesn't answer my question, he said. Kelly spoke up. I'm sorry, sir, but we're not allowed to tell you our names. He looked at her and laughed a little. <laughs> well, Kelly, my name is Tim. We we're all completely shocked and confused. How do you know our names? I asked. He laughed again and put out his cigarette. Let's just say that I know a lot of things. Harbison is a very quiet town, and as of last night, for you guys, it was a very innocent town too. We were all in shock and awe. How did he know that he knew about the murders? We all got spooked, and Jack led the way back around the building, but every crazy person has some parting words. Just remember this, he said to us, as we all halted to stop. I wouldn't have had to kill him if he just kept his eyes closed. To this day it still haunts me, the wheezing laugh of that man, and the wondering of the story. Is it honestly true? A few weeks ago, my grandparents and I went to a Mormon Pioneer Cemetery a few miles from where I live to get a picture of an ancestor's gravestone. While driving into the cemetery, I noticed a particularly tall gravestone. As soon as I saw it, I got the chills. Normally, I'm not scared of cemeteries or things like that, at least not in the daytime. As we left the cemetery, my grandmother pointed out the creepy headstone. She said it was her grand aunt's grave, and that this lady had crossed the plains to come to Utah when she was about eight. She later went north to help settle in the town of Richmond, Utah. Then grandma told me the following story. When my aunt Andrea was about 15, she was home alone in the kitchen right after school. She heard a woman's voice and turned around. She saw an elderly lady in a long, old-fashioned style dress with her hair in a bun. Andrea ran out of the house into a neighbor's where she called my grandmother at work. Grandma thought she was trying to get attention, but told her she could stay with the neighbors until she got home from work. The same thing happened twice over the next two weeks. My grandma requested a picture of my great aunt from my great grandmother so she could copy it and hang it up on the mantle. It was lying on the counter the next day when Andrea came home. As soon as she saw the picture, she jumped. She asked grandma who it was, and then told her it was the ghost. Andrea never saw the woman again, but says it wasn't scary, more like a lady that wanted the help. I know this one's kind of short, but thanks for reading. I have a story to tell you of a site 
which will always be engraved into my mind for life. A friend of mine and I were avid hunters, and we were returning from a duck hunting trip in a place called Dunmurray. We were trying to remain as quiet as possible, so that we could catch and hunt as many of those ducks as possible. As time wore on, we weren't able to find too many, but still decided to have a look by the river to check for those elusive ducks. Before we crossed the fields back to the house, we made our way across the M1 motorway at Dunmurray and had our guns loaded as well. It was then when my heart thunderously stopped and noticed something far more terrifying than a simple duck. I put my last shell up the spout and noticed a tall, light tan colored figure to the right of me. It seemed to be about seven feet tall and off of the ground by about two feet and scared the crap out of me. I couldn't speak and I warned my friend to stay away. At the time, my friend was right behind me when I saw the figure, but didn't quite understand what I was so terrified about since he didn't see it himself. I told him to start running and running as fast as possible so we could be as far from this mysterious figure. My first instinct was to point my gun at it, but I urged my friend to stay away from this thing. I thought by pointing at it with my gun, I would scare the figure away. Of course now, looking back, it was a ghost, so it sounds silly now. We eventually made it out of there without incident and explained to my friend what I saw. He called me crazy, he called me insane, but I swore to him that is exactly what I saw. A seven foot figure floating directly at me from the distance. This happened about 14 years ago and neither of us went hunting at night again. I told a friend of mine this story and he explained that a figure not unlike a monk had been reported on the motorway from as far back as 30 years ago. Huh, wish someone could have told me, then I wouldn't be as spooked. My grandparents used to own a home in New Hartford, Connecticut until about five years ago. It was a huge house, mostly built by my gramps, and it sat centered on about four and a half acres of land. It was really nice, in the daytime, anyhow. It was a two-story house with a huge attic and a basement as well. There were a total of five bedrooms in the main part of the house and there was a two bedroom apartment connected to the house. Now, just as a bit of a background, my gram and gramps were some really cool old people. They traveled a lot. In fact, they've been to many different countries. They've been to all 48 continental states, plus Alaska, in their RV. A few years before I was born, they went to Heidi and they bought this freaky little wooden statue. Ever since I was a little girl, anytime we went up to Connecticut to visit them, I hated that statue. A giant pillowcase used to have to be put over it so that I couldn't see it. One night, when I was about 13, I was sleeping in the bedroom that was converted into my cram's needlepoint and sewing room. I woke up to go to the potty a little freaky statue man had the customary pillowcase pulled over him and was standing in his usual corner across the short, squared hall from my room. I went potty and came out. First thing I always did was I had to check and make sure that the little man hadn't moved. I ended up wetting myself when I looked and saw the pillowcase on the floor in the corner where scary statue man was and then looked at the corner by my door, and he was there. I was only in the bathroom for two minutes, and that statue was way too heavy for anyone to move it, and me to not hear it. Everyone else was asleep anyhow. My older brother, the one who would have been sick enough to pull a mean prank like that, was not at my grandparents' home. He was in Bark Homestead with my cousin Sean and my Aunt Joni and Uncle Jim's house. As soon as I saw that Mr. Man was waiting for me by my door, probably waiting for me to walk by so that he could grab me 
and eat me or something. I immediately took off running down the stairs, which was an incredible feat for me in and of itself. If you've never seen a fat 13 year old girl run before, and run through the family in the living room, through the kitchen, into the foyer, and up two steps to the attached apartment where my mother was sleeping with my little sister Hannah and my baby brother Ryan. The next morning, bright and early, we went upstairs to investigate and where was the statue? Back in the corner it was supposed to be in with the pillowcase pulled over it. Hmm. I've had many encounters with the paranormal since I was about 5 or 6 years old and I've seen ghosts and I've even heard and seen the presence of demons. I wanted to share two of these experiences with you. People can think what they will but I take these things very seriously and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they are real and walk among us. First ghost to ever cross my path was that of a woman. I was five at the time and had gone to the kitchen to get a drink while my family was watching a movie on the hydro bed. I was standing there drinking my water when I see in my peripheral vision a woman in a white dress floating down the hall from my aunt's room right into the room occupied by my mother and myself. Being as I was a child, I thought only that this lady didn't belong in our house surfaced in my mind. Well, for some reason, I decided to throw a kitchen knife at it, and you guessed it, the knife went through it. I always believed that she was hiding in my closet as well. There would be numerous instances where I'd be sleeping in my room in the middle of the night. That's when I would hear the closet door and see it open a crack. It was very terrifying, and I didn't know what to do, but to stare in absolute terror. There were more than a few instances where it felt like something was trapped inside there and was trying to claw its way out. So much so in fact that actually the door was splintered in a few places. My second encounter was with the Phantom Miner. Sounds weird huh? But let me just say that this was in Sacramento, California where gold was discovered. Sutter's Mill was about 10 to 15 miles from our house. I saw the specter in our backyard, digging in the ground. He was dressed as a miner, would have dressed in the 1840s. He even had a mule with him, loaded down with things. It was at about 10 p.m. at night. I guess he found what he was looking for, because he pulled something out of the ground, put it in a pack, grabbed the mule's reins, and started to walk away. About three seconds later, he had vanished from sight. Thing that was odd to me was that a water pipe that was in the spot where the phantasmal miner was searching at, that very next morning, mysteriously began to leak. Strange series of events, but I'm glad you were able to read them, and I appreciate your readership. Since I was a little girl, my sisters and I had frightening experiences with ghosts. When I was six, my family and I moved to a fairly new house, only eight years old at the time, in West Texas. As far back as I can remember, we had strange things going on in that house. First off, at night, if you were to go through the hallway to get to my parents' room, you would always hear what sounded like a TV. You could hear voices and sometimes music. Most of the time, my parents' TV was off. If you left the room and stood in the hallway again, the sounds would be gone. Secondly, when I would try to go to sleep at night, I would always have that classic someone's watching me feeling. I always blamed it on me being a young child. The house was a very scary place to be at night. Wherever you went, someone was watching you. Friends who have spent the night rarely stayed twice. The areas of the house that scared everyone the worst were the hallways to my parents' room and my older sister's closet. The closet always had a feeling of hate radiating from it. 
I tried to spend a night in there with my scared sister and didn't last. I was sleeping on the floor with my head next to the closet and that just wasn't a good feeling. I went back to my room after she fell asleep. A couple years after we moved in, my younger sister had a frightening experience. Her and I shared a bedroom with our beds parallel to each other, with a nightstand in between us. We were about three feet apart. One night, I woke up to her screaming my name. I woke up and asked what was wrong. She told me that, for no reason at all. She woke up and looked over at my bed. Laying at the foot of my bed, she saw a light blue, glowing figure of a woman. Her eyes were gone and her mouth hung open. My sister described her as looking dead. My sister also added that she couldn't see me anywhere on the bed. So she started screaming my name and closed her eyes. When she opened them, I was awake asking her what was wrong. She told me, and I looked down at the foot of my bed, and my huge stuffed animal that I had there every night was sparking like it had really bad static electricity. I took it off my bed and threw it in my bathroom sink and ran water over it. Being young, I thought it would help. Years later, my family and I moved to southern Louisiana and moved into a gated subdivision. One night my two sisters were mad at me and left the house to go on a walk. I followed them without them knowing. I followed them up to the front gate of the subdivision and talked to them for a minute. They quickly left in a huff, being that they were still angry with me. For what, I don't remember now. I stayed by the gate for a couple of minutes afterwards and then decided to run to the end of the main street and hide behind some bushes that faced the gate. I waited for my sisters to walk by, and when they did, unaware of where I was hiding, they stopped remotely in front of the bushes. I heard my younger sister say, what is Jenny, me, doing, sitting on top of that stop sign? The stop sign is located next to the gate. After that, they walked on. I was a bit confused. It was about to chase after them, but then, through the leaves, I saw a shadow of someone running past the bushes I was behind. I could also hear the sound of footsteps. I stood up quickly to see who was there. No one was in sight. After this, I ran to my sisters and told them what I had seen. They then told me that they saw me, or what looked like me, sitting on top of the stop sign. They said I had a very angry, disfiguring grin. After we traded stories, we ran home quickly. Later, my younger sister told me that the ghost she saw on my bed and the ghost she saw on the stop sign both looked exactly like me. Possible doppelganger? I don't know. It all began around the 1st of June, this very year. This incident took place in my grandmother and grandfather's house. My grandfather had been diagnosed with cancer in the summer of 1998, and I didn't know that, that these last few months would be the last time I would ever see him alive. During that period of time, I would spent a whole lot of time with my grandparents, and had felt like I actually gotten a little closer to them both, but especially my grandfather. At the end of the summer I left, and went back home. Subsequently, about five months later, our family received a disturbing phone call. It was from my grandmother. Unfortunately, she informed us about the passing of our grandfather. He had passed away in the hospital. We went back to our grandmother's home, which was the very last place that our grandfather lived in before his passing, a month and a half after we had been staying there. I noticed that something just didn't feel right. The whole atmosphere had changed. I decided to take the guest room. For some reason, I always got the feeling that I was being watched in the guest room. Then, other little occurrences started to evolve. The very first was, I always felt like somebody was standing over my shoulder. I started to notice scars on my back after I would awake in the mornings, and I would feel light touches on my back. 
My mom and brother both complained about the door handles being rattled and opening and closing really fast. Cabinet doors would fly open and the pots and pans would all fall out. My hair would get pulled in the night. Objects would fall from midair, such as paper, and I would hear voices, one of which said, wake up, very loudly in my ear. I would see mist and rays of light shoot past me extremely fast, and so fast in fact, I could feel a whoosh of air. I would notice some of my belongings missing, such as my CDs, jewelry, and money to name a few. Usually the belongings that I would use around the house a lot, I would feel my bed move, as if someone were to bump into it during the night, flickering lights, and last, but certainly not least, since animals can sometimes see things that humans cannot see, my cat would turn her head really fast and just stare at something which I would not be able to see for a significant amount of time. A little while later, about a month after being there, I saw the unthinkable. After I had sound sleep for about 7 hours or so, I woke up suddenly to a spirit at the foot of my bed, and it was my grandfather. I could not believe what I was seeing. But I will describe this to you in full detail. There was no doubt in my mind that this was actually a spirit. He was shadow-like, but his clothing was colored. He would always wave at me, and sure enough, he was waving in my direction with a smile on his face. It was plain to see that he was trying to get my attention. He just wanted to see me. I was too afraid to move a muscle, and feared that in spite of everything else, that he would approach me. I had never seen anything like this before in my entire life. I didn't want to tell this to anyone though. I thought that nobody would believe me or even listen. About a week later, I was in the kitchen with my mom and she told me that the guest room was where our grandpa had stayed before he died because he was too ill. And that explains the reason why that very room felt like the most eerie room in the house. I almost fainted whenever I discovered that but I knew that a spirit can travel anywhere in the home, even outside or in back of the house. But it wasn't until a month later that I decided to come out with the news. I first confided in my mom and brother and my mother believed me because she said that before I brought up anything that I had said. Our grandmother had experienced the exact same thing, that he was at the foot of the bed watching over her and smiling. I had a phone conversation with her and I let her do all the talking fast, and everything that she told me measured up with my experience. And it only happened to my grandmother and I, whom he was the closest with, before he passed away. Everyone was wondering why I didn't scream or attempt to run out of the guest room as soon as I saw him, but I was too afraid. Whenever you're that close to something like that, it just takes your breath away completely. I was in my own little qualm. I felt very uncomfortable. It wasn't until I started sleeping in the living room sofa that I felt appeased. Albeit, this has not been my first experience. Ever since I was the age of five, my family and I started traveling around a lot, and we would move here and there. I've went to nine different schools total. I'm 17 now. In previous homes, I've experienced a whole lot. I lived in a haunted house for a total of three years, not only by all the experiences that I have endured, I have been doing many researches involving the paranormal. I am really good at picking up on things too, which I have found out. There was this one house that we went into that we were thinking about purchasing, but I felt like something was wrong. There were many rooms in the home that I could just not stop venturing off into. The main ones were the master bedroom in the study. After I left the house, I told my parents that someone from the house must have passed away, someone that used to stay in the master bedroom. So my mom went to go look up the history of the house, and sure enough, the owner and his wife on a trip to California got killed in a car wreck and they lived in the master bedroom, and the owner spent most of his time in the study. After I was enlightened with that information, I was in disbelief. I still am, even to this day. My mom told me that it goes back to her being Jewish and Indian. She said that she can pick up on it and see things too. She claims that it's an Indian thing, but I don't know. 
Maybe it is. Anyways, God bless everyone and thank you for your time. Great website by the way. I'm a current visitor. Hello. I have a lot of experiences to share. I've been told that I'm more in tune with the spiritual world, and that's why a lot of stuff happens to me. Anyways, I'll just share some that I can remember. One night, my friend Amanda was having a sleepover with three other girls, and someone brought along a Ouija to play. We were playing and having fun because it was spooky. After that, we went to sleep at about 12, and we slept on a trindle that came out of the couch. We were the only ones in the house because her mom was out. Anyways, I woke up and shook everyone awake because I had a bad feeling and I heard the closet door slamming all night. It was pitch black, so I told for my friend to turn on the light. She did, but it blew out. She tried it again, but it blew out once more. I thought bulbs can only blow out once. We were really scared, and we saw this black mass approaching us and closing in on us. We jumped up and all ran out of the house. We were really spooked and didn't go back inside for like two hours. One time, when I was about seven, I'd been staying at my grandparents' house for Easter vacation. I'd got up to sleep in this one room, but for some reason, I didn't like it. Well, one night, I woke up because I felt someone watching me. There's a door that leads to my room, and right next to it is a door that leads to the backyard. I sat up in bed, and right in front of the back door was this figure. It was about six foot and they appeared to have armor on. I was afraid because I knew it was bad, but I wasn't able to run away because the door to get out of the room was right next to where the spirit was. I just looked at it, and it wouldn't let me go. Finally, after like two minutes it faded away, and I ran out of the room and refused to sleep in there again. Another time, at my mom's house, I was home alone, and I was watching TV in the living room. I heard the bath water running, and so I ran to the bathroom to turn it off. I thought it must have been loose or something, so I tightened it. I closed the door and resumed watching TV again. It somehow turned on again, so I tightened it again. This continued on for another four times, and I still didn't know what it was. In my dad's house, an old lady supposedly died there. I never sleep with the light off because I like to be able to see who and what is in my room. Anyways, I always get knocks on my door, even though it's open, and one night, I felt like someone was sitting on my chest while I was sleeping. My older sister seems to get bugged more. Someone tickles her feet, pokes the bottom of her mattress while she's sleeping, and breathes behind her when she's on the computer. In the same house, in my bedroom, I hung this picture about six inches across and three inches wide of this rapper Dr. Dre on my wall. The next day, there were scratches that I had torn through the picture, although it was still on the wall. This freaked me out because I was the only one visiting my dad that weekend, and he doesn't have any pets. I put tape over it just to cheaply laminate it and see if she could or would scratch it again. The morning after that, I was surprised to find it scratched again. It freaked me out but I left the picture there. I don't think she likes rap very much, and I think she and they take and hide things. These may not sound scary, but when they happen to you, it is. I have many more, but I can't remember anyone right now. Thanks for listening, and I'm sorry it was so long. Hey you! Yeah, you, you watching the video. If you don't like this video and give it a like, share, and subscribe, then I don't know what else to do with you. If you're subscribed, then leave a comment down below or share the video wherever you want because it's December now. We have the last year to make this right. We have four years to get this right. I mean, I don't know why I said four, but you know what I mean. One year, two years, three years, doesn't matter. That's all irrelevant. You like this video, you listen to this video, you don't turn off the video, and I will coerce you until we get it right.
Yeah, because I'm very intimidating, right? I'm totally kidding, guys. You know, if you could please leave a like, share, and subscribe, I'd really appreciate it. You know, it's December, like I said, and it's a good month to start off the year. Well, uh, start off January, but December, you know, let's let's leave on a high note. You know, I've got long videos and short videos coming soon. Let me know if you like a one to two hour video of whatever topic. Uh, I'm trying to branch out here, so guys, let me know what you think is the best option in terms of like what content you want to see, you know, because honestly, it helps me get a sense of what you guys enjoy, and I'm obviously first uh, centered, focused around, you know, making sure you guys have the best listening experience possible, so guys, let me know. I love you guys, and I'll see you in the next video.